It was a moonless night, which was good for the purposes of solid Jackson. He fished for curious squid, so-called because as well as being squid, they were curious. That is to say, their curiosity was the curious thing about them. Shortly after they got curious about the lantern that Solid had hung over the stern of his boat, they started to become curious about the way in which various of their number suddenly vanished skywards with a splash. Some of them even became curious, very briefly curious, about the sharp, barbed thing that was coming very quickly towards them. The curious squid were extremely curious. Unfortunately, they weren't very good at making connections. It was a very long way to this fishing ground, but for Solid the trip was usually well worth it. The curious squid were very small, harmless, difficult to find, and reckoned by connoisseurs to have the foulest taste of any creature in the world. This made them very much in demand in a certain kind of restaurant, where highly skilled chefs made with great care dishes containing no trace of the squid whatsoever. Solid Jackson's problem was that tonight... A moonless night in the spawning season, when the squid were especially curious about everything, the chef seemed to have been at work on the sea itself. There was not a single interested eyeball to be seen. There weren't any other fish either, and usually there were a few attracted to the light. He'd caught sight of one. It had been making through the water extremely fast in a straight line. He laid down his trident and walked to the other end of the boat, where his son Les was also gazing intently at the torch-lit sea. "'Not a thing in half an hour,' said Solid. "'You sure we're in the right spot, Dad?' Solid squinted at the horizon. There was a faint glow in the sky that indicated the city of Al-Khali on the Clachian coast. He turned around. The other horizon glowed, too, with the lights of Ankh Morpork. The boat bobbed gently halfway between the two. "'Course we are,' he said, but certainty edged away from his words. "'Because there was a hush on the sea. "'It didn't look right. "'The boat rocked a little, but that was with their movement, "'not from any motion of the waves. "'It felt as if there was going to be a storm, "'but the stars twinkled softly and there was not a cloud in the sky. "'The stars twinkled on the surface of the water, too. "'Now that was something you didn't often see.' I reckon we ought to be getting out of here, Solid said. Les pointed at the slack sail. What are we going to use for wind, Dad? It was then that they heard the splash of oars. Solid, squinting hard, could just make out the shape of another boat heading towards him. He grabbed his boat hook. I knows that's you, you thieving foreign bastard. The oars stopped. A voice sang over the water. May you be consumed by a thousand devils, you damned person! The other boat glided closer. It looked foreign, with eyes painted on the prow. Fish them all out, have you? I'll take my trident to you, you bottom feeding scum that you are! My curvy sword at your neck, you unclean son of a dog of the female persuasion! Les looked over the side. Little bubbles fizzed on the surface of the sea. Dad! he said. That's greasy Arif out there, snapped his father. You take a good look at him. He's been coming out here for years, stealing our squid, the evil, lying little devil. Dad, there's... You get on them oars and I'll knock his black teeth out. Les could hear a voice saying from the other boat, See, my son, how the underhanded fish thief... Row, his father shouted. To the oars! shouted someone in the other boat. "'Whose squid are they, Dad?' said Les. "'Ours. What, even before we've caught them? Just you shut up and row. I can't move the boat, Dad. We're stuck on something. It's a hundred fathoms deep here, boy. What's there to stick on?' Les tried to disentangle an oar from the thing rising slowly out of the fizzing sea. "'Looks like a chicken, Dad.' There was a sound from below the surface. It sounded like some bell or gong slowly swinging. Chickens can't swim. It's made of iron, Dad. Solid scrambled to the rear of the boat. It was a chicken, made of iron. Seaweed and shells covered it, and water dripped off it as it rose against the stars. It stood on a cross-shaped perch. There seemed to be a letter on each of the four ends of the cross. Solid held the torch closer. What? 
master. Then he pulled the oar free and sat down beside his son. Row like blazes, Les! What's happening, Dad? Shut up and row. Get us away from it. Is it a monster, Dad? It's worse than a monster, son, shouted Solid as the oars bit into the water. The thing was quite high now, standing on some kind of tower. What is it, Dad? What is it? It's a damned weathercock! There was not on the whole a lot of geological excitement. The sinking of continents is usually accompanied by volcanoes, earthquakes, and armadas of little boats containing old men anxious to build pyramids and mystic stone circles in some new land, where being the possessor of genuine ancient occult wisdom might be expected to attract girls. But the rising of this one caused barely a ripple in the purely physical scheme of things. It more or less sidled back, like a cat who's been away for a few days and knows you've been worrying. Around the shores of the Circle Sea, a large wave, only five or six feet high by the time it reached them, caused some comment. And in some of the very low-lying swamp areas, the water swamped some villages of people that no one else cared about very much. But in a purely geological sense, nothing very much happened, in a purely geological sense. It's a city, Dad. Look, you can see all the windows and... I told you to shut up and keep rowing. The seawater surged down the streets. On either side, huge, weed-encrusted buildings boiled slowly out of the surf. Father and son fought to keep some way on the boat as it was dragged along, and since lesson one in the art of rowing is that you do it while looking the wrong way, they didn't see the other boat. You lunatic! Foolish man! Don't you touch that building! This country belongs to Ankh Morpork! The two boats spun in a temporary whirlpool. I claim this land in the name of the Seraf of al Khali. We saw it first. Les, you tell him. We saw it first. We saw it first before you saw it first. Les, you saw him. He tried to hit me with that oar. But, Dad, you're waving that trident. See the untrustworthy way he attacks us, Akhan. There was a grinding noise from under the keel of both boats, and they began to tip as they settled into the sea-bottom ooze. Look, father, there is an interesting statue. He has set his foot on Clatchian soil, the squid thief. Get those filthy sandals off Ankhbor, Porky, and territory. Oh, Dad! The two fishermen stopped screaming at each other, mainly in order to get their breath back. Crabs scuttled away. Water drained between the patches of weed, carving runnels in the grey silt. Father, look, there's still coloured tiles on the... Mine! Mine! Les caught Akhan's eye. They exchanged a very brief glance, which was nevertheless modulated with a considerable amount of information, beginning with the sheer galactic-sized embarrassment of having parents, and working up from there. Dad, we don't have to... Les began. You shut up. It's your future I'm thinking about, my lad. Yes, but who cares who saw it first, Dad? We're both hundreds of miles from home. I mean, who's going to know, Dad? The two squid fishermen glared at one another. The dripping buildings rose above them. There were holes that might well have been doorways, and glassless apertures that could have been windows. But all was darkness within. Now and again, Les fancied he could hear something slithering. Solid Jackson coughed. The lad's right, he muttered. Daft to argue, just the four of us. Indeed, said Arif. They backed away, each man carefully watching the other. Then, so closely that it was a chorus, they both yelled, Grab the boat! There was a confused couple of moments, and then each pair, boat carried over their heads, ran and slithered along the muddy streets. They had to stop and come back with mutual cries of, A kidnapper has well, huh? to get the right sons. As every student of exploration knows, the prize goes not to the explorer who first sets foot upon the virgin soil, but to the one who gets that foot home first. If it is still attached to his leg, this is a bonus. The weathercocks of Ankh Morpork creaked around in the wind. Very few of them were in fact representations of Avis Domestica. There were various dragons, fish, and miscellaneous animals. On the roof of the Assassin's Guild, a silhouette of one of the members squeaked into a new position, cloak and dagger at the ready. On the Beggar's Guild, a tin beggar's hand asked the wind for a quarter. 
On the butcher's guild, a copper pig sniffed the air. On the roof of the thieves' guild, a real, if rather deceased, unlicensed thief turned gently, which shows what you're capable of if you try, or at least if you try stealing without a license. The one on the library dome of Unseen University was running slow and wouldn't show the change for half an hour yet, but the smell of the sea drifted over the city. There was a tradition of soapbox public speaking in Sartor Square. Speaking was stretching a point to cover the ranters, harangers, and occasional self-absorbed mumblers that spaced themselves at intervals amongst the crowds, and traditionally people said whatever was on their minds and at the top of their voices. The patrician, it was said, looked kindly on the custom. He did, and very closely, too. He probably had someone make notes. So did the watch. It wasn't spying, Commander Vimes told himself. Spying was when you crept around peeking in windows. It wasn't spying when you had to stand back a bit so that you weren't deafened. He reached out without paying attention and struck a match on Sergeant Detritus. That was me, sir, said the troll reproachfully. Sorry, Sergeant, said Vimes, lighting his cigar. It's not a problem. They returned their attention to the speakers. It's the wind, thought Vimes. It's bringing something new. Usually the speakers dealt with all kinds of subjects, many of them on the cusp of sanity or somewhere in the peaceful valleys on the other side. But now they were all monomaniacs. Time they were taught a lesson, screamed the nearest one. Why don't our so-called masters listen to the voice of the people? Ark Morpork has had enough of these swaggering brigands. They steal our fish, they steal our trade, and now they're stealing our land. It would have been better if people had cheered, Vimes thought. People generally cheered the speakers indiscriminately to egg them on, but the crowd around this man just seemed to nod approval. He thought, they're actually thinking about what he said. They stole my merchandise, shouted a speaker opposite him. It's a pirate bloody empire. I was boarded in Ankh-Morpork waters. There was a general self-righteous muttering. What did they steal, Mr. Jenkins? said a voice from the crowd. A cargo of fine silks, the crowd hissed. Ah, oh, not dried fish offal and condemned meat, then. That's your normal cargo, I believe. Mr. Jenkins strained to look for the speaker. Fine silks, he said, and what does the city care about that? Nothing. There were shouts of shame. Has the city been told, said the inquiring voice. People started to crane their heads, and then the crowd opened a little to reveal the figure of Commander Vimes of the City Watch. Well, it's, uh, I, Jenkins began, um, I... I care, said Vimes calmly. Shouldn't be too hard to track down a cargo of fine silks that stink of fish guts. There was laughter. Ankh Morpork people always like some variety in their street theatre. Vimes apparently spoke to Sergeant Detritus while keeping his gaze locked on Jenkins. Detritus, just you go along with Mr. Jenkins here, will you? His ship is the Milker. I believe. He'll show you all the lading bills and manifests and receipts and things, and then we can sort him out in jig time. There was a clang as Detritus's huge hand came to rest against his helmet. Yes, sir. Er, uh, er, uh, you uh, can't, said Jenkins quickly. They, uh, they stole the paperwork as well. Really? So they can take the stuff back to the shop if it doesn't fit? Er, uh, anyway, the ship sailed. Yes, sailed. Got to try and recoup my losses, you know. Sailed? Without its captain, said Vimes. So, Mr. Scoplet is in charge, your first officer. Yes, yes. Damn, said Vimes, snapping his fingers theatrically. That man we've got in the cells on a charge of being naughtily drunk last night. We're going to have to charge him with impersonation as well, then. I don't know. More blasted paperwork. The stuff just piles up. Mr. Jenkins tried to look away, but Vimes' stare kept pulling him back. The occasional tremble of a lip suggested that he was preparing a riposte, but he was bright enough to spot that Vimes' grin was as funny as the one that moves very fast towards drowning men. 
and has a fin on top. Mr. Jenkins made a wise decision and got down. I'll, er, uh, I'll go and sort, well, I, I'd better go and, <clears throat> er, uh, he said, and pushed his way through the mob, which waited a little while to see if anything interesting was going to happen, and then, disappointed, sought out other entertainment. You want I should go and have a look at this boat? said Detritus. No, Sergeant, there won't be any silk, and there won't be any paperwork. There won't be anything except a lingering aroma of fish guts. Well, dem damn Clatchians steals everything that ain't nailed down, right? Vimes shook his head and strolled on. They don't have trolls in Clatch, do they? he said. No, sir. It's the heat. Troll brains don't work in the heat. If I was to go to Clatch, said Detritus, his knuckles making little bink-bink noises as he dragged them over the cobbles, I'd be really stupid. Detritus? Yes, sir. Never go to Clatch. No, sir. Another speaker was attracting a much larger crowd. He stood in front of a large banner that proclaimed, Greasy Foreign Hands of Leshp. Leshp, said Detritus. Now there's a name that ain't got its teeth in. It's the land that came back up from under the sea last week, said Vimes despondently. They listened while the speaker proclaimed that Ark Morpork had a duty to protect its kith and kin on the new land. Detritus looked puzzled. How come there's kith and kin on there when it only just come up from under the water? he said. Good question, said Vimes. They've been holding their breath? I doubt it. There was more in the air than the salt of the sea, Vimes thought. There was some other current. He could sense it. Suddenly, the problem was Clatch. Ankh Morpork had been at peace with Clatch, or at least in a state of non-war, for almost a century. It was, after all, the neighbouring country. Neighbours. <laughs> but what did that mean? The watch could tell you a thing or two about neighbours. So could lawyers, especially the real rich ones to whom neighbour meant a man who'd sue for twenty years over a strip of garden two inches wide. People had lived for ages side by side, nodding to one another amicably on their way to work every day, and then some trivial thing would happen, and someone would be having a garden fork removed from their ear. And now some damn rock had risen up out of the sea, and everyone was acting as if Clatch had let its dog bark all night. Ah, uh, said Detritus mournfully. Don't mind me. Just don't spit on my boot, said Vimes. It means, Detritus waved a huge hand, like, them things what only comes in. He paused and looked at his fingers while his lips moved. Uh, fours. Ah, uh, it means literally the time when you see them little pebbles and you just know there's going to be a great big landslide on top of you and it's already too late to run. That moment. That's... Uh, uh, uh. Vimes' own lips moved. Forebodings? That's the bunny. Where does the word come from? Detritus shrugged. Maybe it's named after the sound you make just as a thousand tons of rock hit you. Forebodings. Vimes rubbed his chin. Eh, yeah. well, I've got plenty of them. Landslides and avalanches, he thought. All the little snowflakes land, light as a feather, and suddenly the whole side of a mountain is moving. Detritus looked at him slyly. I know everyone say them two short planks they're as thick as Detritus, he said, but I know which way the wind is blowing. Vimes looked at his sergeant with a new respect. You can spot it, can you? The troll's finger tapped his helmet twice, knowingly. That's pretty obvious, he said. You see up on the roofs them little chickies and dragons and stuff? And that poor bugger on the thieves' guild? You just has to watch them. They know. Beats me how they're always pointing the right way. Vimes relaxed a little. Detritus' intelligence wasn't too bad for a troll, falling somewhere between a cuttlefish and a line dancer, but you could rely on him not to let it slow him down. Detritus winked. And it looks to me like that time when you go and find a big club and listen to a granddad telling you how he beat up all them dwarfs when he was a boy, he said. Something in the wind, right? Uh, 
Yes, said Vimes. There was a fluttering above him. He sighed. A message was coming in, on a pigeon. But they tried everything else, hadn't they? Swamp dragons tended to explode in the air, imps ate the messages, and semaphore helmets had not been a success, especially in high winds. And then Corporal Littlebottom had pointed out that Ark Morpork's pigeons were, because of many centuries of depredation by the city's gargoyle population, considerably more intelligent than most pigeons. Although Vimes considered that this was not difficult, because there were things growing on old damp bread that were more intelligent than most pigeons. He took a handful of corn out of his pocket. The pigeon, obedient to its careful training, settled on his shoulder. In obedience to internal pressure, it relieved itself. You know, we've got to find something better, said Vimes as he unwrapped the message. Every time we send a message to Constable Downspout, he eats it. Well, he are a gargoyle, said Detritus. He think it's lunch arriving. Oh, said Vimes, his lordship requires my attendance. How nice. Lord Vetinari looked attentive, because he'd always found that listening keenly to people tended to put them off. And at meetings like this, when he was advised by the leaders of the city, he listened with great care, because what people said was what they wanted him to hear. He paid a lot of attention to the spaces outside the words, though. That's where the things were that they hoped he didn't know, and didn't want him to find out. Currently he was paying attention to the things that Lord Downey of the Assassin's Guild was failing to say in a lengthy exposition of the Guild's high level of training and value to the city. The voice eventually came to a stop in the face of Vetinari's aggressive listening. Thank you, Lord Downey, he said. I'm sure we shall all be able to sleep a lot more uneasily for knowing all that. Just one minor point. I believe the word assassin actually comes from Clatch. Well, indeed. And I believe also that many of your students are, as it turns out, from Clatch and its neighboring countries. The unrivaled quality of our education, quite so. What you are telling me, in point of fact, is that their assassins have been doing it longer, know their way around our city, and have had their traditional skills honed by you. Um, the patrician turned to Mr. Burley. We surely have superiority in weapons, Mr. Burley. Oh, yes. Say what you like about dwarfs, but we've been turning out some superb stuff lately, said the president of the Guild of Armourers. Ah, that at least is some comfort. Yes, said Burley. He looked wretched. However, the thing about weapons manufacture, the important thing... I believe you are about to say that the important thing about the business of weaponry is that it is a business, said the patrician. Burley looked as though he'd been let off the hook onto a bigger hook. Uh, yes. That, in fact, the weapons are for selling. Uh, exactly. To anyone who wishes to buy them. Uh, yes. Regardless of the use to which they are going to be put. The armaments manufacturer looked affronted. Pardon me? Of course. They're weapons. And I suspect that in recent years a very lucrative market has been... Clatch? Well, yes. The Serif needs them to pacify the outlying regions. The patrician held up his hand. Drumnot, his clerk, gave him a piece of paper. The great leveller cart-mounted ten-bank five-hundred-pound crossbow, he said. And let me see, the meteor automated throwing star hurler decapitates at twenty paces, money back if not completely decapitated. Have you ever heard of the dregs, my lord, said Burley? They say the only way to pacify one of them is to hit him repeatedly with an axe and bury what's left under a rock and even then choose a heavy rock. The patrician seemed to be staring at a large drawing of the dervish Mark III razor-wire bolas. 
There was a painful silence. Burley tried to fill it up. Always a bad mistake. Besides, we provide much-needed jobs in Ankh-Morpork, he murmured. Exporting these weapons to other countries, said Lord Vetinari. He handed the paper back and fixed Burley with a friendly smile. I'm very pleased to see that the industry has done so well, he said. I will bear this particularly in mind. He placed his hands together carefully. The situation is grave, gentlemen. Whose? said Mr. Burley. I'm sorry? What? Oh, I was thinking about something else, my lord. I was referring to the fact that a number of our citizens have gone out to this wretched island, as have, I understand, a number of Clatchians. Why are our people going out there? said Mr. Boggess of the Thieves Guild. Because they are showing a brisk pioneering spirit and seeking wealth and additional wealth in a new land, said Lord Vetinari. What's in it for the Clatchians? said Lord Downey. Oh, they've gone out there because they are a bunch of unprincipled opportunists, always ready to grab something for nothing, said Lord Vetinari. A masterly summation, if I may say so, my lord, said Mr. Burley, who felt he had some ground to make up. The patrician looked down again at his notes. Oh, I do beg your pardon, he said. I seem to have read those last two sentences in the wrong order. Mr. Slant, I believe you have something to say here? The president of the Guild of Lawyers cleared his throat. The sound was like a death rattle, and technically it was, since the man had been a zombie for several hundred years, although historical accounts suggested that the only difference dying had made to Mr. Slant was that he'd started to work through his lunch break. Yes, indeed, he said, opening a large legal tome. The history of the city of Leshp and its surrounding country is a little obscure. It is known to have been above the sea almost a thousand years ago, however, when records suggest that it was considered part of the ankh Morpork Empire. What is the nature of these records, and do they tell us who was doing the considering? said the patrician. The door opened, and Vime stepped in. Ah, Commander! Do take a seat. Continue, Mr. Slant. The zombie did not like interruptions. He coughed again. The records relating to the lost country date back several hundred years, my lord, and they are, of course, our records. Only ours? I hardly see how any others could apply, said Mr. Slant severely. Clatchian ones, for example said Vimes from the far end of the table. Sir Samuel, the Clatchian language does not even have a word for lawyer, said Mr. Slant. Doesn't it, said Vimes. Good for them. It is our view, said Slant, turning his chair slightly so that he did not have to look at Vimes, that the new land is ours by eminent domain, Extraterritoriality, and most importantly, Aquiris quadcumque rapis. I am given to understand that it was one of our fishermen who first set foot on it this time. I hear the Clatchians claim that it was one of their fishermen, said Vetinari. At the end of the table, Vimes's lips were moving. Let's see. Aquiris? You get what you grab, he said aloud. We are not going to take their word for it, are we? said Slant, pointedly ignoring him. Excuse me, my lord, but I don't believe that proud Ankh Morpork is told what to do by a bunch of thieves with towels on their heads. No, indeed. It's about time Johnny Clatchian was taught a lesson, said Lord Salachi. Remember all that business last year with the cabbages? Ten damn boatloads they wouldn't accept. And everyone knows caterpillars add to the flavour, said Vimes, more or less to himself. The patrician shot him a glance. That's right, said Sir Larchie. Good, honest protein. And you remember all that trouble Captain Jenkins had over that cargo of mutton? They were going to imprison him. 
in a Clatchian jail. Surely not. Meat is at its best when it's going green, said Vimes. It's not as if it'd taste any different under all that curry, said Burley. I was at a dinner in their embassy once, and you know what they made me eat. It was a sheep's. Excuse me, gentlemen, said Vimes, standing up. There are some urgent matters I must deal with. He nodded to the patrician and hurried out of the room. He shut the door behind him and took a breath of fresh air, although right now he'd have happily inhaled deeply in a tannery. Corporal Littlebottom stood up and looked at him expectantly. She had been sitting next to a box, which cooed peacefully. Something's up. Run down to, I mean, send a pigeon down to the yard, said Vimes. Yes, sir. All leave is cancelled as of now, and I want to see every officer, and I mean every officer, at the yard at, uh, let's say, six o'clock. Right, sir. That might mean an extra pigeon, unless I can write small enough. Littlebottom hurried off. Vimes glanced out of the window. There was always a certain amount of activity outside the palace, but today there was not so much a crowd as just rather more people than you normally saw, hanging around, as if they were waiting for something. Clatch. Everyone knows it. Old Detritus was right. You could hear the little pebbles bouncing. It's not just a few fishermen having a scrap. It's a hundred years of... Well, like two big men trying to fit into one small room, trying to be polite about it, and then one day one of them just has to stretch, and pretty soon they're both smashing the furniture. But it couldn't really happen, could it? From what he'd heard, the present serif was a competent man who was mostly concerned with pacifying the rowdy edges of his empire. And there were Clatchians living in Ark-Morpork, for heaven's sake. There were Clatchians born in Ark-Morpork. You saw some lad with a face that had got camels written all over it, and when he opened his mouth, it'd turn out he had an Ankian accent, so thick you could float rocks. Oh, there's all the jokes about funny food and foreigners, but surely. Not very funny jokes, come to think of it. When you hear the bang, there's no time to wonder how long the little fuse has been fizzing. There were raised voices when he went back into the rat's chamber. Because, Lord Salachi, the patrician was saying, these are not the old days. It is no longer considered nice to send a warship over there to, as you put it, show Johnny Foreigner the error of his ways. For one thing, we haven't had any warships since the Mary Jane sank four hundred years ago, and times have changed. These days the whole world watches, and, my lord, you are no longer allowed to say... What are you looking at? And black their eyes. He leaned back. There's Chimeria, and Kanli, and Ephib, and Tussort, and Muntab these days, too, and Omnia. Some of these are powerful nations, gentlemen. Many of them don't like Clatch's current expansionist outlook, but they don't like us much either. Why ever not? said Lord Salachi. Well... Because during our history, those we haven't occupied, we've tended to wage war on, said Lord Bettinari. For some reason, the slaughter of thousands of people tends to stick in the memory. Oh, history, said Lord Salachi. That's all in the past. A good place for history, agreed, said the patrician solemnly. I meant, why don't they like us now? Do we owe them money? No, mostly they owe us money, which is, of course, a far better reason for their dislike. How about Stolat and Pseudopolis and the other cities? said Lord Downey. They don't like us much either. Why not? I mean to say, we do share a common heritage, said Lord Salachi. Yes, my lord, but that common heritage largely consists of having had wars with one another, said the patrician. I can't see much support there, which is a little unfortunate because we do not, in fact, have an army. I am not, of course, a military man, but I believe that one of those is generally considered vital to the successful prosecution of a war. He looked along the table. The fact is, he went on, that Ankh Morpork has been violently against a standing army.
We all know why people don't trust an army, said Lord Downey. A lot of armed men, standing around with nothing to do, they start to get ideas. Vimes saw the heads turn towards him. My word, he said, with glassy brightness, can this be a reference to old stone-faced Vimes, who led the city's militia in a revolt against the rule of a tyrannical monarch in an effort to bring some sort of freedom and justice to the place? I do believe it is. And was he commander of the watch at the time? Good heavens, yes, as a matter of fact he was. Was he hanged and dismembered and buried in five graves? And is he a distant ancestor of the current commander? My word, the coincidences just pile up, don't they? His voice went from manic cheerfulness to a growl. Right, that's got that over with. Now, has anyone got any point they wish to make? There was a general shifting of position and a group clearing of throats. What about mercenaries? said Boggis. The problem with mercenaries, said the patrician, is that they need to be paid to start fighting. And unless you are very lucky, you end up paying them even more to stop. Salachi thumped the table. Very well then, by jingo, he snarled. Alone. We could certainly do with one, said Lord Vetinari. We need the money. I was about to say that we cannot afford mercenaries. How can this be? said Lord Downey. Don't we pay our taxes? Ah, I thought it might come to that, said Lord Vetinari. He raised his hand, and on cue again his clerk placed a piece of paper in it. Let me see now. Ah, yes. Guild of Assassins. Gross earnings in the last year. Ankh-Morporkian dollars, 13,207,048. Taxes paid in the last year, $47.22 pence, and what on examination turned out to be a Hershebian half-dong, worth one-eighth of a penny. That's all perfectly legal. The Guild of Accountants, ah, yes, Guild of Accountants, gross earnings arc more porkian dollars, $7,999,011, Taxes paid? Hmm, nil. But, ah, yes, I see they applied for a rebate of Ankh-Morporkian dollars, 200,000. And what we received, I may say, included a Hershebian half-dong, said Mr. Frostrip, of the Guild of Accountants. What goes around comes around, said Vetinari calmly. He tossed the paper aside. Taxation, gentlemen, is very much like dairy farming. The task is to extract the maximum amount of milk with the minimum amount of moo. And I'm afraid to say that these days all I get is moo. Are you telling us that Ankh Morpork is bankrupt? said Downey. Of course, while at the same time full of rich people. I trust they have been spending their good fortune on swords. And you have allowed this wholesale tax avoidance, said Lord Salachi. Oh, the taxes haven't been avoided, said Lord Vetinari, or even evaded. They just haven't been paid. That is a disgusting state of affairs. The patrician raised his eyebrows. Commander Vimes? Yes, sir. Would you be so good as to assemble a squad of your most experienced men, liaise with the tax-gatherers, and obtain the accumulated back taxes, please? My clerk here will give you a list of the prime defaulters. Right, sir. And if they resist, sir? said Vimes, smiling nastily. Oh, how can they resist, Commander? This is the will of our civic leaders. He took the paper his clerk proffered. Let me see now. Top of the list? Lord Salachi coughed hurriedly. Far too late for that sort of nonsense now, he said. Water under the bridge, said Lord Downey. Dead and buried, said Mr. Slant. I paid mine, said Vimes. So let me recap, then, said Vetinari. I don't think anyone wants to see two grown nations scrapping over a piece of rock. We don't want to fight, but... By jingo, if we do, we'll show those, Lord Salachi began. We have no ships. We have no men. 
We have no money to, said Lord Vetinari. Of course we have the art of diplomacy. It is amazing what you can do with the right words. Unfortunately, the right words are more readily listened to if you also have a sharp stick, said Lord Downey. Lord Salachi slapped the table. We don't have to talk to these people, my lords. Gentlemen, it's up to us to show them we won't be pushed around. We must reform the regiments. Oh, private armies, said Vimes, under the command of someone whose fitness for it lies in the fact that he can afford to pay for a thousand funny hats. Someone leaned forward halfway along the table. Up to that moment, Vimes had thought he was asleep. And when Lord Rust spoke, it was indeed in a sort of yawn. Whose fitness, Mr. Vimes, lies in a thousand years of breeding for leadership, he said. The mister twisted in Vimes's chest. He knew he was a mister, would always be a mister, was probably a blueprint for mistership. But he'd be damned if he wouldn't be Sir Samuel to someone who pronounced years as hears. Ah, good breeding, he said. No, sorry, don't have any of that, if that's what you'd need to get your own men killed by sheer... Gentlemen, please, said the patrician. He shook his head. Let's have no fighting, please. This is, after all, a council of war. As for reforming the regiments, well, this is, of course, your ancient right. The supplying of armed men in times of need is one of the duties of a gentleman. History is on your side. The precedents are clear enough. I can't go against them. I have to say I can't afford to. You're going to let them play soldiers, said Vimes. Oh. Commander Vimes, said Mr. Burley, smiling, as a military man yourself, you must. Sometimes people can attract attention by shouting. They might opt for thumping a table or even take a swing at someone else. But Vimes achieved the effect by freezing, by simply doing nothing at all. The chill radiated off him, lines in his face locked like a statue. I am not a military man and then Burley made the mistake of trying to grin disarmingly. Well, Commander, the helmet and armour and everything, it's really all the same in the end, isn't it? No, it's not. Gentlemen, Lord Vetinari put his hands flat on the table, a sign that the meeting had ended, I can only repeat that tomorrow I shall be discussing the matter with Prince Kufura. I've heard good reports of him said Lord Rust. Strict but fair. One can only admire what he's doing in some of those backward regions. A most... No, sir, you are thinking of Prince Kadram, said Lord Vetinari. Kufura is the younger brother. He is arriving here as his brother's special envoy. Him? That one? The man's a wastrel, a cheat, a liar. They say he takes bribes. Thank you for your diplomatic input, Lord Rust, said the patrician. We must deal with facts as they are. There is always a way. Our nations have many interests in common, and of course it says a lot for the seriousness with which Kadram is treating this matter that he is sending his own brother to deal with it. It's a nod towards the international community. A clatchy bigwig is coming here, said Vimes. No one told me. Strange as it may seem, Sir Samuel, I am occasionally capable of governing this city for minutes at a time without seeking your advice and guidance. I mean, there's a lot of anti clatchian feeling around. A really greasy piece of work, Lord Rust whispered to Mr. Boggis, in that special aristocratic whisper that carries to the rafters. It's an insult to send him here. I am sure that you will see to it that the streets are safe to walk, Vimes, said the patrician sharply. I know you pride yourself on that sort of thing. Officially, he's here because the wizards have invited him to their big award ceremony, an honorary doctorate, that sort of thing, and one of their lunches afterwards. I do like negotiating with people after the faculty of Unseen University have entertained them to lunch. They tend not to move about much, and they'll agree to practically anything if they think there's a chance of a stomach powder and a small glass of water. And now, gentlemen, if you will excuse me. 
The lords and leaders departed in ones and twos, talking quietly as they walked out into the hall. The patrician shuffled his papers into order, running a thin finger along each edge of the pile, and then looked up. You appear to be casting a shadow, Commander. You're not really going to allow them to reform the regiments, are you? said Vimes. There is absolutely no law against it, Vimes, and it will keep them occupied. Every official gentleman is entitled, in fact I believe used to be required, to raise men when the city required it. And of course any citizen has the right to bear arms. Bear that in mind, please. Arms is one thing. Holding weapons in them and playing soldiers is another. Vimes put his knuckles on the table and leant forward. You see, sir, he said, I can't help but think that over there in Clatch a bunch of idiots are doing the same thing. They're saying to the Seraph, it's time to sort out those devils in Aunt Moorpork, Effendi. And when a lot of people are running around with weapons and talking daft stuff about war, accidents happen. Have you ever been in a pub when everyone goes armed? Oh, things are a little polite at first, I'll grant you, and then some twerp drinks out of the wrong mug or picks up someone else's change by mistake, and five minutes later you're picking noses out of the beer nuts. The patrician looked down at Vimes's knuckles and stared fixedly until Vimes removed them. Vimes, you will be at the wizard's convivium tomorrow. I sent you a memo about it. I never... A vision of the piles of unread paperwork on Vimes's desk loomed treacherously in his mind. Ah, he said. The commander of the watch leads the procession in full-dress uniform. It's an ancient custom. Me? Walk in front of everyone? Indeed. Very civic, as I'm sure you recall. It demonstrates the friendly alliance between the university and the civil government which I may say seems to consist of their promising to do anything we ask, provided we promise not to ask them to do anything. Anyway, it is your duty. Tradition decrees it. And Lady Sybil has agreed to see to it that you are there with a crisp, bright, shining morning face. Vimes took a deep breath. You asked my wife? Certainly, she is very proud of you. She believes you are capable of great things, Vimes. She must be a great comfort to you. Well, I, I mean, um, yes. Excellent. Oh, just one other thing, Vimes. I do have the assassins and the thieves in agreement on this, but to cover all eventualities, I would consider it a favour if you could see to it that no one throws eggs or something at the prince. That sort of thing always upsets people. The two sides watched each other carefully. They were old enemies. They had tested strengths many a time, had tasted defeat and victory, had contested turf. But this time, it would go all the way. Knuckles whitened. Boots scraped impatiently. Captain Carrot bounced the ball once or twice. All right, lads, one more try, eh? And this time no horseplay. William, what are you eating? The artful nudger scowled. No one knew his name. Kids he'd grown up with didn't know his name. His mother, if he ever found out who she was, probably didn't know his name. But Carrot had found out somehow. If anyone else had called him William, they'd be looking for their ear, in their mouth. Chewing gum, mister. Have you brought enough for everybody? No, mister. Then put it away, there's a good chap. Now, let's... Gavin, what's that up your sleeve? The one known as Scumbag Gav didn't bother to argue. It's a knife, Mr. Carrot. And I bet you brought enough for everybody, eh? That's right, mister, Scumbag grinned. He was ten. Go on, put him on the heat with the others. Constable Shoe looked over the wall in horror. There were about fifty youths in the wide alleyway. Average age in years, about eleven. Average age in cynicism and malevolent evil, about one hundred and sixty-three. Although Ark Moorpork football doesn't usually have goals in the normal sense, Two had been nevertheless made at each end of the alley, using the time-honoured method of piling up things to mark where the posts would be. Two piles, one of knives, one of blunt instruments. In the middle of the boys who were wearing the colours of some of the nastier street gangs, Captain Carrot was bouncing an inflated pig's bladder. Constable Shoe wondered if he ought to go and get help, but the man seemed quite at ease. Er, uh, Captain, he ventured, 
Oh, hello, Reg. We were just having a friendly game of football. This is Constable Shoe, lads. Fifty pairs of eyes said, We'll remember your face, copper. Reg edged around the wall, and the eyes noted the arrow, which had gone straight through his breastplate and protruded several inches from his back. There's been a bit of trouble, sir, said Reg. I thought I'd better fetch you. It's a hostage situation. I'll come right away. OK, lads, sorry about this. Play amongst yourselves, will you? And I hope I'll see you all on Tuesday for the sing-song and sausage sizzle. Yeah, mister, said the artful nudger. And Corporal Angua will see if she can teach you the campfire howl. Yeah, right, said Scumbag. But what do we do before we part? said Carrot expectantly. The bloods of the scats and the mohawks looked bashfully at one another. Usually they were nervous of nothing, it being a banishment matter to show fear in any circumstances. But when they'd variously drawn up the clan rules, no one had ever thought there'd be someone like Carrot. Glaring at one another with, I'll kill you if you ever mention this expressions, they all raised the index fingers of both hands to the level of their ears and chorused, Wib, wib, wib. Wob, 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 Carrot replied heartily. OK, Reg, let's go. How do you do that, Captain? said Constable Shoe as the watchman hurried off. Oh, you just raise both fingers like this, said Carrot. But I'd be obliged if you don't tell anyone, because it's meant to be a secret signal. But they're thugs, Captain. Young killers, villains. Oh, they're a bit cheeky, but nice enough boys underneath, when you take the time to understand. I heard they never give anyone enough time to understand. Does Mr. Vimes know you're doing this? He sort of knows, yes. I said I'd like to start a club for the street kids, and he said it was fine, provided I took them camping on the edge of some really sheer cliff, somewhere in a high wind. But he always says things like that, and I'm sure we wouldn't have him any other way. Now, where are these hostages? It's at Vortins again, Captain, but it's sort of worse than that. Behind them, the scats and the mohawks looked at one another warily. Then they picked up their weapons and edged away with care. It's not that we don't want to fight, their manner said. It's just that we've got better things to do right now, and so we're going to go away and find out what they are. Unusually for the docks, there was not a great deal of shouting and general conversation. People were too busy thinking about money. Sergeant Colon and Corporal Nobbs leaned against a stack of timber and watched a man very carefully painting the name Pride of Ankh Morpork on the prow of a ship. At some point he'd realised that he'd left out the E, and they were idly looking forward to this modest entertainment. "'Have you ever been to sea, Sarge?' said Nobby. "'Eh, not me,' said the sergeant. "'Don't go flogging the organ, lad.' "'I don't,' said Nobby. "'I have never flogged any organ.' Never in my entire life have I flogged Oggin. Right. I've always been very clean in that respect. Except you don't know what flogging the Oggin means, do you? No, Sarge. It means going to sea. You can't bloody trust the sea. When I was a little lad, I had this book about this little kid. He turned into a mermaid sort of thing. And he lived at the bottom of the sea. The Oggin. Right. And it was all nice talking fishes and pink seashells and stuff. And then when I went on my holidays to Quirm, and I saw the sea, and I thought, here goes. And if our ma hadn't been quick on her feet, I don't know what would have happened. I mean, the kid in the book could breathe under the sea, so how was I to know? It's all bloody lies about the sea. It's all just yuck with lobsters in it. My mum's uncle was a sailor, said Nobby. But after the big play, he got press-ganged. Bunch of farmers got him drunk. He woke up next morning tied to a plough. They lounged some more. "'Looks like we're going to be in a fight, Sarge,' said Nobby, as the painter very carefully started on the final K. "'Won't last long. Lot of cowards, the Clatchians,' said Colon. "'The moment they taste a bit of cold steel, they're legging it away over the sand.' Sergeant Colon had had a broad education. He'd been to the school of My Dad Always Said, the college of It Stands to Reason, and was now a postgraduate student at the University of What Some Bloke in the Pub Told Me. Shouldn't be any trouble to sort out, then, said Nobby. And of course they're not the same colour as what we are, said Colon. Well, as me, anyway, 
he added, in view of the various hues of Corporal Nobbs. There was probably no one alive who was the same colour as Corporal Nobbs. Constable visits pretty brown, said Nobby. I never seen him run away. If there's a chance of giving someone a religious pamphlet, old washpots after him like a terrier. Ah, but Omnians are more like us, said Colon. Bit weird, but basically just the same as us underneath. No, the way you can tell a Clatchian is, you look and see if he uses a lot of words beginning with Al, right? Because that's a dead giveaway. They invented all the words starting with Al. That's how you can tell they're Clatchian. Like, alcohol, see? They invented beer? Yeah. Well, that's clever. I wouldn't call it clever, said Sergeant Colon, realising too late that he'd made a tactical error. More luck, I'd say. What else did they do? Well, there's... Colon racked his brains. There's algebra. That's like sums with letters. For... For people whose brains aren't clever enough for numbers, see? Is that a fact? Right, said Colon. In fact, he went on a little more assertively now he could see a way ahead, I heard this wizard down the university say that the Clatchians invented nothing. That was their great contribution to maths, he said. I said, what? And he said, they came up with zero. Don't sound that clever to me, said Nobby. Anyone could invent nothing. I ain't invented anything. My point exactly, said Colon. I told him. It was people who invented numbers, like four and, and, and seven. Right. Who were the geniuses? Nothing didn't need inventing. It was just there. They probably just found it. It's having all that desert, said Nobby. Right. Good point. Desert. Which, as everyone knows, is basically nothing. Nothing's a natural resource to them. It stands to reason. Whereas we're more civilized, see, and we got a lot more stuff around to count, so we invented numbers. It's like, well, they say the Clatchians invented astronomy. Altronomy, said Nobby helpfully. No, 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 Nobby. I reckon they discovered S's by then. Probably nicked them off us. Anyway, they were bound to invent astronomy, because there's bugger all else for them to look at but the sky. Anyone can look at the stars and give them names. It's going a bit to call it inventing, in any case. We don't go around saying we invented something just because we had a quick deco at it. I heard what they got a lot of odd gods, said Nobby. Yeah, and mad priests, said Colin. Foaming at the mouth, half of them. Believe all kinds of loony things. They watched the painter in silence for a moment. Colin was dreading the question that came. So, how exactly... Are they different from ours, then? said Nobby. I mean, some of our priests are, um... I hope you ain't being unpatriotic, said Colin severely. Nah, of course not. I was just asking. I can see where they'd be a lot worse than ours, being foreign and everything. And, of course, they're all mad for fighting, said Colin. Vicious buggers with all those curvy swords of theirs. You mean, like... They viciously attack you while cowardly running away after tasting cold steel, said Nobby, who sometimes had a treacherously good memory for detail. You can't trust them, like I said. And they burp hugely after meals. Well, so do you, Sarge. Yes, but I don't pretend it's polite, Nobby. Well, it's certainly a good job there's you around to explain things, Sarge, said Nobby. It's amazing the stuff you know. I surprise myself sometimes, said Colon modestly. The painter of the ship leaned back to admire his work. They heard him give a heartfelt little groan, and both of them nodded in satisfaction. Hostage negotiations were always tricky, Carrot had learned. It paid not to rush things. Let the other man talk when he was ready. So he was whiling away the time, sitting behind the upturned cart they were using as a shield from the occasional random arrow, and writing his letter home. The exercise was carried out with much frowning, sucking of the pencil, and what Commander Vimes called a ballistic approach to spelling and punctuation. Dear Mum and Daid, I hope this letter finds you in good health as I am also. Thank you for the big parcel of dwarf bread you sent me. I have shard it with the other dwarfs on the watch, and they say it is better even than iron crusts to bread with to edge. 
and you can't beat the taste of a home-forged loaf. So well done, Mum. Things are going well with the wolf pack that I have told you about, but Commander Vimes is not happy. I told him they were good lads at heart, and it would help them to learn the ways of nature and the wilderness, and he said, Ha! They know them already, that is the trouble. But he gave me five dollars to buy a football, which proves he cares deep down. We have more new feces in the watch, which is just as well with this trouble with Clatch. It is all looking very grave. I feel it is the clam before the storm, and no mistake. I must break off now, because some robbers have broke into Vortin's diamond warehouse, and have taken Corporal Angua hostage. I fear there may be terrible bloodshed, so I remain your loving son, Carrot Iron Founderson, Captain. P.S. I will write again tomorrow. Carrot folded the letter carefully and slipped it under his breastplate. I think they have had long enough to consider our suggestion, Constable. What's next on the list? Constable Shoe leafed through a file of grubby paper and pulled out another sheet. Well, we're down to offences of stealing pennies off blind beggars now, he said. Oh, no, this is a good one. Carrot took the sheet in one hand and a megaphone in the other and raised his head carefully over the edge of the cart. Good morning again, he said brightly. We found another one. Theft of jewellery from... Yes, yes, we did it shouted a voice from the building. Really? I haven't even said when it was yet, said Carrot. Never mind, we did it. Now, can we come out, please? There was another sound behind the voice. It sounded like a low, continuous growl. I think you ought to be able to tell me what you stole, said Carrot. Er, uh, rings. Er, uh, gold rings? Sorry, no rings mentioned. Er, uh, pearl necklace. Yes, that's what it was. Getting warmer, but no. Uh, earrings? Ooh, you're so close, said Carrot encouragingly. A crown, was it? Uh, maybe a coronet? Carrot leaned down to the constable. Says here a tiara, Reg. Can we let that? He stood up. We're prepared to accept coronet. Well done. He looked down at Constable Shoe again. This is all right, isn't it, Reg? It's not coercion, is it? Can't see how it can be, Captain. I mean, they broke in. They took a hostage. I suppose you're right. Please, no! Good boy, down! Seems to be about it, sir, said Red Shoe, peering around the edge of the cart. We've got them down for everything but the Hyde Park flasher. We did that, screamed someone. And that was a woman. We did it! This time the voice was a lot higher. Now, please, can we come out? Carrot stood up and raised the megaphone. If you gentlemen would care to step out with your hands up. Are you joking? whimpered someone against the background of another growl. Well, at least with your hands where I can see him. You bet, mister. Four men stumbled out into the street. Their torn clothing fluttered in the breeze. The apparent leader pointed an angry finger back at the doorway as Carrot walked towards them. The owner of that place ought to be prosecuted, he shouted. Keeping a wild animal like that in his strong room is disgraceful. We broke in perfectly peacefully, and it just attacked us for no reason at all. You shot at Constable Shoe here, said Carrot. Only to miss, only to miss. Constable Shoe pointed at the arrow sticking into his breastplate. Right where it shows, he complained. It's a welding job, and we have to pay for our own armour repairs, and there'll always be a mark, you know, no matter what I do. Their horrified gaze took in the stitch marks around his neck and on his hands, and it dawned on them that although the human race came in a variety of colours, very few living people were grey with a hint of green. Here, you're a zombie. That's right, kick a man when he's dead, said Constable Shoe sharply. And you took Corporal Angua hostage, a lady, said Carrot, in the same level voice. It was very polite but it simply suggested that somewhere a fuse was burning, and it would be a good idea not to wait for it to reach the barrel. Yeah, sort of, but she must have got away when that creature turned up. So you left her in there, said Carrot, still very calm. The men dropped to their knees. The leader raised his hand imploringly. Please, we're just robbers and thieves. We're not bad men. 
Carrot nodded to Constable Shoe. Take them down to the yard, Constable. Right, said Reg. There was a mean look in his eye as he cocked his crossbow. I'm down ten dollars thanks to you, so you better not try to escape. No, sir, not us. Carrot wandered into the gloom of the building. Fearful faces peered out of doorways. He gave them a reassuring smile as he walked towards the strong room. Corporal Angua was adjusting her uniform. I didn't bite anyone before you start, she said, as he appeared in the doorway. Not even flesh wounds. I just tore at their trousers. And that was no bed of roses, I might add. A frightened face appeared around the door. Ah, Mr. Vortin, said Carrot. I think you will find that all is in order. They seem to have dropped everything. The diamond merchant looked at him in amazement. But they had a hostage. They saw the error of their ways, said Carrot. And, and there were snarling noises, sounded like a wolf. Ah, oh, yes, said Carrot. Well, you know, when thieves fall out, which was no kind of explanation, but because the tone of voice suggested that it was, Mr. Vortin accepted it as such for fully five minutes after Carrot and Angua had left. Well, that's a nice start to the day, said Carrot. Thank you, yes, I wasn't hurt, said Angua. It makes it all seem worthwhile somehow. Just my hair messed up and another shirt ruined. Well done. Sometimes I might suspect that you don't listen to anything I say, said Angua. Glad to hear it, said Carrot. The entire watch was mustering. Vimes looked down at the sea of faces. My gods, he thought. How many have we got now? A few years ago you could count the watch on the finger of a blind butcher's hand, and now there's more coming in. He leaned sideways to Captain Carrot. Who are all these people? Watchman, sir, you appointed them. Did I? I haven't even met some of them. You signed the paperwork, sir, and you signed the wage bill every month. Eventually. There was a hint of criticism in his voice. Vimes's approach to paperwork was not to touch it until someone was shouting, and then at least there would be someone to help him sort through the stacks. But how did they join? Usual way, sir. Swore them in, gave them each a helmet. Hey, that's Red Shoe. He's a zombie. He falls to bits all the time. Very big man in the undead community, sir, said Carrot. How come he joined? He came round last week to complain about the watch harassing some bogeyman, sir. He was very, er, uh, vehement, sir, so I persuaded him that what the watch needed was some expertise, and so he joined up, sir. No more complaints? Er, uh, twice as many, sir, all from the undead, sir, and all against Mr. Shoe. Funny, that. Vimes gave his captain a sideways look. He's very hurt about it. He says he's found that the undead just don't understand the difficulties of policing in a multi-vital society, sir. Good gods, thought Vimes. That's just what I would have done. But I'd have done it because I'm not a nice person. Carrot is a nice person. He's practically got medals for it. Surely he wouldn't have... And he knew that he would never know. Somewhere behind Carrot's innocent stare was a steel door. You enrolled him, did you? No, sir, you did. You signed his joining orders and his kit chitty and his posting orders, sir. Vimes had another vision of too many documents hurriedly signed. But he must have signed them, and they needed the men, true enough. It was just that it ought to be him who— And anyone of sergeant rank or above can recruit, sir, said Carrot, as if reading his mind. It's in the general orders, page twenty-two, sir, just below the tea stain. And you've recruited how many? Oh, just one or two. We're still very short-handed, sir. We are with Reg. His arms keep falling off. Aren't you going to talk to the men, sir? Vimes looked at the assembled, well, multitude. There was no other word. Well, there were plenty, but none that it would be fair to use. Big ones, short ones, fat ones, troll ones with the lichen still on, bearded dwarf ones, the looming pottery presence of the golem constable Dorful, undead ones, and even now he wasn't certain if that term should include Corporal Angua, an intelligent girl and a very useful wolf, when she had to be. Waifs and strays, Colon had said once. Waifs and bloody strays, because normal people wouldn't be coppers. Technically, they were all in uniform, too, except that mostly they weren't wearing the same uniform as anyone else. Everyone had just been sent down to the armory to collect whatever fitted, and the result was a walking historical exhibit. Funny-shaped helmets through the ages. Er, uh, ladies and gentlemen, he began. 
Be quiet, please, and listen to Commander Vimes, bellowed Carrot. Vimes found himself meeting the gaze of Angua, who was leaning against the wall. She rolled her eyes helplessly. Yes, yes, thank you, Captain, said Vimes. He turned back to the massed array of Ark Morpork's finest. He opened his mouth. He stared. And then he shut his mouth, all but a corner of it. And he said out of that corner, What's that little lump on Constable Flint's head? That's probationary Constable Buggy Swire, sir. He likes to get a good view. He's a gnome. Well done, sir. Another one of yours. Ours, sir, said Carrot, using his reproachful voice again. Yes, sir. Attached to the Chitterling Street Station since last week, sir. Oh, my gods, murmured Vimes. Buggy Swires saw his stare and saluted. He was five inches tall. Vimes regathered his mental balance. The long and the short and the tall waifs and strays, all of us. I'm not going to keep you long, he said. You all know me. Well, most of you know me, he added with a sidelong glance at Carrot. And I don't make speeches, but I'm sure all of you have noticed the way this leshp business has got people all stirred up. There's a lot of loose talk about war. Well, war isn't our business. War is soldiers' business. Our business, I think, is to keep the peace. Let me show you this. He stood back and pulled something out of his pocket with a flourish. At least, that was the intention. There was a rip as something ceased to be entangled in the lining. Damn. Er... Uh, he produced a length of shiny black wood from the ragged pocket. There was a large silver knob on the end. The watchman craned to look. This... Er... Uh, this... Vimes groped. This old man turned up from the palace a couple of weeks ago, gave me this damn thing. Got a label saying, Regalia of the Watch Commander, City of Ark Morpork. You know, they never throw anything away up at the palace. He waved it vaguely. The wood was surprisingly heavy. It's got the coat of arms on the knob. Look. Thirty watchmen tried to see. And I thought, I thought, good grief, this is what I'm supposed to carry. And I thought about it, and then I thought, no. That's right, just once someone got it right. It's not even a weapon. It's just a thing. It ain't for using. It's just for having. That's what it's all about. Same thing with uniforms. You see, a soldier's uniform is to turn him into part of a crowd of other parts, all in the same uniform. But a copper's uniform is there to... Vimes stopped. Perplexed expressions in front of him told him that he was building a house of cards with too few cards on the bottom. He coughed. Anyway, he went on, with a glare to indicate that everyone should forget the previous twenty seconds. Our job is to stop people fighting. There's a lot happening on the street. You've probably heard that they're starting up the regiments again. Well, people can recruit if they like, but we're not going to have any mobs. There's a nasty mood around. I don't know what's going to happen, but we've got to be there when it does. He looked around the room. Another thing... This new Clatchian envoy, or whatever he's called, is arriving tomorrow. I don't think the Assassin's Guild has anything planned, but tonight we're going to check the route the wizard's procession will be taking. A nice little job for the night shift. And tonight, we're all on the night shift. There was a groan from the watch. As my old sergeant used to say, if you can't take a joke, you shouldn't have joined, said Vimes. A nice, gentle door-to-door -door inspection, shaking hands with doorknobs, giving the uniform a bit of an airing. Good old-fashioned policing. Any questions? Good. Thank you very much. There was a general rustling and relaxing among the squad, as it dawned on them that they were free to go. Carrot started to clap. It wasn't the clap used by middlings to encourage underlings to applaud overlings. The palms are held at right angles to one another and flapped together rather than clapped, while the flapper stares intently at the audience as if to say, we're going to have some applause here or else the whole school is in detention. It had genuine enthusiasm behind it, which was somehow worse. A couple of the more impressionable new constables picked it up, and then in the same way that little pebbles lead the avalanche, the sound of humanoids banging their hands together filled the room. Vimes glowered. Very inspiring, sir, said Carrot, as the clapping rose to a storm. Rain poured on Ark Morpork. It filled the gutters and overflowed, and was then flung away by the wind. It tasted of salt. The gargoyles had crept out of their daytime shadows, and were perched on every cornice and tower, ears and wings outstretched, to sieve anything edible out of the water. 
It was amazing what could fall on Ankh Morpork. Rains of small fish and frogs were common enough, although bedsteads caused comment. A broken gutter poured a sheet of water down the window of Ossie Brunt, who was sitting on his bed because there were no chairs, or indeed any other furniture. He didn't mind at the moment. In a minute or two he might be very angry, and then again possibly not. It was not that Ossie was insane in any way. Friends would have called him a quiet sort who kept himself to himself, but they didn't because he didn't have any friends. There was a group of men who went to practice at the archery butts on Tuesday nights, and he sometimes went to a pub with them afterwards and sat and listened to them talk, and he'd saved up once and bought a round of drinks, although they probably wouldn't remember, or maybe they'd say, Oh, oh yeah, Ossie. People said that. People tended to put him out of their minds in the same way that you didn't pay much attention to empty space. He wasn't stupid. He thought a lot about things. Sometimes he'd sit and think for hours, just staring at the opposite wall, where the rain came in on damp nights and made a map of clatch. Someone hammered on the door. Mr. Brunt, are you decent? I'm a bit busy, Mrs. Spence, he said, putting his bow under the bed with his magazines. It's about the rent. Yes, Mrs. Spence, you know my rules. I shall pay you tomorrow, Mrs. Spence said Ossie, looking towards the window. Cash in my hand by noon, or it's out you go. Yes, Mrs. Spent. He heard her stamp downstairs again. He counted to fifty very carefully, and then reached down and pulled out his bow again. Angua was on patrol with Nobby Nobs. This was not an ideal arrangement, but Carrot was on swing patrol, and on a night like this, Fred Colon, who kept the roster, had an uncanny knack of being on desk duty in the warm. So the spare partners had been thrown together. It was a terrible thought. "'Can I have a word, miss?' said Nobby, as they rattled doorknobs and waved their lanterns into alleyways. "'Yes, Nobby?' "'It's personal.' "'Oh!' Only I'd ask Fred, but he wouldn't understand, and I think you would understand on account of you being a woman. Most of the time, anyway. No offence, men. What do you want, Nobby? It's about my sexual nature, miss. Angua said nothing. Rain banged off Nobby's ill-fitting helmet. I think it's time I looked it full in the face, miss. Angua cursed her graphic imagination again. And, um, how were you thinking of doing that, Nobby? I mean, I sent off for stuff, miss. Creams and that. Creams, said Angua flatly. That you rub on, said Nobby helpfully. Rub on. And a thing you do exercises with. Oh, gods. Sorry, miss. What? Oh, I was just thinking of something else. Do go on. Um, exercises. Yeah, to build up my biceps and that. Oh, exercises, really. Nobby did not appear to have any biceps to speak of. There wasn't really anything for them to be on. Technically he had arms because his hands were attached to his shoulders, but that was about all you could say. Horrified interest got the better of her. Why, Nobby? He looked down sheepishly. Well, I mean, you know girls and that. To her amazement, Nobby was blushing. You mean you, she began, you want to, you're looking for a, oh, I'm not just after, I mean, if you want a thing done properly, then, no, well, I mean, no, said Nobby reproachfully. What I'm saying is, as you get older, you know, you think about settling down, finding someone who'll go with you hand in hand down life's bumpy highway. Why's your mouth open? Angua shut it abruptly. But I just don't seem to meet girls, Nobby said. Well, I mean, I meet girls, and, and then they rush off. Despite the cream? Right. And the exercises? Yes. Well, you've covered all the angles, I can see that, said Angua. Beats me where you're going wrong, she sighed. What about stamina thrum in Elm Street? She's got a wooden leg. Well, then, Verity Push Pram, nice girl. She runs the Clam and Cockle Barrow in Rhyme Street. Hammerhead? <laughs> Stinks of fish all the time, and she's got a squint. She's got her own business, though. Does wonderful chowder, too. And a squint. 
not exactly a squint, Nobby. Yeah, but you know what I mean. Angua had to admit that she did. Verity had the opposite of a squint. Both eyes appeared to be endeavouring to see the adjacent ear. When you talked to her, you had to suppress a feeling that she was about to walk off in two directions. But she could gut fish like a champion. She sighed again. She was familiar with the syndrome. They said they wanted a soulmate and help meet, but sooner or later the list would include a skin-like silk and a chest fit for a herd of cows. Except for Carrot. That was almost, almost one of the annoying things about him. She suspected he wouldn't mind if she shaved her head or grew a beard. It wasn't that he wouldn't notice. He just wouldn't mind. And for some reason that was very aggravating. The only thing I can suggest, she said, is that women are quite often attracted to men who can make them laugh. Nobby brightened. Really? he said. I ought to be well in there, then. Good. People laugh at me all the time. High above, quite oblivious of the rain that had already soaked him to the skin, Ossie Brunt checked the oilskin cover round his bow and settled down for the long wait. Rain was a copper's friend. Tonight people were making do with indoor crime. Vimes stood in the lee of one of the fountains in Sartor Square. The fountain hadn't worked for years, but he was getting just as wet as if it were in full flow. He'd never experienced truly horizontal rain before. There was no one around. The rain marched across the square like... like an army. Now there was an image from his youth. Funny how they hung around in the dark alleys of your brain and suddenly jumped out on you. Rain falling on water. Ah, yes. When he was a little lad, he'd pretended that the raindrops splashing in the running gutters were soldiers, millions of soldiers. And the bubbles that sometimes went floating by were men on horseback. Right now he couldn't remember what the occasional dead dog had been. Some kind of siege weapon, possibly. Water swirled around his boots and dripped off his cape. When he tried to light a cigar, the wind blew the match out and the rain poured off his helmet and soaked the cigar in any case. He grinned in the night. He was, temporarily, a happy man. He was cold, wet and alone, trying to keep out of the worst of the weather at three o'clock on a ferocious morning. He'd spent some of the best nights of his life like this. At such times you could just sort of punch your shoulders like this and let your head pull in like this, and you became a little hutch of warmth and peace, the rain banging on your helmet, the mind just ticking over, sorting out the world. It was like this in the old days when no one cared about the watch and all you really had to do was keep out of trouble. Those were the days when there wasn't as much to do. But there was as much to do, said an inner voice. You just didn't do it. He could feel the official truncheon hanging heavily in the special pocket that Sybil herself had sewn in his breeches. Why is it just a bit of wood? he'd asked himself when he'd unwrapped it. Why not a sword? That's the symbol of power. And then he'd realised why it couldn't ever be a sword. Ho oh, there, good citizen! May I ask your business this brisk morning? He sighed. There was a lantern appearing through the murk, surrounded by a halo of water. Ho oh, there, good citizen! There was only one person in the city who would say something like that and mean it. It's me, Captain! The halo drew nearer and illuminated the damp face of Captain Carrot. The young man ripped off a salute. At God's damn three in the morning, Vimes thought, that would have brought a happy tear to the eye of the most psychotic drill sergeant. What are you doing out, sir? I just wanted to check up on things, said Vimes. You could have left it all to me, sir, said Carrot. Delegation is the key to successful command. Really, is it? said Vimes sourly. My word, we live and learn, don't we? And you certainly learn, he added in the privacy of his head and he was almost sure he was being mean and stupid. "'We've just about finished, sir. We've checked all the empty buildings, and there will be an extra squad of constables on the route, and the gargoyles will be up as high as they can. You know how good they are at watching, sir.' "'Gargoyles? I thought we just had Constable Downspout. And Constable Pediment now, sir. One of yours? One of ours, sir. You signed—' "'Yes, yes, I'm sure I did. Damn!' A gust of wind caught the water pouring from an overloaded gutter and dumped it down Vimes's neck. "'They say this new island's upset the air streams,' said Carrot. "'Not just the air,' said Vimes. 
A lot of damn fuss over a few square miles of silt and some old ruins. Who cares? They say it's strategically very important, said Carrot, falling into step beside him. What for? We're not at war with anyone. <laughs> but we might go to war to keep some damn island that's only useful in case we have to go to war, right? Oh, his lordship will have it all sorted out today. I'm sure that when moderate-mannered men of good will can get round a table, there's no problem that can't be resolved, said Carrot cheerfully. He is, thought Vimes glumly. He really is sure. No much about Clatch, he said. I've read a little, sir. Very sandy place, they say. Yes, sir, apparently. There was a crash somewhere ahead of them and a scream. Coppers learned to be good at screams. There was to the connoisseur a world of difference between I'm drunk and I've just trodden on my fingers and I can't get up and look out, he's got a knife. Both men started to run. Light blazed out in a narrow street. Heavy footsteps vanished into the darkness. The light flickered beyond a shop's broken window. Vimes stumbled through the doorway, pulled off his sodden cape and threw it over the fire in the middle of the floor. There was a hiss and a smell of hot leather. Then Vimes stood back and tried to work out where the hell he was. People were staring at him. Dimly his mind assembled clues. The turban, the beard, the woman's jewellery. Where did he come from? Who is this man? Um, good morning, he said. Looks like there's been a bit of an accident. He raised the cape gingerly. A broken bottle lay in a pool of sizzling oil. Vimes looked up at the broken window. Oh! The other two people were a boy almost as tall as his father and a small girl trying to hide behind her mother. Vimes felt his stomach turn to lead. Carrot arrived in the doorway. I lost them, he panted. There were three of them, I think. Can't see anything in this rain. Oh, it's you, Mr. Goriff. What happened here? Captain Carrot, someone threw a burning bottle through our window, and then this beggar man rushed in and put it out. What did he say? What did you say? said Vimes. You speak, Clatchian. Not very well, said Carrot modestly. I just can't get the back of the throat sound. But you can understand what he said. Oh, yes, he just thanked you very much, by the way. It's all right, Mr. Cardiff. He's a watchman. But you speak. Carrot knelt down and looked at the broken bottle. Oh, you know how it is. You come in here on a night shift for a hot caraway bun and you just get chatting. You must have picked up the odd word, sir. Well, Vindaloo, maybe, but this is a firebomb, sir. I know, Captain. This is very bad. Who would do a thing like this? Right now, said Vimes, half the city, I should think. He looked helplessly at Goriff. He vaguely recognised the face. He vaguely recognised Mrs. Goriff's face. They were faces. They were usually at the other end of some arms, holding a portion of curry or a kebab. Sometimes the boy ran the place. The shop opened very early in the morning and very late at night, when the streets were owned by bakers, thieves and watchmen. Vimes knew the place as mundane meals. Nobby Nobbs had said that Goriff had wanted a word that meant ordinary, everyday, straightforward, and had asked around until he found one he liked the sound of. Uh, tell him... Tell him you're staying here, and I'll go back to the watch-house and send someone out to relieve you, said Vimes. Thank you, said Goriff. Oh, you understand? Vimes felt like an idiot. Of course you do. You must have been here, what, five, six years? Ten years, sir. Really, said Vimes manically. That long, really? My word, well, I'd better get along. Good morning to you. He hurried out into the rain. I must have been going in there for years, he thought, as he splashed through the darkness, and I know how to say Vindaloo, and Korma. Carrot's hardly been here five minutes, and he gargles the language like a native. Good grief! I can get by in dwarfish, and I can at least say put down that rock you're under arrest in troll, but... He stamped into the watch-house, water pooling off him. Fred Colon was dozing quietly at the desk. In deference to the fact that he'd known Fred all these years, Vimes was extra noisy about taking off his cape. When he officially turned round, the sergeant was sitting at attention. "'I didn't know you were on tonight, Mr. Vimes.' "'This is unofficial, Fred,' said Vimes. He accepted Mr. from certain people. In an odd way, they'd earned it. "'Send someone along to mundane meals in Scandal Alley, will you? Bit of trouble there.' He reached the stairs. "'You stopping, sir?' said Fred. 
Oh, yes, said Vimes grimly. I've got to catch up on the paperwork. The rain fell on Lesp so hard it probably hadn't been worth the island's bother of rising from the bottom of the sea. Most of the explorers slept in their boats now. There were buildings on the Risen Island, but the buildings weren't quite right. Solid Jackson peered out from the tarpaulin he'd rigged up on deck. Mist was rising off the soaking ground and was made luminous by the occasional flash of lightning. The city, by stormlight, looked far too malevolent. There were things he could recognise, columns and steps and archways and so on, but there were others. He shuddered. It looked as if people had once tried to add human touches to structures that were already ancient. It was because of his son that everyone was staying in the boats. A party of Ankh Morpork fishermen had gone ashore that morning to search for the heaps of treasure that everyone knew littered the ocean bottom and had found a tiled floor washed clean by the rain. Pretty blue and white squares showed a pattern of waves and shells and in the middle a squid. And Les had said, That looks pretty big, Dad. And everyone had looked around at the weed-covered buildings and had shared the thought, which remained unspoken, but was made up of a lot of little thoughts, like the occasional ripples in the pools and the little splashes in the dark water of cellars that made the mind think of claws, winnowing the deeps, and the odd things that sometimes got washed up on the beaches or turned up in nets. Sometimes you pulled things over the side that had put a man off fish for life. And suddenly, no one wanted to explore any more, just in case they found something. Solid Jackson pulled his head back under the cover. Why ain't we going home, Dad? said his son. You said this place gives you the willies. All right, but there aren't more pork willies, see? And no foreigner's going to get his hands on them. Dad? Yes, lad. Who was Mr. Hong? How should I know? Only, when we was all heading back for the boats, one of the other men said, We all know what happened to Mr. Hong when he opened the three jolly luck takeaway fish bar on the site of the old fish god temple in Dagon Street on the night of the full moon, don't we? Well, I don't know. Ah, Solid Jackson hesitated. Still, Les was a big lad now. He closed up and left in a bit of a hurry, lad. So quick he had to leave some things behind. Like what? If you must know, half an ear hole and one kidney. Cool! The boat rocked and wood splintered. Jackson jerked the cover up. Spray washed over him. Somewhere close in the wet darkness, a voice shouted, Why are you not carrying lights, you second cousin of a jackal? Jackson pulled out the lantern and held it up. What are you doing in Ankh Morpork territorial waters, you camel-eating devil? These waters belong to us. We were here first. Yeah, we were here first. We were here first first. You damaged my boat. That's piracy, that is. There were other shouts around them. In the darkness, the two flotillas had collided. Bowsprits tore away rigging, hulls boomed. The controlled panic that is normal sailing became the frantic panic composed of darkness, spray, and too much rigging coming unrigged. At times like this, the ancient traditions of the sea that unite all mariners should come to the fore and see them combine in the face of their common foe, the hungry and relentless ocean. However, at this point, Mr. Arif hit Mr. Jackson over the head with an oar. Hmm? What? Vimes opened the only eye that appeared to respond. A horrible sight met it. I read him his rights, whereupon he said, Up yours, copper. Sergeant Detritus then cautioned him, upon which he said, Ouch. There may be a lot of things I'm not good at, thought Vimes, but at least I don't treat the punctuation of a sentence like a game of pin the tail on the donkey. He rolled his head away from Carrot's fractured grammar. The pile of paper shifted under him. Vimes's desk was becoming famous. Once there were piles, but they had slipped as piles do, forming this dense, compacted layer that was now turning into something like peat. It was said there were plates and unfinished meals somewhere down there. No one wanted to check. Some people said they'd heard movement. There was a genteel cough. Vimes rolled his head again and looked up into the big, pink face of Willikins, Lady Sybil's butler. His butler, too, technically, although Vimes hated to think of him like that. I think we had better proceed with alacrity, Sir Samuel. 
I have brought your dress uniform, and your shaving things are by the basin. What? What? You are due at the university in half an hour. Lady Sybil has vouchsafed to me that if you are not there, she will utilize your intestines for hosiery accessories, sir. Was she smiling? said Vimes, staggering to his feet and making his way to the steaming basin on the washstand. Only slightly, sir. Oh, gods. Yes, sir. Vimes made an attempt at shaving, while behind him, Willikins brushed and polished. Outside, the city's clocks began to strike ten. It must have been almost four when I sat down, Vimes thought. I know I heard the shift change at eight, and then I had to sort out Nobby's expenses. That's advanced mathematics if ever there was some. He tried to yawn and shave at the same time, which is never a good idea. Damn! I shall fetch some tissue paper directly, sir, said Willikins, without looking round. As Vimes dabbed at his chin, the butler went on, I should like to take this opportunity to raise a matter of some import, sir. Yes. Vimes stared blearily at the red tights that seemed to be a major item of his dress uniform. Regretfully, I am afraid I must ask leave to give my notice, sir. I wish to join the colours. Which colours are these, Willikins? said Vimes, holding up a shirt with puffed sleeves. Then his brain caught up with his ears. You want to become a soldier? They say Clatch needs to be taught a sharp lesson, sir. A Willikins has never been found wanting when his country calls. I thought that Lord Venturi's heavy infantry would do for me. They have a particularly attractive uniform of red and white, sir, with gold fogging. Vimes pulled his boots on. You've had military experience, have you? Oh, no, sir, but I am a quick learner, sir, and I believe I have some prowess with the carving knife. The butler's face showed a patriotic alertness. On turkeys, and on, said Vimes. Yes, sir, said Willikins, buffing up the ceremonial helmet. And you're off to fight the screaming hordes in Clatch, are you? If it should come to that, sir, said Willikins, I think this is adequately polished now, sir. A very sandy place, sir, they say. Indeed, sir, said Willikins, adjusting the helmet under Vimes's chin. And rocky, very rocky, lots of rocks. Dusty, too. Very parched in part, sir, I believe you are correct. And so into this land of sand-coloured dust and sand-coloured rocks and sand-coloured you, Willikins, will march with your expertise in cutlery and your red and white uniform. With the gold fogging, sir, Willikins thrust out his jaw. Yes, sir, if the need arises. You don't see anything wrong with this picture, sir? Oh, never mind. Vimes yawned. Well, we shall miss you, Willikins. Others may not, he thought, especially if they have time for a second shot. Oh, Lord Venturi says it'll all be over by Hogswatch, sir. Really? I didn't know it had started. Vimes ran down the stairs and into a smell of curry. We saved you some, sir, said Sergeant Colon. You was asleep when the lad brought it round. It was Goriff's kid, said Nobby, chasing a bit of rice around his tin plate. Enough for half the shift. The rewards of duty, said Vimes, hurrying towards the door. Bread and mangle, pickle and everything, said Colon happily. I've always said old Goriff isn't that bad for a raghead. A pool of sizzling oil. Vimes stopped at the door, the family huddling together. He took out his watch. It was twenty past ten. If he ran... Fred, could you just step up to my office, he said. It won't take a moment. Right, sir. Vimes ushered the sergeant up the stairs and closed the door. Nobby and the other watchman strained to listen, but there was no sound except for a low murmuring, which went on for some time. The door opened again. Vimes came down the stairs. Nobby, come up to the university in five minutes, will you? I want to stay in touch, and I'm damned if I'm taking a pigeon with this uniform on. Right, sir. Vimes left. A few moments later, Sergeant Colon walked carefully down to the main office. He had a slightly glassy look, and walked back to his desk with the nonchalance that only the extremely worried try to achieve. He toyed with some paper for a while, and then said, You don't mind what people call you, do you, Nobby? I'd be minding the whole time if I minded that, Sarge, said Corporal Nobbs cheerfully. 
Right. Right. And I don't mind what people call me, neither. Colon scratched his head. Don't make sense, really. I reckon Sir Sam is missing too much sleep. He's a very busy man, Fred. Trying to do everything, that's his trouble. And Nobby. Yes? It's Sergeant Colon, thanks. There was Sherry. There was always Sherry at these occasions. Sam Vimes could regard it dispassionately, since he always drank fruit juice these days. He'd heard they made sherry by letting wine go rotten. He couldn't see the point of sherry. "'And you will try to look dignified, won't you?' said Lady Sybil, adjusting his cloak. "'Yes, dear.' "'What will you try to look?' "'Dignified, dear.' "'And please try to be diplomatic.' "'Yes, dear.' "'What will you try to be?' "'Diplomatic, dear.' "'You're using your hen-pecked voice, Sam?' "'Yes, dear.' You know that's not fair. No, dear. Vimes raised a hand in a theatrical gesture of submission. All right, all right. It's just these feathers and these tykes. He winced and tried to do some surreptitious rearranging in an effort to prevent himself becoming the city's first hunch groin. I've been supposing people see me. Of course they'll see you, Sam. You're leading the procession. And I'm very proud of you. She brushed some lint off his shoulder. Women always do this. Feathers in my hat, Vimes thought glumly, and fancy tights, and a shiny breastplate. A breastplate shouldn't be shiny, it should be too dented to take a decent polish. And diplomatic talk? How should I know how to talk diplomatically? And now I must go and have a word with Lady Salachi, said Lady Sybil. You'll be all right, will you? You keep yawning. Of course, didn't get much sleep last night, that's all. You promise not to run away? Me? I never run. You ran away before the big soiree of the genuine ambassador. Everyone saw you. I'd just got news that the debris gang were robbing Vortin's strong room. But you don't have to chase everyone, Sam. You employ people for that now. We got them, though, said Vimes with satisfaction. He'd enjoyed it immensely, too. It wasn't just the pursuit that was so invigorating, with his velvet cloak left behind on a tree and his hat in a puddle somewhere. It was the knowledge that while he was doing this, he wasn't eating very small sandwiches and making even smaller talk. It wasn't proper police work, Vimes considered, unless you were doing something that someone somewhere would much rather you weren't doing. When Sybil had disappeared into the crowd, he found a handy shadow and lurked in it. It enabled him to see almost the whole of the university's great hall. He quite liked wizards. They didn't commit crimes. Not Vimes's type of crimes, anyway. The occult wasn't Vimes's beat. The wizards might well mess up the very fabric of time and space, but they didn't lead to paperwork, and that was fine by Vimes. There were a lot of them in the hall, in all their glory, and there was nothing finer than a wizard dressed up formally, until someone could find a way of inflating a bird of paradise, possibly by using an elastic band and some kind of gas. But the wizards were getting a run for their money, because the rest of the guests were either nobles or guild leaders or both, and an occasion like the convivium brought out the peacock in everyone. His gaze went from face to chatting face, and he wondered idly what each person was guilty of. The possibility that they were not guilty of anything was one that he didn't even think worthy of consideration. Quite a few of the ambassadors were there, too. They were easy to pick out. They wore their national costumes. But since by and large their national costumes were what the average peasant wore, they looked slightly out of place in them. Their bodies wore feathers and silks, but their minds persistently wore suits. They chatted in small groups. One or two nodded and smiled to him as they passed. The world is watching, Vimes thought. If something went wrong and this stupid leshp business started a war, it's men like these who'd be working out exactly how to deal with the winner, whoever it was. Never mind who started it, never mind how it was fought, they'd want to know how to deal with things now. They represented what people called the international community, and like all uses of the word community, you were never quite sure what or who it was. He shrugged. It wasn't his world, thank goodness. He sidled over to Corporal Nobbs, who was standing by the main doors in the sort of lopsided slouch which was the closest a living Nobbs could come to attention. All quiet, Nobby? he said out of the corner of his mouth. Yes, sir. Nothing going on at all? No, sir. Not a pigeon anywhere, sir. What, nowhere? Nothing? No, sir. There was trouble all over the place yesterday. Yes, sir. 
You did tell Fred he was to send a bird if there was anything at all? Yes, sir. The shades? There's always something. Dead quiet, sir. Damn. Vimes shook his head at the sheer untrustworthiness of Unc Morpork's criminal fraternity. I suppose you couldn't take a brick and... F Lady Sibyl was very speffic about how you was to stop here, said Corporal Nobbs, staring straight ahead. Speffic? Yeah, sir. She come and have a word with me. Gave me a dollar, said Nobby. Ah, Sir Samuel, said a booming voice behind him. I don't think you've met Prince Kufura yet, have you? He turned. Arch-Chancellor Ridcully was bearing down on him, towing a couple of swarthy men. Vimes hurriedly put on his official face. This is Commander Vimes, gentlemen. Sam, no, I'm doing this the wrong way round, aren't I? Got the protocol all wrong. So much to sort out. The bursar's locked himself in the safe again. We don't know how he manages to get the key in there with him. I mean, it's not even as if it's got a keyhole on the inside. The first man held out a hand as Ridcully bustled off again. Prince Kufura, he said. My carpet got in only two hours ago. Carpet? Oh, yes, you flew. Yes, very chilly, and of course you can't get a good meal. And did you get your man, Sir Samuel? What? Pardon? I believe our ambassador told me you had to leave the reception last week. The prince was a tall man, who had probably once been quite athletic until the big dinners had finally weighed him down, and he had a beard. All Clatchians had beards. This Clatchian had intelligent eyes, too. Disconcertingly intelligent. You looked into them and several layers of person looked back at you. What? Oh, yes. Yes, we got them all right, said Vimes. Well done. He put up a sight, I see. Vimes looked surprised. The prince tapped his jaw thoughtfully. Vimes's hand flew up and encountered a little bit of tissue on his own chin. Ah, oh, er, uh, yes. Commander Vimes always gets his man, said the prince. Well, I wouldn't say it. Veterinarius Terrier, I've heard them call you, the prince went on. Always hot on the chase, they say, and he won't let go. Vimes stared into the calm, knowing gaze. "'I suppose at the end of the day we're all someone's dog,' he said weakly. "'In fact, it is fortuitous I have met you, Commander.' "'It is?' "'I was just wondering about the meaning of the word shouted at me as we were on our way down here. Could you be so kind?' "'Er, uh, if I—' "'I believe it was—let me see now. Oh, yes. Towelhead.' The prince's eyes stayed locked on Vimes's face. Vimes was conscious of his own thoughts moving very fast, and they seemed to reach their own decision. We'll explain later, they said. You're too tired for explanations. Right now, with this man, it's oh so much better to be honest. It refers to your headdress, he said. Oh, is it some kind of obscure joke? Of course he knows, thought Vimes, and he knows I know. No. It's an insult, he said eventually. Ha! Huh. Well, we certainly cannot be held responsible for the ramblings of idiots, Commander. The prince flashed a smile. I must commend you, incidentally. I'm sorry? For your breadth of knowledge. I must have asked a dozen people that question this morning, and do you know not one of them knew what it meant? And they all seemed to have caught a cough. There was a diplomatic pause, but in it someone sniggered. Vimes let his glance drift sideways to the other man, who had not been introduced. He was shorter and skinnier than the prince, and under his black headdress he had the most crowded face Vimes had ever seen. A network of scars surrounded a nose like an eagle's beak. There was a sort of beard and moustache, but the scars had affected the hair growth so much that they stuck out in strange bunches at odd angles. The man looked as though he had been hit in the mouth by a hedgehog. He could have been any age. Some of the scars looked fresh. All in all, the man had a face that any policeman would arrest on sight. There was no possible way it could be innocent of anything. He caught Vimes' expression and grinned. And Vimes had never seen so much gold in one mouth. He'd never seen so much gold in one place. Vimes realized he was staring when he ought to have been making polite, diplomatic conversation. So, he said, are we going to have a scrap over this lesh business or what? 
The prince gave a dismissive shrug. <laughs> he said. A few square miles of uninhabited fertile ground, with superb anchorage in an unsurpassed strategic position? <laughs> what sort of inconsequence is that for civilized people to war over? Once again, Vimes felt the gaze on him, reading him. Well, the hell with it, he said. Sorry, I'm not good at this diplomacy business. Did you mean what you said just then? There was another snigger. Vimes turned and looked at the leering, bearded face again, and was aware of a smell, no, a stench, of cloves. Good grief! He chews the stinking things. Ah, said the prince, you haven't met seventy-one hour Ahmed. Ahmed grinned again and bowed. Offendi, he said, in a voice like a gravel path. And that seemed to be it. Not, this is seventy-one hour Ahmed cultural attaché or Seventy-One-Hour Ahmed, My Bodyguard, or even Seventy-One-Hour Ahmed, Walking Strong Room and Moth Killer. It was clear that the next move was up to Vimes. That's, uh, that's an unusual name, he said. Not at all, said the prince smoothly. Ahmed is a very common name in my country. He leaned forward again. Vimes recognized this as the prelude to a confidential aside. Incidentally, was that beautiful lady I saw just now your first wife? Er, uh, all my wives, said Vimes. That is, could I offer you twenty camels for her? Vimes looked back into the dark eyes for a moment, glanced at seventy-one-hour Ahmed's twenty-four-carat grin, and said, This is another test, isn't it? The prince straightened up, looking pleased. Well done, Sir Samuel, you're good at this. Do you know Mr. Boggis of the Thieves' Guild was prepared to accept fifteen? For Mrs. Boggis? Vimes waggled a hand dismissively. Nah, four camels, maybe four camels and a goat in a good light, and when she's had a shave. The milling guests turned at the sound of the prince's explosion of laughter. Very good, very good. I am afraid, Commander, that some of your fellow citizens feel that just because my people invented advanced mathematics and all-day camping, we are complete barbarians who tried to buy their wives at the drop of, shall we say, a turban. I am surprised they're giving me an honorary degree, considering how incredibly backward I am. Oh, what degree is that? said Vimes. No wonder this man was a diplomat. You couldn't trust him an inch. He thought in loops, and you couldn't help liking him despite it. The prince pulled a letter out of his robe. Apparently it's a Doctorum Adamus cum Flabello Dorci. Is there something wrong, Sir Samuel? Vimes managed to turn the treacherous laugh into a coughing fit. No, <clears throat> no, <clears throat> nothing, he said. No. He desperately wanted to change the subject. Unfortunately, there was something here to provide just the opportunity. Why has Mr. Ahmed got such a big curved sword slung on his back? He said. Ah, you are a policeman. You notice such things. It's hardly a concealed weapon, is it? It's nearly bigger than him. He's practically a concealed owner. It's ceremonial, said the prince, and he does fret so if he has to leave it behind. And what exactly is his... Ah, oh, there you are, said Ridcully. I think we're just about ready. You know, you go right at the front, Sam. Yes, I know, said Vimes. I was just asking his highness what... And if you, your highness, and you, mister... Oh, my word, what a big sword. And you come back here and take your place among the honoured guests, and we'll be ready in a brace of shakes. What a thing it is to have a copper's mind, Vimes thought as the great file of wizards and guests tried to form a dignified and orderly line behind him. Just because someone makes himself pleasant and likable, you start to be suspicious of him, for no other reason than the fact that anyone who goes out of their way to be nice to a copper has got something on their mind. Of course, he's a diplomat, but still, I just hope he never studied ancient languages, and that's a fact. Someone tapped Vimes on the shoulder. He turned and looked right into the grin of Seventy-One Hour Ahmed. If you changing your mind, Offendi, I give you twenty-five camels, no problem, he said, pulling a clove from his teeth. May your loins be full of fruit. He winked. 
It was the most suggestive gesture Vimes had ever seen. Is this another? he began, but the man had vanished into the crowd. My loins be full of fruit, he repeated to himself. Good grief. Seventy-one hour Ahmed reappeared at his other elbow in a gust of cloves. I go. I come back, he growled happily. The prince says the degree is daughter of sweet Fanny Adams. A wizard wheeze, yes? Oh, how we are laughing. And then he was gone. The convivium was Unseen University's big day. Originally, it had just been the degree ceremony, but over the years it had developed into a kind of celebration of the amicable relationship between the university and the city, in particular celebrating the fact that people were hardly ever turned to clams any more. In the absence of anything resembling a Lord Mayor's show, or a state opening of Parliament, it was one of the few formal opportunities the citizens had of jeering at their social superiors, or at least at people wearing tights and ridiculous costumes. It had grown so big that it was now held in the city's opera house. Distrustful people, that is to say people like Vimes, considered that this was so there could be a procession. There was nothing like the massed ranks of wizardry walking sedately through the city in a spirit of civic amicability to subtly remind the more thoughtful kind of person that it hadn't always been this way. Look at us, the wizards seemed to be saying. We used to rule this city. Look at our big staffs with the knobs on the end. Any one of these could do some very serious damage in the wrong hands, so it's a good thing, isn't it, that they're in the right hands at the moment. Isn't it nice that we all get along so well? And someone once had decided that the commander of the watch should walk in front, for symbolic reasons. That hadn't mattered for years because there hadn't been a commander of the watch. But now there was, and he was Sam Vimes, in a red shirt, with silly baggy sleeves, red tights, some kind of puffed shorts in a style that went out of fashion by the look of it at the time when Flint was at the cutting edge of cutting edge technology, a tiny, shiny breastplate, and a helmet with feathers in it. And he really did need some sleep. And he had to carry the truncheon. He kept his eyes fixed on the damn thing as he walked out of the university's main gate. Last night's rain had cleaned the sky. The city steamed. If he stared at the truncheon, he didn't have to see who was giggling at him. The downside was that he had to keep staring at the thing. It said, on a little tarnished shield that he'd had to clean before reading it, Protector of the King's Peace. That had brightened the occasion slightly. Feathers and antiques, gold braid and fur. Perhaps it was because he was tired, or just because he was trying to shut out the world, but Vimes found himself slowing down into the traditional watchman's walk and the traditional idling thought process. It was an almost Pavlovian response a term invented by the wizard De Nephew Boot, who had found that by a system of rewards and punishments he could train a dog at the ringing of a bell to immediately eat a strawberry meringue. De Nephew's parents, who were uncomplicated country people, had wanted a girl. They were expecting to call her Denise. The legs swung, the feet moved, the mind began to work in a certain way. It wasn't a dream state, exactly. It was just that the ears, nose, and eyeballs wired themselves straight into the ancient, suspicious bastard node of his brain, leaving his higher brain center free to free wheel. Fur and tights. What kind of wear was that for a watchman? Bashed in armor, greasy leather breeches, and a tatty shirt with bloodstains on it. Someone else's, for preference. That was the stuff. Nice feel of the cobbles through his boots. It was really comforting. Behind him, confusion running up and down the ranks, the procession slowed down to keep in step. <laughs> Protector of the Kingi's peace, indeed. He'd said to the old man who delivered it, What peace did you have in mind? But that had fallen on stony ears. Damn silly thing, anyway, he thought. A short length of wood with a lump of silver on the end. Even a constable got a decent sword. What was he supposed to do? Wave it at people? Ye gods, it was months since he'd had a good walk through the streets. A lot of people about today. Some parade on, wasn't there? Oh dear, said Captain Carrot in the crowd. What's he doing? Next to him, an Agatean tourist was industriously pulling the lever off his iconograph. 
Commander Vine stopped and, with a faraway look in his eyes, tucked his truncheon under one arm and reached up to his helmet. The tourist looked up at Carrot and tugged his shirt politely. Please, uh, what is he doing now? he said. Uh, he's, uh, he's taking out... Oh, no, said Angua. He's taking the ceremonial packet of cigars out of his helmet, said Carrot. And he's... oh, he's lighting one. The tourist pulled the lever a few times. Very historic tradition. Memorable, murmured Angua. The crowd had fallen silent. No one wanted to break Vimes's concentration. There was the big, gusty silence of a thousand people holding their breath. What's he doing now? said Carrot. Can't you see? said Angua. Not with my hands over my eyes. Oh, the poor man. He's... he's just blown a smoke ring. First one of the day, he always does that. And now he's set off again, and now he's pulled out the truncheon and he's tossing it up in the air and catching it again. You know the way he does with his sword when he's thinking. He looks quite happy. I think he's going to really treasure this moment of happiness, said Carrot. Then the murmur started. The procession had halted behind vines. Some of the more impressionable people who weren't sure what they should be doing, and those who had partaken too heavily of the university's rather good sherry, started to fumble around on their person for something to throw up in the air and catch. After all, this was a traditional ceremony. If you took the view that you were not going to do things because they were apparently ridiculous, you might as well go home right now. He's tired, that's what it is, said Carrot. He's been running around overseeing things for days. Night and day watches. You know what a hands-on person he is. Let's hope the patrician will agree to let him stay that way. Oh, his lordship wouldn't... He wouldn't, would he? Laughter was starting. Vimes had started to toss the truncheon from one hand to the other. He can make his sword spin three times and still catch it. Vimes' head turned. He looked up. His truncheon clattered onto the cobbles and rolled into a puddle unheeded. Then he started to run. Carrot stared at him and then tried to see what the man had been looking at. On top of the barbican, he said, in that window. Isn't that someone up there? Excuse me, excuse me, sorry, excuse me. He began to push his way through the crowd. Vimes was already a small figure in the distance, his red cloak flying out after him. Well, there's a lot of people watching the parade from high places, said Angua. What's so special about... No one should be up there, said Carrot, starting to run now he was free of the crowd. It's all sealed up. Angua looked around. Every face was turned towards the street theatre, and there was a cart nearby. She sighed and strolled behind it, wearing an expression of suspicious nonchalance. There was a gasp, a faint but distinctly organic sound, a muffled yelp, and then the clank of armour hitting the ground. Vimes didn't know why he ran. It was a sixth sense. It was when the back of the brain picked up out of the ether that something bad was going to happen, and didn't have time to rationalise, and just took over the spinal cord. No one could get to the top of the Barbican. The Barbican had been the fortified gateway in the days when Ark Morpork didn't regard an attacking army as a marvellous commercial opportunity. Some parts were still in use, but the bulk of it was six or seven stories of ruin without stairs that any sensible man would trust. For years it had been used as an unofficial source of masonry for the rest of the city. Bits of it fell off on windy nights. Even gargoyles avoided it. He was aware that far behind him the noise of the crowd became a lot of shouting. One or two people screamed. He didn't turn round. Whatever was going on, Carrot could take care of it. Something overtook him. It looked like a wolf would look if one of its ancestors had been a long-haired, clatchy and hunting dog, one of those graceful things that were all nose and hair. It bounded ahead and through the crumbling gateway. The creature was nowhere to be seen when Vimes arrived, but the absence was not a matter that grabbed at his attention because of the more pressing presence of the corpse, lying in a mess of fallen masonry. One of the things Vimes had always said... That is to say, one of the things he said he always said, and no one disagrees with the commanding officer, was that sometimes small details, tiny little details, things that no one would notice in ordinary circumstances, grab your senses by the throat and scream, See me! There was a lingering, spicy scent in the air, and in the gap between a couple of cobblestones was a clove. It was five o'clock. Vimes and Carrot sat in the patrician's outer office, in silence, except for the irregular ticking of the clock. After a while, Vimes said, Let me have a look at that again. Garrett obediently pulled out the small square of paper. Vimes looked down at it. There was no mistaking what it showed. He tucked it into his own pocket. Er, uh, why do you want to keep it, sir? 
Cape what? said Vimes. The iconograph I borrowed from the tourist. I don't know what you're talking about, said Vimes. But you... I can't see you going very far in the watch, Captain, if you go around seeing things that aren't there. Oh. The clock seemed to tick louder. You're thinking something, aren't you, sir? It is a use to which I occasionally put my brain, Captain, strange as it may seem. What are you thinking, sir? What they want me to think, said Vimes. Who's they? I don't know yet. One step at a time. A bell tinkled. Vimes stood up. You know what I always say, he said. Carrot removed his helmet and polished it with his sleeve. Yes, sir. Everyone's guilty of something, especially the ones that aren't, sir. No, not that one. Er, uh, always take into consideration the fact that you might be dead wrong, sir. No, nor that one neither. Er, uh, how come Nobby ever got a job as a watchman, sir? You say that a lot. No, I meant always act stupid, Carrot. Ah, oh, right, sir. From now on I shall remember that you always said that, sir. They put their helmets under their arms. Vimes knocked at the door. Come, said a voice. The patrician was standing at the window. Sitting or standing around the office were Lord Rust and the others. Vimes never quite understood how the civic leaders were chosen. They just seemed to turn up, like a tack on the sole of your shoe. Ah, Vimes, said Vetinari. Sir, let us not beat about the bush, Vimes. How did the man get up there when your people had so thoroughly checked everything last night? Magic? Couldn't say, sir. Carrot, still staring straight ahead, blinked. Your people did check the Barbican, I assume? No, sir. They didn't? No, sir. I did that myself. You physically checked it yourself, Vimes, said Boggis of the Thieves' Guild. Captain Carrot could feel Vimes's thoughts at this point. That is correct, Boggis, said Vimes, without turning his head. But we think someone got in where the windows are boarded up and pulled the boards back after him. Dust has been disturbed, and... And you didn't spot this, Vimes? Vimes sighed. It'd be hard enough to spot the nailed back boards in daylight, Boggis, let alone in the middle of the night. Not that we did, he added to himself. Angua smelled the scent on them. Lord Betinari sat down at his desk. Hmm, the situation is grave, Vimes. Yes, sir. His Highness is very seriously injured, and Prince Cadram, we understand, is... Beside himself with rage. They insist on keeping his brother in the embassy, said Lord Rust. A studied insult, as if we haven't good surgeons in this city. That's right, of course, said Vimes, and many of them could give him a decent shave and a haircut, too. Are you making fun of me, Vimes? Certainly not, my lord, said Vimes. In my opinion, no surgeons anywhere have cleaner sawdust on their floors than the ones in this city. Rust glared at him. The patrician coughed. <clears throat> you have identified the assassin, said the patrician. Carrot was expecting Vimes to say, alleged assassin, sir, but instead he said, yes, he is, he was, called... Ossie Brunt, sir. No other name that we know. Lived in Market Street, did odd jobs from time to time, bit of a loner. No relatives or friends that we can find. We are making inquiries. And that's all you fellows know, said Lord Downey. It took some time to identify him, sir, said Vimes stolidly. Oh, why should that be? Couldn't give you the technical answer, sir, but it looks to me like they wouldn't need to make him a coffin. They could just have posted him between two barn doors. Was he acting alone? We only found the one body, sir, and a lot of recently fallen masonry, so it looks... I meant, does he belong to any organisation? Any suggestion that he's anti -Klatchian? Apart from him trying to kill one? Inquiries are continuing. Are you taking this... Seriously, Vimes? I have put my best men on the job, sir. Who's looking worried? 
Sergeant Colon and Corporal Nobbs. Who's looking relieved? Very experienced men, the keystones of the watch. Colon and Nobbs, said the patrician. Really? Yes, sir. Their gazes met very briefly. We're getting some very threatening noises, Vimes, said Vetinari. What can I say, sir? I saw someone up on the tower. I ran. Someone shot the prince with an arrow, and then I found the man at the bottom of the tower very obviously dead with a broken bow and a lot of rock beside him. The storm last night probably loosened things up. I can't make up facts that don't exist, sir. Tarrant watched the faces round the table. The general expression was one of relief. A lone bowman, said Vetinari, an idiot with some kind of mad grudge, who died in the execution of the, uh, attempted execution. And, of course, valiant action by our watchman probably at least prevented an immediately fatal shot. Valiant action, said Downey. I knew Captain Carrot here ran towards the VIPs, and Vimes headed for the tower, but frankly, Vimes, your strange behaviour beforehand... Somewhat immaterial now, said Lord Vetinari. Once again he adopted a slightly faraway voice, as if reporting to somebody else. If Commander Vimes had not slowed down the procession, the wretch would undoubtedly have got a much better shot. As it was, the man panicked. Yes, the prince possibly would accept that. Prince? said Vimes. But the poor devil... His brother, said the patrician. Oh, the nice one. Thank you, Commander, said the patrician. Thank you, gentlemen. Do not let me detain you. Oh, Vimes, just a brief word, if you would be so good. Not you, Captain Carrot. I'm sure someone is committing some crime somewhere. Vimes remained staring at the far wall while the room emptied. Vetinari left his chair and went over to the window. Strange days indeed, Commander, he said. Sir. For example, I gather that this afternoon Captain Carrot was on the roof of the Opera House, firing arrows down towards the archery butts. Very keen lad, sir. It could well be that the distance between the Opera House and the targets is about the same, you know, as the distance between the top of the Barbican and the spot where the Prince was hit. Just fancy that, sir. Vetinari sighed. And why was he doing this? It's a funny thing, sir, but he was telling me just the other day that in fact it is still law that every citizen should do one hour's archery practice every day. Apparently the law was made in 1356 and it's never been... Do you know why I sent Captain Carrot away just now, Vimes? Couldn't say, sir. Captain Carrot is an honest young man, Vimes. Yes, sir. And did you know that he winces when he hears you tell a direct lie? Really, sir? Damn. I can't stand to see his poor face twitch all the time, Vimes. Very thoughtful of you, sir. Where was the second bowman, Vimes? Damn. Second bowman, sir? Have you ever had a hankering to go on the stage, Vimes? Yes, at the moment I'd leap on it wherever it's heading, thought Vimes. No, sir. Pity! I am certain you're a great loss to the acting profession. I believe you said that the man had put the boards back after him. Yes, sir. Nailed them back? Blast. Yes, sir. From the outside? Damn. Yes, sir. A Particularly resourceful lone bowman, then. Vimes didn't bother to comment. Vetinari sat down at his desk, raised his steepled fingers to his lips, and stared at Vimes over the top of them. Hmm. Colon and Nobbs are investigating this. Really? Yes, sir. If I were to ask you why, you'd pretend not to understand? Vimes let his forehead wrinkle in honest perplexity. Sir, if you say sir again in that stupid voice, Vimes, I swear there will be trouble. They're good men, sir. However, some people might consider them to be unimaginative, stolid, and 
mm, how can I put this, possessed of an inbuilt disposition to accept the first explanation that presents itself and then bunk off somewhere for a quiet smoke? A certain lack of imagination, an ability to get out of their depth on a wet pavement, a tendency to rush to judgment? I hope you're not impugning my men, sir. Vimes, Sergeant Coulon and Corporal Nobbs have never been puned in their entire lives, sir. And yet, in fact, we do not need complications, Vimes, an ingenious lone madman. Well, there are many madmen. A regrettable incident. Yes, sir. The man was looking harassed, and Vimes felt there was room for a pinch of sympathy. Fred and Nobby don't like complications either, sir. We need simple answers, Vimes. Sir, Fred and Nobby are good at simple. The patrician turned away and looked out over the city. Ah, he said in a quieter voice, simple men to see the simple truth. This is a fact, sir. You are learning fast, Vimes. Couldn't say about that, sir. And when they have found the simple truth, Vimes, can't argue with the truth, sir. In my experience, Vimes, you can argue with anything. When Vimes had gone, Lord Vetinari sat at his desk for a while, staring at nothing. Then he took a key from a drawer and walked across to a wall where he pressed a particular area. There was a rattle of a counterweight. The wall swung back. The patrician walked softly through the narrow passageway beyond. Here and there it was illuminated by a very faint glow from around the edges of the little panels, which, if gently slid back, would allow someone to look out through the eye sockets of a handy portrait. They were a relic of a previous ruler. Vetinari never bothered with them. Looking out of someone else's eyes wasn't the trick. There was a certain amount of travel up dark stairways and along musty corridors. Occasionally he'd make movements the meaning of which might not be readily apparent. He'd touch a wall here and here, apparently without thinking as he passed. Along one stone-flagged passage, lit only by the grey light from a window forgotten by everyone except the most optimistic flies, he appeared to play a game of hopscotch robes flying around him, and calves twinkling as he skipped from stone to stone. These various activities did not seem to cause anything to happen. Eventually, he reached a door which he unlocked. He did this with some caution. The air beyond was full of acrid smoke, and the steady pop-pop sound which he had begun to hear further back along the passage was now quite loud. It faltered for a moment, was followed by a much louder bang, and then a piece of hot metal whirled past the patrician's ear and buried itself in the wall. In the smoke, a voice said, Oh, dear. It didn't seem unhappy, but sounded rather like the voice one might use to a sweet and ingratiating little puppy, which, despite one's best efforts, is sitting next to a spreading damp patch on the carpet. As the billows cleared, the indistinct shape of the speaker turned to Betanari with a wan little smile and said, Fully fifteen seconds this time, my lord. There is no doubt that the principle is sound. That was one of Leonard of Quirm's traits. He picked up conversations out of the air, he assumed everyone was an interested friend, and he took it for granted that you were as intelligent as he was. Betinari appeared at a small heap of bent and twisted metal. What was it, Leonard? he said. An experimental device for turning chemical energy into rotary motion, said Leonard. The problem, you see, is getting the little pellets of black powder into the combustion chamber at exactly the right speed and one at a time. If two ignite together, well, what we have is the external combustion engine. And uh, what would be the purpose of it? said the patrician. I believe it could replace the horse, said Leonard proudly. They looked at the stricken thing. One of the advantages of horses that people often point out, said Vetinari after some thought, is that they very seldom explode. Almost never, in my experience, apart from that unfortunate occurrence in the hot summer a few years ago. With fastidious fingers he pulled something out of the mess. It was a pair of cubes made out of some soft white fur and linked together by a piece of string. There were dots on them. Dice, 
he said. Leonard smiled in an embarrassed fashion. Yes, I can't think why I thought they'd help it go better. It was just, well, an idea. <laughs> you know how it is? Lord Vetinari nodded. He knew how it was. He knew how it was far more than Leonard of Quirm did, which was why there was one key to the door, and he had it. Not that the man was a prisoner, except by dull humdrum standards. He appeared rather grateful to be confined in this light, airy attic with as much wood, paper, sticks of charcoal and paint as he desired, and no rent or food bills to pay. In any case, you couldn't really imprison someone like Leonard of Quirm. The most you could do was lock up his body. The gods alone knew where his mind went. And although he had so much cleverness it leaked continually, he couldn't tell you which way the political wind was blowing, even if you fitted him with sails. Leonard's incredible brain sizzled away alarmingly, an overloaded chip pan on the stove of life. It was impossible to know what he would think of next, because he was constantly reprogrammed by the whole universe. The sight of a waterfall or a soaring bird would send him spinning down some new path of practical speculation that invariably ended in a heap of wire and springs and a cry of, I think I know what I did wrong. He'd been a member of most of the craft guilds in the city, but had been thrown out for getting impossibly high marks in the exams, or in some cases, correcting the questions. It was said that he'd accidentally blown up the alchemist's guild, using nothing more than a glass of water, a spoonful of acid, two lengths of wire, and a ping-pong ball. Any sensible ruler would have killed off Leonard, and Lord Vetinari was extremely sensible, and often wondered why he had not done so. He decided that it was because, imprisoned in the priceless inquiring amber of Leonard's massive mind, Underneath all that bright investigative genius was a kind of willful innocence that might in lesser men be called stupidity. It was the seat and soul of that force which down the millennia had caused mankind to stick its fingers in the electric light socket of the universe and play with the switch to see what happened, and then be very surprised when it did. It was, in short, something useful, and if the patrician was anything, he was the political equivalent of the old lady who saves bits of string, because you never know when they might come in handy. After all, you couldn't plan for every eventuality, because that would involve knowing what was going to happen, and if you knew what was going to happen, you could probably see to it that it didn't, or at least happened to someone else. So the patrician never planned. Plans often got in the way. And finally, he kept Leonard around because the man was easy to talk to. He never understood what Lord Betanari was talking about, he had a world view about as complex as that of a concussed duckling, and above all, never really paid attention. This made him an excellent confidant. After all, when you seek advice from someone, it's certainly not because you want them to give it. You just want them to be there while you talk to yourself. I've just made some tea, said Leonard. Will you join me? He followed the patrician's gaze to a brown stain all up one wall, which ended in a star of molten metal in the plaster. I'm afraid the automatical tea engine went wrong, he said. I shall have to make it by hand. So kind, said Lord Vetinari. He sat down amidst the easels, and while Leonard busied himself at the fireplace, leafed through the latest sketches. Leonard sketched as automatically as other people scratched. Genius, a certain kind of genius, fell off him like dandruff. There was a picture of a man drawing the lines catching the figure so accurately it appeared to stand out of the paper. And around it, because Leonard never wasted white space, were other sketches, scattered aimlessly. A thumb, a bowl of flowers, a device apparently for sharpening pencils by water power. Betinari found what he was looking for in the bottom left-hand corner, sandwiched between a sketch for a new type of screw and a tool for opening oysters. It, or something very much like it, was always there, somewhere. One of the things that made Leonard such a rare prize, and kept him under such secure lock and key, was that he really didn't see any difference between the thumb and the roses and the pencil sharpener, and this. Ah, oh, the self-portrait, said Leonard, returning with two cups. Yes, indeed, said Betinari, but my eye was drawn to this little sketch here, the war machine. Oh, that, uh, mere nothing. Have you ever noticed the way in which the dew on roses? This bit here. What is it for? said Vetinari, pointing persistently. 
Oh, that, that's just the throwing arm for the balls of molten sulphur, said Leonard, picking up a plate of small cakes. I calculate that one should get a range of almost half a mile, oh, if one detaches the endless belt from the driving wheels and uses the oxen to wind the windlass. Really, said Bettinari, taking in the carefully numbered parts. And it could be built? What? Oh, yes. Macaroon? In theory. In theory. No one would ever actually do it. Raining unquenchable fire down upon fellow humans? Ho, 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 ho. Leonard sprayed macaroon crumbs. You'd never find an artisan to build it, or a soldier who would pull the lever. <laughs> That's part 3B on the plan, just here, look. Ah, yes, said Vetinari. Anyway, he added, I imagine these huge power arms here couldn't possibly be operated without them breaking. Season Dash and you laminated and held together by special steel bolts, said Leonard promptly. I made a few calculations just there below the sketch of light on a raindrop, as an intellectual exercise, obviously. Vetinari ran his eye along several lines of Leonard's spidery mirror writing. Oh, yes, he said glumly. He put the paper aside. Have I told you that the Clatchian situation is in Intensely political. Prince Kadram is trying to do a great deal very fast. He needs to consolidate his position. He is depending on support that is somewhat volatile. There are many plotting against him, I understand. Really? Well, this is the sort of thing people do, said Leonard. Incidentally, I've recently been examining cobwebs. And I know this will interest you. Their strength, in relation to their weight, is much greater even than our best steel wire. Isn't that fascinating? What kind of weapon do you intend to make out of them? said the patrician. Sorry? Oh, nothing. I was just thinking aloud. And you haven't touched your tea, said Leonard. Vetinari looked around the room. It was full of things. Tubes and odd paper kites, and things that look like the skeletons of ancient beasts. One of Leonard's saving graces, in a very real sense, from Vetinari's point of view, was his strange attention span. It wasn't that he soon got bored with things. He didn't seem to get bored with anything. But since he was interested in everything in the universe all the time, the end result tended to be that an experimental device for disemboweling people at a distance then became a string-weaving machine— and ended up as an instrument for ascertaining the specific gravity of cheese. He was as easily distracted as a kitten. All that business with the flying machine, for example, giant bat wings hung from the ceiling even now. The patrician had been more than happy to let him waste his time on that idea, because it was obvious to anyone that no human being would ever be able to flap the wings hard enough. He needn't have worried. Leonard was his own distraction. He had ended up spending ages designing a special tray so that people could eat their meals in the air. A truly innocent man. And yet always, always some little part of him would sketch these wretchedly beguiling engines with their clouds of smoke and carefully numbered engineering diagrams. What's this? Betinari said, pointing to yet another doodle. It showed a man holding a large metal sphere. That, oh, oh, something of a toy, really, makes use of the strange properties of some otherwise quite useless metals. They don't like being squeezed, <laughs> so they go bang, hmm, with extreme alacrity. Another weapon? Certainly not, my lord. It would be no possible use as a weapon. I did think it might have a place in the mining industries, though. Really? for when they need to move mountains out of the way? Tell me, Vetinari said, putting this paper aside as well, you don't have any relatives in Clatch, do you? I don't believe so. My family lived in Quirm for generations. Oh, good. But, uh, very clever people in Clatch, are they? Oh, in many disciplines they practically wrote the scroll... Fine metalwork, for example. Metalwork, the patrician sighed. And alchemy, of course. 
I fear Al Kemas Principia Explosia has been the seminal work for more than a hundred years. Alchemy, said the patrician glumly. Sulphur and so forth. Yes, indeed. But the way you put it, these major achievements were some considerable time ago. Lord Bettinari sounded like a man straining to see a light at the end of a tunnel. Certainly, I would be astonished if they hadn't made considerable progress, said Leonard of Quirm happily. Ah, the patrician sank a little in his chair. It had turned out that the end of the tunnel was on fire. A splendid people with much to recommend them, said Leonard. I always thought it was the presence of the desert. It leads to an urgency of thought. It makes you aware of the briefness of life. The patrician glanced at another page. Between a sketch of a bird's wing and a careful drawing of a ball joint was a little doodle of something with spiked wheels and spinning blades. And then there was the device for moving mountains aside. The desert is not required, he said. He sighed again and pushed the pages aside. Have you heard about the lost continent of Leshp? he said. Oh, yes. I did some sketches there a few years ago, said Leonard. Some interesting aspects, I recall. More tea? I fear you've let that one get cold. Was there anything you particularly wanted? The patrician pinched the bridge of his nose. I'm not sure. There is a small problem developing. I thought perhaps you could help. Unfortunately, the patrician glanced at the sketches again. I suspect that you can. He stood up, straightened his robe, and forced a smile. You have everything that you require? Some more wire would be nice, said Leonard, and I have run out of burnt umber. I shall have some sent along directly, said Bettinari. And now, if you will excuse me, he let himself out. Leonard nodded happily as he cleared away the teacups. The infernal combustion engine was carried to the heap of scrap metal beside the small forge and he fetched a ladder and removed the piston from the ceiling. He'd just opened out his easel to start working on a new design when he was aware of a distant pattering. It sounded like someone running, but also occasionally pausing to hop sideways on one leg. Then there was a pause, such as might be made by someone adjusting their clothing and getting their breath back. The door opened, and a patrician returned. He sat down and looked carefully at Leonard of Quirm. You did what? he said. Vimes turned the clove over and over under the magnifying glass. "'I see tooth marks,' he said. "'Yes, sir,' said Littlebottom, who represented in her entirety the watch's forensic department. "'Looks like someone was chewing it like a toothpick.' Vimes sat back. "'I would say,' he said, "'that this was last touched by a swarthy man of about my height. "'He had several gold teeth and a beard, "'and a slight cast in one eye, scarred.' He was carrying a large weapon, curved, I'd say, and you'd have to call what he was wearing a turban because it wasn't moving fast enough to be a badger. Littlebottom looked astonished. Detectoring is like gambling, said Vimes, putting down the clove. The secret is to know the winner in advance. Thank you, Corporal. Write down that description and make sure everyone gets a copy, please. He goes by the name of Seventy-One Hour Ahmed, heaven knows why, and then go and get some rest. Vimes turned to face Carrot and Angua, who had crammed into the tiny little room and nodded at the girl. I followed the clothes smell all the way down to the docks, she said. And then? Then I lost it. Angua looked embarrassed. I didn't have any trouble through the fish market, sir, or in the slaughterhouse district. And then it went into the spice market. Ah, I see. And didn't come out again? In a way, sir. Or came out going fifty different ways. Sorry. Can't be helped. Carrot, I did what you said, sir. The top of the opera house is about the right distance from our archery butts. I used a bow just like the one he used, sir. Vimes raised a finger. Carrot stared and then slowly said, Like the one you found next to him? Right, and? It's a burly and strong in the arm, sure shot five, sir. A bow for the expert. I'm not a great bowman, but I could at least hit the target at that elevation, but I'm ahead of you said Vimes. You're a big lad, Carrot. Our late Ossie had arms like Nobby. I could put my hand round them. Yes, sir. 
It's a hundred-pound draw. I doubt if he could even pull the string back. I'd hate to watch him try. Good grief, the only thing he could be sure of hitting with a bow like that would be his foot. By the way, do you think anyone saw you up there? I doubt it, sir. I was right in among the chimneys and the air vents. Vimes sighed. Captain, I expect if you'd done it in a cellar at midnight, his lordship would have said, Wasn't it rather dark down there, next morning? He took out the by now rather creased picture. There was Carrot, or at least Carrot's arm and ear, as he ran towards the procession. And there, among the people in the procession, turning to look at him, was the face of the prince. There was no sign of seventy-one-hour Ahmed. He'd been at the soiree, hadn't he? But then there'd been all that milling around at the door, people changing places, treading on one another's robes, nipping back to the privy, walking into one another. He could have gone anywhere. And the prince fell as you got to him, with the arrow in his back. He was still facing you. Yes, sir, I'm sure of that. Everyone else was milling around, of course. So he was shot in the back by a man in front of him who could not possibly have used the bow that he didn't shoot him with from the wrong direction. There was a tapping at the window. That'll be down, Spout, said Vimes, without looking round. I'll send him on an errand. Downspout never quite fitted in. It wasn't that he didn't get on with people, because he hardly ever met people, except those whose activities took them above, say, second-floor level. Constable Downspout's beat was the rooftops, very slowly. He'd come down for the watch's hogs' watch party, and had poured gravy into his ears to show willing, but Gargoyles got very nervy indoors at ground level, and he had soon exited via the chimney, and his paper squeaker had echoed out forlornly amongst the snowy rooftops all night. But gargoyles were good at watching, and good at remembering, and very, very good at being patient. Vimes opened the window. Moving jerkily, down Spout unfolded himself into the room, and then quickly scrambled up onto a corner of Vimes's desk for the comfort that it brought. Angua and Carrot stared at the arrow the gargoyle held in his hand. Ah, well done, said Vimes in the same even voice. Where did you find it, down Spout? Downspout spluttered a series of guttural syllables only pronounceable by someone with a mouth shaped like a pipe. In the wall on the second floor of the dress shop in the Plaza of Broken Moons, Carrot translated. Ish, said Downspout. That's barely halfway to Sartor Square, sir. Yes, said Vimes. A small, weak man trying to pull a heavy bow, the arrow wobbling all over the place. Thank you very much, Downspout. There will be an extra pigeon for you this week. <laughs> said Downspout and clambered back out of the window. Excuse me, sir, said Angua. She took the arrow from Vimes and, closing her eyes, sniffed at it gingerly. Oh, yes, Ossie, she said, all over it. Thank you, Corporal. It's as well to be sure. Carrot took the arrow from the werewolf and looked at it critically. Huh, <laughs> peacock feathers and a plated point. The sort of thing an amateur buys because he thinks it'll magically improve his shot. Showy. Right, said Vimes. You, Carrot, and you, Angua, you're on the case. Sir, I don't understand, said Carrot. I am perplexed. I thought you said Fred and Nobby were investigating this. Yes, said Vimes. But Sergeant Colon and Corporal Nobbs are investigating why the late Ossie tried to kill the Prince. And you know what? They're going to find lots of clues. I just know it. I can feel it in my water. But we know he couldn't have, said Carrot. Isn't this fun, said Vimes. I don't want you to get in Fred's way. Just, uh, ask around. Try Dunnett Duncan or Sidney Lopsides. Heh, <laughs> there's a man with his ear to the ground, all right. Or the Agony Aunts, or Lily Goodtime, or Mr. Slider. Haven't seen him around for a while, but... He's dead, sir. What? Smelly Slider? When? Last month, sir, he got hit by a falling bedstead. Freak accident, sir. No one told me. You were busy, sir, but you put some money in the envelope when Fred brought it round, sir. Ten dollars, which Fred remarked was very generous. Vimes sighed. Oh, yes, the envelopes. Fred was always wandering around with an envelope these days. Someone was always leaving, or some friend of the watch was in trouble, or there was a raffle or the tea money was low again, or some complicated explanation, so Vimes just put some money in. Simplest way. Old smelly slider. You should have mentioned it, he said reproachfully. You've been working hard, sir. Any other street news you haven't mentioned, Captain? 
Not that I can think of, sir. All right. Well, see which way the wind is blowing, very carefully, and trust no one. Carrot looked worried. Er, uh, I can trust Angua, can't I? He said. Well, of course you... And you, presumably. Me? Well, obviously, that goes without saying. Corporal Littlebottom, she can be very helpful. Cheery, yes, certainly you can trust Chit. Sergeant Detritus, I always thought he was very tr Detritus, oh yes, he... Nobby, should I? Carrot, I understand what he means, said Angua, tugging his arm. Carrot looked a little crestfallen. I've never liked, you know, underhand things, he mumbled. I don't want any written reports, said Vimes, grateful for that small mercy. This is unofficial, but officially unofficial, if you see what I mean. Angua nodded. Carrot just stayed looking dismal. She's a werewolf, thought Vimes. Of course she understands. And you think a man who is technically a dwarf would be able to fold his head around the idea of subterfuge? Look, just listen to the streets, said Vimes. The streets know everything. Talk to Blind Hugh. I'm afraid he passed away last month, said Carrot. Did he? No one told me. I thought I sent you a memo, sir. Vimes glanced guiltily at his overloaded desk and then shrugged. Have a quiet look at things. Get to the bottom of things. And trust no... Trust practically no one. All right? Except trustworthy people. Come on. Open up. Watch business. Corporal Nobbs pulled at Sergeant Colon's sleeve and whispered in his ear. Er, uh, not watch business, said Colon, pounding the door again. Nothing to do with the watch at all. We're all just, er, uh, civilians, all right? The door opened a crack. Yes, said a voice that counted its small change. We have to ask some questions, missus. Are you the watch? said the voice. No, I think I just made that clear. Piss off, copper, the door slammed. You sure this is the right place, Sarge? Harry Chestnut said he saw Ossie going in here. Come on, open up. Everyone's looking at us, Sarge, said Nobby. Doors and windows had opened all along the street. And don't call me Sarge when we're in plain clothes. Right you are, Fred. That's... Colon hesitated in an agony of status. Well, that's... that's Frederick to you, Nobby. And a giggling Fred, uh, Ick, Frederick. We don't want to make a cock-up of this, Nobby. Right, Frederick. And that's Cecil, thank you. Cecil? That is my name, said Nobby coldly. Have it your way, said Colin. Just remember who's the superior civilian around here, all right? He hammered on the door again. We hear you've got a room to let, missus, he yelled. Brilliant, Frederick, said Nobby. That was bloody brilliant. Well, I am the sergeant, right, Colin whispered. No. Er, uh, yeah, right. Well, you just remember that, right? The door snapped open. The woman within had one of those faces that had settled over the years as though it had been made of butter and then left in the sun. But age hadn't been able to do much with her hair. It was a violent ginger and piled up like a threatening thunderhead. Room? You should have said, she said. Two dollars a week, no pets, no cooking, no women after six a.m. If you don't want it, thousands do. Are you with the circus? You look like you're with the circus. Plain clothes was the problem. Both the men had been used to uniforms all their lives. Sergeant Colan's only suit had been bought by a man two stone lighter and ten years younger, so the buttons creaked under tension. And Nobby's idea of plain clothes was the ribbon and bell bedecked costume he wore as a leading member of the Ankmore Pork Folk Dance and Song Society. Small children had followed them in the street to see where the show was going to be. We're, Colon began, and then stopped. There were undoubtedly a large number of things to be apart from policemen, but there and then he couldn't think of any of them. Uh, actors, said Nobby. Then it's payment a week in advance, said the woman, and no filthy foreign habits. This is a respectable house, she added, in defiance of evidence so far. We ought to see the room first, said Colan. Oh, the choosy sort, eh? She led them upstairs. The room vacated so terminally by Ossie was small and bare. 
A few items of clothing hung on nails in the wall, and a heap of wrappers and greasy bags indicated that Ossie had been a man who ate, as it were, off the street. "'Whose is this stuff?' said Sergeant Colon. "'Oh, he's gone now. I told him he'd be out if he didn't pay up. I'll throw it all out afore you settle in.' "'We'll get rid of it for you,' said Sergeant Colon. He fumbled in his pouch and produced a couple of dollars. "'Here you are, Miss... Uh, Mrs... Spent.' said Mrs. Spent. She gave them a lopsided look. Are you both stopping here, or what? Nah, I've just come along as his chaperone, said Colon, giving her a friendly grin. He has to fight women off when they find out about his sexual magnetism. Mrs. Spent gave the shocked Nobby a sharp look, and bustled out of the room. What you can't say that for, said Nobby. It's got rid of her, hasn't it? You were having a go at me, don't deny it, just because I'm going through a bit of emotional what's name, eh? It was just a joke, Nobby, just a joke. Nobby peered under the narrow bed. Wow, he said, all emotional what's names forgotten. What is it? What is it? said Colum. It looks like a complete run of bows and ammo, and... Nobby pulled another stack of badly engraved magazines out into the light. Here's Warrior of Fortune, look, and Practical Siege Weapons. Colon leafed through page after page of very similar-looking people holding very similar weapons of personal destruction. "'You've got to be a bit odd to sit around all day reading this kind of thing,' he said. "'Yeah,' said Nobby. "'Here, don't put that one back. That's last August's issue. I ain't got that one. Hang on, there's a box right at the back.' He wriggled out, towing a small box with him. It was locked, but the cheap metal gave away when he accidentally levered at the lid. Silver coins gleamed. Lots and lots of them. Whoops, he muttered. We're in trouble now. That's Clatchian money, that is, said Colon. Sometimes people slip you one instead of half a dollar in your change. Look, there's all curly writing on them. We're in big trouble, said Nobby. No, no, no. This is a clue, what we have found by patient detectoring, said Sergeant Colon. And it's going to be a feather in our caps, and no mistake when Mr. Vimes hears about it. How much do you reckon there is? Got to be hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth, said Colon. And that's a lot of money to a clatch in. You can probably live like a king for a year and a dollar in clatch. It wasn't very patient detectoring, said Nobby doubtfully. All I did was look under the bed. Ah, but that's because you is trained, said Colon. Your basic civilian wouldn't think of that right. <laughs> it all begins to make sense. Does it? Why would the Clatchians give him money to shoot a Clatchian? said Nobby. Colon tapped the side of his nose. Politics, he said. Oh, politics, said Nobby. Oh, well, oh, oh, oh. politics, I see. Yeah. Politics, right. So, why? Aha! said Colon again, tapping the other side of his nose. Why are you picking your nose, Sarge? I'm tapping it, said Colon severely. That's to show I'm in the know. In the nose, said Nobby cheerfully. It's just the sort of underhand cunning thing they do, said Colon. Paying us to kill them, said Nobby. Ah, you see, some Clatchian knob gets topped here, and then they can send a snotty note saying, You killed our big knob, you foreign nephews of dogs. This means war. See? Perfect excuse. Do you need an excuse to have a war? said Nobby. I mean, who for? Can't you just say, You got lots of cash and land, but I've got a big sword, so divvy up right now, chop chop? That's what I'd do, said Corporal Nobbs, military strategist. And I wouldn't even say that until after I'd attacked. Ah, but that's because you don't know about politics, said Colon. You can't do that stuff any more. Mark my words, this case has got politics written all over it. That's why old Vines put me on it. Depend upon it. Politics. Young carrots all very well, but you need a experienced man of the world in these delicate political situations. You've certainly got the nose tapping just right, said Nobby. I generally miss. But he felt troubled, if not in his nose, then in whatever small organ propelled his blood around his body. This didn't feel right. Nothing much in Nobby's life had ever felt right, so he knew very well how the feeling felt. 
He looked up at the bare walls and down at the rough floorboards. There's a bit of sand on the floor, he said. Another clue, then, said Colon happily. A Clatchian has been here. Bugger all else but sand in Clatch. Still got so many sandals. Nobby opened the window. It gave on to a gently sloping roof. Someone could get through it easily and be away over the tiles and into the maze of chimneys. He could have gone in and out this way, Sarge, he volunteered. Good point, Nobby. Write that down. Evidence of conniving and sneaking around. Nobby peered down. Here, yeah, there's glass outside, Fred. Sergeant Colon joined him at the stricken window. One of the panes had been smashed. Outside, glass glittered on the tiles. That could be a, a clue, eh? said Nobby, hopefully. It certainly is, said Sergeant Colon. See, the glass fell outside the window. Everyone knows you look at which way the glass falls. I reckon he was just testing his bow, and it went off while it was loaded. That's clever, Sarge, said Nobby. That's detectorin', said Colon. It's no good just looking at things, Nobby. You've got to think straight, too. Uh, Cecil, Sarge. That's Frederick, Cecil. Come on, I think we've wrapped this up nicely. Old Vine says he wants a report toot sweet. Nobby looked out of the broken window. The roof abutted the end wall of a much larger warehouse. For a moment he found himself thinking bendy rather than straight, but he reasoned that his thinking was only a corporal's thinking and worth far less per thought than a sergeant's thinking, so he kept his private thoughts to himself. As they went downstairs, Mrs. Spent watched them suspiciously through a barely opened doorway at the far end of the hall, clearly ready to slam it shut at the first suggestion of any sexual magnetism. It's not as if I even know where to get a sexual magnet, Nobby muttered. And she didn't even laugh. Also, we went to the bow shops in the street of cunning artificers and showed the iconograph to the man in burly and strong in the arm who vouchsafed that is him, e.g. he was referring to the diseased. Oh, my. Vime's lips moved slightly as his gaze went back up the page. Also, in addition to the Clatchian money, you could tell one of them had been there because of, e.g., the sand on the floor. He'd still got sand in his sandals, murmured Vimes. Good grief. Sam? Vimes looked up from his reading. Your soup will be cold, said Lady Sybil from the far end of the table. You've been holding that spoonful in the air for the last five minutes by the clock. Sorry, dear. What are you reading? Oh, just a little masterpiece, said Vimes, pushing Fred Colon's report aside. Interesting, is it? said Lady Sybil, a little sourly. Practically unparalleled, said Vimes. The only things they haven't found are the bunch of dates and the camel hidden under the pillow. Belatedly, his nuptial radar detected a certain chilliness from the far side of the cruet. Is, uh, there something wrong, dear? he said. Can you remember when we last had dinner together, Sam? Tuesday, wasn't it? That was the Guild of Merchants' annual dinner, Sam. Vimes's brow wrinkled. But, uh, you were there too, weren't you? A further subtle change in the Dragon House quotient told him that this was not a well-chosen answer. And then you rushed off afterwards because of that business with the barber in Gleam Street. Sweeney Jones, said Vimes. Well, he was killing people, Sybil. The best you could say is that he didn't mean to. He was just very bad at shaving. But you didn't have to go, I'm sure. Policing's a twenty-four-hour job, dear. Only for you. Your constables do their ten hours, and that's it. But you're always working. It's not good for you. You're always running around during the day, and when I wake up in the middle of the night, there's always a cold space beside me. The dots hung in the air, the ghosts of words unsaid. Little things, thought Vimes. That's how a war starts. There's so much to do, Sybil, he said as patiently as he could. There's always been a lot to do, and the bigger the watch gets, the more there is to do. Have you noticed that? Vimes nodded. That was true. Rotors, receipts, notebooks, reports. The watch might or might not be making a difference in the city, but it was certainly frightening a lot of trees. You ought to delegate, 
said Lady Sybil. So he tells me, muttered Vimes. Pardon? Just thinking aloud, dear. Vimes pushed the paperwork away. I'll tell you what. Let's have an evening in, he said. There's a nice fire in the drawing room. Er, uh, no, Sam, there isn't. Hasn't young Forthright lit it? Forthright was the boy. It came as news to Vimes that this was an official servant position, but the boy's job was to light the fires, clean the privies, help the gardener, and take the blame. He's gone off to be a drummer boy in the Duke of Eyal's regiment, said Lady Sybil. Him too. He seemed a bright lad. Isn't he too young? He said he was going to lie about his age. I hope he lies about his musical ability. I've heard him whistling. Vimes shook his head. Whatever possessed him to do such a daft thing? He thinks the uniform will impress the girls. Sybil gave him a gentle smile. An evening at home suddenly began to seem very inviting. Well, it won't take a genius to find the woodshed, said Vimes, and then we can bolt the doors and... One of the aforesaid doors shook to the sound of frantic knocking. Vimes caught Sybil's gaze. Go on, then, answer it, she sighed and sat down. The door admitted Corporal Littlebottom, seriously out of breath. <sighs> You've got to come quick, sir. It, it, it's murder this time. Vimes looked helplessly at his wife. Of course you must go, she said. Angua brushed out her hair in front of the mirror. I don't like this, said Carrot. It's not a proper way to behave. She patted him on the shoulder. Don't worry, she said. Vimes explained it all. You're acting as though we're doing something wrong. I like being a watchman, said Carrot, still in the mournful depths. And you've got to wear a uniform. If you don't wear a uniform, it's like spying on people. He knows I think that. Angua looked at his short red hair and honest ears. I've taken a lot of the work off his shoulders, Carrot went on. He doesn't have to go on patrol at all, but he still tries to do everything. Perhaps he doesn't want you to be quite so helpful, said Angua, as tactfully as possible. It's not as if he's getting any younger either. I've tried to point that out. That was kind of you, and I've never worn plain clothes. On you they'll never be very plain, said Angua, pulling on her coat. It was a relief to be out of that armour. As for Carrot, there was no disguising him. The size, the ears, the red hair, the expression of muscular good-naturedness. I suppose a werewolf is in plain clothes all the time when you think about it, said Carrot. Thank you, Carrot, and you're absolutely right. I just don't feel comfortable living a lie. Walk a mile on these paws. Pardon? Oh, nothing Gorif's son, Jamil, had been angry. He didn't know why. The anger was built up of a lot of things. The firebomb last night was a big part. So were some of the words he'd been hearing in the street. He'd had an argument with his father about sending that food round to the watchhouse this morning. They were an official part of the city. They had those stupid badges. They had uniforms. He was angry about a lot of things, including the fact that he was thirteen. So when at nine in the evening, while his father was baking bread, the door had slammed back and a man had rushed in, Janil had pulled his father's elderly crossbow from under the counter and aimed it where he thought the heart was and pulled the trigger. Carrot stamped his feet once or twice and looked around. Here, he said, I was standing here and the prince was in that direction. Angua obediently walked across the square. Several people turned to look curiously at Carrot. All right, stop. No, on a bit. Stop. Turn a little bit to the left. I mean, my left. Uh, back a bit. Now. Throw your arms up. He walked over to her and followed her gaze. He was shot from the university. Looks like the library building, said Angua. But a wizard wouldn't do it, surely. They keep out of that sort of thing. Oh, it's not too hard to get in there, even when the gates are shut, said Carrot. Let's try the unofficial way, shall we? OK. Carrot? Yes? The, uh, false moustache. Mm, it's not you, you know, and the nose is far too pink. Doesn't it make me look inconspicuous? No. And the hat? I, I should lose the hat, too. It's a good hat, she added quickly, but a brown bowler is not your style. It doesn't suit you. Exactly, said Carrot. If it was my style, people would know it's me, right? 
I mean it makes you look like a twerp, Carrot. Do I normally look like a twerp? No, not... Aha! Carrot fumbled in the pocket of his large brown overcoat. I got this book of disguises from the joke shop in Phaedra Road. Look, funny thing, Nobby was in there buying stuff too. I asked him why, and he said it was desperate measures. What do you think he meant by that? I can't imagine, said Angua. It's just amazing the stuff they've got. False hair, false noses, false beards, even false... He hesitated and began to blush. Even false... you know, chests. For ladies. But I can't imagine for the life of me why they'd want to disguise those. <laughs> he probably couldn't, Angua thought. She took the very small book from Carrot and glanced through it. She sighed. Carrot, these disguises are meant for a potato. Are they? Look, they're all on potatoes, see? I thought that was just for display. Carrot, it's got Mr. Spuddy Face on it. Behind his thick black moustache, Carrot looked hurt and perplexed. What does a potato want a disguise for? he said. They'd reached the alley alongside the university that had been known informally as Scholar's Entry for so many centuries that this was now on a nameplate at one end. A couple of student wizards went past. The unofficial entrance to the university has always been known only to students. What most students failed to remember was that the senior members of the faculty had also been students once, and also liked to get out and about after the official shutting of the gates. This naturally led to a certain amount of embarrassment and diplomacy on dark evenings. Carrot and Angua waited patiently as a few more students climbed over, followed by the dean. "'Good evening, sir,' said Carrot politely. "'Good evening to you, Spuddy,' said the dean, and ambled off into the night. "'You see?' "'Ah, but he didn't call me Carrot,' said Carrot. "'The principal is sound.' They dropped down onto the lawns of academia and headed for the library. "'It'll be shut,' said Angua. "'Remember we have a man on the inside,' said Carrot, and knocked. The door opened a little way. Ooh. Carrot raised his horrible little round hat. "'Good evening, sir. I wonder if we could come in. It's watch business.' Ooh. 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 Um, what did he say? said Angua. If you must know, he said, my goodness me, a walking potato, said Carrot. The librarian wrinkled his nose at Angua. He did not like the smell of werewolves. But he beckoned them inside and then left them waiting while he knuckled back to his desk and rummaged in a drawer. He produced a watch special constable's badge on a string, which he hung around the general area where his neck should have been, and then stood as much to attention as an orangutan can, which is not a great deal. The central ape gets the idea, but outlying areas are slow to catch on. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Was that, how may I be of assistance, Captain Tuba? said Angua. We need to have a look on the fifth floor overlooking the square, said Carrot, a shade coldly. Ooh, ooh, ooh. He says that's just old storerooms, said Carrot. And that last ook, said Angua. Mr. Horrible Hat, said Carrot. Still, he hasn't worked out who you are, eh? said Angua. The fifth floor was a corridor of airless rooms, smelling sadly of old, unwanted books. They were stacked not on shelves, but on wide racks, bundled up with string. A lot of them were battered and missing their covers. Judging by what remained, though, they were old textbooks that not even the most ardent bibliophile could treasure. Carrot picked up a torn copy of Waddley's Occult Primer. Several loose pages fell out. Angua picked one up. Chapter 15, Elementary Necromancy, she read aloud. Lesson 1, Correct Use of Shovel. She put it down again and sniffed the air. The presence of the librarian filled the nasal room like an elephant in a matchbox, but... Someone else has been in here, she said, in the last couple of days. Could you leave us, sir? When it comes to odours, you're a bit, um, forthright. Ooh. The librarian nodded at Carrot shrugged at Angua, and ambled out. Don't move, said Angua. Stay right where you are, Carrot. Don't disturb the air. She inched forward carefully. Her ears told her the librarian was down the corridor because she could hear the floorboards creaking, but her nose told her that he was still here. He was a little fuzzy, but... I'm going to have to change, she said. I can't get a proper picture this way. It's too strange. Carrot obediently shut his eyes. She'd forbidden him to watch her en route from a human to a wolf 
because of the unpleasant nature of the shapes in between. Back in Überwald, people went from one shape to the other as naturally as ordinary humans would put on a different coat, but even there it was considered polite to do it behind a bush. When he reopened them, Angua was slinking forward, her whole being concentrated in her nose. The olfactory presence of the librarian was a complex shape, a mere purple blur where he had been moving, but almost a solid figure where he'd been standing still. Hands, face, lips. They'd be just the center of an expanding cloud in a few hours' time, but now she could still smell them out. There must be only the tiniest air currents in here. There weren't even any flies buzzing in the dead air to cause a ripple of disturbance. She edged nearer to the window. Vision was a mere shadowy presence, providing a charcoal sketch of a room over which the scents painted their glorious colors. By the window. By the window, yes. A man had stood there, and by the scent of it he hadn't moved for some time. The smell wavered in the air on the edge of her nasal skill. The curling, billowing traces said that the window had been opened and closed again, and was there just the merest, tiniest suggestion that he'd held an arm out in front of him? Her nose raced, trying to form original shapes from the patterns hanging in the room like dead smoke. When she'd finished, Angua went back to her pile of clothes and coughed politely while she was pulling on her boots. There was a man standing by the window, she said. Long hair, a bit dry, stinks of expensive shampoo. He was the man who nailed the boards back after Rossi got into the barbican. Are you sure? Is this nose ever wrong? Sorry. Go on. I'd say he was heavy set, a bit bulky for his height. He doesn't wash a lot, but when he does, he uses Windpike soap, the cheap brand, but expensive shampoo, which is odd, quite new boots and a green coat. You can smell the colour? No, the dye. It comes from Stolat, I think, and I think he shot a bow. An expensive bow. There's a hint of silk in the air, and that's what the strongest bowstrings are made of, isn't it? And you wouldn't put one of those on a cheap bow. Carrot stood by the window. He got a good view, he said, and looked down at the floor, and then at the sill, and on the shelves nearby. How long was he here? Two or three hours, I'd say. He didn't move around much? No. Or smoke? Or spit? He just stood and waited. A professional. Mr. Vimes was right. A lot more professional than Ozzy, said Angua. Green coat, said Carrot, as if thinking aloud. Green coat. Green coat. Oh, and bad dandruff, said Angua, standing up. Snowy slopes, shouted Carrot. What? Really bad dandruff? Oh, yes, it was. That's why they called him Snowy, said Carrot. Daceyville slopes, the man with the reinforced comb. But I'd heard he'd moved to Stolat. In unison, they said, where the dye comes from. Is he good with a bow? said Angua. Very good. He's good at killing people he never met, too. He's an assassin, is he? Oh, no, he just kills people for money. No style. Snowy can't read and write. Carrot scratched his head in sympathetic recollection. He doesn't even look at complicated pictures. We'd have got him last year, but he shook his head fast and got away while we were trying to dig out Nobby. Well, well, I wonder where he's staying. Don't ask me to follow him in these streets. Thousands of people will have walked over the trail. Oh, there's people who will know. Someone sees everything in this town. Mr. Slopes. Snowy Slopes gingerly felt his neck, or at least the neck of his soul. The human soul tends to keep the shape of the original body for some time after death. Habit is a wonderful thing. Ah, who the hell was he? he said. Not someone you know, said Death. Well, no, I don't know many people who cut my head off. Snowy Slopes' body had knocked against the table as it fell. Several bottles of medicated shampoo now dripped and mixed their contents onto the other more intimate fluids from the Slopes' corpse. That stuff with a special oil in it cost me nearly four dollars, said Snowy, yet somehow it all seemed slightly irrelevant now. Death happens to other people. The other person in this case had been him. That is, the one down there, not the one standing here looking at it. In life, Snowy hadn't even been able to spell metaphysical, 
but he was already beginning to view life in a different way. From the outside, for a start. Four dollars, he repeated. I never even had time to try it. It wouldn't have worked, said Death, patting the man on a fading shoulder. But if I might suggest that you look on the bright side, it will no longer be necessary. No more dandruff, said Snowy, now quite transparent and fading fast. Ever, said Death. Trust me on this. Commander Vimes ran down the darkened streets, trying to buckle on his breastplate as he ran. All right, Cheery, what's happening? They say a Clatchian killed someone, sir. There's a mob up in Scandal Alley, and it's looking bad. I was on the desk, and I thought you ought to be told, sir. Right. And anyway, I couldn't find Captain Carrot, sir. A little bit of acid ink scribbled its subtle entry on the ledger of Vimes' soul. Oh, gods. And so who's the officer in charge? Sergeant Detritus, sir. It seemed to the dwarf that she was suddenly standing still. Commander Vimes had become a rapidly disappearing blur. With the calm expression of someone who was methodically doing his duty, Detritus picked up a man and used him to hit some other men. When he had a clear area around him and a groaning heap of former rioters, he climbed the heap and cupped his hands around his mouth. Listen to me, ye people! A troll shouting at the top of his voice could easily be heard above a riot. When he seemed to have their attention, he pulled a scroll out of his breastplate and waved it over his head. This is the riot act! He said, You know what that means? It means if an I reads it out and you don't disp disp uh, go away, the watch can use deadly force. You understand? <clears throat> what did you just use then? moaned someone from underneath his feet. That was you helping the watch, said Detritus, shifting his weight. He unrolled the scroll. Although there was some scuffling in alleyways and shouts from the next street, a ring of silence expanded outwards from the troll. An almost genetic component of the citizens of Ankh Morpork was their ability to spot an opportunity for amusement. Detritus held the document at arm's length, and then, a few inches from his face, he tried turning it round a few times. His lips moved unsteadily. Finally, he leaned down and showed it to Constable Visit. What's this word? That's whereby, Sergeant. I knew that. He straightened up again. Whereby it is. Beads of the troll equivalent of sweat began to form on Detritus's forehead. Whereby it is acknowledged. Acknowledged, whispered Constable Visit. I knew that. Detritus stared at the paper again and then gave up. "'You don't want to stand here listening to me all day,' he bellowed. "'This is the riot act, and you've all got to read it, right? Pass it round.' "'What if we don't read it?' said a voice in the crowd. "'You've got to read it. It's legal.' "'And then what happens?' "'Then I shoot you,' said Detritus. "'That's not allowed,' said another voice. "'You've got to shout, "'Stop, armed watchman first. Sure, that suits me, said Detritus. He shrugged one huge shoulder to bring his crossbow under his arm. It was a siege bow, intended to be mounted on the cart. The bolt was six feet long. It's harder to hit running targets. He released the safety catch. Anyone finishing reading that thing yet? Sergeant! Vimes pushed his way through the crowd, and it was a crowd now. Ankh Morpork was always a good audience. There was a clang as Detritus saluted. Were you proposing to shoot these people in cold blood, Sergeant? No, sir. Just a warning shot in the head, sir. Really? Just give me a moment to talk to them, then. Vimes looked at the man next to him. He was holding a flaming torch in one hand and a long length of wood in the other. He gave Vimes the nervously defiant stare of someone who has just felt the ground shift under his feet. Vimes pulled the torch towards him and lit a cigar. What's happening here, friend? The Clatchians have been shooting people, Mr. Vimes. Unprovoked attack. Really? People have been killed. Who? I, uh, there were... Everyone knows they've been killing people. The man's mental footsteps found safer ground. What do they think they are? Coming over here. That's enough, said Vimes. He stood back and raised his voice. I recognise a lot of you, he said, and I know you've got homes to go to. 
See this? He pulled his baton of office out of his pocket. This says I've got to keep the peace. So in ten seconds I'm going somewhere else to find some peace to keep. But detritus is going to stay here. And I just hope he doesn't do anything to disgrace the uniform. Or get it very dirty, at least. Irony was not a degree-level subject among the listeners, but the brighter ones recognised Vime's expression. It said that he was a man hanging on to his patience by his teeth. The mob dispersed, going ragged at the edges as people legged it down side alleys, threw away their makeshift weapons, and emerged at the other end, walking the grave, thoughtful walk of honest citizens. All right, what happened? said Vimes, turning to the troll. We're hearing where this boy shot this man, said Detritus. We got here. Next minute it's raining people from everywhere shouting. He smote him, as Hudrun smote the flesh pots of her, said Constable Visit. Constable Visit the Ungodly with Explanatory Pamphlets was a good copper, Vimes always said, and that was his highest term of praise. He was an omnian with his countryman's almost pathological interest in evangelical religion, and spent all his wages on pamphlets. He even had his own printing press. The results were handed out to anyone interested, and everyone who wasn't interested as well. Even detritus couldn't clear a crowd faster than visit, Vimes said. And on his days off he could be seen tramping the streets with his colleague, smite the unbeliever with cunning arguments. So far they hadn't made a single convert. Vimes thought that Visit was probably a really nice man underneath it all, but somehow he could never face the task of finding out. Smote, said Vimes, bewildered. He killed someone. Not by the way the man was cursing, sir, said Detritus. Hit him in the arm. His friends brought him round the watch house to complain. He's a baker on the night shift. He said he was late for work. He come running in to pick up his dinner. Next minute he's flat on the floor. Vimes walked across the street and tried the door of the shop. It opened a little way, and then fetched up against what seemed to be a barricade. Furniture had been piled up against the window as well. How many people were there, Constable? A multitude thereof, sir. And four people in here, thought Vimes. A family. The door moved a fraction, and Vimes realised he was ducking even before the crossbow protruded. There was the thung of the string. The bolt tumbled rather than sped. It corkscrewed wildly across the alley, and was almost moving sideways when it hit the opposite wall. Look, said Vimes, keeping his body down but raising his voice, anyone who got hit with that, it must have been an accident. This is the watch. Open the door, otherwise Detritus will open it. And when he opens the door, it stays open. You know what I mean? There was no reply. All right. Detritus, just step over here. There was a hissed argument inside, and then the sound of scraping as furniture was moved. He tried the door. It swung inwards. The family were at the far end of the room. Vimes felt eight eyes on him. The atmosphere had a hot, worrying feel, spiced with the smell of burnt food. Mr. Goriff was holding the crossbow gingerly, and the expression on his son's face told Vimes a lot of what he needed to know. All right, he said. Now you all listen to me. I'm not arresting anyone right now, you hear? This sounds like one of those things that make his lordship yawn. But you'd do better spending the rest of the night in the watch-house. I can't spare the men to stand guard here. Do you understand? I could arrest you, but this is just a request. Mr. Goriff cleared his throat. The man I shot, he began, and left the question and the lie hanging in the air. Vimes forced himself not to glance at the boy. Not badly hurt, he said. He... Ran in, said Mr. Goriff, and after last night, you thought you were being attacked again and grabbed the crossbow. Yes, said the boy defiantly before his father could speak. There was a brief argument in Clatchian. Then Mr. Goriff said, We must leave the house for your own good. We'll try to have someone watch it. Now get something together and go off with the sergeant, and give me that crossbow. Goriff handed it over with a look of relief. It was a typical Saturday night special, so badly made and erratic that the only safe place to be when it was fired would be directly behind it, and even then you would be running a risk. And then no one had told its owner that under the counter, in a steamy shop and a perpetual rain of grease, wasn't the best place to keep it strung. The string sagged. Probably the only way you could reliably hurt someone with it was to beat them over the head. Vimes waited until they'd been ushered out and took a last look around the room. It wasn't large. In the kitchen behind the shop, something spicy in a pot was boiling dry. 
After burning his fingers a couple of times, he managed to tip the pot onto the fire to put it out, and then, vaguely remembering his mother doing something like this, put the pot under the pump to soak. Then he barricaded the windows as best he could and went out, locking the door behind him. A discreetly obvious Brass Thieves Guild plaque over the door told the world that Mr. Gorriff had conscientiously paid his annual fee and would not therefore be officially burgled. Ankh Morpork had a very direct approach to the idea of insurance. When the middleman was cut out, that wasn't a figure of speech. But the world had plenty of less formal dangers, and so Vimes took a piece of chalk out of his pocket and wrote on the door, Under the Protection of the Watch. As an afterthought, he signed it. Sergeant Detritus. In the imaginations of the less civically minded, the majesty of the rule of law didn't carry anything like as much weight as the dread of Detritus. The Riot Act. Where the hell had he dredged that from? Carrot, probably. It hadn't been used for as long as Vimes could remember, and that was no wonder when you knew what it really did. Even Veterinari would hesitate to use it. Now it was nothing more than a phrase. Thank goodness for trollishy literacy. It was when Vimes stood back to admire his handiwork that he saw the glow in the sky over Park Lane almost at the same time as he heard the clatter of iron boots on the street. Oh, hello, little bottom, he said. What now? Don't tell me. Someone set fire to the Clatchian embassy. All right, sir, said the dwarf. She stood uncertainly in the middle of the alley, looking worried. Well, said Vimes, er, uh, you said... With a sinking feeling, Vimes remembered that the generic dwarfish skill with iron was matched only by the fumble-fingered grasp of irony. The Clatchian embassy is really on fire. Yes, sir. Mrs. Spent opened the door a crack. Yes? I'm a friend of... Carrot hesitated, wondering if Fred would have given his real name. Uh, big fat man, um, suit doesn't fit. The one who goes around with the sex maniac. Pardon? Skinny little twerp dresses like a clown. They said you'd have a room, said Carrot desperately. They've got it, said Mrs. Spent, trying to shut the door. They said I could use it. No subletting. They said I should pay you two dollars. The pressure of the door was released a little. On top of what they paid, said Mrs. Spent. Of course. Well, she looked Carrot up and down and sniffed. All right. What shift are you on? Sorry? You're a watchman, right? Er... Uh... Carrot hesitated and then raised his voice. No, I am not a watchman. Ha, 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 ha! You think I'm a watchman? Do I look like a watchman? Yes, you do, said Mrs. Spent. You're Captain Carrot. I've seen you walking about the town. Still, I suppose even coppers have to sleep somewhere. On the roof, Angua rolled her eyes. No women, no cooking, no music, no pets, said Mrs. Spent as she led the way up the creaking stairs. Angua waited in the dark until she heard the window open. She's gone, Carrot hissed. There's glass on the tiles out here, just like Fred reported, said Angua, as she swung herself over the sill. Inside the room she took a deep breath and shut her eyes. First she had to forget the smell of Carrot, anxious sweat, soap, the lingering hints of armour polish. And Fred Colon... All perspiration with a hint of beer, and then the odd ointment Nobby used for his skin condition, and the smells of feet, bodies, clothes, polish, fingernails. After an hour, it was possible for the eye of the nose to see someone walk across the room, frozen in time by their smell. But after a day, smells crisscrossed and entangled. You had to take them apart, remove the familiar pieces, and what you had left... Oh, they're so mixed up. All right, all right said Carrot soothingly. At least three people, but I think one of them is Ossie. It's stronger round the bed, and... She opened her eyes wide and looked down at the floor. Somewhere here. What? What is? Angua crouched down with her nose just above the floorboards. I can smell it, but I can't see it. A knife appeared in front of her. Carrot got down on his knees and ran the blade along the dust-filled crack between the floorboards. Something splintery and brown popped up. It had been trodden on and rolled underfoot, but at this distance even Carrot could pick up traces of the clove smell. Do you think 
Ossie made a lot of apple pies, he whispered. No cooking, remember, said Angua, and grinned. There's something else. Carrot levered out more dirt and dust. In it, something glittered. Fred said all the glass was outside, didn't he? Yes. Well, supposing we assume that someone didn't pick up all the bits when they broke in. For someone that doesn't like lying, Carrot, you can be quite devious, you know. Just logical. There's glass outside the window, but all that means is that there is glass outside the window. Commander Vimes always says there's no such things as clues. It's how you look at them. You think someone broke in and then carefully put the glass outside? Could be. Carrot, why are we whispering? No women, remember? And no pets, said Angua. So she's got me coming and going. Don't look like that, she added when she saw his face. It's only bad taste if someone else says it. I'm allowed. Carrot scratched up some more glass fragments. Angua looked under the bed and pulled out the battered magazines. Ye gods, do people really read this stuff, she said, flicking through bows and ammo. Testing the Loxley Reflex 7 a whole lot of bow. Foot saw, we test the ten best caltrops. And what's this magazine? Warrior of Fortune. There's always little wars somewhere, said Carrot, pulling out the box of money. But will you look at the size of this axe here? Get a head, get a burly and strong in the arm street sweeper, and win by a neck. Well, it must be true what they say about men who like big weapons. And that is, said Carrot, lifting the lid of the box. She looked up at the top of his head. As always, Carrot radiated innocence like a small sun. But he'd, they'd, surely he... They, uh, they're rather small, she said. Oh, that's true, said Carrot, picking up some of the Clatchian coins. Look at dwarfs, never happier than with a chopper the same size as them. And Nobby's fascinated by weapons, and he's practically dwarf-sized. Um... Technically, Angua was sure she knew Carrot better than anyone else. She was pretty sure he cared a lot for her. He seldom said so, he just assumed that she knew. She'd known other men, although turning into a wolf for part of the month was one of those little flaws that could put any normal man off, and up until Carrot always had. And she knew the sort of things men said in what might be called the heat of the moment and then forgot. But when Carrot said things... You knew that he felt that everything was now settled until further notice. So if she made any comment, he'd be genuinely surprised that she'd forgotten what it was he had said, and would probably quote date and time. And yet all the time there was this feeling that the greater part of him was always deep, deep inside, looking out. No one could be so simple, no one could be so creatively dumb, without being very intelligent. It was like being an actor, only a very good actor was any good at being a bad actor. Rather a lonely person, our Nobby, said Carrot. Well, yes, but I'm sure he'll find the right person for him, Carrot added cheerfully. Probably in a bottle, said Angua to herself. She remembered the conversation with him. It was a terrible thing to think, but there was something itchy about the thought of Nobby being allowed in the gene pool, even at the shallow end. You know, these coins are odd, said Carrot. How do you mean? said Angua, grateful for the distraction. Why would he be paid in Clatchian walls? He wouldn't be able to spend them here, and the money changers don't give very good rates. Carrot tossed a coin in the air and caught it. When we were leaving, Mr. Vimes said to me, make sure you find the bunch of dates and the camel hidden under the pillow. I think I know what he meant. Sand on the floor, said Angua. Now isn't that an obvious clue? You can tell they were Clatchians because of the sand in their sandals. But these clothes, Carrot prodded the little bud, it's not as if it's a common habit, even among Clatchians. That's not a very obvious clue, is it? It smells newer, said Angua. I'd say he was here last night. After Ossie was dead? Yes. Why? How should I know? What kind of name is Seventy-One Hour Ahmed? said Angua. Carrot shrugged. I don't know. I think Mr. Vimes thinks that someone in Ankh Morpork wants us to believe that Clatchians paid to have the prince killed. That sounds nasty, but logical. But I don't understand why a real Clatchian would get involved. Their eyes met. Politics, they said together. 
For enough money, a lot of people would do anything, said Angua. There was a sudden and ferocious knocking at the door. Have you got someone in there? said Mrs. Spent. Out of the window, said Carrot. Why don't I just stay and rip her throat out, said Angua. All right, all right, it was a joke, all right, she said, swinging her legs over the sill. Ark Morpork no longer had a fire brigade. The citizens had a rather disturbingly direct way of thinking at times, and it didn't take long for people to see the rather obvious flaw in paying a group of people by the number of fires they put out. The penny really dropped shortly after Charcoal Tuesday. Since then, they had relied on the good old principle of enlightened self-interest. People living close to a burning building did their best to douse the fire, because the thatch they saved might be their own. But the crowd watching the burning embassy were doing so in a hollow-eyed, distant way, as if it was all taking place on some distant planet. They moved aside automatically as Vimes elbowed his way through to the space in front of the gates. Flames were already licking from every ground-floor window, and they could make out scurrying silhouettes in the flickering light. He turned to the crowd. Come on, what's up with you? Get a bucket chain going! It's their bloody embassy, said a voice. Yes, clatchy and soil, right? Can't go on clatchy and soil. That'd be an invasion, that would. They wouldn't let us, said a small boy holding a bucket. Vimes looked at the embassy gateway. There were a couple of guards. Their worried glances kept going back from the fire behind them to the crowd in front. They were nervous men, but it was much worse than that, because they were nervous men holding big swords. He advanced on them, trying to smile, and holding his badge out in front of him. It had a shield on it. It was not a very big shield. Commander Vimes, Ark Morpork City Watch, he said, in what he hoped was a helpful and friendly voice. A guard waved him away. <laughs> You'll be off. Ah, said Vimes. He looked down at the cobbles of the gateway, and then back up at the guard. Somewhere in the flames, someone was screaming. You, come here. You see this? he shouted at the guard, pointing down. The man took a hesitant step forward. That's Ark Morpork soil down there, my friend, said Vimes, and you're standing on it, and you're obstructing me in my— He rammed his fist as hard as he could into the guard's stomach. Duty! He was already kicking out as the other guard rushed him. He caught him on the knee. Something went click. It felt like Vimes' own ankle. Cursing and limping slightly, he ran on into the embassy and caught a scurrying man by his robe. Are there still people in there? Are there people in there? The man gave Vimes a panicky look. The armfuls of paper he'd been carrying spilled onto the ground. Someone else grabbed his shoulder. Can you climb, Mr. Vimes? Who are you? The newcomer turned to the cowering paper carrier and struck him heavily across the face. Rescuer of paper? As the man fell back, his turban was snatched from his head. This way! The figure plunged off through the smoke. Vimes hurried after him until they reached a wall with a drainpipe attached. How did you— Up! Up! Vimes put one foot in the man's cupped hands, managed to get the other one on a bracket, and forced himself upwards. Hurry! He managed to half-climb, half-pull himself up the pipe, little fireworks of pain exploding up and down his leg, as he reached a parapet and hauled himself over. The other man rose behind him, as if he'd run up the wall. There was a strip of cloth hiding the lower half of his face. He thrust another strip towards Vimes. Across your nose and mouth, he commanded, for the smoke. It was boiling across the roof. Beside Vimes, a chimney pot gushed a roaring tongue of flame. The rest of the unwound turban was thrust into his hands. You take this side, I'll take the other, said the apparition, and darted away again into the smoke. But who— Vimes could feel the heat through his boots. He edged away across the roof and heard the shouting coming from below. When he leaned over the edge here, he could see the window some way below him. Someone had smashed a pane because a hand was waving. There was more commotion down in the courtyard. Amid a press of figures, he could make out the huge shape of Constable Dorfel, a golem, and quite definitely fireproof. But Dorfel was bad enough at stairs as it was. There weren't many that could take the weight. The hand in the smoke stopped waving. Vimes looked down again. Can you fly, Mr. Vimes? He looked at the chimney, belching flame. He looked at the unwound turban. A lot of Sam Vimes's brain had shut down, although the bits relaying the twinges of pain from his legs were operating with distressing efficiency. But there were still some thoughts operating down around the core, and they delivered for his consideration the insight, tough-looking cloth. He looked back at the chimney. It looked stout enough. The window was about six feet below. Vimes began to move automatically. 
So, purely theoretically, if a man were to wrap one end of the cloth round the belching stack like this, and pay it out like this, and lower himself over the parapet like this, and kick himself away from the wall like this, then, when he swung back again, his feet ought to be able to smash his way through the other panes of the window like this. A cart squeaked along the wet street. Its progress was erratic, because no two of its wheels were the same size, so it rocked and wobbled and skidded, and probably involved more effort to pull than it saved overall, especially since its contents appeared to be rubbish. But then so did its owner, who was about the size of a man, but bent almost double, and was covered with hair, or rags, or quite possibly a matted mixture of both, that was so felted and unwashed that small plants had taken root on it. If the thing had stopped walking and crouched down, it would have given an astonishingly good impression of a long-neglected compost heap. As it walked along, it snuffled. A foot was stuck out to impede its progress. "'Good evening, Stooley,' said Carrot, as the cart halted. The heap stopped. Part of it tilted upwards. "'Get off,' it muttered from somewhere in the thatch. "'Now, now, Stooley, let's help one another, shall we? You help me, and I'll help you.' "'Bugger off, Captain.' "'Will you tell me things I want to know?' said Carrot, "'and I won't search your cart.' "'I hate gnolls,' said Angua. "'They smell awful.' "'Oh, that's hardly fair. "'The streets would be a lot dirtier without you and yours, eh, Stooley?' said Carrot, still speaking quite pleasantly. "'You pick up this, you pick up that. "'Maybe bash it against a wall until it stops struggling.' <laughs> "'Survile accuracy,' said the gnoll. "'There was a bubbling noise that might have been a chuckle.' "'So I'm hearing you might know where Snowy Slopes is these days,' said Carrot. nothing. Fine. Carrot produced a three-tined garden fork and walked round to the cart, which dripped. nothing about said the gnoll quickly. "'Yes,' said Carrot, fork poised. "'Nothing about in the sweet shop, in the money trip lane.' The one with the rooms to let sign? Right. Well done. Thank you for being a good citizen, said Carrot. Incidentally, we passed a dead seagull on the way here. It's in Brewer Street. But if you hurried, you could beat the rush. Hut diggity, snuffled the gnoll. The cart started to judder forward. The watchman watched it lurch and scrape around the corner. They're good fellows at heart, said Carrot. I think it says a lot for the spirit of tolerance in this city that even gnolls can call it home. They turn my stomach, said Angua, as they set off again. That one had plants growing on him. Mr. Vimes says we ought to do something for them, said Carrot. Fool heart, that man. With a flamethrower, he says. Wouldn't work. Too soggy. Has anyone ever really found out what they eat? It's better to think of them as cleaners. You certainly don't see as much rubbish and dead animals on the streets as you used to. Yes, but have you ever seen a gnoll with a brush and a shovel? Well, that's society for you, I'm afraid, said Carrot. Everything is dumped on the people below until you find someone who's prepared to eat it. That's what Mr. Vimes says. Yes, said Angua. They walked in silence for a while, and then she said, You care a lot about what Mr. Vimes says, don't you? He is a fine officer and an example to us all. And... You've never thought of getting a job in Quirm or somewhere, have you? The other cities are head-hunting Ankh-Morpork watchmen now. What? Leave Ankh-Morpork? The tone of voice included the answer. No, I suppose not, said Angua sadly. Anyway, I don't know what Mr. Vimes would do without me running around all the time. It's a point of view, certainly, said Angua. It wasn't far to Money Trap Lane. It was in a ghetto of what Lord Rust would probably call skilled artisans, the people too low down the social scale to be movers and shakers, but slightly too high to be easily moved or shook. The sanders and polishers, generally, the people who hadn't got very much but were proud even of that. There were little clues, shiny house numbers, for a start, and on the walls of houses that were effectively just one long continuous row, after centuries of building and inbuilding, very careful boundaries in the paint where people had brushed up to the very border of their property and not a gnat's blink to each side. Garrett always said it showed the people were the kind who instinctively realised that civilization was based on a shared respect for ownership. Angua thought they were just tight little bastards who'd sell you the time of day. 
Carrot walked noiselessly down the alley beside the sweet shop. There was a rough wooden staircase going up to the first floor. He pointed silently to the midden below it. It seemed to consist almost entirely of bottles. Big drinker? Angua mouthed. Carrot shook his head. She crouched down and looked at the labels, but her nose was already giving her a hint. Dibbler's homeopathic shampoo. Mia and Stingbat's herbal wash with herbs. Rinse and run scalp tonic with extra herbs. There were others. Herbs, she thought. Chuck a handful of weeds in the pot and you've got herbs. Carrot was starting up the stairs when she put her hand on his shoulder. There was another smell. It was the one that drove through all the other scents of the streets like a spear. It was one that a werewolf's nose is particularly attuned to. He nodded and went carefully to the door. Then he pointed down. There was a stain under the gap. Carrot drew his sword and kicked the door open. Daisyville Slopes hadn't taken his condition lightly. Bottles of all shapes and colours occupied most flat surfaces, giving testimony to the alchemist's art and humanity's optimism. The suds of his latest experiment were still in a bowl on the table, and his body on the floor had a towel around his neck. The watchman looked down at it. Snowy had cleaned, washed, and gone. I think we can say life is extinct, said Carrot. Yuck, said Angua. She grabbed the open shampoo bottle and sniffed deeply. The sickly scent of marinated herbs assailed her sinuses, but anything was better than the sharp, beguiling smell of blood. I wonder where his head is at, said Carrot, in a determinedly matter-of-fact voice. Oh, it's rolled over there. What's the horrible smell? This. Angua flourished the shampoo. Four dollars a bottle, it says. Shit. Angua took another deep sniff at the herbal goo to drown out the call of the wolf. Doesn't look as if they stole anything, said Carrot, unless they were very neat. What's the matter? Don't ask. She managed to get a window open and sucked down great draughts of comparatively fresh air, while Carrot went through the corpse's pockets. Er, uh, you can't tell if there's a clove around, can you? he said. Carrot, please, this is a room with blood all over the floor. Have you any idea? Excuse me. She rushed out and down the steps. The alley had the generic smell of all alleys everywhere, overlaid on the basic all-embracing smell of the city. But at least it didn't make your hair grow and your teeth try to lengthen. She leaned against the wall and fought for control. Shampoo? She could have saved Snowy a hell of a lot of money with just one careful bite. Then he'd know all about a really bad hair day. Carrot came down a couple of minutes later, locking the door behind him. Are you feeling better? A bit. There was something else, said Carrot, looking thoughtful. I think he wrote a note before he died, but it's all rather odd. He waved in the air what looked like a cheap notepad. This needs careful looking at. He shook his head. Poor old Snowy. He was a killer. Yes, but that's a nasty way to die. Decapitation? With a very sharp sword, by the look of it. I can think of worse. Yes, but I can't help thinking that if only the chap had better hair or had found the right shampoo at an early age, he'd have led a different life. Well, at least he won't have to worry about dandruff any more. That was a little tasteless. Sorry, but you know how blood makes me tense. Your hair always looks amazing, said Carrot, changing the subject, with Angua thought unusual tact. I don't know what you use, but it's a shame he never tried it. I doubt he went to the right shop, said Angua. It says, for a glossy coat, on the bottles I usually buy. What's the matter? Can you smell smoke, said Carrot? Carrot, it's going to be five minutes before I can smell anything, except but he was staring past her at the big red glow in the sky. Vimes coughed, and then coughed some more, and eventually opened his streaming eyes in the confident expectation of seeing his own lungs in front of him. Glass of water, Mr. Vimes? Vimes peered through the tears at the shifting shape of Fred Colon. Thanks, Fred. What's the horrible burning smell? It's you, sir. Vimes was sitting on a low wall outside the wreck of the embassy. Cool air washed around him. He felt like underdone beef. The heat was radiating off him. You was passed on for a while there, sir, said Sergeant Colon, helpfully. But everyone saw you swing in that window, sir, and you threw that woman out for the detritus to catch. That'll be a feather in your cap and no mistake, sir. 
I bet the raghead, uh, I bet the uh, Clatchians will be giving you the order of the camel or something for this night's work, sir. Colon beamed, bursting with pride by association. A feather in my cap, murmured Vimes. He undid his helmet and with a certain amount of exhausted delight saw that every single plume had been burnt to a stub. He blinked slowly. What about the man, Fred? Did he get out? What man? There was... Vimes blinked again. Various parts of his body, aware that he hadn't been taking calls, were ringing in to complain. There had been some man. Vimes had landed on a bed or something, and there was a woman clutching at him, and he had smashed out at what was left of the window, seen the big, broad, and above all strong arms of detritus down below, and had thrown her out as politely as the circumstances allowed. Then the man from the roof had come out of the smoke again, carrying another figure over his shoulder, screaming something at him, and beckoned him to follow, and then the floor had given way. There were two other people in there, he said, coughing again. They didn't get out the front way, then, said Colin. How did I get out, said Vimes. Oh, Dorful was stamping on the fire below, sir. Very handy, a ceramic constable. You landed right on him, so of course he stopped what he was doing and brought you out. It's going to be handshakes and buns all round in the morning, sir. There weren't any right now, Vimes noted. There were still plenty of people around, carrying bundles, putting out small fires, arguing with one another but there was a big hole where the congratulating the hero of the hour should have been. "'Oh, everyone's always a bit preoccupied after something like this, sir,' said Colin, as if reading his thoughts. "'I think I'll have a nice cold bath,' said Vimes to the world in general, "'and then some sleep. Sybil's got some wonderful ointment for burns. "'Oh, hello, you two. "'We saw the fire,' Carrot began running up. "'Is it all over?' "'Mr. Vimes saved the day,' said Sergeant Colon excitedly. "'Just went straight in and saved everyone, in the finest tradition of the watch.' "'Fred,' said Vimes wearily. "'Yes, sir. "'Fred, the finest tradition of the watch, is having a quiet smoke somewhere out of the wind at 3 a.m. "'Let's not get carried away, eh?' "'Colon looked crestfallen. "'Well,' he began. "'Vimes staggered to his feet and patted his sergeant on the back. Oh, all right, it's a tradition, he conceded. You can do the next one, Fred. And now, he steadied himself as he stood up, I'm going down to the yard to write my report. You're covered in ash and you're swaying, said Carrot. I should just get on home, sir. Oh, no, said Vimes. Got to do the paperwork. Anyone know the time? Bingly, 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 beep, said a cheerful voice from his pocket. Damn, said Vimes, but it was too late. It is, said the voice which had the squeaky, friendly quality that begs to be strangled. About nine-ish. Nine-ish? Yep. Nine-ish. Precisely about nine-ish. Vimes rolled his eyes. Precisely about nine-ish, he said, pulling a small box out of his pocket and opening the lid. The demon inside gave him an angry look. Yesterday you said, it said, that if I, and I quote, didn't stop all that eight, fifty-six, and six seconds precisely business, I would be looking at a hammer from below. And when I said, Mr. Insert Name Here, that this would invalidate my warranty, you said that I could take my warranty and shove... I thought you'd lost that thing, said Carrot. Ha! said the disorganiser. Really? You thought he did? I don't call putting something in your trouser pockets just before they go into the wash losing it. That was an accident, muttered Vimes. Oh, oh, and dropping me in the dragon's feeding bowl, that was accidental too, was it? The demon mumbled to itself for a moment and then said, Anyway, do you want to know your appointments for this evening? Vimes looked at the smouldering wreckage of the embassy. Do tell, he said. You don't have any, said the demon sulkily. You haven't told me any. You see, said Vimes, that's what drives me livid. Why should I have to tell you? Why didn't you tell me, eight-ish, break up riot at mundane meals and stop to try to shooting people, eh? You didn't tell me to tell you. I didn't, no. And that's how real life works. How can I tell you to warn me about things that no one knows are going to happen? If you were any good, that'd be your job. He writes in the manual said the demon nastily. Did you know that, everybody? He writes in the manual. 
Well, of course, I make notes. He's actually sneakily trying to keep his diary in the manual so his wife won't find out he's never bothered to learn how to use me, said the demon. What about the Vimes manual, then? snapped Vimes. I notice you've never bothered to learn how to use me. The demon hesitated. Humans come with a manual, it said. it will be a damn good idea, said Vimes. True, murmured Angua. It could say things like, Chapter One, Bingley, Bingley, Beep, and other damn fool things to spring on people at six in the morning, said Vimes, his eyes wild. And troubleshooting. My owner keeps trying to drop me in the privy. What am I doing wrong? And Carrot patted him gently on the back. I should sign off now, sir, he said gently. It's been a busy few days. Vimes rubbed his forehead. I dare say I could do with the rest, he said. Come on, there's nothing more to see here. Let's go home. I thought you said you weren't going, Carrot began, but Vimes's mind was already scolding him. I meant the yard, of course he said. I'll go home afterwards. A ball of lamplight floated through the Ramkin library, drifting across the shelves of huge leather-bound books. Many of them had never been read, Sybil knew. Various ancestors had simply ordered them from the engravers and put them on the shelves because a library was something you had to have, don't you know, like a stable yard and a servant's wing and some ghastly landscaping mistake created by bloody stupid Johnson, although in the latter case her grandfather had shot the man before he could do any real damage. She held the lamp higher. Ramkins looked down their noses at her from their frames through the brown varnish of the centuries. Portraits were another thing that had been collected out of unregarded habit. Most of them were men. They were invariably in armour and always on horseback and every single one of them had fought the sworn enemies of Ankh Morpork. In recent times this had been quite difficult, and her grandfather, for example, had to lead an expedition all the way to Hawondaland in order to find some sworn enemies, although there was an adequate supply and a lot of swearing by the time he left. Earlier, of course, it had been a lot easier. Ramkin regiments had fought the city's enemies all over the Stow Plains, and had inflicted heroic casualties, quite often on people in the opposing armies. It is a long-cherished tradition among a certain type of military thinker that huge casualties are the main thing. If they're on the other side, then this is a valuable bonus. There were a few women among the sitters, none of them holding anything heavier than a glove or a small pet dragon. Their job had largely been to roll bandages and await the return of their husbands with, she likes to think, resolution and fortitude and a general hope that said husbands would return with as many of their bits as possible. The point was, though, that they never thought about it. There was a war, and off they went. If there wasn't a war, they looked for one. They didn't even use words like duty. It was all built in, at bone level. She sighed. It was all so difficult these days, and Lady Sybil came from a class that was not used to difficulty, or at least the kind that couldn't be sorted out by shouting at a servant. Five hundred years ago, one of her ancestors had cut off a Clatchian's head in battle, and had brought it home on a pole, and no one thought any the worse of him, given what the Clatchians would have cut off if they'd caught him. That seemed straightforward. You fought them, they fought you. Everyone knew the rules, and if you got your head cut off, you jolly well didn't blub about it afterwards. Certainly things were better now, but they were just more difficult. And, of course, some of those antique husbands were away for months or years at a time, and for them wives and families were pretty much like the library and stable yard and the Johnson exploding pagoda. You got them sorted out and then didn't think much about it. At least Sam was home every day. Well, most days. Every night, anyway. Well, part of most nights, certainly. At least they ate meals together. Well, most meals. Well, at least they made a start on most meals. Well, at least... She knew he was never very far away, just somewhere where he was trying to do too much and run too fast and people were trying to kill him. All in all, she considered she was jolly lucky. Vimes stared at Carrot, who was standing in front of his desk. So, what does all that add up to? he said. The man we know didn't get the prince is dead. The man who probably did is dead. Someone tried very clumsily to make it look as if Ossie was paid by the Clatchians. OK, I can see why someone might want to do that. That's what Fred calls politics. They get Snowy to do the real business, 
and he helps poor dumb Ossie, who's there to take the fall, and then the watch proves that Ossie was in the pay of the Clatchians, and that's another reason for fighting. And Snowy just slopes off, only someone cured his dandruff for him. After he'd written something, sir, said Carrot. Ah, yes. Vimes looked at the notepad retrieved from Snowy's room. It was a crude affair, the wads of mismatched bits of scrap that the engravers sold off cheaply. He sniffed at it. Soap on the edges, he said. His new shampoo, said Carrot. First time he'd used it. How do you know? We looked at all the bottles on the heap, sir. Hmm. Looks like fresh blood here at the spine where they're stitched together. His, sir, said Angua. Vimes nodded. You never argued with Angua about blood. But none of the actual pages have blood on them, said Vimes, which is a bit odd. Messy business, decapitation. People tend to, uh, spray. So the top page has been taken away, sir, said Carrot, grinning and nodding. But that's not the funny part, sir. See if you can guess, sir. Vimes glared at him and then moved the lamp closer. Very faint impression of writing on the top page, he muttered. Can't make it out. We can't either, sir. We know he wrote in pencil, sir. There was one on the table. Very faint traces, said Vimes. Blokes like Snowy write as though they're chipping stone. He flicked the notebook. Someone tore out not just the page he'd written on, but several below it as well. Clever, eh, sir? Everyone knows you can read the suspicious note by looking at the marks on the page below, said Vimes. He tossed the book on the table again. Hmm. There's a message there, yes. Perhaps he was blackmailing whoever's behind all this, said Angua. That's not his style, said Vimes. No, what I meant was, there was a knock on the door, and Fred Colon entered. Bring you a mug of coffee, he said, and there's a bunch of what, uh, clutchins to see you downstairs, Mr. Vimes. Probably come to give you a medal and gabble at you in their lingo. And if you're on for late supper, Mrs. Gorriff's doing goat and rice and foreign gravy. I suppose I'd better go down and see them, said Vimes, but I haven't even had time for a wash. That's evidence of your heroic endeavours, said Colon stoutly. Oh, all right. Unease began about halfway down the stairs. Vimes had never run into a group of citizens wishing to give him a medal, and so he did not have a lot of experience on this score, but the group waiting for him in a tight cluster near the sergeant's desk did not look like a committee of welcome. They were Clatchian. At least they were wearing foreign-looking clothes, and one or two of them had caught more sun than you generally got in Ankh Morpork. The feeling crept over Vimes that Clatch was a very big place in which his city and the whole of the Stowe Plains would be lost, and so there must be room in it for all kinds of peoples, including this short chap in the red fez, who was practically vibrating with indignation. "'Are you the man Vimes?' the enfezed one demanded. "'Well, I'm Commander Vimes.' We demand the release of the Gaudi family, and we won't take any excuses. Vimes blinked. Release? You have locked them up and confiscated their shop. Vimes stared at the man, and then he looked across the room at Sergeant Detritus. Where did you put the family, Sergeant? Detritus saluted. In the cell, sir. Aha, said the man in the fez. You admit it. "'Excuse me, who are you?' said Vimes, blinking with tiredness. "'I don't have to tell you, and you can't beat it out of me,' said the man, sticking out his chest. "'Oh, thank you for telling me,' said Vimes. "'I do hate wasted effort.' "'Oh, hello, Mr. Wazir,' said Carrot, appearing behind Vimes. "'Did you get the note about that book?' There was one of those silences that happen when everyone has to reprogram their faces. Then Vimes said, "'What?' Mr. Wazir sells books in Widdy Street, said Carrot. Only I asked him for some books on Clatch, you see, and one of the ones he gave me was The Perfumed Allotment, or The Garden of Delights, and I didn't mind because the Clatchians invented gardens, sir, so I thought it might be a very useful cultural insight. Get inside the Clatchian mind, as it were. Only it, um, um, well, it wasn't about gardening. Er, uh, he started to blush. Yes, yes, all right. Bring it back if you like said Mr. Wazir, looking a little derailed. I just thought you ought to know, in case you hadn't, in case you sold, well, 
it, it, it could shock the impressionable, you know, a book like that. Yes, fine. Corporal Angua was so shocked she couldn't stop laughing, Carrot went on. I will have your money sent round directly, said Wazir. His expression turned vengeful again. He glared at Vimes. Books are unimportant at this time. We demand you release my countrymen now. Detritus, why the hell did you put them in the cells? said Vimes wearily. What else we got, sir? They're not locked in and they got clean blankets. There's your explanation, said Vimes. They're our guests. In the cells, said Wazir, relishing the word. They're free to go whenever they like, said Vimes. I'm sure they are now, said Wazir, contriving to indicate that only his arrival had prevented officially sanctioned bloodshed. You can be sure the patrician will hear about this. He hears about everything else, said Vimes. But if they leave here, who is going to protect them? We are their fellow countrymen. How? Wazir almost stood to attention. By force of arms, if necessary. Oh, good, said Vimes. Then there'll be two mobs. Bingly, 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 beep. Damn, Vimes slapped at his pocket. I don't want to know I haven't got any appointments. You have one at 11 p.m., the rat's chamber at the palace, said the disorganiser. Don't be stupid. Please yourself and shut up. I was just trying to help. Shut up. Vimes turned back to the Clatchian bookseller. Mr. Wazir, if Gorif wants to leave with you, we won't stop him. Aha! You may well try. Vimes told himself that there was no reason at all why a Clatchian couldn't be a pompous little troublemaker, but he felt uneasy about it, like a man edging along the side of a very deep crevasse. Sergeant Colon? Yes, sir. See to this, will you? Yes, sir. Diplomatically. Right, sir. Colon tapped the side of his nose. Is this politics, sir? Just, just go and fetch the Gory family and they can... Vimes waved a hand vaguely. They can do whatever they like. He turned and walked up the stairs. Someone has to protect my people's rights, shouted Wazir. They heard Vimes stop halfway up the stairs. The board creaked under his weight for a second. Then he continued upwards and several of the watchmen started breathing again. Vimes shut his office door behind him. Politics. He sat down and scrabbled through the papers. It was much easier to think about crime. Give him a good, honest crime any time. He tried to shut out the outside world. Somebody had beheaded Snowy Slopes. That was a fact. You couldn't put it down to a shaving accident or unreasonably strong shampoo. And Snowy had attempted to shoot the prince. And so had Ozzy. But Ozzy only thought he was an assassin. Everyone else thought he was a weird little twerp who was as impressionable as wet clay. A lovely idea, though. You used a real murderer, a nice, quiet professional, and then you had, Vimes smiled grimly, someone else to take the fall. And if he hadn't taken a less metaphorical fall, the poor twisted little sod would have believed he was the murderer. And the watch was supposed to believe it was a Clatchian plot. Sand in their sandals. The nerve of it. Did they think he was stupid? He wished Fred had carefully swept up the sand, because he was damn well going to find out who'd put it there, and they were going to eat it. Someone wanted Vimes to chase Clatchians. The man on the burning roof, did he fit in? Did he have to fit in? What could Vimes recall? A man in a robe, his face hidden, and a voice of a man not just used to giving commands, Vimes was used to giving commands, but also used to having commands obeyed whereas a member of the watch treated orders as suggestions. But some things didn't have to fit. That was where clues let you down, and the damned notebook. That was the oddest thing yet. So someone had carefully ripped out several pages after Snowy had written whatever he'd written. Someone bright enough to know the trick of looking at the pages underneath for faint impressions. So why not pinch the whole pad? It was all too complicated. But somewhere was the one thing that would make it simple, that would turn it all into sense. He flung down his pencil and wrenched open the door to the stairs. What the hell's all this noise? he yelled. Sergeant Colon was halfway up the stairs. It was Mr. Goriff and Mr. Wazir having a bit of what you might call an argy-bargy, sir. Someone set fire to someone else's country two hundred years ago, Carrot says. What? Just now? 
It's all clatchy into me, sir. Anyway, Wazir has gone off with his nose in a sling. Wazir comes from Smale, you see, said Carrot, and Mr. Gorith comes from El Harib, and the two countries only stopped fighting ten years ago. Religious differences. Run out of weapons, said Vimes. Ran out of rocks, sir. They ran out of weapons last century. Vimes shook his head. That always chews me up, he said. People killing one another just because their gods have squabbled. Oh, they've got the same god, sir. Apparently it's over a word in their holy book, sir. The El Haribians say it translates as God, and the Smailies say it's man. How can you mix them up? Well, there's only one tiny dot difference in the scripture, see, and some people reckon it's only a bit of fly dirt in any case. Centuries of war because a fly crapped in the wrong place. It could have been worse, said Carrot. If it had been slightly to the left, the word would have been licorice. Vimes shook his head. Carrot was good at picking up this sort of thing, and I know how to ask for Vindaloo, he thought. And it turns out that's just a Clatchian word, meaning mouth-scalding gristle for macho foreign idiots. I wish we understood more about Clatch, he said. Sergeant Colon tapped the side of his nose conspiratorially. Know the enemy, eh, sir? he said. Oh, I know the enemy, said Vimes. It's Clatchians I want to find out about. Commander Vimes? The watchman looked round. Vimes narrowed his eyes. You're one of Rust's men, aren't you? The young man saluted. Lieutenant Hornet, sir. He hesitated. Ah, uh, his lordship has sent me to ask you if you and your senior officers would be so good as to come to the palace at your convenience, sir. Really? Those were his words. The lieutenant decided that honesty was the only policy. In fact, he said, get Vimes and his mob up here right now, sir. Oh, he did, did he? said Vimes. Bingly, 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 beep, said a small triumphant voice from his pocket. The time is 11 p.m. precisely. The door opened before Nobby knocked, and a small stout woman glared out at him. Yes, I am, she snapped. Nobby stood with his hand still raised. Eh, uh, are you Mrs. Cake, he said. Yes, but I don't hold with doing it except for money. Nobby's hand did not move. Er, uh, you can tell the future, right? said Nobby. They stared at one another. Then Mrs. Cake thumped her own ear a couple of times and blinked. Drat, left my precognition on again. Her gaze unfocused for a moment as she replayed the recent conversation in the privacy of her head. I think we're sorted out, she said. She looked at Nobby and sniffed. You'd better come in. Mind the carpet, it's just been washed. And I can only give you ten minutes, cause I've got cabbage boiling. She led Corporal Nobbs into her tiny front room. A lot of it was occupied by a round table covered with a green cloth. There was a crystal ball on the table, not very well covered by a pink-knitted lady in a crinoline dress. Mrs. Cake motioned Nobby to sit down. He obediently did so. The smell of cabbage drifted through the room. A bloke in the pub told me about you, Nobby mumbled. Said you do, uh, mediuming. Would you care to tell me your problem, said Mrs. Cake. She looked at Nobby again, and in a state of certainty that had nothing to do with precognition and everything to do with observation, added, That is, which of your problems do you want to know about? Nobby coughed. Er, uh, <clears throat> it's a bit, you know, uh, intimate like affairs of the heart sort of thing. Are women involved? said Mrs. Cake cautiously. Er, uh, I hope so. Uh, what else is there? Mrs. Cake visibly relaxed. I just want to know if I'm going to meet any, Nobby went on. I see. Mrs. Cake gave a kind of facial shrug. It wasn't up to her to tell people how to waste their money. Well, there's the tenpenny future, that's what you see. Then there's the ten dollar future, that's what you get. Ten dollars? That's more than a week's pay. I'd better take the ten penny one. A very wise choice, said Mrs. Cake. Give me your paw. Hand, said Nobby. That's what I said. Mrs. Cake examined Nobby's outstretched palm while taking care not to touch it. Are you going to moan and roll your eyes and stuff, said Nobby, a man out to get his ten pennyworth. 
I don't have to take cheek, said Mrs. Cake, without looking up. That sort of... She peered closer, and then gave Nobby a sharp look. Have you been playing with this hand? Pardon? Mrs. Cake whipped the crinoline lady off the crystal and glared into the depths. After a while, she shook her head. I don't know, I'm sure. Oh, well. She cleared her throat and spoke in a more sibyllic voice. Mr. Nobbs, I see you surrounded by dusky ladies in a hot place. Looks a bit foreign to me. They're laughing and chatting with you. In fact, one of them's just handed you a drink. None of them are uh, shouting or anything, are they? said Nobby, mystified. Doesn't look like it, said Mrs. Cake, equally fascinated. They seem quite happy. You can't see any uh, magnets. What are they? Dunno, Nobby admitted. I suspect you'd know them if you saw them. Mrs. Cake, despite a certain rigidity of character, couldn't help but be aware of a drift in Nobby's speculation. Some of the ladies look, uh, nubile, she hinted. Oh, right, said Nobby, his expression not changing in any way. If you understand what I mean. Right, yes, uh, nubile, right. Mrs. Cake gave up. Nobby counted out ten pennies. And that'll be soon, will it? said Nobby. Oh, yes, I can't see very far for tenpence. Happy young ladies, mused Nobby. Nubile, too. Definitely something to think about. After he'd gone, Mrs. Cake went back to her crystal and sneaked a whole ten dollars' worth of precognition for her own curiosity and satisfaction, and laughed about it all afternoon. Vimes was only half surprised when the doors to the rat's chamber opened, and there, sitting at the head of the table, was Lord Rust. The patrician wasn't there. He was half surprised. That is, at a certain shallow level, he thought, that's odd. I thought you couldn't budge the man with a siege weapon. But at a dark level, where the daylight seldom penetrated, he thought, of course, at a time like this, men like Rust rise to the top. It's like stirring a swamp with a stick. Really big bubbles are suddenly on the surface, and there's a bad smell about everything. Nevertheless, he saluted and said, Lord Vetinari on his holidays, then. Lord Vetinari steps down this evening, Vimes, said Lord Rust. Pro tem, of course, just for the duration of the emergency. Really? said Vimes. Yes, and I have to say that he anticipated a certain cynicism on your part, Commander, and therefore asked me to give you this letter. You will see that it is sealed with his seal. Vimes looked at the envelope. There was certainly the official seal in the wax, but... He met Lord Rust's gaze, and at least that suspicion faded. Rust wouldn't try a trick like that. Men like Rust had a moral code of sorts, and some things weren't honourable. You could own a street of crowded houses where people lived like cockroaches and the cockroaches lived like kings, and that was perfectly okay, but Rust would probably die before he'd descend to forgery. I say, sir, said Vimes, you wanted me? Commander Vimes, I must ask you to take the Clatchians resident in the city into custody. On what charge, sir? Commander, we are on the verge of war with Clatch. Surely you understand? No, sir. We are talking about spying, Commander. Sabotage, even, said Lord Rust. To be frank, the city is to be placed under martial law. Yes, sir. What kind of law is that, sir? said Vimes, staring straight ahead. You know very well, Vimes. Is it the kind where you shout stop before you fire, sir, or the other kind? Ah, I see. Rust stood up and leaned forward. It pleased you to be smart with Lord Vetinari, and for some reason he indulged you, he said. I, on the other hand, know your type. My type? It seems to me that the streets are full of crimes, Commander, unlicensed begging, public nuisances, but you seem to turn a blind eye. You seem to think you should have bigger ideas. 
But you are not required to have big ideas, Commander. You are a thief-taker, nothing more. Are you eyeballing me, Vimes? I was trying not to turn a blind eye, sir. You seem to feel, Vimes, that the law is some kind of big glowing light in the sky which is not subject to control. And you are wrong. The law is what we tell it to be. I'm not going to add, do you understand, because I know you understand, and I am not going to try and reason with you. I know a rank bad hat when I see one. Bad hat, said Vimes weakly. Commander Vimes, he said, I had hoped to avoid this. But the last few days point to a succession of astonishing judgmental errors on your part. The Prince Kufura was shot, and you seemed helpless to prevent this or find the criminal responsible. Mobs appear to run around the city unimpeded. I gather that one of your sergeants proposed to shoot innocent people in the head. And we have just heard that you took it upon yourself to arrest an innocent businessman and lock him in the cells for no reason at all. Vimes heard Colon gasp, but it sounded a long way off. He could feel everything crumbling under him, but his mind seemed to be flying now, flapping through a pink sky where nothing mattered very much. Oh, I don't know about that, sir, he said. He was guilty of repeatedly being clatchy in, wasn't he? Don't you want me to do that to all of them? And if this was not enough... Rust went on. We are told, and in other circumstances I would find this very hard to believe, even of a counter-jumper like you, that earlier tonight, you, being quite unprovoked, assaulted two Clatchian guards, trespassed on Clatchian soil, entered the women's quarters, abducted two Clatchians from their beds, ordered the destruction of Clatchian property, and, well, frankly, acted quite disgracefully. What is the point of arguing, Vimes thought? Why play cards with a shaved deck? And yet... Two Clatchians, sir. It seems Prince Kufura has been kidnapped, Vimes. I find it hard to believe that even you would attempt that. But the Clatchians seem to be suggesting this. You were seen entering their property illegally, and you appear to have dragged a helpless lady from her bed. What have you got to say about that? It was on fire at the time, sir. Lieutenant Hornet stepped forward and whispered something. Lord Rust subsided a bit. All right, very well. There were perhaps mitigating circumstances, but politically it was a most ill-advised action, Vimes. I cannot pretend to know what has happened to the Prince, but frankly you seem to have taken a positive delight in making matters worse. Can you climb, Mr. Vimes? Vimes said nothing. The other man had been carrying something bulky over his shoulder. You are removed from authority, Commander, and the watch will come under the direct command of this council. Is that understood? Rust turned to Carrot. Captain Carrot, many of us here have heard... Good reports about you, and by due authority, I hereby appoint you acting commander of the watch. Vimes shut his eyes. Carrot saluted smartly. No, sir. Vimes opened his eyes wide. Really? Rust stared at Carrot for a few moments and then gave a little shrug. Ah, well. Loyalty is a fine thing. Sergeant Colon? Sir, in the circumstances and since you are the most experienced non-commissioned officer and have an exemplar and have a military record, you will take command of the watch for the duration of the emergency. No, sir. That was an instruction, Sergeant. Beads of sweat began to form on Colon's brow. No, sir. Sergeant, you can put it where the sun does not shine, sir, said Colon desperately. Once again, Vimes saw Rust's milky blue stare. Rust never looked surprised, and since he knew that a mere sergeant would never dare offer cheeky defiance, he erased Sergeant Colon from the immediate universe. The gaze turned briefly to detritus. And he doesn't know how to speak to a troll, Vimes thought. 
and he was once again impressed in the same dark way by the manner in which Russ dealt with the problem. He dealt with it by making it not be there. Who is the senior corporal in the watch, Sir Samuel? That would be Corporal Nobbs. The committee went into a huddle. There was a rush of whispering in which the words, an absolute little tit, could be heard several times. Finally, Russ looked up again. And the next in seniority? Ah, uh, let me see, that would be Corporal Strong in the arm, said Vimes. He felt oddly light-headed. Perhaps he is a man who can take orders. He's a dwarf, you idiot. Not a muscle moved on Rust's face. There was a clink as Vimes's badge was set neatly on the table. I don't have to take this, said Vimes calmly. Oh, so you'd rather be a civilian, would you? A watchman is a civilian, you inbred streak of piss. Rust's brain erased the sounds that his ears could not possibly have heard. And the keys to the armory, Sir Samuel, he said. They jangled as they landed on the table. And do the rest of you have any empty gestures to make? said Lord Rust. Sergeant Colan took his grimy badge out of his pocket and was a little disappointed that it didn't make a defiant tinkle when he threw it on the table, but instead bounced and smashed the water jug. I got my badge carved on my arm, Detritus rumbled. Someone can try and take it off if they likes. Carrot laid his badge down very carefully. Rust raised his eyebrows. You too, Captain. Yes, sir. I would have thought that you, at least. He stopped and looked up in annoyance as the doors opened. A couple of the palace guards ran in with a group of Clatchians behind them. The council got to their feet in a hurry. Vimes recognized the Clatchian in the center of the group. He'd seen him around at official functions, and if it hadn't been for the fact that the man was a Clatchian, would have marked him down as a shifty piece of work. Who's he? he whispered to Carrot. Prince Caliph. He's the deputy ambassador. Another prince? The man came to a halt in front of the table, glanced at Vimes with no show of recognition, and bowed to Lord Rust. Prince Caliph, said Lord Rust, your arrival is unannounced, but nevertheless... I have grave news, my lord. Even in his stunned state, a part of Vimes registered that the voice was different. Kufura had learned his second language on the street, but this one had had tutors. At a time like this, what news isn't? said Rust. There have been developments on the new land, regrettable incidents, and indeed in Ankh-Morpork, too. He glanced at Vimes again, although here, I must say, reports are confused. Lord Rust, I have to tell you, we are technically at war. Technically at war? said Vimes. I'm afraid events are carrying us forward, said Caliph. The situation is delicate. They know they're going to fight, Vimes thought. This is just like the sort of a dance where you hang around looking at your partner. I must tell you that you are being given twelve hours to remove all your citizens from Leshp, said Caliph. If that is done, matters will be happily resolved, for the present. Our response is that you have twelve hours to quit Leshp, said Rust. If that is not done, then we will take steps. Caliph bowed slightly. We understand one another. A formal document will be with you shortly, and no doubt we will be receiving one from you. Indeed. Here, hang on, you can't just... Vimes began. Sir Samuel, you are no longer commander of the watch, and you have no place at these proceedings, said Rust sharply. He turned back to the prince. It is unfortunate that things have come to this, he said stiffly. Indeed, but there comes a time when words are no longer sufficient. I must agree with you, and then it is time to test one's strength. Vimes stared in fascinated horror from one face to the other. We will, of course, allow you time to quit your embassy, such of it as remains. So kind, and of course we will extend to you the same courtesy. Caliph bowed slightly. So did Rust. After all, just because our countries are at war is no reason why we should not respect one another as friends, said Lord Rust. What? Yes, it bloody well is, said Vimes. I can't believe this. You can't just stand there. Good grief, what happened to diplomacy? War, Vimes, is a continuation of diplomacy by other means, said Lord Rust. As you would know, 
if you were really a gentleman. And you Clatchians are as bad, Barnes went on. It's that green mouldy mutton Jenkins sells. You've all got foaming sheep disease. You can't just stand there and... Sir Samuel, you are, as you are at pains to point out, a civilian, said Rust. As such, you have no place here. Vimes didn't bother with a salute, but just turned away and walked out of the room. The rest of the squad followed him in silence back to Pseudopolis Yard. I told him he could put it where the sun didn't shine, said Sergeant Colon as they crossed the brass bridge. That's right, said Vimes woodenly. Well done. Right to his face, where the sun don't shine. Just like that, said Colon. It was a little difficult to tell from his tone whether this was a matter of pride or dread. I'm afraid Lord Rust is technically correct, sir, said Carrot. Really? Yes, Mr. Vimes, the safety of the city is of paramount importance, so in times of war the civil power is subject to military authority. Huh. I told him, said Fred Colon, right where the sun does not shine, I said. The deputy ambassador didn't mention Prince Kafura, said Carrot. That was odd. I'm going home, said Vimes. We're nearly there, sir, said Carrot. I mean, home, home. I need some sleep. Yes, sir. What shall I tell the lad, sir? Tell him anything you like. I looked him right in the eye, and I told him. I said, you can put it right where the sun, mused Sergeant Colon. You want me and some of the boys to go and sort out that rust later on, said Detritus. It's no problem. He's bound to be guilty of something. No. Vimes's head felt so light now that he couldn't touch the ground with a rope. He left them outside the yard and let his head drag him on and up the hill and round the corner and into the house and past his astonished wife and up the stairs and into the bedroom where he fell full length on the bed and was asleep before he hit it. At nine the next morning the first recruits from Lord Venturi's heavy infantry paraded down Broadway. The watchman went out to watch. That was all that was left for them to do. "'Isn't that Mr. Vimes's butler?' said Angua, pointing to the stiff figure of Willikins in the front rank. "'Yeah, and that's his kitchen boy banging the drum in front,' said Nobby. "'You were a, a military man, weren't you, Fred?' said Carrot, as the parade passed by. "'Yes, sir. Duke of Aorl's first heavy infantry, sir. The pheasant pluckers.' "'Pardon?' said Angua. "'Nickname for the regiment, miss. All from ages ago.' They were bivvy-whacking on some estate and came across a lot of pheasant pens and, well, you know, having to live off the land and everything. Anyway, that's why we always wore a pheasant feather on our helmets. Traditional, see? Already old Fred's face was creasing up in the soft expression of someone who's been mugged in memory lane. We even had a marching song, he said. Mind you, it was quite hard to sing right. Er, uh, sorry, miss? Oh, it's all right, Sergeant said Angua. I often start to laugh like that for no reason at all. Fred Colon once again stared dreamily at nothing. And of course before that I was in the Duke of Quirm's middleweight infantry. Saw a lot of action with them. I'm sure you did, said Carrot, while Angua entertained cynical thoughts about the actual distance of Fred's vantage point. Your distinguished military career has obviously given you many pleasant memories. The ladies liked the uniform said Fred Colon, with the unspoken rider that sometimes a growing lad needed all the help he could get. And it... well... Yes, Sarge? Colon looked awkward, as if the bunched underwear of the past was tangling itself in the crotch of recollection. It was more easier, sir, than being a copper, I mean. I mean, your soldier ride and the other buggers is the enemy. You march into some big field somewhere, and all form up into them oblongs, and then a bloke with a feathery helmet gives the order, and you all forms up into big arrows. Good gods, do people really do that? I thought it was just how they drew the battle plans. Well, the old duke, sir, he did it by the book. Anyway, it's just a case of watching your back and walloping any bloke in the wrong uniform. But... Fred Colon's face screwed up in agonized thought. Well, when you're a copper, well... You don't know the good guys from the bad guys without a map, miss, and that's a fact. But there's military law, isn't there? Well, yes, but when it's pissing with rain and you're up to your tonk, your, your, your waist, in dead horses and someone gives you an order, that ain't the time to look up the book of rules, miss. Anyway, most of it's about when you're allowed to get shot, sir. 
Oh, I'm sure there's more to it than that, Sergeant. Oh, probably so, Colin conceded diplomatically. I'm sure there's lots of stuff about not killing enemy soldiers who've surrendered, for instance. Oh, yes, there's that, Captain. Doesn't say you can't duff them up a bit, of course. Just give them a little something to remember you by. Not torture, said Angua. Oh, no, miss. But, uh, memory lane for Colon had turned into a bad road through a dark valley. Well, when your best mate's got an arrow in his eye and there's blokes and horses screaming all around you and you're scared shit, well, you're really scared, and you come across one of the enemy, well, for some reason or other you've got this kind of urge to give him a bit of a, a nudge sort of thing. Just, you know, like, maybe in twenty years' time his leg will twinge a bit on frosty days and he'll remember what he's done, that's all. He rummaged in a pocket and produced a very small book which he held up for inspection. This belonged to my great-granddad he said. He was in the scrap we had against Pseudopolis, and my great-grand gave him this book of prayers for soldiers, because you need all the prayers you can get, believe you me. And he stuck it in the top pocket of his jerkin, because he couldn't afford armor. And the next day in battle, whoosh, this arrow came out of nowhere, wham, straight into this book, and it went all the way through to the last page before stopping to look. You can see the hole. Pretty miraculous, Carrot agreed. Yeah, it was, I suppose, said the sergeant. He looked ruefully at the battered volume. Shame about the other seventeen arrows, really. The drumming died away. The remnant of the watch tried to avoid one another's gaze. Then an imperious voice said, Why aren't you in uniform, young man? Nobby turned. He was being addressed by an elderly lady with a certain turkey-like cast of feature and a capital punishment expression. Me? Got one, missus, said Nobby, pointing to his battered helmet. A proper uniform, snapped the woman, handing him a white feather. What will you be doing when the Clatchians are ravishing us in our beds? She glared at the rest of the guards and swept on. Angua saw several others like her passing along the crowds of spectators. Here and there was a flash of white. I'll be thinking, those Clatchians are jolly brave, said Carrot. I'm afraid, Nobby, that the white feather is to shame you into joining up. Oh, that's all right, then said Nobby, a man for whom shame held no shame. What am I supposed to do with it? That reminds me, did I tell you what I said to Lord Rust? said Sergeant Colan nervously. Seventeen times so far, said Angua, watching the women with the feathers. She added, apparently to herself, come back with your shield or on it. I wonder if I can get the lady to give me any more, said Nobby. What was that? said Carrot. These feathers, said Nobby, they look like real goose. I've got a use for a lot more of these. I meant, what was it that Angua said? said Carrot. What? Oh, it's just something women used to say when they sent their men off to war. Come back with your shield or on it. On your shield? said Nobby. You mean like sledging, sort of thing? Like dead, said Angua. It meant come back a winner or not at all. Well, I always came back with my shield, said Nobby. No problem there. Nobby, sighed Colon, you used to come back with your shield, everyone else's shield, a sack of teeth and fifteen pairs of still warm boots, on a cart. Well, no point in going to war unless you're on the winning side, said Nobby, sticking the white feather in his helmet. Nobby, you was always on the winning side, the reason being you used to lurk around the edges to see who was winning, and then pull the right uniform off of some poor dead sod. I used to hear where the generals kept an eye on what you were wearing so they'd know how the battle was going. Lots of soldiers have served in lots of regiments, said Nobby. Right, what you say is true, only not usually during the same battle, said Sergeant Colan. They trooped back into the watch house. Most of the shift had taken the day off. After all, who was in charge? What were they supposed to be doing today? The only ones left were those who never thought of themselves as off-duty, and the new recruits who hadn't had their keen edge blunted. I'm sure Mr. Vimes will think of something, said Carrot. Look, I'd better take the Goriffs back to their shop. Mr. Goriff says he's going to pack up and leave. A lot of Clatchians are leaving. You can't blame them either. Dreams rising with him like bubbles, Vimes surfaced from the black fathoms of sleep. Normally these days he treasured the moment of waking. It was when solutions presented themselves. He assumed bits of his brain came out at night and worked on the problems of the previous day, handing him the result just as he opened his eyes. All that arrived now were memories. He winced. Another memory turned up. He groaned. 
The sound of his badge bouncing on the table replayed itself. He swore. He swung his legs off the covers and groped for the bedside table. Bingly bingly beep. Oh, no. All right. What's the time? One o'clock p.m. Hello. Insert name here. Vimes looked blearily at the disorganizer. One day he knew he really would have to try to understand the manual for the damn thing. Either that or drop it off a cliff. One of the universal rules of happiness is always be wary of any helpful item that weighs less than its operating manual. What? he began and then groaned again. The twanging sound made by the unwound turban as it took his weight had just come back to haunt him. Sam? The bedroom door was pushed open and Sybil came in carrying a cup. Yes, dear. How do you feel? I've got bruises on my bruises. Another memory crawled up from the pit of guilt. Oh, good grief, did I really call him a long streak of... Yes, said his wife. Fred Colan came round this morning and told me all about it. And a very good description, I'd say. I went out with Ronnie Rust once. Bit of a cold fish. Another recollection burst like a ball of marsh gas in Vines's head. Did Fred tell you where he said Rust could put his badge? Yes. Three times. It seems to be weighing on his mind. Anyway, knowing Ronnie, he'd have to use a hammer. Vimes had long ago got used to the fact that the aristocracy all seemed to know one another by their first name. And did Fred tell you anything else? he said timidly. Yes, about the shop and the fire and everything. I'm proud of you. She gave him a kiss. What do I do now? he said. Drink your tea and have a wash and a shave. I ought to go down to the watch house and a shave. There's hot water in the jug. When she'd left, he hauled himself upright and tottered into his bedroom. There was indeed a jug of hot water on the marble washstand. He looked at his face in the mirror. Unfortunately, it was his. Perhaps if he shaved it first, and then he could wash the bits that were left. Fragments of the night before kept on respectfully drawing themselves to his attention. It was a shame about that guard, but sometimes you just couldn't stand and argue. He shouldn't have done that with his badge. It wasn't like the old days. He had responsibilities. He should have stayed on and made things just a little less... No, that never worked. He managed to get the lather on his face. The riot act. Good grief. He stropped his razor thoughtfully. Rust's milky eyes stared out of his memory. Bastard. Men like that thought, they really thought that the watch was a kind of sheepdog to nip at the heels of the flock, bark when spoken to, and never, ever bite the shepherd. Ah, oh, yes, Vimes knew in his bones who the enemy was. Except no badge, no watch, no job. Another memory arrived, late. Lather still dripping down his shirt, he pulled Vetinari's sealed letter out of his pocket and slit it open with the razor. There was a blank sheet of paper inside. He turned it over and there was nothing on the other side either. Mystified, he glanced at the envelope. Sir Samuel Vimes, knight. Nice of him to be so precise about it, Vimes thought. What was the point of a message with no message? Some people might absent-mindedly have slipped the wrong piece of paper in an envelope, but Betinari wouldn't. What was the point of sending him a note telling him he was a knight, for God's sake? He knew that embarrassing fact well enough. Another little memory burst open as silently as a mouse passing wind in a hurricane. Who'd said it? Any gentleman? Vimes stared. Well, he was a gentleman, wasn't he? It was official. And then he didn't shout, and he didn't run out of the room. He finished shaving, had a wash, and put on a change of underwear very calmly. Downstairs, Sybil had cooked him a meal. She wasn't a very good cook. This was fine by Vimes because he wasn't a very good eater. After a lifetime of street meals, his stomach wasn't set upright. What it craved was little crunchy brown bits, the food group of the gods, and Sybil reliably always left the pan too long on the dragon. She eyed him carefully as he chewed his fried egg and stared into the middle distance. Her manner was that of someone with a portable safety net, watching a man on the high wire. After a while, while she watched him crack open a sausage, he said, Do we have any books on chivalry, dear? Hundreds, Sam. Is there anyone which tells you what, uh, you know, what it's all about? I mean, what you have to do if you're a knight, say. Responsibilities and so on. Most of them, I should think. 
Good. I think I shall do a little reading. Vimes hit the bacon with his fork. It shattered very satisfactorily. Afterwards, he went into the library. Twenty minutes later, he came back out for a pencil and some paper. Ten minutes after that, Lady Sybil took him a cup of coffee. He was hidden behind a pile of books and apparently deep in Life of Chivalry. She crept out and went into her own study, where she settled down to update her dragon breeding records. It was an hour later when she heard him step out into the hall. He was humming under his breath, tunelessly, with the faraway look of preoccupation that means that some big thought has required the shutting down of all non-essential processes. He was also re-radiating the field of angered innocence that was, to her, part of his essential vimesness. Are you going out, Sam? Yes. I'm just going to kick some ass, dear. Oh, good. Just be sure you wrap up well, then. The Gorith family trudged along silently beside Carrot. I'm sorry about your shop, Mr. Gorith, he said. Gorith shifted the load he was carrying. We can start other shops, he said. We'll certainly keep an eye on it, said Carrot, and when all this is over you can come back. Thank you. His son said something in Clachian. There was a brief family argument. I appreciate your strength of feeling, said Carrot, going red, although I must say I think your language was a little strong. My son is sorry, said Gorif automatically. He did not remember that you speak Clachian. No, I'm not. Why should we run away? said the boy. We live here. I've never seen Clatch. Oh, well, that would be something to look forward to, said Carrot. I hear it has many fine... Are you stupid? said Janil. He shook himself free of his father's grasp and confronted Carrot. I don't care. I don't want all this stuff about the moon rising over the mountains of the sun. I get that at home all the time. I live here. Now you really ought to listen to your parents. Why? My dad works all the time, and now he's being pushed out. What good's that? We ought to stay here and defend what's ours. Ah, oh, well, you shouldn't take the law into your own hands. Why not? It's our job. But you're not doing it. There was a rattle of clatchian from Mr. Gorif. He says I've got to apologise, said Janiel sullenly. I'm sorry. So am I, said Carrot. The boy's father gave him that complicated shrug used by adults in a situation involving adolescents. You'll be back, I know it, said Carrot. We shall see. They went down the quay towards a waiting boat. It was a Clatchian ship. People lined the rails. People were getting out with what they could carry before they could only get out with what they wore. The watchmen found themselves under hostile scrutiny. Surely Rust isn't already forcing Clatchians out of their homes, said Angua. We can tell which way the wind is blowing, said Gorif calmly. Carrot sniffed the salt air. "'It's blowing from Clatch,' he said. "'For you, perhaps,' said Gorif. A whip cracked behind them, and they stood aside as several coaches rumbled by. A blind at the window was pulled aside momentarily. Carrot caught a brief glimpse of a face, all gold teeth and black beard, before the cloth twitched back. "'That's him, isn't it?' There was a faint grunt from Angua. She had her eyes closed, as she always did when she was letting her nose do the seeing. Clothes, she murmured, and then grabbed Carrot's arm. Don't run after it, there's armed men on that ship. What will they think when they see a soldier running towards them? I'm not a soldier. How long do you think they'll spend working out the difference? The coach pushed through the press of people on the dock. The crowd surged back around it. There's boxes being unloaded. I can't quite see, said Carrot, shading his eyes. Look, I'm sure they'll understand if... Seventy-one-hour Ahmed stepped out onto the dock and looked back towards the watchman. There was a momentary sparkle as he grinned. They saw his hand reach over his shoulder and come back holding the curved sword. I can't just let him get away, said Carrot. He's a suspect. Look, he's laughing at us. With diplomatic impunity, said Angua. But there's a lot of armed men down there. My strength is as the strength of ten because my heart is pure, said Carrot. Really? Well, there's eleven of them. Seventy-one hour Ahmed threw his sword in the air. It spun a couple of times, making a whum-whum noise, and then his hand shot out and caught it by the handle as it fell. "'That's what Mr. Vimes was doing,' said Carrot, through gritted teeth. "'Now he's taunting us.' "'You will be killed if you go on the ship,' said Gorith, behind him. "'I know that man.' "'You do? How?' "'He is feared in the whole of Clatch. That is seventy-one-hour Ahmed.' "'Yes. 
Why is... You haven't heard of him? And he is a dreg. Mrs. Gorriff pulled at her husband's arm. Dreg, said Angua. A warlike desert tribe, said Carrot. Very fierce. Honourable, though. They say that if a dreg is your friend, he's your friend for the rest of your life. And if he's not your friend... Uh, that's about five seconds. He drew his sword. Nevertheless, he added, we can't let him... I have said too much. We must go, said Gorif. The family picked up their bundles. Look, there might be another way to find out about him, said Angua. She pointed at the carriage. A couple of lean, long-haired and extremely graceful dogs had been let out and were straining at their leashes as they led the way up the gangplank. Tlachistan hunting dogs, she said. The Clatchian nobility are very keen on them, I understand. They look a bit like... Carrot began, and then the penny dropped. No, I can't let you go on there by yourself, he said. Something would go wrong. I stand a much better chance than you would, believe me, said Angua quickly. They won't be leaving until the tide changes in any case. It's too dangerous. Well, they are supposed to be our enemies. I meant for you. Why, said Angua. I've never heard of werewolves in Clatch, so they probably don't know how to deal with us. She undid the little leather collar that held her badge and handed it to Carrot. Don't worry, she said. If the worst comes to the worst, I'll dive overboard. Into the river? Even the river Ark can't kill a werewolf. Angua glanced at the turgid water. Probably, anyway. Sergeant Colon and Corporal Nobbs had gone on patrol. They weren't sure why they were patrolling and what they were supposed to do if they saw a crime, although many years of training had enabled them not to see some quite large crimes. But they were creatures of habit. They were watchmen, so they patrolled. They didn't patrol with a purpose. They patrolled, as it were, in pure essence. Nobby's progress wasn't helped by the large leather-bound book in his arms. A war would do this place good, said Sergeant Colon after a while. Put some backbone in people. Everything's gone all to pot these days. Not like when we were kids, Sarge. Not like when we were kids, indeed, Nobby. People trusted one another in them days, didn't they, Sarge? People trusted one another, Nobby. Yes, Sarge, I know, and people didn't have to lock their doors, did they? That's right, Nobby, and people were always ready to help. They were always in and out of one another's houses. That's right, Sarge said Nobby vehemently. I oh, know no one ever locked their houses down our street. That's what I'm talking about. That's my point. It was cause the bastards even used to steal the locks. Colon considered the truth of this. Yes, but at least it was each other's stuff they were necking, Nobby. It's not like they was foreigners. Right. They strolled on for a while, each entangled in his own thoughts. Sarge? Yes, Nobby? Where's New Bylia? New Bylia? It's got to be a place, I reckon. Pretty warm there, I think. Ah, New Bylia, said Colon. He invented desperately. Right, yes. It's one of them Clatchian places. Yes, yeah, got lots of sand and mountains. Uh, exports dates. Why do you want to know? Oh, uh, <clears throat> no reason. Nobby? Yes, Sarge? Why are you carrying that huge book? Ah, clever idea, Sarge. I saw what you said about that book of your great granddad, so if there's any fighting, I got this one off of Washpot. It's the Book of Om, five inches thick. It's a bit big for a pocket, Nobby. It's a bit big for a cart, to be honest. I thought I could make sort of braces to carry it. I reckon even a longbow could only get an arrow as far as the Apocrypha. A familiar creak made them look up. A Clatchian's head was swinging in the breeze. Fancy a pint, said Sergeant Colon. Big Angie brews up some that's a treat. Better not, Sarge. Mr. Vimes is in a bit of a mood. Colon sighed. You're right. Nobby looked up at the head again. It was wooden. It had been repainted many times over the centuries. The Clatchian was smiling very happily for someone who'd never have to buy a shirt ever again. The Clatchian's head. My granddad said his granddad remembered when it was still the real one, Colin said. Of course it was about the size of a walnut by then. Bit nasty, sticking up a bloke's head for a pub sign, said Nobby. No, Nobby. Spoils of war, right? 
Some bloke came back from one of the wars with a souvenir, stuck it on a pole and opened a pub. The Clatchian's head. Teach him not to do it again. I used to get into enough trouble just for nicking boots, said Nobby. More robust times, Nobby. You ever met a Clatchian, Sarge? said Nobby, as they began to pace the length of the quiet street. I mean, one of the wild ones. Well, no, but you know what? They're allowed three wives. That's criminal, that is. Yeah, cause here's me, and I ain't got one, said Nobby. And to eat funny grub, curry and that. Nobby gave this some thought. Like uh, we do, when we're on light duty. Well, yes, but they don't do it properly. You mean runny earwax yellow with peas and currants in, like your mum used to do? Right, you poke around as much as you like in a clatchy and curry, and you won't find a single piece of swede. And I heard where they eat sheep's eyeballs too, said Nobby, international gastronome. Right again. Not decent ordinary stuff like lamb's fry or sweetbreads, then. Er, uh, that's right. Colon felt that he was being got at in some way. Look, Nobby, when all's said and done, they ain't the right colour. And there's an end to it. Good job you found out, Fred, said Nobby, so cheerfully that Sergeant Colon was almost sure that he meant it. Well, it's obvious, he conceded. Er, uh, wood is the right colour, said Nobby. White, of course. Not brick red, then, cos you are... Are you winding me up, Corporal Nobbs? Course not, Sarge. So, what colour am I? That caused Sergeant Colon to think. You could have found somewhere on Corporal Nobbs a shade appropriate to every climate on the disc, and a few found only in specialist medical books. White is... white is a state of, you know, mind, he said. It's like doing an honest day's work for an honest day's pay, that sort of thing. And washing regular, not lazying around sort of thing, right? Or like working all hours like Gorif does. Nobby... And you never see those kids of his with dirty clothes. Nobby, you're just trying to get me going, right? You know we're better than Clatchians, otherwise what's the point? Anyway, if we're going to fight them, you could get locked up for going around talking treachery. Or are you going to fight them, Fred? Fred Colon scratched his chin. Well, as an experienced military man, I suppose I'll have to. What are you going to do, join a regiment and go to the front? Well, my forte lies in training so I reckon I'd better stay here and train up the new recruits. Here at the back, you might say. We all have to do our bit, Nobby. If it was down to me, I'd be out there like a shot, giving Johnny Clatchy a taste of cold steel. Their razor-sharp swords wouldn't worry you then. I should laugh at them with scorn, Nobby. But supposing the Clatchians attack here, then you'll be at the front, and the front will be at the back. I'll sort of try for a post in, in the middle. The middle of the front, or the middle of the... Gentlemen? They looked round to find that they had been followed by a man of medium height, but with an extraordinary head. It wasn't that he had gone bald. He had quite a lot of hair, which was long and curly, and reached almost to his shoulders, and his beard was large enough to conceal a small chicken. But his head had simply risen through his hair like a kind of intrusive dome. He gave them a friendly smile. Am I, by any chance, addressing the heroic Sergeant Colon and the... The man looked at Nobby. Expressions of amazement, dread, interest, and charity passed across his otherwise sunny countenance like storm-driven clouds. And the Corporal Nobbs, he finished. That is us, citizen, said Colon. Ah, good. I was very specifically told to find you. It's quite amazing, you know. No one had ever broken into the boathouse, although I must say I did design the locks rather well. <laughs> and all I've had to do is replace the leatherwork around the joints and grease it up. Oh, do excuse me. I've got rather ahead of myself now. There was a message I had to give you. Um, what was it now? Something about your hands. He reached down into the large canvas bag by his feet and pulled out a long tube, which he handed to Nobby. I do apologize about this, he said, producing a smaller tube and handing it to Colon. I had to do things in such a hurry. 
There really was no time to finish it off properly, and frankly the materials are not very good. Colon looked at his tube. It was pointed at one end. This is a firework rocket, he said. Look, it's got a riot of colored balls and stars on it. Yes, I do so apologize, said the man, lifting a complex little arrangement of wood and metal out of the bag. May I have the tube back, Corporal? He took it and screwed the arrangement onto one end. Thank you. Yes, I am afraid that without my lathe, and indeed my forge, I really have had to make do with what I could find lying around. Could I have the rocket back, please? Thank you. They don't go properly without a stick, said Nobby. Oh, in fact they do, said the man, just not very accurately. He raised the tube to shoulder height and peered into a small wire grid. That seems about right, he said. And they don't go along, said Nobby. They just go up. Ah, a common misconception, said Leonard of Quern, turning to face them. Colon could see the tip of the rocket in the depths of the tube, and had a sudden image of stars and balls. Now, apparently, you two have to step into this alley here and come with me, said Leonard. I'm very sorry about this, but his lordship has explained to me at great length how the needs of society as a whole may have to overrule the rights of a particular individual. Oh, and I've just remembered. Hmm. Hmm. You have to put your hands up. Sand had been spilled across the big table in the rat's chamber. Lord Rust felt a sensation akin to pleasure as he surveyed it. There were the little square boxes for the towns and cities, and cut-out palm trees to indicate the known oasises. And although he was uneasy about the word oasises, Lord Rust looked at it and saw that it was good, especially since it was a map of Clatch, and everyone knew that Clatch was sand anyway, which made it rather satisfying in an existential sort of way, although this sand here had been commandeered from the heap behind Chalky the Troll's wholesale pottery, and bore the occasional cigarette end and trace of feline incontinence that would probably not be found in the real desert, or certainly not to scale. Here would be a good landing area, he said, pointing with his stick. His equerry tried to look helpful. The El Kint Peninsula, he said. That's the closest point to us, sir. Exactly. We can be across the straits in jig time. Very good, sir, said Lieutenant Hornet. But you don't think the enemy might be expecting us there, it being such an obvious landing site? Not obvious at all to the trained military thinker, sir. They won't be expecting us there precisely because it is so obvious, you see. You mean they'll think only a complete idiot would land there, sir? Correct. And they know we're not complete idiots, sir, and therefore that will be the last place they will be expecting us, you see. They'll be expecting us somewhere like... His stick stabbed into the sand. Here. Hornet looked closely. In the street outside, someone started to bang a drum. Oh, you mean Eritor, he said, where I believe there is a concealed landing area and two days forced march through good cover would have us at the heart of the Empire, sir. Exactly. Whereas landing at El Kint means three days over sand dunes and past the fortified city of Gebra. Precisely. Wide open spaces. And that is where we can practice the art of warfare. Lord Rust raised his voice above the drumming. That's how you settle these things. One decisive battle. Us on one side, the Clatchins on the other. That is how these things are done. He threw down his pointer. Who the devil is making that infernal noise? The equerry walked across to the window. It's someone else recruiting, sir, he said. But we're all here. The equerry hesitated as the bearers of bad tidings to short-tempered men often do. It's Vimes, sir. Recruiting for the watch? Uh, no, my lord, for a regiment. Uh, the banner says, Sir Samuel Vimes is first of foot, my lord. The arrogance of the man! Go and... No, I'll go myself. There was a crowd in the street. In the centre there rose the bulk of Constable Dorfel. And a key thing about the golem was that if he was banging a drum, then no one was going to ask him to stop. 
No one except possibly Lord Rust, who strode up and snatched the drumsticks out of his hands. Yes, it are species of your choice's life in the first of foot, shouted Sergeant Atritus, unaware of the events going on behind him. You're learning a trade, you're learning self-respect. Also, you get spiffy uniform, plus all the boots you can eat. Here, that's my banner. What's the meaning of this? said Rust, flinging the homemade banner onto the ground. Vimes can't do this. A figure detached itself from the wall where it had been watching the show. You know, I rather think I can, said Vimes. He handed Rust a piece of paper. It's all here, my lord, with references citing the highest authorities, in case you are in any doubt. Citing the high... on the role of a knight, my lord. In fact, the duties of a knight, funnily enough. A lot of it is pretty damn stupid stuff, riding around the place on one of those bloody great horses with curtains round it and so on. But one of them says, in time of need, a knight has to raise and maintain, you'll laugh when I tell you this, a body of armed soldiers. No one could have been more surprised than me, I don't mind telling you. Seems there's nothing for it, but I have to go out and get some chaps together. <laughs> of course, most of the watch have joined. Well, you know how it is. Disciplined lads, anxious to do their bit. So that saved me a bit of effort. Except for Nobby Dobbs, because he says if he leaves it till Thursday, he's going to have enough white feathers for a mattress. Rust's expression would have preserved meat for a year. This is a nonsense he said, and you, Vimes, certainly are no knight. Only a king can make... There's a good few lordships in this city created by the patricians, said Vimes. Your friend Lord Dowdy, for one, you were saying... Then, if you persist in playing games, I will say that before a knight is created, he must spend a knight's vigil watching his armour. Practically every night of my life, said Vimes. A man doesn't keep an eye on his armour round here. That man's got no armour in the morning. In prayer, said Rust, sharply. That's me, said Vimes. Not a night has gone by without me thinking, ye gods, I hope I get through this alive. And he must have proved himself on the field of combat against other trained men, Vimes, not vermin and thugs. Vimes started to undo the strap on his helmet. Well, this isn't the best of moments, my lord, but if someone will hold your coat, I can spare you five minutes. In Vimes's eyes, Rust recognised the fiery gleam of burning boats. I know what you're doing, Vimes, and I am not going to rise to it, he said, taking a step back. In any case, you have had no formal training in arms. That's true, said Vimes. You've got me there right enough. No one ever trained me in arms. I was lucky there. He leaned closer and lowered his voice so that the watching crowd wouldn't hear. You see, I know what training in arms means, Ronald. There hasn't been a real war in ages, so it's all prancing around and wearing padded waistcoats and waving swords with knobs on the end, so no one'll really get hurt, isn't it? But down in the shades no one's had any training in arms either, wouldn't know an epée from a sabre. No, what they're good at is a broken bottle in one hand and a length of four by two in the other, and when you face them, Ronnie, you know you aren't going off for a laugh and a jolly drink afterwards, because they want you dead. They want to kill you, you see, Ron. And by the time you've swung your nice shiny broadsword, they've carved their name and address on your stomach. And that's where I got my training in arms. Well, fists and knees and teeth and elbows, mostly. You, sir... I know, gentlemen, said Rust. I knew there was something about me that I liked. Can you not even see that you can't enrol dwarfs and trolls in an Ankh Morpok regiment? It just says armed soldiers, and dwarfs come with their own axes. A great saving. Besides, if you've ever seen them really fight, then you must have been on the same side. Vimes, it's Sir Samuel, my lord. Rust seemed to think for a moment. Very well, then he said, then you and your regiment come under my command. Strangely, no, said Vimes swiftly. Under the command of the king or his duly appointed representative, it says in Scavone's chivalric law and usage, and of course there has been no duly appointed representative ever since some complete bastard cut off the last king's head. Our assorted bods appeared to have been ruling the city, but according to the chivalric tradition... Rust stopped to think again. 
He had the look of a lawnmower just after the grass has organised a workers' collective. There was a definite suggestion that deep inside he knew this was not really happening. It could not be happening because this sort of thing did not happen. Any contradictory evidence could be safely ignored. However, it might be necessary to find some motions to go through. I think you'll find that legally your position, he began, and his eyes bulged for a moment as Vimes interrupted him cheerfully. Oh, there might be a few problems, I grant you, but if you ask Mr. Slant, he'll say this is a very interesting case, which, as you know, is lawyer talk, for $1,000 a day plus expenses, and it'll take months. So I'll leave you to get on with it, shall I? Got such a lot of things to do, you know. I think the swatches for the new uniforms should be in my office about now. It's so important to look right on the battlefield, isn't it? Rust gave Vimes another look and then strode away. Detritus stamped to attention beside Vimes, and his salute clanged smartly off his helmet. What we're doing now, sir? We can pack up now, I think. All the lads have joined up? Yes, sir. You told them it wasn't compulsory? Yes, sir. I said, it ain't compulsory, you just got to... Sir, Detritus, I wanted volunteers. That's right, sir. They volunteered all right. I thought of that. Vimes sighed as he walked back to his office. But they were probably safe. He was pretty sure he was legally sound, and if he knew anything about Rust, the man would respect the letter of the law. Such men did in a chilly way. Besides, thirty men in the watch simply didn't figure in the great scheme of things. Rust could ignore them. Suddenly there's a war brewing, Vimes thought, and they all come back. Civil order is turned upside down, because that's the rules, and people like Rust are at the top of the heap again. You have these aristocrats lazing around for years, and suddenly the old arm is out, and the sword is being taken down from over the fireplace. They think there's going to be a war, and all they can think about is that wars can be won or lost. Someone's behind this. Someone wants to see a war. Someone paid to have Ossie and Snowy killed. Someone wanted the prince dead. I've got to remember that. This isn't a war. This is a crime. And then he realised he was wondering if the attack on Goriff's shop had been organised by the same people, and whether those same people had set fire to the embassy. And then he realised why he was thinking like this. It was because he wanted there to be conspirators. It was much better to imagine men in some smoky room somewhere, made mad and cynical by privilege and power, plotting over the brandy. You had to cling to this sort of image, because if you didn't, then you might have to face the fact that bad things happened because ordinary people, the kind who brushed the dog and told their children bedtime stories, were capable of then going out and doing horrible things to other ordinary people. It was so much easier to blame it on them. It was bleakly depressing to think that they were us. If it was them, then nothing was anyone's fault. If it was us, what did that make me. After all, I'm one of us. I must be. I've certainly never thought of myself as one of them. No one ever thinks of themselves as one of them. We're always one of us. It's them that do the bad things. Around about this time, in his former life, Vimes would be taking the cap off a bottle and wouldn't be too bothered about the bottle's contents so long as they crinkled paint. Oh, oh hello. What can I do for... Oh, yes. I asked about books on Clatch. Is that all? The librarian shyly held out a small, battered green book. Vimes had been expecting something bigger, but he took it anyway. It paid to look at any book the orangutan gave you. He matched you up to books. Vimes supposed it was a knack, in the same way that an undertaker was very good at judging heights. On the spine, in very faded gold lettering, were the words Veni Vidi Vici, A Soldier's Life, by Gen A. Tacticus. Nobby and Sergeant Colon edged along the alley. I know who he is, Fred hissed. That's Leonard of Quirm, that is. He went missing five years ago. So he's called Leonard, and he's from Quirm. So what, said Nobby. He's a raving genius. He's a loony. Yeah, well, they say there's a thin line between genius and madness. He's fallen off it, then. The voice behind them said, Oh, dear, this won't do at all, will it? I can't deny it, you were quite right, the accuracy would be quite unacceptable at any reasonable range. Could you 
spare to stop a moment, please? They turned. Leonard was already dismantling the tube. If you could just hang on to this bit, Corporal, and, 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 and Sergeant, if you would be so good as to hold this piece steady, some sort of fins should do it. I'm sure I had a suitable piece of wood somewhere. Leonard began to pat his pockets. The watchman realized that the man holding them up had paused to redesign his weapon and had given it to them to hold while he looked for a screwdriver. This was a thing that did not often happen. Nobby silently took the rocket from Colon and pushed it into the tube. "'What's this bit here, mister?' he said. Leonard glanced up briefly in between patting his pockets. "'Oh, oh that's the trigger,' he said, "'which, as you can see, rubs against the flint and good.' There was a short burst of flame and rather more black smoke. "'Oh, dear,' said Leonard. The watchmen turned, like men dreading what they were about to see. The rocket had shot the length of the alley and through the window of the house. Ah, putting this way up on the projectile would be an important safety point to bear in mind for the new design, said Leonard. Now, where's that notebook? I think we'd better leave, said Colin, moving backwards. Very fast. Inside the house there was an explosion of stars and balls to delight young and old, but not the troll who had just opened the door. Ah, really? said Leonard. Well, if speed is required, I have this very interesting design for a two-wheeled... Acting on an unspoken agreement, the watchman each put a hand under a shoulder, lifted him off the ground, and ran for it. Oh, dear, said Leonard, as he was dragged backwards. The watchman dived into a side alley, and then jinked and dodged along several others with quiet professionalism. Finally, they leaned Leonard against a wall and peered around the end of the alley. All clear, said Nobby. They went the other way. Right, said Colin. Now, what was you doing? I mean, you might be a genius like I heard, Mr. De Quirm, but when it comes to threatening people, you're as clever as an inflatable dartboard. I appear to have been a bit of a juggins, don't I? Leonard agreed. But I do implore you to come with me. I'm afraid I thought that as warriors you would be more inclined to understand force. Well, yes, we're warriors, said Sergeant Colon, but... Here, have you got another one of these rockets? said Nobby, hefting the tube onto his shoulder again. He had the special gleam in his eye that a small man gets when he's laid his hands on a big, big weapon. I may have, said Leonard and the gleam in his eye was the mad twinkle of the naturally innocent when they think they're being cunning. Why don't we go and see? You see, I was told to fetch you by any means necessary. Bribery sounds good, said Nobby. He put his eye to the tube sights and started making whoosh noises. Who told you to fetch us? said Colon. Lord Vetinari. The patrician wants us. Yes, he said you have special qualities, and must come at once. To the palace? I heard he'd done a runner. Oh, no, to the, to the, um, uh, uh, to the docks. Special qualities, eh? said Colon. Uh, Sarge, Nobby began. Now then, Nobby, said Colon importantly, it's about time we were given some recognition. You know that. Experienced officers are the backbone of the force. Seems to me, he went on, seems to me that this is a case of cometh the time, cometh the man. When's he cometh? I'm talking about us, men, with special qualities. Nobby nodded, but with a certain amount of reluctance. In many ways, he was a much clearer thinker than his superior officer, and he was worrying about special qualities. Being picked for something because of your special qualities was tantamount to being volunteered. Anyway, what was so special about special qualities? Limpets had special qualities. Will we go undercover again? said Colin. Leonard blinked. There, yes, I think I can say there is a strong mm, under-element involved. Yes, indeed. Sarge, you just be quiet, Corporal. Colon pulled Nobby closer. Undercover means not getting stabbed and shot at, right? he whispered. And what's the most important thing a professional soldier wants not to happen to him? Not getting stabbed and shot, said Nobby automatically. Right. So, let's be going, Mr. Quirm. The call has come.
Well done, said Leonard. Tell me, Sergeant, are you of a nautical persuasion? Colan saluted again. No, sir. Happily married man, sir. I mean, have you ploughed the ocean waves at all? Colan gave him a cunning look. Ah, you can't catch me with that one, sir, he said. Everyone knows the horses would sink. Leonard paused for a moment and retuned his brain to Radio Colon. Ah, uh, have you in the past floated around on the sea in a boat at all? Me, sir? Not me. It's the sight of the waves going up and down, sir. Really, said Leonard. Well, happily, that will not be a problem. All right. Start again. Assembling facts. That's what it was about. The world watched. Someone wanted the watch to say that the assassination had been inspired by Clatch. Who? Someone had also beheaded Snowy Slopes where he stood and left him deader than six buckets of fish bait. A vision of seventy-one-hour Ahmed's big curved sword presented itself for his attention. So, let's assume that Ahmed was Kufura's servant or bodyguard, and he'd found out... No, how could that work? Who'd tell him? Well, maybe he'd found out somehow, and that meant that he might also know who'd paid the man. Vime sat back. It was still a mystery, but he'd solve it. He knew he would. He'd assemble the facts, analyse them, look at them from every angle with an open mind, and find out exactly how Lord Rust had organised it. Rank bad hat. He didn't have to sit still for something like that, especially from a man who rhymed house with mice. His eye was caught by the ancient book, General Tacticus. Every kid knew about him. Ankh Morpork had ruled a huge empire, and a lot of it had been in clatch thanks to him. Except there wasn't any thanks for him, strangely enough. Vimes had never quite known why, but the city seemed to be rather ashamed of the general. One reason, of course, was that he'd ended up fighting Ankh Morpork. The city of Genua had run out of royalty, inbreeding having progressed to the point where the sole remaining example consisted mostly of teeth, and senior courtiers had written to Ankh Morpork asking for help. There'd been a lot of that sort of thing, Vimes had been surprised to learn. The little kingdoms of the Stow Plains were forever scrounging spare royalty off one another. The king had sent Tacticus out of sheer exasperation. It's hard to run a proper empire when you're constantly getting blood-stained letters on the lines of, Dear Sire, I beg to inform you that we have conquered Betrek, Smail, and Ushistan. Please send Ankh-Morporkian dollars twenty thousand back pay. The man never knew when to stop, so he was hastily made a duke and packed off to Genua, whereupon his first action was to consider what was the city's greatest military threat, and then, having identified it, to declare war on Ankh-Morpork. But what else had anyone expected? He'd done his duty. He'd brought back heaps of spoils, lots of captives, and almost uniquely among Ankh Morpork's military leaders, most of his men. Vimes suspected that this last fact was one reason why history didn't approve. There was a suggestion that this was in some way not playing fair. Veni vidi vici. That was what the man was supposed to have said when he'd conquered, where, Pseudopolis, wasn't it? Or Al Kali? Or Quirm? Maybe Stolat? That was in the old days when you attacked anyone else's city on principle, and went back and did them over again if they looked like getting up. And in those days you didn't care if the world watched. You wanted them to watch, and learn. Veni, vidi, vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. As a comment, it always struck Vimes as a bit too pat. It wasn't the sort of thing that you came up with on the spur of the moment, was it? It sounded as if he'd worked it out. He'd probably spent long evenings in his tent, looking up in the dictionary short words beginning with V, and trying them out. Veni, vermini, vomui. I came, I got ratted, I threw up. Visi, venere, vermusi. I visited, I caught an embarrassing disease, I ran away. It must have been a big relief to come up with three short, acceptable words. He probably made them up first, and then went off to see somewhere and conquer it. He opened the book at random. It is always useful to face an enemy who is prepared to die for his country, he read. This means that both you and he have exactly the same aim in mind. Huh. Bingly, 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 beep! Vimes's hands slammed down on the box. Yes, what is it? 
3.05 p.m. Interview with Corporal Littlebottom re-missing Sergeant Colon, said the demon sulkily. I never arranged anything like... Who told you? Are you telling me that I've got an appointment and I don't know about it? That's right. So how do you know about it? You told me to know about it last night, said the demon. You can tell me about appointments I don't know about, said Vimes. There's still appointments, sine qua appointments, said the demon. They exist, as it were, in appointment phase space. What the hell does that mean? Look, said the demon patiently, you can have an appointment at any time, right? So therefore any appointment exists in potentia. Where's that? Any particular appointment simply collapses the waveform, said the demon. I merely select the most likely one from the projected matrix. You're just making this up, said Vimes. If you were right, then any second now... Someone knocked at the door. It was a polite, tentative tap. Vimes didn't take his eyes off the smirking demon. Is that you, Corporal Littlebottom? he said. Yes, sir. Sergeant Colon has sent a pigeon. I thought you ought to see it, sir. Come in. A small roll of thin paper was placed on his desk. He read, Have volunteered for a mission of vital importance. Nobby is here also. There will be statues of us when this day's work is over. P.S. Someone I can't tell you who says this note will self-destruct in five seconds. He is sorry he hasn't got good chemicals to do it better. The paper began to crinkle around the edges and then vanished in a small puff of acrid smoke. Vimes stared at the little pile of ash that remained. "'I suppose it's a mercy they didn't blow up the pigeon, sir,' said Cheery. "'What the hell are they up to? Well, I can't chase around after them. Thanks, Cheery.' The dwarf saluted and departed. "'Coincidence,' said Vimes. "'All right, then,' said the demon. "'Bingly, bingly, bingly, beep. 3.15 p.m., Emergency meeting with Captain Carrot. It was a cylinder, tapering to a point at both ends. At one end the taper was quite complex, the cylinder narrowing in a succession of smaller and smaller rings, overlapping one another until they ended in a large fishtail. Oiled leather could be seen gleaming in the gaps between the metal. At the other end, extending from the cylinder for all the world like a horn of a unicorn, was a very long and pointed screw thread. The whole thing was mounted on a crude trolley, which was in turn riding on a pair of iron rails that disappeared into the black water at the far end of the boathouse. "'Looks like a giant fish to me,' said Colon, made of tin. "'With an own, said Nobby. "'It'll never float,' said Colon. "'I can see where you've gone wrong there. Everyone knows metal sinks.' "'Not entirely true,' said Leonard, diplomatically. "'In any case, this boat is designed to sink.' What? Propulsion was a major headache, I'm afraid, said Leonard, climbing up a stepladder. I thought of paddles and oars, and even some kind of screw, and then I thought, Dolphins! That's the ticket! They move extremely fast, with barely an effort. That's out at sea, of course. We only get the shovel-nosed dolphin in our estuary here. The linkage rods are a bit complicated, but I used to be able to get quite a turn of speed. The peddling can be somewhat tiresome, but with three of us we should be able to get up some quite satisfactory accelerations. It's amazing what you can do when you imitate nature. I just wish my flying expe Oh, where did you go? It would be difficult to establish what part of satisfactorily accelerating nature the watchmen were trying to imitate, but it was a part which tended to get stuck indoors a lot. They stopped struggling and began to back into the room. Ah, Sergeant, said Lord Vetinari, entering in front of them, and Corporal Nobbs, too. Leonard has explained everything to you. You can't ask us to go in that thing, sir. It'll be suicide, said Colon. The patrician brought his hands together in front of his lips in the manner of someone praying, and sucked air thoughtfully. No, no. I think you are wrong, he said at last as if reaching a conclusion on some complex metaphysical conundrum. I think that in all probability going into that thing would be a valiant and possibly rewarding deed. I would venture to suggest that in fact it is not going that would be suicidal, but I would appreciate your views. 
Lord Vetinari was not a heavily built man, and these days he walked with the aid of an ebony cane. No one could remember seeing him handle a weapon, and a flash of unaccustomed insight told Sergeant Colan that this was not in fact a comforting thought at all. They said he'd been educated at the Assassin's School, but no one remembered what weapons he'd learned. He'd studied languages, and suddenly, with him in front of you, this didn't seem like the soft option. Sergeant Colan saluted, always a useful thing to do in an emergency such as this, and shouted, Corporal Nobbs, why aren't you in the, 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 the metal sinking fish thing? Sarge, let's see you get up them steps, lad. Hup, hup, hup. Nobby scrambled up the ladder and disappeared. Colan saluted again. You could usually tell his nervousness by the smartness of his salute. You could have cut bread with this one. Ready to go, sir, he shouted. Well done, Sergeant said Vetinari. You're displaying exactly those special qualities I'm looking for. Here, Sarge, came a metallic voice from the belly of the fish. There's all chains and cogwheels in here. What's this do? The big auger in front of the thing started to squeak around. Leonard appeared from behind the fish. I think we should all get in, he said. I've lit the candle that'll burn down and sever the string that'll release the weight that'll pull the blocks out. Eh, uh, what's this thing called? said Colan, as he followed the patrician up the ladder. Well, because it is submersed in a marine environment, I've always called it the going-under-the-water-safely device, said Leonard behind him. But usually I just think of it as the boat. Thinking up good names was, oddly enough, one area where Leonard of Quirm's genius tended to give up. He reached behind him and shut the lid. After a moment, any listener in the boathouse would have heard a complicated plonk as bolts slid into place. The candle burned down and severed the string that released the weight that pulled the blocks out, and slowly at first the boat slid down the rails and into the dark water which after a second or two closed over it with a gloop. No one took any notice of Angua as she trotted up the gangplank. The important thing she knew was to look at home. No one bothered a large dog that looked as though it knew where it was going. People were milling about on the deck in the manner peculiar to non-sailors on board ship, not sure of what they should be doing or where they should refrain from doing it. Some of the more stoic ones had made little camps, defining with bundles and pieces of cloth tiny areas of private property. They reminded Angua of the bi-coloured drainpipes and microscopically delineated household boundaries in Money Trap Lane, showing yet another way of drawing a line in the sand. This is mine, and that is yours. Trespass on mine, and you'll get yours. There were a couple of guards standing on either side of the door to the cabins. They hadn't been told to stop dogs. Scents led down below. She could smell the other dogs and a strong odour of cloves. At the end of the narrow passage a door was ajar. She forced it open with her nose and looked around. The dogs were lying on a rug on one side of a large cabin. Other dogs might have barked, but these just turned their beautiful heads towards her, sighted down the length of their noses, and examined her carefully. A narrow bed beyond them was half concealed by silk hangings. Seventy-one hour Ahmed was bending over it, but he turned when she entered. He glanced towards the dogs and gave her a puzzled look. Then, to her amazement, he sat down on the deck in front of her. And who do you belong to? he said in perfect Morporkian. Angua wagged her tail. There was someone in the bed. She could smell them. But they wouldn't be a problem. Jaw muscles strong enough to sever someone's neck help you to feel relaxed in most situations. Ahmed patted her on the head. Very few people have ever done that to a werewolf without having to get people to cut up their meals for them in future, but Angua had learned self-control. Then he stood up and went to the door. She heard him say something to someone outside, and then he came back into the room and smiled at her. I go, I come back. He opened a small cupboard and took out a jeweled dog collar. You shall have a collar. Oh, and here is some food, he added, as a servant brought in some bowls. Nick, knack paddywhack give a dog a bone is a rhyme I hear your ankh more pork children sing. But a paddywhack is a ball of gristle suitable only for animal food, and who knows what part of the animal is its knick-knack. The plate was put in front of Angua. The other dogs stirred, but Ahmed snapped a word at them, and they settled back again. The food was dog food. 
In Aunt Morpork terms, it meant something that you wouldn't even put in a sausage, and there are very few things that a man with a big enough mincer cannot put in a sausage. The little central human part of her was revolted, but the werewolf drooled at the sight of every glistening tube and wobbly fat bit. It was on a silver plate. She looked up. Ahmed was watching her carefully. Of course, the royal dogs were treated like kings, all those diamond collars. Didn't have to mean he knew. Not hungry, he said. Your mouth says you are. Something snapped around her neck as she spun around to bite. Her teeth closed on a mouthful of greasy cloth, but that wasn't as important as the pain. His Highness has always liked fine collars on his dogs, said Seventy-One Hour Ahmed through the red mist. Rubies, emeralds, and diamonds, Miss Angua. His face came down level with hers, set in silver. A crucial factor, I have always found, is not the size of the forces, it is the positioning and commitment of reserves, the bringing of power to a point. Vimes tried to concentrate on Tacticus, but there were two distractions. One was that the grinning face of seventy-one-hour Ahmed looked out at him from every line. The other was his watch, which he had propped up against the disorganizer. It was powered by actual clockwork and was much more reliable and it never needed feeding. It ticked quietly. As far as it was concerned, he could forget his appointments. He liked it. The second hand was just curving towards the top of the minute when he heard someone coming up the stairs. Come in, Captain, said Vimes. There was a snigger from the box. Carrot's face was pinker than normal. Something's happened to Angua, said Vimes. The high colour drained from Carrot's face. How did you know that? Vimes firmly closed the lid on the sniggering demon. Let's call it intuition, shall we? I'm right, am I? Yes, sir. She went aboard a Clatchian boat, and now it's sailing. She hasn't come off. What the hell did she go on board for? We were after Ahmed, and he looked as if he was taking someone with him, sir. Someone ill, sir. He's left, but the diplomats are still... Vimes stopped. There was, if you didn't know, Carrot, something wrong with the situation... There were people who, when their girlfriend was spirited away on a foreign ship, would have dived into the Ark, or at least run briskly along the crust, leapt aboard and dealt out merry hell on a democratic basis. Of course, at a time like this, that would be a dumb thing to do. The sensible approach would be to let people know, but even so. But Carrot really did believe that personal wasn't the same as important. Of course, Vimes believed the same thing— you had to hope that when push came to shove you'd act the right way, but there was something slightly creepy about someone who didn't just believe it, but lived their life by it. It was as unnerving as meeting a really poor priest. Obviously, it was a consideration that if someone had captured Angua, you knew that the rescue you were going to probably wouldn't be hers. But the gods alone knew what would happen if he left now. The city had gone war-mad. Big things were happening. At a time like this, every cell in his body was telling him that the commander of the watch had responsibilities. He drummed his fingers on the desk. In times like this, it was vital to make the right decision. That was what he was paid for. Responsibility. He ought to stay here and do the best he could. But history was full of the bones of good men who'd followed bad orders in the hope that they could soften the blow. Oh yes, there were worse things they could do, but most of them began right where they started following bad orders. His eyes went from Carrot to the disorganiser, and then to the tottering mounds of paperwork on his desk. Blow that! He was a thief-taker! He'd always be a thief-taker! Why lie? Damned if I'll let Ahmed get back to Clatch, he said, standing up. Fast boat, was it? Yes, but it looked pretty heavy in the water. Then maybe we can catch it up before it goes very far. As he hurried forward, he had just for a second the strange sensation that he was two people, and this was because for the merest fraction of a second he was two people. They were both called Samuel Vimes. To history, choices are merely directions. The trousers of time opened up, and Vimes began to hurtle down one leg of them. And somewhere else, the Vimes who made a different choice began to drop into a different future. They both darted back to grab their disorganizers. By the most outrageous of freak chances, quite uniquely, in this split second of decision, they each got the wrong one. And sometimes the avalanche depends on one snowflake. Sometimes a pebble is allowed to find out what might have happened if only it had bounced the other way.
The wizards of Aunt Morpork had been very firm on the subject of printing. It's not happening here, they said. Supposing, they said, someone printed a book on magic and then broke up the type again and used it for a book on, say, cookery. The metal would remember. Spells aren't just words. They have extra dimensions of existence. We'd be up to here in talking souffles. Besides, someone might print thousands of the damn things, many of which could well be read by unsuitable people. The Engravers Guild was also against printing. There was something pure, they said, about an engraved page of text. It was there, whole, unsullied. Their members could do very fine work at very reasonable rates. Allowing unskilled people to bash lumps of type together showed a disrespect for words, and no good would come of it. The only attempt ever to set up a printing press in Ankh Morpork had ended in a mysterious fire and the death by suicide of the luckless printer. Everyone knew it was suicide because he'd left a note. The fact that this had been engraved on the head of a pin was considered an irrelevant detail. And the patrician was against printing because if people knew too much it would only bother them. So people relied on word of mouth, which worked very well because the mouths were so close together. A lot of them were just below the noses of the members of the Beggars Guild. Citizens generally regarded as reasonably reliable and well-informed, except in the particular case of Sidney Lopsides, who was paid two dollars a day from city funds to wear a sack over his head. It wasn't that he was spectacularly deformed as such, it was merely that anyone who saw him spent the rest of the day with an unnerving feeling that they were upside down. Some of them were highly thought of for their sports coverage. Lord Rust looked thoughtfully at Cumbling Michael a grade two mutterer. And what happened next? Cumbling Michael scratched his wrist. He'd recently got his extra grade because he'd finally managed to catch a disfiguring but harmless skin disease. Mr. Carrot was in there about two minutes, my lord. Then they all come running out, right? And, and, and they... Who were they? said Rust. He fought off an urge to scratch his own arm. There was... Carrot and, and, and vimes and, and, and a dwarf and a zombie and all of them, my lord. They ran all the way to the docks, my lord, and vimes saw Captain Jenkins, and he said, Ah, Captain Jenkins, this is your lucky day. The captain looked up from the rope he was coiling. No one likes being told it's their lucky day. That sort of thing does not bode well. When someone tells you it's your lucky day, something bad is about to happen. It is, he said. Yes, because you have an unrivaled opportunity to aid the war effort. I have? And also to demonstrate your patriotism, Carrot added. I do? We need to borrow your boat, said Vimes. Bugger off. I'm choosing to believe that was a salty nautical expression meaning why certainly, said Vimes. Captain Carrot, sir... You and Detritus go and look behind that false partition in the hold, said Vimes. Right, sir, said Carrot, walking towards the ladder. There's no false partition in the hold, snapped Jenkins, and I know the law, and you can't... There was a crash of timber from below. If that wasn't a false partition, our Carrot's gone and knocked a hole in the side, said Vimes calmly, watching the captain. Er, uh, I know the law too, said Vimes. He drew his sword. Say this, he said, holding it up. This is military law, and military law is a sword, not a two-edged sword. There's only one edge, and it's pointing at you. Found anything, Carrot? Carrot appeared over the edge of the hold. There was a crossbow in his hand. I do declare, said Vimes, but that looks to me like a burly and strong-in-the-arm Viper Mark III, which kills people but leaves buildings standing. There's crates and crates of stuff, said Carrot. "'There's no law,' Jenkins began, but he sounded as if the bottom was dropping out of his world. "'You know, I think there probably is some law against selling weapons to the enemy in times of war,' said Vimes. "'Of course there might not be. Tell you what,' he added brightly, "'why don't we all go along to Sartor Square? It's full of people around this time, all very keen on the war and cheering our brave lads. Why don't we go along and put it to them? You told me I ought to listen to the voice of the people. Odd thing, ain't it?' You meet people one at a time, they seem decent, they got brains that work, and then they get together, and you hear the voice of the people, and it snarls. That's mob rule. Oh, no, surely not, said Vimes. Call it democratic justice. 
One man, one rock, Detritus volunteered. Jenkins looked like a man afraid the world was about to drop out of his bottom. He glared at Vimes and then at Carrot, and saw no help there. Of course you'd have nothing to fear from us, said Vimes, although you might trip on your way down the stairs to the cells. There's no stairs down to your cells. Stairs can be arranged. Please, Mr. Jenkins, said Carrot, the good cop. I wasn't taking the weapons to clatch, Jenkins said slowly, as if he was reading the words very painfully off some interior script. I had, in fact, bought them to donate them to... Yes, yes, said Vimes. Our brave lads, said Jenkins. Well done, said Carrot. And you'd be happy to... Vimes prompted, and I'd be happy to... Lend my boat to the war effort, said Jenkins, sweating. A true patriot, said Vimes. Jenkins writhed. Who told you there was a false panel in the hold, he demanded. It was a guess, right? Right, said Vimes. Aha! I knew you were only guessing. Patriotic and clever, said Vimes. Now, how do you make this thing go fast? Lord Rust tapped his fingers on the table. What did he take the boat for? Mm, Dunno, my lord, said Cumbling Michael, scratching his head. Damn! Did anyone else see them? Oh, there weren't many people around, my lord. That's a small mercy, at least. Just me and foul old Ron and the duck man and blind Hugh and Ringo Eyebrows and No Way Jose and Sidney Lopsides and that bastard Stooley and Whistling Dick and a few others, my lord. Rust sank back in his chair and put a pale hand over his face. In Arkmorpork, the night had a thousand eyes, and so did the day, and it also had five hundred mouths and nine hundred and ninety-nine ears. Sidney Lopsides again. The Clatchians must know, then, he said. A detachment of Ankh-Morpork soldiery has taken ship for Clatch, an invasion force. Oh, you could hardly call it, Lieutenant Hornet began. The Clatchians will call it that. Besides, the troll Detritus is with them, said Rust. Hornet looked glum. Detritus was an invasion force all by himself. What ships have we commandeered, said Rust. There's more than twenty now, if you include the indestructible, the indolence, and the— Lieutenant Hornet looked at his list again. And the prid of Ark Morpork, sir. The prid? I'm afraid so, sir. We should be able to take more than a thousand men and two hundred horses, then. Why not let Vimes go, said Lord Salachi. Let the Clatchians deal with him, and good riddance. And give them a victory over Ark Morpork forces? That's how they will see it, damn the man. He forces our hand, but still, perhaps it is for the best. We should embark. Are we entirely ready, sir? said Lieutenant Hornet, with the special inflection that means we are not entirely ready, sir. We had better be. Glory awaits, gentlemen. In the words of General Tacticus, let us take history by the scrotum. Of course, he was not a very honourable fighter. White sunlight etched dark shadows in Prince Kadram's palace. He, too, had a map of Clatch, made of tiny coloured tiles set into the floor. He sat looking at it pensively. "'Just one boot,' he said. General Ashal, his chief adviser, nodded, and added, "'Our scryers can't get a very clear picture over that distance, but we do believe one of the men to be Vimes. You recall the name, sire?' Ah, the useful Commander Vimes, the prince smiled. Indeed, and since then there has been a lot of activity all along the docks. We have to take the view that the expeditionary force is setting out. I thought we had at least a week, Ashal. It is certainly puzzling. They cannot possibly be prepared, sire. Something must have happened. Kadram sighed. Oh, well, let us follow where fate points the way. Where will they attack? Gebra, sire. I'm sure of it. Our most heavily fortified city? Surely not. Only an idiot would do that. I have studied Lord Rust in some depth, sire. Remember that he doesn't expect us to fight, so the size of our forces really doesn't worry him. The general smiled. It was a neat, thin little smile. And, of course, in attacking us... 
He is piling infamy upon infamy. The other coastal states will take note. A change of plan, then, said Kadram. Ankh Morpork can wait. A wise move, sire, as always. Any news of my poor brother? Alas, no, sire. Our agents must search harder. The world is watching, I shall. Correct, sire. Sarge? Yes, Nobby? Tell me again about our special qualities. Shut up and keep peddling, Nobby. Right, Sarge. It was quite dark in the boat. A candle swung from a bracket over Leonard of Quirm's bowed head as he sat steering with two levers. Around Nobby, pulleys rattled and little chains clicked. It was like being inside a sewing machine. A damp one, too. Condensation dropped off the ceiling in a steady stream. They had been peddling for ten minutes. Leonard had spent most of the time talking excitedly. Nobby got the impression he didn't get out much. He talked about everything. There were the tanks of air, for example. Nobby was happy to accept that you could squeeze air up really small, and that was what was in the groaning, creaking, steel-bound casks strapped to the walls. It was what happened to the air afterwards that came as a surprise. Bubbles, said Leonard. Dolphins again, you see. They don't swim through the water, they fly through a cloud of bubbles, which is much easier, of course. I add a little soap, which seems to improve matters. He thinks dolphins fly, Sarge, whispered Nobby. Just keep paddling. Sergeant Colon risked a glance behind him. Lord Vetinari was sitting on an upturned box, amidst the clicking chains, with several of Leonard's sketches open on his knees. Carry on, Sergeant, said the patrician. Right, sir. The boat was moving faster now they were away from the city. There was even a brackish light filtering through the little glass windows. Mr. Leonard, said Nobby. Yes? Where are we going? His lordship wishes to go to Lesp. Yes, I thought it would be something like that, said Nobby. I thought, where don't I want to go? And the answer just popped into my head just like that. Only I don't think we'll get there, the reason being in about another five minutes my knees are going to fall off. Oh, my word, you won't have to pedal all the way, said Leonard. What do you think the big auger on the nose is for? That, said Nobby, I thought that was for drilling into the bottom of enemy ships. What? Leonard spun around in his seat, a look of horror on his face. Sink ships? Sink ships? With people on them? Well, yes. Corporal Nobbs, I think you are a very misguided young man, said Leonard stiffly. Use the boat to sink ships. That would be terrible. In any case, no sailor would dream of doing such a dishonourable thing. Sorry. The auger, I would have you know, is for attaching us to passing ships in the manner of the remora, the suckerfish which attaches itself to sharks. A few turns is all that is necessary for a firm attachment. So you couldn't bore all the way through the hull, then? Only if you were a very careless and extremely thoughtless young man. The ocean waves may not be ploughable, but the crust of the river Ankh downstream from the city was known to sprout small bushes in the summertime. The milker moved slowly, leaving a furrow behind it. Can't you go faster? said Vimes. Why, certainly, said Jenkins nastily. Where would you like us to put the extra mast? The ship's just a dot, said Carrot. Why aren't we gaining on them? It's a bigger ship, so it's got what we technically call more sails, said Jenkins. And there are fast hulls on those Clatchian boats, and we've got a full hold. He stopped, but it was too late. Captain Carrot, said Vimes. Sir? Throw everything overboard, said Vimes. Not the crossbows. They cost more than a hundred dollars each. Jenkins stopped. Vimes's expression said very clearly that there were a whole lot of things that could be thrown off the boat, and it would be a good idea not to be among them. Go and pull some ropes, Mr. Jenkins, he said. He watched the captain stamp off. A few moments later there was a splash. Vimes looked over the side and saw a crate bob for a moment and then sink, and he felt happy. Thief-taker, Rust had called him. The man had meant it as an insult, but it'd do. Theft was the only crime, whether the loot was gold, innocence, land, or life. And for the thief-taker, there was the chase.
There were several more splashes. Vimes fancied the ship surged forwards. The chase. Because the chase was simpler than the capture, once you'd caught someone it got complicated, but the chase was pure and free, much better than prodding at clues and peering at notebooks. He flees, I chase. Simple. Veterinary's terrier, hmm? Bingley, 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 beep, said his pocket. Don't tell me, said Vimes. It's something like 5 p.m. at sea, yes? Er, uh, no, said the disorganiser. Says here, violent row with Lord Rust, insert name here. Aren't you supposed to tell me what I'm going to do, said Vimes, opening the box? Er, uh, what you should be doing, said the demon, looking very worried. What you should be doing. I don't understand it. Um, something seems to be wrong. Angua stopped trying to rub the collar off against a bulkhead. It wasn't working, and the silver pressing against her skin seemed to freeze her and burn her at the same time. Apart from that, and a silver collar on a werewolf was a fairly major that, she'd been treated well. They'd left a plate of food, a wooden plate, and she'd let her wolf side eat it while the human side shut its eyes and held its nose. There was a bowl of water, quite fresh by Aunt Morpork standards. She could see the bottom of the bowl, at least. It was so hard to think in wolf shape. It was like trying to unlock a door while drunk. It was possible, but you had to concentrate every step of the way. There was a sound. Her ears pricked up. Something tapped once or twice under the hull. She hoped it was a reef. That meant land, possibly. With any luck, she could swim ashore. Something clinked. She'd forgotten about the chain. It was hardly necessary. She felt as weak as a kitten. There was a rhythmic noise, like something chewing at the wood. A tiny metal point splintered through the wall just in front of her nose and rose an inch. And someone spoke. It sounded far off and distorted, and perhaps only a werewolf would have heard it, but words were happening somewhere under her paws. Can stop peddling now, Corporal Nobbs. I am knackered, Sarge. Is there anything to eat? There's some more of that garlic sausage, or there's the cheese or cold beans. We're in a tin with no air and we're supposed to eat cheese. I ain't even gonna comment on the beans. I'm very sorry, gentlemen. Things were rather rushed and I had to take food which would keep. It's just that it's getting a bit crowded, if you get my meaning. I will pay out the rope as soon as it's dark and we can surface and take on air. Just so long as we get rid of the air we've got, that's all I'm saying. Angua's brows wrinkled as she tried to make sense of this. The voices were familiar. Even muffled as they were, she recognised the tones. The vague feeling that fought its way through the mists of animal intellect was friends. The tiny little unchangeable centre of her thought, Good grief, next thing I'll be licking hands. She laid her head down near the point again. Way to do it, young man, there you go again, sink ships I can't imagine how anyone could think of such a thing. Names. Some of those voices had names. Thinking was getting harder. That was the silver at work. But if she stopped, she might forget how to start again. She stared at the point of metal, the point of metal with sharp edges. The tiny human part of her mind raged at the wolf brain, trying to get it to understand what it needed to do. It was after midnight. The lookout man knelt on the deck in front of 71-hour Ahmed and trembled. I know what I saw, Wali, he moaned. And the others saw it too. Something rose up behind the ship and began chasing us. Uh, a monster. Ahmed looked at the captain, who shrugged. Who knows what lies on the floor of the sea, Wally? It's breath, moaned the seaman. There was a great roar of breath like the stink of a thousand privies. And then it spoke. Really, said Ahmed. This is not unusual. What did it say? I did not understand. The man's face screwed up as he tried to assemble the unfamiliar syllables. It sounded like, he swallowed and went on, Ye gods, that was better out than in, Sarge. Ahmed stared at him. And what did that mean to you? he said. I do not know, Wali. You have not spent much time in Ankh-Morpork? No, Wali. Then return to your post. The man stumbled out. We have lost speed, Wally, said the captain. Perhaps the sea monster is clutching at our keel. It pleases you to joke, Lord, but who knows what has been disturbed by the rising of the new land? 
I shall have to see for myself, said Seventy-One Hour Ahmed. He walked alone to the stern of the ship. Dark waters sucked and splashed, and left a phosphorescent glow edging the wake. He watched for a long time. People bad at watching didn't last long in the desert, where a shadow in the moonlight could be just a shadow, or it could be someone anxious to help you on your way to paradise. The dregs came across many shadows of the latter persuasion. Dereg wasn't their name for themselves, although they tended to adopt it now out of pride. The word meant enemy, everyone's. And if anyone else wasn't around, then one another's. If he concentrated, he might believe that there was a darker shape about a hundred yards behind the ship, very low in the water. Waves were breaking where waves shouldn't be. It looked as though the ship was being followed by a reef. Well, well. Seventy-one-hour Ahmed was not superstitious. He was substitious, which put him in a minority among humans. He didn't believe in the things everyone believed in, but which nevertheless weren't true. He believed instead in the things that were true, in which no one else believed. There are many such substitutions, ranging from it'll get better if you don't picket it, all the way up to sometimes things just happen. Currently, he was disinclined to believe in sea monsters, especially ones that spoke in the language of Ankh Morpork, but he did believe that there were a lot of things in the world that he didn't know about. In the far distance, he could see the lights of a ship. It didn't seem to be gaining on them. This was much more worrying. In the darkness, seventy-one-hour Ahmed reached over his shoulder and grasped the handle of his sword. Above him, the mainsail creaked in the wind. Sergeant Colon knew he was facing one of the most dangerous moments in his career. There was nothing for it. He was out of options. Er, uh, if I add this A and this O, and this I and this D, he said, the sweat pouring down his pink cheeks, then I can use that V to make a void. Er... Uh, and that gets me, uh, 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 what do you call these blue squares, Len? Uh, three times ye value of the letter score, said Leonard of Quirm. Well done, Sergeant, said Lord Betinari. I do believe that puts you in the lead. Uh, I do believe it does, sir, squeaked Sergeant Colon. However, I find that you have left me the use of my U, N, and A, B, L, E the patrician went on, which incidentally lands me on this three times the whole word square, and I rather suspect wins me the game. Sergeant Colon sagged with relief. A capital game, Leonard, said Vetinari. What did you say it was called? I call it the make words with letters that have all been mixed up game, my lord. Ah, yes, obviously. Well done. Eh, and I got three points, mumbled Nobby. They was perfectly good words that you wouldn't let me have to. I'm sure the gentlemen don't want to know those words, said Colin severely. I'd have got ten points for that X. Leonard looked up. Strange, we seem to have stopped moving. He reached up and opened the hatch. Damp night air poured in, and there was the sound of voices quite close, echoing loudly as voices do when heard across water. He then clatchy and talk, said Colon. What are they gabbling about? What nephew of a camel cut the rigging, said Lord Vetinari, without looking up. Not just the ropes, look at the sail. Here, give me a hand. I didn't know you spoke clatchian, my lord. Not a word, said Lord Vetinari. But you... I did not, said Vetinari calmly. Ah, right. Where are we, Leonard? Well, my star charts are all out of date, of course, but if you would care to wait until the sun rises, and I've invented a device for ascertaining position by reference to the sun, and devised a satisfactorily accurate watch, where are we now, Leonard? Um, in the middle of the Circle Sea, I suspect. The middle? Pretty close, I should say. Look, if I can measure the wind speed... Then Lesp should be in this vicinity? Oh, yes, I should... Good. Unhitch us from this apparently stricken ship while we still have the cover of darkness, and in the morning I wish to see this troublesome land. In the meantime, I suggest that everyone get some sleep. Sergeant Colon did not get a lot of sleep. 
This was partly because he was woken up several times by sawing and banging coming from the front of the boat, and partly because the water kept dripping on his head, but mainly because the lull in activity was causing him to consider his position. Sometimes when he woke up he saw the patrician hunched over Leonard's drawings, a gaunt silhouette in the light of the candle, reading, making notes. He was in the immediate company of a man even the Assassin's Guild was frightened of. Another man who would stay up all night in order to invent an alarm clock to wake him up in the morning, and a man who had never knowingly changed his underwear. And he was at sea. He tried to look on the bright side. What was the main reason why he hated boats? The fact that they sank, right? But this one had the sinking built in right from the start, and you didn't have to watch the waves going up and down because they were already above you. All this was logical. It just wasn't very comforting. When he awoke at one point, there were faint voices coming from the other end of the vessel. Don't quite understand, my lord. Why, then? They do what they're told. They tend to believe the last thing they heard. They're not bright enough to ask questions, and they have that certain unshakable loyalty available to those unencumbered by too much intelligence. I suppose so, my lord. Such men are valuable, believe me. Sergeant Colon turned over and tried to make himself comfortable. Glad I'm not like those poor bastards, he thought as he drifted off to sleep on the bosom of the deep. I'm a man with special qualities. Vimes shook his head. The stern light of the Clatchian ship was barely visible in the gloom. Are we gaining on them, he said. Captain Jenkins nodded. We might be. There's a lot of sea between us. And has all excess weight been thrown overboard? Yes. What do you want me to do, shave my beard off? Carrot's face appeared over the edge of the hold. All the lads are bedded down, sir. Right. I'll turn in for a few hours too, sir, if it's all right with you. Sorry, Captain. I'll get the head down, sir. But, but... Vimes waved vaguely at the darkening horizon. We're in hot pursuit of your girlfriend, among other things, he added. Yes, sir. So aren't you... you mean you can... you want to... Captain, you intend to go and have a bit of a nap? To refresh for when we catch up with them, yes, sir. If I spend the whole night staring out there worrying, then I'll probably be a bit useless when we catch up with them, sir. It made sense. It really did make sense. Of course it made sense. Vimes could see the sense all over it. Carrot had actually sat down and thought sensibly about things. You'll be able to get to sleep, will you? he said weakly. Oh, yes. I owe it to Angua. Oh. Well, good night, then. Carrot disappeared into the hold again. Good heavens, said Jenkins. Is he real? Yes, said Vimes. I mean, would you go and bang your ear if we was chasing your lady in that ship? Vimes said nothing. Jenkins sniggered. Mind you, if it was Lady Sybil, she'd be a bit lower on the water line. You just watch the, the sea. Don't run into any damn whales or anything, said Vimes, and strode up to the sharp end. Carrot, he thought. If you didn't know him, you wouldn't believe it. They're slowing, Mr. Vimes, Jenkins called out. What? I reckon they're slowing down, I said. Good. So what are you going to do when we catch them? Nah. Vimes hadn't given this a lot of thought, but he recalled a very bad woodcut he'd once seen in a book about pirates. We'll swing across onto them with our cutlasses in our teeth, he said. Really? said Jenkins. That's good. I haven't seen that done in years. Only ever seen it done once, in fact. Oh, yes. Yeah, this lad had seen the idea in a book, and he swung across into the other ship's rigging with his cutlass clenched, as you say, between his teeth. Yes. Topless Harry, we wrote on his coffin. Oh. I don't know if you've ever seen a soft-boiled egg after you've picked up your knife and slight. All right, I see the point. What do you suggest? Grapnels. You can't beat grapnels. Catch them on the other ship and just pull them towards you. And you've got grapnels? Oh, yes. Saw some only today, in fact. Good. Then, as I recall, Jenkins went on relentlessly, it was when your Sergeant Detritus was chucking stuff over the side and he said, What shall we do with these bendy hooky things, sir? And someone can't recall his name just at this minute, said, they are dead weight, throw them over. Why didn't you say something? Oh, well, I didn't like to, said Jenkins. You were doing so well. 
Don't mess me about, Captain, otherwise I'll clap you in irons. No, you ain't going to do that, and I'll tell you why. First, because when Captain Carrot said, These chains, sir, what shall I do with them? You said, Now listen, you. And second, I don't reckon you know anything about ships. Oh, dearie me. We don't clap people in irons, we put them in chains. Do you know how to splice the main brace? Because I don't. All that yo-ho-ho -ho stuff's for landlubbers, or it would be if we ever used words like landlubber. Do you know the difference between port and starboard? I don't. I've never even drunk starboard. Shiver my timber. Isn't it shiver my timbers? I've been ill. Captain Jenkins spun the wheel. Also, this is a frisky wind, and me and my crew know how to pull the strings that make the big square canvas things work properly. If your men tried it, you'd soon find out how far it is to land. How far is it to land? About thirty fathoms hereabouts. The light was noticeably nearer. Bingly, 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 beep. Good grief, what now? said Vimes. Eight p.m. Uh, narrowly escape assassination by Clatchian spy. Vimes went cold. Where? he said, looking around wildly. Corner of Brewer Street and Broadway, said the little sing-song voice. But I'm not there. What's the point of having appointments, then? What's the point of my making an effort? You told me you wanted to know what you ought to... Listen, you don't have an appointment for being assassinated. The demon went silent for a moment and then said, You mean it should be on your to-do list? Its voice was trembling. You mean like, to do? Die? Look, it's no good taking it out on me just because you're not on the right timeline. What the hell does that mean? Aha! Uh -huh. I knew you didn't read the manual. Chapter 7, 2C makes it very clear that sticking to one reality is vitally important, otherwise the uncertainty principle says, Forget I asked, all right. Vimes glared at Jenkins and at the distant ship. We'll do this my way, wherever the hell we are, he said. He strode to the hold and pulled aside a hatchway. Detritus! The Clatchian sailors struggled with the canvas while their captain screamed at them. Seventy-one-hour Ahmed didn't scream. He just stood with his sword in his hand, watching. The captain hurried over to him, trembling with fear and holding a length of rope. See, Wally, he said, someone cut it. Who would do that? said seventy-one-hour Ahmed quietly. I do not know, but when I find him... The dogs are almost on us, said Ahmed. You and your men will work faster. Who could have done such a thing, said the captain. You were here. How could they... His gaze flickered from the cut rope to the sword. Was there something you wished to say, said Ahmed. The captain hadn't got where he was by being stupid. He spun around. Get that sail up right now, you festering sons of bitches, he screamed. Good said Seventy-One-Hour Ahmed. Detritus's crossbow was originally a three-man siege weapon, but he had removed the windlass as an unnecessary encumbrance. He cocked it by hand. Usually the mere sight of the troll pulling the string back with one finger was enough to make the strong-willed surrender. He looked doubtfully at the distant light. "'It's a million to one chance,' he said. "'Got to be closer than this.' Just hit it below the waterline so they can't cut the rope, said Vimes. Right, right. What's the problem, Sergeant? We're heading for Clatch, right? Well, in that direction, yes. Only, I'm going to be really stupid in Clatch because of the heat, right? I hope we're going to stop them before we get there, Detritus. I ain't keen on being stupid. I know people say, that troll Detritus, he's thicker than a... than a... Brick sandwich, said Vimes, staring at the light. Right, only I hear in it get really, really hot in the desert. The troll looked so mournful that Vimes felt moved to give him a cheerful slap on the back. Then let's stop them now, eh? he said, shaking his hand hurriedly to stop the stinging. The other ship was so close they could see the sailors working feverishly on the deck. The mainsail billowed in the lamplight. Detritus raised the bow. A ball of blue-green light glowed on the tip of the arrow. The troll stared at it. Then green fire ran down the masts, and when it hit the deck, burst into dozens of green balls that rolled, cracking and spitting over the planks. "'They're using magic?' said Detritus. 
A green flame spluttered over his helmet. What is this, Jenkins? said Vimes. It ain't magic. It's worse than magic, said the captain, hurrying forward. All right, lads, get those sails down right now. You leave them where they are, shouted Vimes. You know what this is? It don't even feel warm, said Detritus, poking the flame on the crossbow. Don't touch it! Don't touch it! That's St. Ungulant's fire, that is. It means we're going to die in a dreadful storm. Vimes looked up. Clouds were racing across. No, they were pouring into the sky in great twisting billows, like ink streaming into water. Blue light flashed somewhere inside them. The ship lurched. Look! We've got to lose some sail, shouted Jenkins. That's the only way. No one touches anything, shouted Vimes. Green fire skimmed along the tops of the waves now. Detritus, arrest any man who touches anything. Right. We want to go fast, after all, Vimes said, above the hissing and the distant crackle of thunder. Jenkins gawped at him as the ship lunged beneath them. You're mad. Have you any idea what happens to a ship that tries... You haven't got any idea, have you? This isn't normal weather. You have to ride it out careful. You can't try to run ahead of it. Something slippery landed on Detritus's head and bounced onto the deck where it tried to slither away. And now it's raining fish, Jenkins moaned. The clouds formed a yellow haze, lit almost constantly by the lightning. And it was warm. That was the strangest thing. The wind howled like a sack full of cats, and the waves were turning into walls on either side of the ship, but the air felt like an oven. Look, even the Clatchians are reducing sail, shouted Jenkins in a shower of shrimp. Good, we'll catch them up. Mad, ouch! Something hard rebounded from his hat, hit the rail and rolled to a stop by Vimes's feet. It was a brass knob. Oh, no! moaned Jenkins, putting his arms over his head. Now it's bloody bedsteads again! The captain of the Clatchian ship was not an argumentative man when he was anywhere near 71-hour Ahmed. He just looked at the straining sails and calculated his chances of paradise. Perhaps the dog who cut the sail loose did us a favour, he shouted above the roar of the wind. Ahmed said nothing. He kept looking back. The occasional burst of electric storm light showed the ship behind aflame with green light. Then he looked at the cold fire streaming behind their own masts. Can you see that light on the edge of the flames? he said. My lord? Can you, man? Uh, no. Of course you can't. But can you see where the light isn't? The captain stared at him and then looked up again in terrified obedience. And there was somewhere where the light wasn't. As the fizzing green tongues waved in the wind, they seemed to be edged with blackness, perhaps, or a moving hole in space. That's Octarine, shouted Ahmed, as another wave sloshed over the deck. Only wizards can see it. There's magic in these storms. That's why the weather is so bad. The ship screamed in every joint as it hit the waves again. We we're coming right out the water, wept Jenkins. We're just going from crest to crest. Good. It won't be so bumpy, shouted Vimes. We should pick up speed again now we've got those bedsteads over the side. Does it often raid bedsteads out here? What do you think? I'm not a nautical man. No, rains of bedsteads are not an everyday occurrence, nor are coal scuttles, Jenkins added as something black crashed off a rail and over the side. We just get the normal stuff, you know, rain, snow, sleet, fish. Another squall blew across the bounding boat and the deck was suddenly covered with flashing silver. Back to fish, shouted Vimes. That's better, surely. No, it's worse. Why? Jenkins held up a tin. These are sardines! The ship thumped into another wave, groaned and took flight again. The cold green fire was everywhere. Every nail of the deck sprouted its flame. Every rope and ladder had its green outline. And the feeling crept over Vimes that it was holding the ship together. He wasn't at all sure that it was just light. It moved too purposefully. It crackled, but it didn't sting. It looked as though it was having fun. The ship landed. Water washed over Vimes. Captain Jenkins! Yes! Why are we playing with this wheel? It's not as if the rudder's in the water. They let go. The spokes blurred for a moment and then stopped as the fire wrapped itself around them. Then it rained cake. The watch had tried to make themselves comfortable in the hold, but there were difficulties. There wasn't any area of floor, which at some point in every ten seconds wasn't an area of wall. Nevertheless, someone was snoring. How can anyone sleep in this? said Red Shoe. 
Tapping Carrot can, said Cheery. She was hacking at something with her axe. Carrot had wedged himself into a corner. Occasionally he mumbled something and shifted position. Like a baby. Beats me how he's managing it, said Red Shoe. Of course, any minute this thing is going to fall apart. Yeah, but that shouldn't worry you, should it, said Detritus, on account of you being dead already. So, I end up at the bottom of the sea, knee-deep in whale droppings, and it'll be a long walk home in the dark, not to mention the problems if a shark tries to eat me. I shall fear not. According to the testament of Meserek, the fisherman Nonpur spent four days in the belly of a giant fish, said Constable Visit. The thunder seemed particularly loud in the silence. Washpot, are we talking miracles here, said Reg eventually, or just a very slow digestive process? You would be better employed considering the state of your immortal soul than making jokes, said Constable Visit severely. It's the state of my immortal body that's worrying me, said Reg. I have a leaflet here which will bring you considerable... Visit began. Washpot, is it big enough to be folded into a boat that'll save us all? Constable Visit pounced on the opening. Aha! Yes, metaphorically, it is. Hasn't this ship got a lifeboat? said Cheery hurriedly. I'm sure I saw one when we came on. Yeah, lifeboat, said Detritus. Anyone want a sardine? said Cheery. I've managed to get a tin open. Lifeboat, Detritus repeated. He sounded like someone exploring an unpleasant truth. Like a big, heavy thing which would have slowed us down. Yes, I saw it. I know I did, said Reg. Yeah, there was one, said Detritus. That was a lifeboat, was it? At the very least we ought to get somewhere sheltered and drop the anchor. Yeah, hmm, anchor, mused Detritus. That's a big thing, kind of hooks on right. Of course, kind of heavy thing, obviously. Right, and uh, if it was dropped a long time ago on account of being heavy, that wouldn't do as much good now. Hardly, Red Shoe glared through the hatchway. The sky was a dirty yellow blanket crisscrossed with fire. Thunder boomed continuously. I wonder how far the barometer sunk, he said. All the way, said Detritus gloomily. Trust me on this. It was in the nature of a dreg to open doors carefully. There was generally an enemy on the other side, sooner or later. He saw the collar lying on the floor right by a little fountain of water trickling from the hull and swore under his breath. Ahmet waited just a moment and then pushed the door back quickly. It rattled against the wall. I don't intend to harm you, he said to the gloom of the bilges. If that was my intention, by now you'd... She wished she'd used the wolf. There would have been no problem with the wolf. That was the problem. She'd easily win, but then she'd be nervy and frightened. A human could stay on top of that. A wolf might not. She'd do the wrong things, panicky things, animal things. She pushed him hard as she dropped down from above the door, somersaulted backwards, slammed the door, and turned the key. The sword came through the planking like a hot knife through runny lard. There was a gasp beside her. She spun around and saw two men holding a net. They would have thrown it over the wolf. What they hadn't been expecting was a naked woman. The sudden appearance of a naked woman always causes a rethink of anyone's immediate plans. She kicked them both hard and ran in the opposite direction, opened the first door at random and slammed it behind her. It was the cabin with the dogs in it. They sprang to their feet, opened their mouths, and slunk down again. A werewolf can have considerable power over other animals, whatever shape she's in, although it is largely the power to make them cringe and try to look inedible. She hurried past them and pulled at one of the hangings over the bunk. The man in the bunk opened his eyes. He was a Clatchian, but pale with weakness and pain. There were dark rings under his eyes. Ah, he said, it would appear that I have died and gone to paradise. Are you a hoori? I don't have to take that kind of language, thank you, said Angua, ripping the silk in two with a practiced hand. She was aware that she had a slight advantage over male werewolves in that naked women caused fewer complaints, although the downside was that they got some pressing invitations. Some kind of covering was essential, for modesty and the prevention of inconvenient bouncing, which was why fashioning impromptu clothes out of anything to hand was a lesser-known werewolf skill. Angua stopped. Of course, to the unpractised eye, all Clatchians looked alike, but then to a werewolf, all humans looked alike. They looked appetizing. 
she'd learned to discern. Are you Prince Kufura? I am. And you are? The door was kicked open. Angua leapt towards the window and flung aside the bar, restraining the shutters. Water funneled into the cabin, drenching her, but she managed to scramble up and out. Just passing through, the prince murmured. Seventy-one-hour Ahmed strode to the window and looked out. Green-blue waves edged with fire fought outside as the ship heaved. No one could stay afloat in a sea like that. He turned and looked along the hull to where Angua was clinging to a trailing line. She saw him wink at her. Then he turned away, and she heard him say, She must have drowned. Back to your posts. Presently, up on the deck, a hatch closed. The sun rose in a cloudless sky. A watcher, if such had been out there, would have noticed a slight difference in the way the swells were moving on this tiny patch of sea. They might even have wondered about this piece of bent piping which turned with a faint squeaking noise. Had they been able to place an ear to it, they would have heard the following. His idea, while I was dozing off, piece of pipe, two angled mirrors, the solution to all our steering and air problems. Fascinating. A seeing thing's pipe you can breathe down. My goodness, how did you know it was called that, my lord? A lucky guess. Here, someone's redesigned my peddling seat. It's comfortable. Ah, oh, yes, Corporal. I took some measurements while you were asleep, and rebuilt it for a better anatomical configuration. You took measurements? Oh, yes, I... what, of my... saddlery regions? Oh, please don't be concerned. Anatomy is something of a passion with me. Is it? Is it? Well, you can stop being passionate about mine for a start. Here, I can see an island of some sort. The pipe squeaked around. Ah, leshp. And I see people. To your pedals, gentlemen. Let us explore the ocean's bottom. I expect we shall, with him steering. Shut up, Nobby. The pipe slid down into the waves. There was a little flurry of bubbles and a damp argument about whose job it should have been to put the cork in, and then the patch of sea that had been empty was somehow a little bit emptier still. There weren't any fish. At a time like this, Solid Jackson would have even been prepared to eat curious squid, but the sea was empty, and it smelled wrong. It fizzed gently. Solid could see little bubbles breaking on the surface, which burst with a smell of sulphur and rotting eggs. He guessed that the rise of the land must have stirred up a lot of mud. It was bad enough at the bottom of a pond, all those frogs and bugs and things, and this was the sea. He tried hard to reverse that train of thought, but it kept on rising from the depths like a... Like, uh, why would there no fish? Oh, there'd been the storm last night, but generally you got better fishing in these parts after a storm, because it stirred up. The raft rocked. He was beginning to think it might be a good idea to go home, but that had been leaving the land to the Clatchians, and that had happened over his dead body. The treacherous internal voice said, Funnily enough, they never found Mr. Hong's body, not most of the important bits anyway. I think, I think uh, we'll be getting back now, he said to his son. Oh, Dad, said Les, another dinner of limpets and seaweed? Nothing wrong with seaweed, said Jackson. It's full of nourishing seaweeds, got iron in it. It's good for you, iron. Why don't we boil an anchor, then? None of your lip, son. The Clatchians have got bread, said Les. They brought flour with them, and they've got firewood. This was a sore point with Jackson. Efforts to make seaweed combust had not been successful. Yeah, but you wouldn't like their bread, said Jackson. It's all flat and got no proper crust. The breeze blew the scent of baking over the water. It carried a hint of spices. They're baking bread on our property. Well, they say it's their property. Jackson grabbed the piece of broken plank he used as an oar and began to scull furiously towards the shore. The fact that this only made the raft go round in circles added to his fury. They bloody move in right next to us, and all we get is the stink of foreign food. Why's your mouth watering, Dad? And how come they've got wood, may I ask? I think the current takes the driftwood to their side of the island, Dad. See, they're stealing our driftwood, our damned driftwood. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll... 
but I thought we agreed that the bit over there was theirs, and— Jackson had finally remembered how to propel a raft with one oar. That wasn't an agreement, he said, creating foam as the oar thrashed back and forth. That was just an— an arrangement. It's not as if they created the driftwood. It just turned up. Accident of geography. It is a natural resource, right? It don't belong to anyone. The raft hit something which made a metallic sound, but they were still a hundred yards from the rocks. Something else, long and bent at the end, rose up with a creaking noise. It twisted around until it pointed at Jackson. Excuse me, it said in a tinny yet polite voice, but this is Lesh, isn't it? Jackson made a sound in his throat. Only, the thing went on, the water's a little cloudy, and I thought we might have been going the wrong way for the last twenty minutes. Leshp, squeaked Jackson, in an unnaturally high-pitched voice. Ah, oh, good, thank you so much, good day to you. The appendage sank slowly into the sea again. The last sounds from it erupting on the surface in a cloud of bubbles were, Don't forget to put the cork in, you've forgotten to put the cork in. The bubbles stopped. After a while, Les said, Dad? What was that? It wasn't anything, snapped his father. That sort of thing doesn't happen. The raft shot forward. You could have water-skied behind it. Another important thing about the boat, thought Sergeant Colon gloomily, as they slipped back into a blue twilight, was that you couldn't bail out the bilges. It was the bilges. He was peddling with his feet in water, and he was suffering simultaneously from claustrophobia and agoraphobia. He was afraid of everything in here and everything out there at the same time. Plus, there were unpleasantnesses out there moving past as the boat drifted down the wall of rock. Feelers waved. There were claws. Things scuttled into the waving weeds. Giant clams watched Sergeant Colon with their lips. The boat creaked. Sarge, said Nobby, as they looked out at the wonders of the deep. Yes, Nobby. You know they say every tiny part of your body is replaced every seven years. A well-known fact, said Sergeant Colon. Right, so, I've got a tattoo on my arm, right? Had it done eight years ago, so, how come it's still there? Giant seaweeds winnowed the gloom. Interesting point, quavered Colon. Um... I mean, OK, new tiny bits of skin float in, but that means it ought to be all new and pink by now. A fish with a nose like a saw swam past. In the middle of all his other fears, Sergeant Colon tried to think fast. What happens, he said, is that all the blue skin bits are replaced by other blue skin bits. Off of other people's tattoos. So I've got other people's tattoos now. Er, uh, yes. Amazing, because it still looks like mine. It's got the cross daggers and wum. Wum? It was going to be mum, but I passed out and Needle Ned didn't notice I was upside down. I should have thought he'd noticed that. He was pissed too. Come on, Sarge, you know it's not a proper tattoo unless no one can remember how it got there. Leonard and the patrician were staring out at the submarine landscape. What are they looking for? said Colin. Leonard keeps talking about hieroglyphs, said Nobby. What are they, Sarge? Colon hesitated, but not for long. Ah, a type of mollusk, Corporal. Tch, you know everything, Sarge, said Nobby admiringly. That's what hieroglyphs are, is it? So if we go any deeper, there'll be lower oglyphs. There was something slightly off-putting about Nobby's grin. Sergeant Colon decided to go for broke. Don't be daft, Nobby. Lower old glyphs if you go lower. Oh, dearie me. Sorry, Sarge. Everyone knows you don't get lower old glyphs in these waters. A couple of curious squid peered at them. Curious. Jenkins' ship was a floating wreck. Several sails were in tatters. Rigging and other string that Vimes refused to learn the nautical names for covered the deck and trailed in the water. Such sail as remained was moving them along in the brisk breeze. Atop the mast, the lookout cupped his hands round his mouth and leaned down. Land ahoy! Even I can see that, said Vimes. Why did he have to shout? It's lucky, said Jenkins. He squinted into the haze. But your friend ain't heading for Gebra. Wonder where he's going? Vimes stared at the pale yellow mass on the horizon and then up at Carrot. We'll get her back, don't worry. He said, 
I wasn't actually worrying, sir, although I am very concerned, said Carrot. Eh, uh, right. Vimes waved his arms helplessly. Uh, everyone fit and well? The men in good heart, are they? It would help morale no end if you were to say a few words, sir. The monstrous regiment of watchmen had lined up on deck, blinking in the sunshine. Oh, dear, round up the unusual suspects. One dwarf, one human who was brought up as a dwarf and thinks like a manual of etiquette, one zombie, one troll, me, and, oh, no, one religious fanatic. Constable Visit saluted. Permission to speak, sir. Go ahead, mumbled Vimes. I'm pleased to tell you, sir, that our mission is clearly divinely approved of, sir. I refer to the rain of sardines which sustained us in our extremity, sir. We were a little hungry. I wouldn't say we were in extremity. With respect, sir, said Constable Visit firmly, the pattern is firmly established, sir. Yes, indeed. The Psychulites, when being pursued in the wilderness by the forces of Oflarian Mitolites, sir, were sustained by a rain of celestial biscuits, sir. Chocolate ones, sir. Perfectly normal phenomenon, muttered Constable Shoe, probably swept up by the wind passing a baker's shop. Visit glared at him and went on, and the Murmurians, when driven into the mountains by the tribes of Mishmik, would not have survived but for a magical reign of elephants, sir. Elephants? Well, one elephant, sir, Visit conceded, but it splashed. Perfectly normal phenomenon, said Constable Shoe. Probably an elephant was picked up by a freak. And when they were thirsty in the desert, sir, the four tribes of Kanli were succoured by a sudden and supernatural rain of rain, sir. A rain of rain, said Vimes, almost mesmerised by Visit's absolute conviction. Perfectly normal phenomenon, sneered Red Shoe. Probably water was evaporated from the ocean, was blown through the sky, condensed around the nuclei when it ran into cold air and precipitated. He stopped and continued irritably. Anyway, I don't believe it. So, which particular deity is on our case? said Vimes, hopefully. I shall definitely inform you as soon as I have ascertained this, sir. Er, uh, very good, constable. Vimes took a step back. I don't pretend this is going to be easy, men, he said, but our mission is to catch up with Angua and this bastard Ahmed and shake the truth out of him. Unfortunately, this means we will be following him through his own country, with which we are at war. This is bound to put a few barriers in our way, but we should not let the prospect of being tortured to death dismay us, hmm? Fortune favours the brave, sir, said Carrot cheerfully. Good, good. Pleased to hear it, Captain. What is her position vis-a-vis -vis heavily armed, well-prepared and excessively banned armies? Oh, no one's ever heard of fortune favouring them, sir. According to General Tacticus, it's because they favour themselves, said Vimes. He opened the battered book. Bits of paper and string indicated his many bookmarks. In fact, men, the General has this to say about ensuring against defeat when outnumbered, outweaponed and outpositioned. It is, he turned the page, don't have a battle. Sounds like a clever man, said Jenkins. He pointed to the yellow horizon. See all that stuff in the air, he said. What do you think that is? Mist, said Vimes. Heh, yes, clatchy and mist. It's a sandstorm. The sand blows about all the time. Vicious stuff. If you want to sharpen your sword, just hold it up in the air. Oh, and it's just as well because otherwise you'd see Mount Gebra, and below it is what they call the Fist of Gebra. It's a town, but there's a bloody great fort, walls thirty feet thick like a big city all by itself. It's got room inside for thousands of armed men, war elephants, battle camels, everything. And if you saw that, you'd want me to turn round right now. What's your famous general got to say about it, eh? I think I saw something, said Vimes. He flicked to another page. Ah, oh, yes. He says, After the first battle of Stolat, I formulated a policy which has stood me in good stead in other battles. It is this. If the enemy has an impregnable stronghold, see, he stays there. That's a lot of help, said Jenkins. Vimes slipped the book into a pocket. So, constable visit. There's a god on our side, is there? Certainly, sir. 
but probably also a god on their side as well. Very likely, sir. There's a god on every side. Let's hope they balance out, then. The Clatchian ship's boat hit the water with the gentlest of splashes. This was because 71-hour Ahmed was standing by the winches with his sword at the ready, which had the effect of making the men lowering the boat take some trouble over their task. When we are away, you may take the ship into Gebra, he said to the captain. The captain trembled. What shall I tell them, Wali? Tell them the truth, eventually. The commander of the garrison is a man of no breeding and will torture you a little bit. Save up the truth until you need it. That will make him happy. It will help you to say that I forced you. Oh, I will, I will. Tell that lie, the captain added quickly. Ahmed nodded, slid down the rope into the boat and set it adrift. The crew watched him row through the surf. This wasn't a nice beach. It was a wrecking coast. Rib cages of broken ships crumbled into the sand. Bones and driftwood and bleached white seaweed mounded along the high tide line, and beyond the dunes of the real desert rose. Even down here sand stung the eyes and gritted the teeth. There's sudden death on that beach, said the first mate, looking over the rail and trying to blink his eyes clear. Yes, said the captain. He's just got out of the boat. The figure on the beach pulled the other recumbent figure out of the boat and dragged him out of reach of the waves. The mate raised his bow. I could kill him from here, master. Just say the word. How sure are you? Because you'd better be really sure. First, if you miss him, you're dead, and second, if you hit him, you're still dead. Look up there. On the high distant dunes, dark against the sand-filled sky, there were mounted figures. The mate dropped his bow. How did they know we were here? Oh, they watched the sea, said the captain. Dregs like a good shipwreck as much as anyone else. More, in fact. A lot more. As they turned away from the rail, something leapt from the hull and entered the water with barely a splash. Detritus tried to lurk in the shade, but there was not a lot of it about. The heat came off the high desert ahead of them like a blowtorch. I'm gonna get thick, he muttered. There was a shout from the lookout. He says someone's climbing the dunes, said Carrot. Carrying someone else, he says. Uh, female? Look, sir, I know Angua. She's not the useless type. She doesn't stand there and scream helplessly. She makes other people do that. Well, if you're sure... Vimes turned to Jenkins. Don't bother to chase the ship, Captain. Just keep heading for the shore. I don't work like that, mister. For one thing, that's a damn difficult shore. The wind's always against you, and there's some very nasty currents. Many an incautious sailor man has left his bones to bleach on those sands. No. We'll stand out a little way, and you can lower the... Uh, well, if we had a boat any more, you could lower it, and we'll drop the anchor... Oh, no. Tell a lie. It turned out to be too heavy, didn't it? You just keep straight on, said Vimes. We'll all be killed. Think of it as the lesser of two evils. What's the other one? Vimes drew his sword. Me. The boat squeaked through the mysterious depths of the ocean. Leonard spent a lot of time looking out of the tiny windows, particularly interested in pieces of seaweed, which to Sergeant Colon looked like pieces of seaweed. Do you note the fine strands of Dropley's etoliated bladderack? said Leonard. That's the brown stuff, a marvellous growth which, of course, you will see as significant. Could we just assume for the moment that I have neglected my seaweed studies in recent years? said the patrician. Really? Oh, the loss is entirely yours, I assure you. The point is, of course that the etoliated bladderack is never usually found growing above thirty fathoms, and it's only ten here. Ah, the patrician flicked through a stack of Leonard's drawings, and the hieroglyphs, an alphabet of signs and colours, colours as a language. What a fascinating idea. An emotional intensifier, said Leonard, but of course we ourselves use something like it, red for danger and so on, I never did succeed in translating it, though. Colours as a language, murmured Lord Vetinari. Sergeant Colon cleared his throat. I know something about seaweed, sir. Yes, Sergeant. Yes, sir. If it's wet, sir, it means it's going to rain. Well done, Sergeant, said Lord Vetinari without turning his head. I think it is quite possible that I will never forget you said that. 
Sergeant Colon beamed. He had made a contribution. Nobby nudged him. What are we doing down here, Sarge? I mean, what's it all about? Poking around, looking at weird marks on the rocks, going in and out of caves, and the smell on me. It's not me, said Sergeant Colon. Smells like sulphur. Little bubbles steamed past the window. It stunk up on the surface, too, Nobby went on. Nearly finished, gentlemen, said Lord Vetinari, putting the papers aside. One last little venture, and then we can surface. Very well, Leonard, take us underneath. Er, uh, aren't we underneath already, sir? said Colon. Only underneath the sea, Sergeant. Ah, right. Colon gave this due consideration. Is there anything else to be under, then, sir? Yes, Sergeant. Now we're going under the land. The beach was a lot closer now. The watchman couldn't help noticing that the sailors were all hurrying to the blunt end of the ship and hanging on to any small, lightweight and above all buoyant objects they could find. This seems close enough, said Vimes. Right, stop here. Stop here? How? Don't ask me, I'm no sailor. Aren't there some sort of breaks? Jenkins stared at him. You, you landlubber! I thought you never used that word. I never met one like you before. You even think we call the bows the sharp end. It was, the crew agreed later, one of the strangest landings in the history of bad seamanship. The shelving of the beach must have been right and the tides as well, because the ship did not so much hit the beach as sail up it, rising out of the water as the keel debarnacled itself on the sand. Finally, the forces of wind, water, impetus and friction all met at the point marked Fall Over Slowly. It did so, earning the title of world's most laughable shipwreck. Well, that might have been worse, said Vimes, when the splintering noises had died away. He eased himself out of a tangle of canvas and adjusted his helmet with as much aplomb as he could muster. He heard a groan from the lopsided hold. Is that you, Cherry? Yes, detritus. Is this me? No. Sorry. Carrot eased his way down the sloping deck and jumped onto the damp sand. He saluted. All present and lightly bruised, sir. Shall we establish a beachhead? A what? We have to dig in, sir. Vimes looked both ways along the beach, if such a sunny-sounding word could be applied to the forsaken strand. It was really just a hem to the land. Nothing stirred except the heat haze, and in the distance one or two carrion birds. What for? he said. Establish a defensible position. It's just one of those things soldiers do, sir. Vimes glanced at the birds. They were approaching with a kind of sidling, sideways hop, ready to move in just as soon as anyone had been dead for a few days. Then he flicked through Tacticus until the word Beachhead caught his eye. It says here, if you want your men to spend much time wielding a shovel, encourage them to become farmers, he said. So I think we'll press on. He can't have got very far. We'll be back soon. Jenkins waded out of the surf. He didn't look angry. He was a man who had passed through the fires of anger and was now in some strange peaceful bay beyond them. He pointed a quivering finger at his stricken ship and said, "'Pretty good shape, all things considered,' said Vimes. "'I'm sure you and your salty sailors will be able to float it again.' Jenkins and his wading crew watched the regiment as it slithered and complained its way up the side of the dune. Eventually the crew went into a huddle and drew lots, and the cook, who was always unlucky in games of chance, approached the captain. "'Never mind, Captain,' he said. "'We can probably find some decent bulks of timber in all this driftwood, "'and a few days' work with block and tackle should—' mm -hmm. "'Only we'd better get started, because he said they won't be long.' "'They won't be back,' said the captain. "'The water they've got won't last a day up there. "'They haven't got the right gear, and once they're out of sight of the sea, they'll get lost.' "'Good. It took half an hour to get to the top of the dune.' The sand had been stamped down, but even as Vimes watched, the wind caught the particles and nibbled away at the prints. "'Camel tracks,' said Vimes. "'Well, camels don't go all that fast. Let's—' "'I think Detritus is having real trouble, sir,' said Carrot. The troll was standing with his knuckles on the ground. The motor of his cooling helmet sounded harsh for a moment in the dry air, and then stopped as the sand got into the mechanism. 
feeling thick, he muttered. My brain hurts. Quick, hold your shield over his head, said Vimes. Give him some shade. He's never going to make it, sir, said Carrot. Let's send him back down to the boat. We need him. Quick, cheery, fan him with your axe. At which point the sand stood up and drew a hundred swords. Bingly, 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 beep, said a cheerful, if somewhat muffled voice. Eleven a.m. Get haircut. Eh, that's right, isn't it? It wasn't large, but slabs of collapsing building had smashed together in such a way that they made a cistern that the rain had filled half full. Solid Jackson slapped his son on the back. Fresh water at last, he said. Well done, lad. You see, I was looking at these sort of painting things, Dad, and then... Yeah, yeah, pictures of octopuses, very nice, said Jackson. <laughs> the ball is on the other foot now, and no mistake. It's our water on our side of the island, and I'd just like to see them greasy buggers claim otherwise. Let them keep their damn driftwood and suck water out of fishes. Yeah, Dad, said Les, and we can trade them some of the water for wood and flour, right? His father waved a hand cautiously. Maybe, he said. No need to rush into that, though. We're pretty close to finding a seaweed that'll burn. I mean, what are our long-term objectives here? Cooking meals and keeping warm, said Les hopefully. Well, initially, said Jackson. That's obvious. But you know what they say, lad. Give a man a fire and he's warm for a day, but set fire to him and he's warm for the rest of his life. See my point? I don't think that's actually what the saying is. I mean, we can stop here living on water and raw fish for, well, practically forever. But that lot can't go without proper fresh water for much longer, see? So they'll have to come begging to us, right? And then we deal on our terms, eh? He put his arm around his son's reluctant shoulders and waved a hand at the landscape. I mean, I started out with nothing, son, except that old boat that your granddad left me, but... You worked and scraped said Les wearily. I worked and scraped. And you've always kept your head above water? Right, I've always kept my head above water. And you've always wanted to leave me something that— Ow! Stop making fun of your dad, said Jackson. Otherwise I'll wallop the other ear. Look, you see this land? You see it? I see it, Dad. It's a land of opportunity. But there's no fresh water and all the ground's full of salt, Dad. And it smells bad. That's the smell of freedom, that is. Smells like someone did a really big fart, Dad. Ow! Sometimes the two are very similar, and it's your future I'm thinking of, lad. Les looked across the acres of decomposing seaweed in front of him. He was learning to be a fisherman like his father before him, because that's how the family had always done it, and he was too good-natured to argue, although he actually wanted to be a painter, like no one in the family had ever been before. He was noticing things, and they worried him, even though he couldn't quite say why. But the buildings didn't look right. Here and there were definite bits of, well, architecture, like more porky and pillars, and the remains of clatchy and arches. But they'd been added to buildings that looked as though some ham-fisted people had just piled rocks on top of one another. And then in other places the slabs had been stacked on top of ancient brick walls and tiled floors. He couldn't imagine who'd done the tiling, but they did like pictures of octopuses. The feeling was stealing over him that more Porkians and Clatchians arguing over who owned this piece of old sea bottom was extremely pointless. Uh, I'm thinking about my future too, Dad, he said. I really am. Far below Solid Jackson's feet, the boat surfaced. Sergeant Colon reached automatically for the screws that held the lid shut. Don't open it, Sergeant! shouted Leonard, rising from his seat. The air is getting pretty lived in, sir. It's worse outside. Worse than in here? I'm almost certain. But we're on the surface. A surface, Sergeant, said Lord Vetinari. Beside him, Nobby uncorked the seeing device and peered through it. We're in a cave, said Colon. Uh, Sarge, said Nobby. Capital, well worked out said Lord Vetinari. Yes, a cave, you could say that. Er, uh, Sarge, said Nobby again, nudging Colon. This isn't a cave, Sarge. It's bigger than a cave, Sarge. What, you mean like a cavern? Bigger. Bigger than a cavern? More like, er, uh, a big cavern. 
Yeah, that'd be about right, said Nobby, taking his eye away from the device. Have a look yourself, Sarge. Sergeant Colon peered into the tube. Instead of the darkness he was half expecting, he saw the sea's surface bubbling like a boiling saucepan. Green and yellow flashes of lightning danced across the water, illuminating a distant wall that seemed practically a horizon. The tube squeaked around. If this was a cave, it was at least a couple of miles across. How long do you think? said Lord Vetinari behind him. Well, the rock has a large proportion of tufa and pumice, very light, and once floated up the build-up of gas starts to escape very rapidly because of the swell, said Leonard. I don't know. Perhaps another week? And then I think it takes a very long time for a sufficient bubble to build up again. What are they saying, Sarge? said Nobby. This place floats. A most unusual natural phenomenon, Leonard went on. I'd have thought it was just a legend, had I not seen it for myself. Of course it's not floating, said Sergeant Colon. Honestly, Nobby, how are you ever going to find out anything when you ask daft questions like that? Land's heavier than water, right? That's why you find it at the bottom of the sea. Yeah, but he said pumice, and my grand had a pumice stone that worked a treat for getting tough skin off your feet in the tub, and that'd float. That sort of thing happens in bathtubs, maybe said Colon. Not in real life. This is just a phenomena. It's not real. Next thing you'll be saying, there's rocks up in the sky. Yeah, but I am a sergeant, Nobby. Yes, yeah, Sarge. It puts me in mind, said Leonard, of those nautical stories about giant turtles that sleep on the surface, thus causing sailors to think they are an island. Of course, you don't get giant turtles that small. Hey, Mr. Quirm, this is an amazing boat, said Nobby. Thank you. I bet you could even smash up ships with it if you wanted. There was an embarrassed silence. Altogether, an interesting experience, said Lord Betinari, making some notes. And now, gentlemen, downward and onward, please. The watchmen drew their weapons. They are dregs, sir, said Carrot, but this is all wrong. What do you mean? We're not dead yet. They're watching us like cats watch mice, thought Vimes. We can't run away and we can't win a fight, and they want to see what we'll do next. What does General Tacticus have to say about this, sir? said Carrot. There's a hundred of them, thought Vimes, and six of us, except that Detritus is drifting off, and there's no knowing what particular commandment visit is obeying right now, and Reggie's arms tend to drop off when he gets excited. I don't know, he said. Probably something along the lines of, don't allow this to happen. Why don't you check, sir, said Carrot, not taking his eyes off the watching dregs. What? I said, why don't you check, sir? Right now. Might be worth a try, sir. That's crazy, Captain. Yes, sir. The dregs have some very strange notions about crazy people, sir. Vimes pulled out the battered book. The dreg nearest to him, with a grin almost as wide and as curved as his sword, had a certain additional swagger that suggested chieftainship. A huge ancient crossbow was slung on his back. I say, said Vimes, could we just delay things a little? He strode towards the man, who looked very surprised and waved the book in the air. This is a book by General Tacticus. Don't know if you ever heard of him. Quite a big name in these parts once. Probably slaughtered your great-great-great-great-grandfather, in fact. And I just want to take a moment to see what he has to say about this situation. You don't mind, do you? The man gave Vimes a puzzled look. This might take a moment. There's no index, but I think I saw something. The chieftain took a step backwards and looked at the men next to him, who shrugged. I wonder if you could help me with this word here, Vimes went on, reaching the man's side and holding the book under his nose. He got another puzzled grin. What Vimes did next was known in Ark Morpork's alleyways as the friendly handshake, and consisted largely of driving his elbow into the man's stomach, then bringing his knee up to meet the man's chin on its way down, gritting his own teeth because of the pain in both knee and ankle, and then drawing his sword and holding it to the dreg's throat before he could scramble up. Now, Captain, said Vimes, I'd like you to say in a loud, clear voice that unless they back off a really long way, this gentleman here is going to be in some very serious legal trouble. Mr. Vimes, I don't think do it. The dreg looked into his eyes while Carrot hawked his way through the demand. 
The man was still grinning. Vimes couldn't risk shifting his gaze, but he sensed some puzzlement and confusion among the tribesmen. Then, as one man, they charged. A Clatchian fishing boat, whose captain knew which way the wind was blowing, made its way to the harbour of Alcali. It seemed to the captain that despite the favourable wind, he wasn't making quite the speed he should. He put it down to barnacles. Vimes awoke with a nose full of camel. There are far worse awakenings, but not as many as you might think. By turning his head, which took some effort, he ascertained that the camel was sitting down. By the sound of things, it was digesting something explosive. And now how had he got here? Oh, gods! But it should have worked. It was classic. You threatened to cut off the head and the body just folded up. That was how everyone reacted, wasn't it? That was practically how civilization worked. Put it down to cultural differences, then. On the other hand, he wasn't dead. According to Carrot, knowing the Deregs for five minutes and still being alive at the end of it meant that they really, really liked you. On the other hand, he'd just given their headman a handshake, which influenced people without making friends. Well, no sense lying over this saddle bound hand and foot and dying of sunstroke all day. He ought to start being a leader of men again, and would do so just as soon as he could get this camel out of his mouth. Bingly, 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 beep! Yes, said Vimes, struggling with his bonds. Would you like to know about the appointments you missed? No, I'm trying to get these damn ropes untied. Do you want me to put that on your to-do list? Oh, you've woken up, sir. It sounded like Carrot's voice, and it was the sort of thing he'd say. Vimes tried to turn his head. What he saw was mainly a white sheet, but it then became Carrot's face upside down. They asked if they should untie you, but I said you hadn't been getting enough rest lately, Carrot went on. Captain, my arms and legs have gone to sleep, Vimes began. Oh, well done, sir. That's a start, at least. Carrot. Yes, sir? I want you to listen very carefully to the order I am about to give you. Certainly, sir. The point I'm making is that it won't be a request, or a suggestion, or some sort of hint. Understood, sir? I have, as you know, always encouraged my officers to think for themselves and not blindly obey me, but sometimes in any organisation it is necessary for instructions to be followed to the letter and with alacrity. Right, sir. Untie me right now, or you'll bloody well live to regret untying me. Er, uh, sir, I believe there is an inadvertent inconsistency in... Carrot! Of course, sir. His ropes were cut. He slid down onto the sand. The camel turned its head, looked at him with its nostrils for a moment, and then looked away. Vimes managed to sit upright, while Carrot busied himself cutting the rest of his bonds. Captain, why are you wearing a white sheet? It's a burnus, sir. Very practical for desert wear. The Deregs gave them to us. Us? The rest of us, sir. Everyone's okay? Oh, yes. But they attacked. Yes, sir, but they only wanted to take us prisoners, sir. One of them did accidentally cut Reggie's head off, but he did help him sew it on again, so no real harm done there. I thought de Regs didn't take prisoners. Beats me too, sir, but they say if we try to escape they'll cut our feet off, and Reg says he hasn't got enough thread for everyone, sir. Vimes rubbed his head. Someone had hit him so hard his helmet was dented. What went wrong, he said. I had their boss down. As I understand it, sir, the de Regs think that any leader who is stupid enough to be defeated so easily isn't worth following. It's a Clatchian thing. Vimes tried to persuade himself that there wasn't a hint of sarcasm in Carrot's voice as he went on. They're not really very interested in leaders, sir, to tell you the truth. They look on them as a sort of ornament. You know, just someone to shout charge, sir. A leader has to do other things, Carrot. The dregs think charge pretty well covers all of them, sir. Vimes managed to stand up. Strange muscles twanged in his legs. He tottered forward. Here, let me give you a hand, said Carrot, catching him. The sun was setting. Ragged tents clustered below one of the dunes, and there was the glow of firelight. Someone was laughing. It didn't sound like a prison, but then thought Vimes the desert was probably better than bars. He wouldn't even know which way to run, feet or no feet. The dregs, like all Clatchians, are a very hospitable people, said Carrot, as if he'd memorised this. They take hospitality very, very seriously. Their captors were sitting around the fire. 
so were the watchmen. They'd also been persuaded to dress more suitably, which meant that Cheery looked like a girl in her mum's dress, apart from the iron helmet, and Red Shoe looked like a mummy, and Detritus was a small snow-covered mountain. "'He's gone very insensible in all this heat,' whispered Carrot, "'and that's Constable Visit over there arguing religion. There are 653 religions on the Clatchian continent.' "'He must be having fun. And this is Jabbar,' said Carrot. Exhibit A, who looked like a slightly older version of 71-hour Ahmed, stood up and salaamed to Vimes. "'Offendi,' he said. "'He's the—well, he's like an official wise man,' said Carrot. "'Oh, so he's not the one who tells them to charge,' said Vimes. His head buzzed with the heat. "'No, that's the leader,' said Carrot, whenever they have one. "'So perhaps Jabbar tells them when it's wise to charge,' said Vimes brightly. "'It is always wise to charge, Ovendi, said Jabbar. He bowed again. "'My tent is your tent,' he said. "'It is,' said Vimes. "'My wives are your wives.' Vimes looked panicky. "'They are, really? My food is your food.' Jabbar went on. Vimes stared down at the dish by the fire. It looked like a sheep or a goat had been the main course, and the man bent down, picked up a morsel, and handed it to him. Sam Vimes looked at the mouthful, and it looked back. The best part, said Jabbar, and made appreciative sucking noises. He added something in Clatchian. There was some muffled laughter from the other men around the fire. Uh, this looks like a sheep's eyeball, said Vimes doubtfully. Yes, sir, said Carrot, but it is unwise to— You know what, Vimes went on, I think this is a little game called Let's See What Effendi Will Swallow, and I'm not swallowing this, my friend. Jabbar gave him an appraising look. The sniggering stopped. Then it is true that you can see further than most, he said. So can this food, said Vimes. My father told me never to eat anything that can wink back. There was one of those little hanging-by-a-thread moments, which might suddenly rock one way or the other into a gale of laughter or sudden death. Then Jabbar slapped Vimes on the back. The eyeball shot off his palm and into the shadows. "'Well done! Extremely good! First time it have not worked in twenty years! Now sit down and have proper rice and sheep, just like mother!' There was a certain feeling of relaxation. Vimes found himself pulled down. Bottoms shuffled aside to make room for him, and a big slab of bread dripping with meat was put in front of him. Vimes prodded at it, as politely as he dared, and then took the usual view that if you can recognize at least half of it, it's probably okay to eat the rest. So we're your prisoners, Mr. Jabbar. Honored guests, my tent is... But how could I put this? You want us to enjoy your hospitality for some time. We have tradition, said Jabbar. A man who is a guest in your tent, even if he is your worst enemy, you owe him hospitality for three days. Three days, eh? said Vimes. I learn language on... Jabbar waved a hand vaguely. You know, wooden thing, a camel of the sea. Boat? Right, but too many water. He slapped Vimes on the back again, so that hot fat spilled into his lap. Any road up. Lots speaking more porky and these days, Offendi. It is a language of merchant. He put an inflection on the word that suggested it was the same as earthworm. So you have to know how to say things like, give us all your money, said Vimes. Why ask, said Jabbar. We take it anyway. But now, he spat at the fire with amazing accuracy, they say, we got to stop, this is wrong. What harm we do? Apart from killing people and taking all their merchandise, said Vimes. Jabbar laughed again. Wally said you were a big diplomatic. But we don't kill merchants. Why should we kill merchants? What is the sense? How foolish to be killing gift horse that lays the golden egg. You could make money exhibiting it, certainly, said Vimes. We kill merchants, we rob too much. They never come back. Dumb. We let them go, they get rich again. 
Our sons robbed them. Such is wisdom. Ah, it's a sort of agriculture, said Vimes. Right, but if you plant merchants, they don't grow so good. Vimes realized that it was getting colder as the sun went down. In fact, a lot colder. He inched closer to the fire. Why is he called 71-hour Ahmed, he said. The murmur of conversation stopped. Suddenly all eyes were on Jabbar, except the one that had ended up in the shadows. Not so diplomatic, said Jabbar. We chase him up here, then suddenly we're ambushed by you. That seems... I know nothing, said Jabbar. Why won't you... Vimes began. Er, uh, sir, said Carrant urgently, that would be very unwise, sir. Look, I had a bit of a talk with Jabbar while you were, uh, resting. It's a bit... Political, I'm afraid. What is it? Prince Kadram is trying to unite the whole of Clatch, you see. Dragging it, kicking and screaming into the century of the fruit bat. Why, well, yes, sir. How did you... Just a lucky guess. Go on. But he has been having trouble, said Carrot. What kind, said Vimes. Us, said Jabbar proudly. None of the tribes like the idea, sir, Carrot went on. They've always fought amongst themselves, and now most of them are fighting him. Historically, sir, Clatch isn't so much an empire as an argument. He say you must be educated. You must be learning to pay taxes. We do not wish to be educated about taxes, said Jabbar. So you think you're fighting for your freedom, said Vimes. Jabbar hesitated and looked at Carrot. There was a brief exchange in Clatchian, then Carrot said, That's a rather difficult question for a dreg, sir. You see, their word for freedom is the same as their word for fighting. They certainly make their language do a lot of work, don't they? Vimes was feeling better in the colder air. He took out a crushed and damp packet of cigars, pulled a coal out of the fire and took a deep drag. So, Prince Charming's got a lot of troubles at home, has he? Does Vetinari know this? Does a camel shit in the desert, sir? You're really getting the hang of Clatch, aren't you? said Vimes. Jabbar rumbled something. There was more laughter. Er, uh, Jabbar says a camel certainly does shit in the desert, sir, otherwise you wouldn't have anything to light your cigar with, sir. Once again there was one of those moments when Vimes felt that he was under close scrutiny. Be diplomatic, Vetinari had told him. He took another deep draw. Improves the flavour, he said. Remind me to take some home. In Jabbar's eyes, the judges held up at least a couple of grudging eights. A man on a horse came and said we must fight the foreign dogs. That's us, sir, said Carrot helpfully, because you have stolen an island that is under the sea. But what is that to us? We know no harm of you, foreign devils. But the men who oil their beards in Al-Kali we do not like. So we send him back. All of him, said Vimes, we are not barbaric. He was clearly a madman, but we kept his horse. And seventy-one-hour Ahmed told you to keep us, didn't he? said Vimes. No one orders the dregs. It is our pleasure to keep you here. And when will it be your pleasure to let us go? When Ahmed tells you? Jabbar stared at the fire. I will not speak of him. He is devious and cunning and not to be trusted. But you are dregs too. Yes. Jabbar slapped Vimes on the back again. We know what we are talking about. The Clatchian fishing boat was a mile or two out of harbour when it seemed to its captain that it was suddenly riding better in the water. Perhaps the barnacles have dropped off, he thought. When his boat was lost in the evening mists, a length of bent pipe rose slowly out of the swell and squeaked around until it faced the coast. A distant tinny voice said, Oh, no! And another tinny voice said, What's up, Sarge? Take a look through this. OK. There was a pause. Then the second tinny voice said, Oh, bugger. What was riding at anchor before the city of Al-Kali wasn't a fleet. It was a fleet of fleets. The masts looked like a floating forest. Down below, Lord Vetinari took his turn to peer through the pipe. 
So many ships, he said, in such a short time, too. How very well organized. Very well organized. One might almost say astonishingly well organized. As they say, if you would seek war, prepare for war. I believe, my lord, the saying is, if you would seek peace, prepare for war, Leonard ventured. Letinari put his head on one side and his lips moved as he repeated the phrase to himself. Finally, he said, No, no, I just don't see that one at all. He ducked back into his seat. Let us proceed with care, he said. We can go ashore under cover of darkness. Er, uh, can we maybe go ashore under cover of cover, said Sergeant Colon. In fact, these extra ships will make our plan that much easier, said the patrician, ignoring him. Our plan? said Colon. People within the Clatchian hegemony come in every shape and colour. Vetinari glanced at Nobby. Practically every shape and colour, he added. So our appearance on the streets should not cause undue comment. He glanced at Nobby again. To any great extent. But we're wearing a uniform, sir, said Sergeant Colon. It's not like we can say we're on our way to a fancy dress party. Well, I'm not taking mine off said Nobby firmly. I'm not running around in me drawers, not in a port. Sailors are at sea a long time. You hear stories. That'd be worse, said the sergeant, without wasting time calculating how long any sailor would need to be at sea before the vision of Nobby Nobs would present itself as anything other than a target. Because if we're not in uniform, we'll be spies. And you know what happens to spies? Are you going to tell me, Sarge? Excuse me, your lordship. Sergeant Colon raised his voice. The patrician looked up from a conversation with Leonard. Yes, Sergeant. What do they do to spies in Clatch, sir? Uh, let me see, said Leonard. Oh, yes, I believe they give you to the women. Nobby brightened up. Oh, well, that doesn't sound too bad. Er, uh, no, Nobby, Colon began. "'Cause I've seen the pictures in that book, the perfumed allotment that Corporal Angua was reading, and... No, listen, Nobby, you got the wrong... I mean, blimey, I didn't know you could do that with a... Nobby, listen. And then there's this bit where she... Corporal Nobbs, Colon yelled. Yes, Sarge? Colon leaned forward and whispered in Nobby's ear. The corporal's expression changed slowly. They really? Yes, Nobby. They really? Yes, Nobby. They don't do that at home. We ain't at home, Nobby. I wish we was. Although you hear stories about the agony, aunt, Sarge. Gentlemen, said Lord Vetinari, I am afraid Leonard is being rather fanciful. That may apply to some of the mountain tribes, but Clatch is an ancient civilization, and that sort of thing is not done officially. I should imagine they'd give you a cigarette. A cigarette, said Fred. Yes, Sergeant, and a nice sunny wall to stand in front of. Sergeant Colon examined this for any downside. A nice roll-up and a wall to lean against, he said. I think they prefer you to stand up straight, Sergeant. Fair enough. No need to be sloppy just because you're a prisoner. Ah, well, I don't mind risking it, then. Well done, said the patrician calmly. Tell me, Sergeant, in your long military career, did anyone ever consider promoting you to an officer? No, sir. I cannot think why. Night poured over the desert. It came suddenly in purple. In the clear air, the stars drilled down out of the sky, reminding any thoughtful watcher that it is in the deserts and high places that religions are generated. When men see nothing but bottomless infinity over their heads, they have always had a driving and desperate urge to find someone to put in the way. Life emerged from the burrows and fissures. Soon the desert was filled with the buzz and click and screech of creatures which, lacking mankind's superior brain power, did not concern themselves with finding someone to blame, and instead tried to find someone to eat. At around three in the morning Sam Vimes walked out of the tent for a smoke. The cold air hit him like a door. It was freezing. That wasn't what was supposed to happen in deserts, was it? Deserts were all hot and sand and camels, and... He struggled for a while as a man whose geographical knowledge got severely cramped once he got off paved road. Camels, yes, and dates, and possibly bananas and coconuts, 
but the temperature here made your breath tinkle in the air. He waved his cigar packet theatrically at a dreg who was lounging near the tent. The man shrugged. The fire was just a heap of grey, but Vimes poked around in the vain hope of finding a glowing ember. He was amazed at how angry he was. Ahmed was the key, he knew it, and now they were stuck out here in the desert. A man had gone, and they were in the hands of quite likeable people, fair enough, brigands maybe, the dry land equivalent of pirates, but Carrot would have said they were jolly good chaps for all that. If you were content to be their guests, then they were as nice as pie, or sheep's eyeball and treacle, or whatever you got out here. Something moved in the moonlight, a shadow slipped down the side of a dune. Something howled out in the desert night. Tiny hairs rose all down Vimes' back, just like they had for his distant ancestors. The night is always old. He'd walked too often down dark streets in the secret hours and felt the night stretching away, and known in his blood that while days and kings and empires come and go, the night is always the same age, always eons deep. Terrors unfolded in the velvet shadows, and while the nature of the talons may change, the nature of the beast does not. He stood up quietly and reached for his sword. It wasn't there. They'd taken it away. They'd not even... A fine night, said a voice beside him. Jabbar was standing by his shoulder. Who is out there? Vimes hissed. An enemy. Which one? Teeth gleamed in the shadows. We will find out, Offendi. Why would they attack you now? Maybe they think we have something they want, Offendi. More shadows slid across the desert, and one rose right up behind Jabbar, reached down and picked him up. A huge grey hand dragged his sword out of his belt. What do you want me to do with him, Mr. Vames? Detritus? The troll saluted with the hand that still held the dreg. All present and correct, sir. But... And then Vimes realised. It's freezing cold. Your brain's working again. With rather more efficiency, sir. Is this a gin? said Jabbar. I don't know, but I could certainly do with one, said Vimes. He finally managed to locate some matches in his pockets and lit one. Put him down, Sergeant, he said, puffing his cigar into life. Jabbar, this is Sergeant Detritus. He could break every bone in your body, including some of the small ones in the fingers, which are quite hard to do. The darkness went schwap and something whispered past the back of his neck, just a slice of a second before Jabbar cannoned into him and bore him to the ground. They shoot at the light, mm hmm? Vimes raised his head cautiously and spat out sand and fragments of tobacco. Mr. Vimes? Only Carrot could whisper like that. He associated whispering with concealment and untruth, and compromised by whispering very loudly. To Vimes's horror, the man came round the edge of a tent, holding a tiny lamp. Put that damn but he didn't have time to finish the sentence because somewhere out in the night a man screamed. It was a high-pitched scream and was suddenly cut off. Ah, oh, said Carrot, crouching down by Vimes and blowing out the lamp. That was Angua. That was nothing like... Oh, yeah, I think I see what you mean, Vimes said uneasily. She's out there, is she? I heard her earlier. She's probably enjoying herself. She doesn't really get much of a chance to let herself go in Ark Moorpork. Er, uh, no. Vimes had a mental picture of a werewolf letting go, but surely Angua wouldn't. You too. Um, you're getting along okay, are you? He said, trying to make out shapes in the darkness. Oh, fine, sir, fine. So her turning into a wolf occasionally doesn't worry you? Vimes couldn't bring himself to say it. No problems then? Oh, not really, sir. She buys her own dog biscuits and she's got her own flap in the door. When it's full moon, I don't really get involved. There were shouts in the night, and then a shape erupted from the darkness, streaked past Vimes, and disappeared into a tent. It didn't wait for a door. It simply hit the cloth at full speed, and continued until the tent collapsed around it. "'And what is that?' said Jabbar. "'This may take some explaining,' said Vimes, picking himself up. Carrot and Detritus were already hauling at the collapsed tent. "'We are dregs.' said Jabbar, reproachfully. We are supposed to fold tents, silently, in the night, not... There was enough moonlight. Angua sat up and snatched a piece of tent out of Carrot's hand. Thank you, she said, wrapping it round her, and before anyone says anything, I just bit him on the bum. Hard. And that was not the soft option, let me tell you. Jabbar looked back into the desert, and then down at the sand, and then at Angua. Vimes could see him thinking and put a fraternal arm around his shoulders. 
I'd better explain, he began. There's a couple of hundred soldiers out there, Angua snapped. Later. They're taking up positions all round you, and they don't look nice. Has anyone got any clothes that might fit, and some decent food, and a drink? There's no water in this place. They will not dare attack before dawn, said Jabbar. And what will you do, sir, said Carrot? At dawn, we will charge. Ah, uh, I wonder if I could suggest an alternative approach. Alternative? It is right to charge. Charging is what dawn is for. Carrot saluted Vimes. I've been reading your book, sir, while you were uh, asleep. Tacticus has got quite a lot to say about how to deal with overwhelming odds, sir. Yes. He says take every opportunity to turn them into underwhelming odds, sir. We could attack now. But it's dark, man. It's just as dark for the enemy, sir. I mean, it's pitch black. You wouldn't know who the hell you were fighting. Half the time you'd be shooting your own side. We wouldn't, sir, because there'd only be a few of us, sir. All we need to do is crawl out there, make a bit of noise, and then let them get on with it. Tacticus says all armies are the same size in the night, sir. There might be something in that, said Angua. They're crawling around in ones and twos, and they're dressed pretty much like... She waved a hand at Jabbar. This is Jabbar, said Carrot. He's sort of not the leader. Jabbar grinned nervously. It happens often in your country, where dogs turn into naked women. Sometimes days can go past and it doesn't happen at all, Angua snapped. I'd like some clothes, please, and a sword if there's going to be fighting. Um, I think Clatchins have a very particular view about women fighting, Carrot began. Yes, said Jabbar. We expect them to be good at it, Blue Eyes. We are dregs. The Boat surfaced in the scummy dead water under a jetty. The lid opened slowly. "'Smells like home,' said Nobby. "'You can't trust the water,' said Sergeant Colon. "'But I don't trust the water at home, Sarge.' Fred Colon managed to get a foothold on the greasy wood. It was, in theory, quite a heroic enterprise. He and Nobby Nobbs, the bold warriors, were venturing forth in hostile territory. Unfortunately, he knew they were doing it because Lord Vetinari was sitting in the boat and would raise his eyebrows in no uncertain manner if they refused. Colon had always thought that heroes had some special kind of clockwork that made them go out and die famously for God, country and apple pie, or whatever particular delicacy their mother made. It had never occurred to him that they might do it because they'd get yelled at if they didn't. He reached down. Come on up, Nobby, he said, and remember we're doing this for the gods, Ankh Morpork, and... It seemed to Colon that a foodstuff would indeed be somehow appropriate. And my mum's famous knuckle sandwich. Our mum never made us knuckle sandwiches, said Nobby, as he hauled himself onto the planks, but you'd be amazed at what she could do with a bit of cheese. Yeah, all right, but that ain't much of a battle cry, is it? For the gods, Ankh Morpork, and amazing things Nobby's mum can do with cheese. That'll strike fear in the hearts of the enemy, said Sergeant Colon as they crept forward. Ah, oh, well, if that's what you're after, you want my mum's distressed pudding and custard, said Nobby. Frightening, is it? They wouldn't want to know about it, Sarge. The docks of Alkali were like docks everywhere, because all docks everywhere are connected. Men have to put things on and off boats. There are only a limited number of ways to do this, so all docks look the same. Some are hotter, some are damper. There are always piles of vaguely forgotten-looking things. In the distance there was the glow of the city, which seemed quite unaware of the enemy incursion. "'Get us some clothes so that we'll blend in,' muttered Colon. "'That's all very well to say.' "'Nah, nah, that's easy,' said Nobby. "'Everyone knows how to do that one. You lurk in an alley somewhere, right, and you wait until a couple of blokes come by, and you lure them into the alley, see, and there's a couple of thumps, and then you come out wearing their clothes.' That works, does it? Never fail, Sarge, said Nobby, confidently. The desert looked like snow in the moonlight. Vimes found himself quite at ease with the tacticus method of fighting. It was how coppers had always fought. A proper copper didn't line up with a lot of other coppers and rush at people. A copper lurked in the shadows, walked quietly, and bided his time. In all honesty, of course, the time he bided until was the point when the criminal had already committed the crime and was carrying the loot. Otherwise, what was the point? You had to be realistic. 
we got the man who done it carries a lot more gravitas than we got the man what looked as if he was going to do it, especially when people say, prove it. Somewhere off to the left in the distance, someone screamed. Vimes was a bit uneasy in this robe, though. It was like going into battle in a nightshirt. Because he wasn't at all certain he could kill a man who wasn't actively trying to kill him. Of course, technically, any armed Clatchian these days was actively trying to kill him. That was what war was all about. But he raised his head over the top of the dune. A Clatchian warrior was looking the other way. Vimes crept. Bingly, 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 beep. This is your 7 a.m. alarm call. Insert name here. At least I hope... Huh? Damn. Vimes reacted first and punched the man on the nose. Since there was no point in waiting to see what effect this would have, he threw himself forward, and the two of them rolled down the other side of the freezing dune, struggling and punching. But my real-time function seems erratic at the moment. The Clatchian was smaller than Vimes. He was younger, too, but it was unfortunate for him that he appeared to be too young to have learned the repertoire of dirty fighting that spelled survival in Ankh Morpork's back streets. Vimes, on the other hand, was prepared to hit anything with anything. The point was that the opponent shouldn't get up again. Everything else was decoration. They slid to a halt at the bottom of the dune, with Vimes on top and the Clatchian groaning. Things to do, the disorganiser shrilled. Eight. And then it was probably throat-cutting time. Back home, Vimes could have dragged him off to the cells in the knowledge that everything would look better in the morning, but the desert had no such options. No, he couldn't do that. Thump the bloke senseless. That was the merciful way. Vindaloo! Vindaloo! Vimes' fist stayed raised. What? That's you, isn't it, Mr. Vimes? Vindaloo! Vimes pulled a fold of cloth away from the figure's face. Are you Goriff's boy? I didn't want to be here, Mr. Vimes. The words came fast, desperate. All right, all right, I'm not going to hurt you. Vimes lowered his fist and stood up, pulling the boy after him. Talk later, he muttered. Come on. No, everyone knows what the dregs do to their captives. Well, I'm their captive, and they'll have to do it to both of us, OK? Keep away from the more amusing food, and you'll probably be OK. Someone whistled in the darkness. Come on, lad, hissed Vimes. No harm's going to come to you. Well, less than it'd come to you if you stayed here, all right? This time he didn't give the boy time to argue, but dragged him along. As he headed towards the dregs' camp, other figures slid down the dunes. One of them had an arm missing and had a sword sticking in him. "'How did you get on, Reg?' said Vimes. "'A bit odd, sir. After the first one chopped my arm off and stabbed me, the rest of them seemed to keep out of my way. Honestly, you'd think they'd never seen a man stabbed before.' "'Did you find your arm?' Reg waved something in the air. "'That's another thing,' he said. "'I hit a few of them with it, and they ran off screaming.' It's your type of unarmed combat, said Vimes. It probably takes some getting used to. Is that a prisoner you've got there? In a way, Vimes glanced around. He seems to have fainted. I can't think why. Reg leaned closer. These foreigners are a bit weird, he said. Reg? Yes? Your ear's hanging off. Is it? Wretched thing. You'd think a nail would work, wouldn't you? Sergeant Colon looked up at the stars. They looked down at him. At least Fred Colon had a choice. Beside him, Corporal Nobbs gave a groan. But the attackers had left him his pants. There are some places where the boldest dare not go, and those areas of Nobby upwards of the knees and downwards of the stomach were among them. Well, Colon thought of them as attackers. Technically, he supposed they were defenders. Aggressive defenders. Just run all that past me again, will you? he said. We fired a couple of blokes about our height and weight. We did that. We lure them into this alley. We did that. I take a swing at them with a length of wood and hit you by accident in the dark, and they get angry and turn out to be thieves and nick all our clothes. We weren't supposed to do that. Well, it worked, basically, said Nobby, managing to get to his knees. We could give it another go. Nobby, you're in a port in a foreign city, clad only in your, and I use the word with feeling, Nobby, your unmentionables. This is not the point to start talking about luring people into alleys. There could be talk. Angua always says that nakedness is the national costume everywhere, Sarge. She was talking about herself, Nobby, said Colon, sidling along in the shadows. 
It's different for you. He peered around the other end of the alley. There was a noise and clatter from the building that formed one of the walls. A couple of laden donkeys waited patiently outside. Nip out and grab one of those packs, right? Why me, Sarge? Cause you're the corporal and I'm the sergeant, and you've got more on than me. Grumbling under his breath, Nobby edged into the narrow street and unfastened a tether as fast as he could. The animal followed him obediently. Sergeant Colon pulled at the pack. If push comes to shove, we can wear the sacks, he said. That'll... What's this? He held up something red. Flower pot, said Nobby helpfully. It's a fez. Some Clatchians wear them. Looks like we struck lucky. Oh, here's another one. Try it on, Nobby. And looks like one of them nightshirts they wear. And here's another one of those, too. We're home and dry, Nobby. They're a bit short, Sarge. Beggars can't be choosers, said Colon, struggling into the costume. Go on, put your fez on. It makes me look like a twit, Sarge. Look, I'll put mine on all right. Then we'll be fez to fez, Sarge. Sergeant Colon gave him a severe look. Did you have that one prepared, Nobby? No, Sarge, I just made it up in my head right then. Well, look, no calling me Sarge. That doesn't sound Clatchian. Nor does Nobby, Sarge. Uh, sorry. Oh, I don't know. You could be Kenobi, or Nobby, or Nobby. Sounds pretty Clatchian to me. What's a good Clatchian name for you, then? I don't know hardly any, said Nobby. Sergeant Colon didn't answer. He was peering round the corner again. His lordship did say we was not to hang about, Nobby murmured. Yeah, but inside that tin can, well, it smells pretty lived in, if you know what I mean. What I wouldn't give for... There was a bellow behind them. They turned. There were three Clatchian soldiers, or possibly watchmen. Nobby and Sergeant Colon didn't look much further than the swords. The leader growled a question at them. What did he say? Nobby quavered. To know. Where are you from? said the leader in Morporkian. What? Oh, er... Uh, Colon hesitated, waiting for shiny death. Ah, yes. The guard lowered his sword and jerked a thumb towards the docks. You get back to your detachment now. Right, said Nobby. What your name? one of the guards demanded. Nobby, said Nobby. This seemed to pass. And you, fat one? Colon was panicking on the spot. He sought desperately for any name that sounded Clatchian, and there was only one that presented itself and which was absolutely and authentically Clatchian. Ow, he said, his knees trembling. You get back right now or there will be trouble. The watchman ran for it, dragging the donkey behind them, and didn't stop until they were on the greasy jetty, which somehow felt like home. What was all that about, sir, um, Al? said Nobby. All they wanted to do was push us around a bit. Typical watch behaviour, he added. Not ours, of course. I suppose we had the right clothes on. He didn't even tell them where we came from, and they spoke our language. Well, they, I mean, anyone ought to be able to speak more Porkian, said Colon, gradually regaining his mental balance. Even babies learn it. I bet it comes easy after learning something as complicated as Clatchian. What are we going to do with the donkey, Al? Do you think it can pedal? I doubt it. Then leave it up here. But it'll get pinched, Al. Oh, these Clatchians will pinch anything. Not like us, eh, Al? Nobby looked at the forest of masts filling the bay. Looks like even more of them from here, he said. You could walk from boat to boat for a mile. What are they all here for? Don't be daft, Nobby, it's obvious. They're here to take everyone to Ankh-Mor Pork. What for? We don't eat that much curry. Invasion, Nobby! There's a war on, remember? They looked back at the ships. Riding lights gleamed on the water. The bit of it that was immediately below them bubbled for a moment, and then the hull of the boat rose a few inches above the surface. The lid unscrewed, and Leonard's worried face appeared. Ah, there you are, he said. We were getting concerned. They lowered themselves down into the fetid interior of the vessel. Lord Vetinari was sitting with a pad of paper across his knees, writing carefully. He glanced up briefly. Report. Nobby fidgeted while Sergeant Colon delivered a more or less accurate account, although there was some witty repartee with the Clatchian guards that the corporal had not hitherto recalled. Vetinari did not look up. Still writing, he said, Sergeant, 
Ur is an old country rimward of the kingdom of Jellababy, whose occupants are a byword for bucolic stupidity. For some reason, I cannot think why, the guard must have assumed you were from there, and Morporkian is something of a lingua franca, even in the Kachian Empire. When someone from Hersheba needs to trade with someone from Istanzia, they will undoubtedly haggle in Morporkian. This will serve us well, of course. The force that is being assembled here must mean that practically every man is a distant stranger with outlandish ways. Provided we do not act too foreign, we should pass muster. This means not asking for curry with swede and currants in it, and refraining from ordering pints of Winkle's old peculiar do I make myself clear. Eh, uh, what is it we're going to do, sir? We will reconnoitre, initially. Ah, right, yes, very important. And then seek out the Clatchian High Command. Thanks to Leonard, I have a little package to deliver. I hope it will end the war very quickly. Sergeant Colon looked blank. At some point in the last few seconds the conversation had run away with him. Sorry, sir, you said high command, sir. Yes, sergeant. Like the uh, top brass, or turbans or whatever, all surrounded by crack troops, sir. That's where you always put the best troops around the top brass. I expect this will be the case, yes. In fact, I rather hope it is. Sergeant Colon once again tried to keep up. Ah, right. And we'll go and look for them, will we, sir? I can hardly ask them to come to us, Sergeant. Right, sir, I can see that. It could be a bit crowded. At last, Lord Vetinari looked up. Is there some problem, Sergeant? And Sergeant Colon once again knew a secret about bravery. It was arguably a kind of enhanced cowardice. The knowledge that while death may await you if you advance, it will be a picnic compared to the certain living hell that awaits you should you retreat. Ah, not as such, sir, he said. Very well. Vetinari pushed his paperwork aside. If there is more suitable clothing in your bag, I will get changed and we can take a look at Al-Kali. Oh, gods. Sorry, Sergeant. Oh, good, sir. Good. Vetinari began to pull other items out of the liberated sack. There was a set of jugglers' clubs a bag of coloured balls, and finally a placard such as might be placed to one side of the stage during an artiste's performance. Gully, gully, and Betty, he read. Exotic tricks and dances. Hmm, he added. It would seem there was a lady among the owners of this sack. The watchman looked at the gauzy material that came out of the sack next. Nobby's eyes bulged. What are them? I believe they're called harem pants. Corporal. They're very, uh... Curiously, the purpose of the clothing of the nautch girl or exotic dancer has always been less to reveal and more to suggest the imminence of revelation, said the patrician. Nobby looked down at his costume, and then at Sergeant Al Colon in his costume, and said cheerfully, Well, I ain't sure if it's going to suit you, sir. He regretted the words immediately. I hadn't intended that they should suit me, said the patrician calmly. Please pass me your fez, Corporal Betty. The subtle, deceiving dawn before dawn slid over the desert, and the commander of the Clatchian detachment wasn't happy about it. The Deregs always attacked at dawn, all of them. It didn't matter how many of them there were, or how many of you there were. Anyway, the whole tribe attacked. It wasn't just the women and children— but the camels, goats, sheep, and chickens, too. Of course you were expecting them, and bows could cut them down, but they always appeared suddenly, as if even the desert had spat them out. Get it wrong, be too slow, and you'd be hacked, kicked, butted, pecked, and viciously spat at. His troops lay in wait. Well, if you could call them troops, he'd said they were overstretched. Well, he hadn't actually said, because that sort of thing could get you into trouble in this man's army, but he'd thought it very hard. Half of them were keen kids who thought that if you went into battle shouting and waving your sword in the air, the enemy just ran away. They'd never faced a dreg chicken coming in at eye height. As for the rest of it, in the night people had run into one another, ambushed one another by mistake, and were now as jittery as peas on a drum. 
A man had lost his sword and swore that someone had walked away with it, stuck right through him, and some kind of rock had got up and walked around him, hitting people, with other people. The sun was well up now. It's the white thing that's the worst part, said his sergeant next to him. It might be the worst part, said the commander, or there again, the bit where they suddenly rise out of the desert and cut you in half might be the worst part. He stared mournfully at the treacherously empty sand. Or the bit where a maddened sheep tries to gnaw your nose off might be the worst part. In fact, when you think of all the things that can happen when you're surrounded by a horde of screaming dregs, the bit where they aren't there at all is, I think you'll find, the best part. The sergeant wasn't trained for this sort of thing, so he said, They're late. Good. Rather them than us. Sun's right up now, sir. The commander looked at his shadow. It was full day, and the sand was mercifully free of his blood. The commander had been pacifying various recalcitrant parts of Clatch for long enough to wonder why, if he was pacifying people, he always seemed to be fighting them. Experience had taught him never to say things like, I don't like it, it's too quiet. There was no such thing as too quiet. They might have decamped in the night, sir, said the sergeant. That doesn't sound like the dregs. They never run away. Anyway, I can see their tents. Why don't we rush them, sir? You haven't fought dregs before, sergeant? No, sir. I've been pacifying the mad sabotage in Uhistan, though, and there... The dregs are worse, sergeant. They pacify right back at you. I didn't say how mad the sabotage were, sir. Compared to the dregs, they were merely slightly vexed. The sergeant felt that his reputation was being impugned. How about I take a few men and investigate, sir? The commander glanced at the sun again. Already the air was too hot to breathe. Oh, very well. Let's go. The Clatchians advanced on the camp. There were the tents and the ash of fires, but there were no camels and horses, merely a long scuffed trail leading off among the dunes. Morale began to rise a little. Attacking a dangerous enemy who isn't there is one of the more attractive forms of warfare, and there was a certain amount of assertion about how lucky the dregs were to have run away in time, and some extemporising on the subject of what the soldiers would have done to the dregs if they caught them. Who's that? said the sergeant. A figure appeared between the dunes riding on a camel. His white robes fluttered in the breeze. He slid down when he reached the Clatchians and waved at them. Good morning, gentlemen. May I persuade you to surrender? Who are you? Captain Carrot, sir. If you would be kind enough to lay down your weapons, no one will get hurt. The commander looked up. Blobs were appearing along the tops of the dunes. They rose and turned out to be heads. They're dregs, sir, said the sergeant. No, dregs would be charging, sergeant. Oh, sorry. Shall I tell them to charge, said Carrot? Is that what you'd prefer? The dregs were all along the dunes now. The climbing sun glittered off metal. Are you telling me, the commander began slowly, that you can persuade the regs not to charge? It was tricky, but I think they've got the idea, said Carrot. The commander considered his position. There were dregs on either side. His troop were practically huddling together, and this red-headed, blue-eyed man was smiling at him. How do they feel about the merciful treatment of prisoners, he ventured. I think they could get the hang of it if I insist. The commander glanced at the silent dregs again. Why, he said, why aren't they fighting us, he said. My commander says he doesn't want unnecessary loss of life, sir, said Carrot. That's Commander Vimes, sir. He's sitting on that dune up there. You can persuade armed dregs not to charge, and you have a commander? Yes, sir. He says this is a police action. The commander swallowed. We give in, he said. What, just like that, sir, said his sergeant, without a fight? Yes, sergeant. Without a fight, this man can make water run uphill, and he has a commander. I love the idea of giving in without a fight. I've fought for ten years, and giving in without a fight is what I've always wanted to do. Water dripped off the boat's metal ceiling and blobbed onto the paper in front of Leonard of Quirm. He wiped it away. It might have been boring, 
waiting in the small metal can under a nondescript jetty, but Leonard had no concept of the term. Absent-mindedly, he jotted a brief sketch of an improved ventilation system. He started to watch his own hand. Almost without his guidance, taking its instructions from somewhere else in his head, it drew a cutaway of a much larger version of the boat. Here, here, and here, there could be a bank of a hundred oars rather than pedals, each one manned. His pencil caressed the paper by a well-muscled and not overdressed young warrior. A boat that would pass unseen under other boats, take men wherever they needed to go. Here a giant saw affixed to the roof, so that when rowed at speed it could cut the hulls of enemy ships. And here, and here, a tube. He stopped and stared at his drawing for a while. Then he sighed and started to tear it up. Vimes watched from the dune. He couldn't hear much from up here, but he didn't need to. Angua sat down beside him. It's working, isn't it? she said. Yes. What's he going to do? Oh, he'll take their weapons and let them go, I suppose. Why do people follow him? said Angua. Well, you're his girlfriend, you ought to know. That's different. I love him because he's kind without thinking about it. He doesn't watch his own thoughts like other people do. When he does good things, it's because he's decided to do them, not because he's trying to measure up to something. He's so simple. Anyway, I'm a wolf living with people, and there's a name for wolves that live with people. If he whistled, I'd come running. Vimes tried not to show his embarrassment. Angua smiled. Don't worry, Mr. Vimes, you've said it yourself. Sooner or later, we're all someone's dog. It's like hypnotism, said Vimes hurriedly. People follow him to see what's going to happen next. They tell themselves that they're just going along with it for a while, and can stop at any time they want to, but they never want to. It's damn magic. No. Have you ever really watched him? I bet he'd found out everything about Jabbar by the time he'd talked to him for ten minutes. I bet he knows the name of every camel, and he'll remember it all. People don't take much interest in other people, usually. Her fingers idly traced a pattern in the sand. So he makes you feel important. Politicians do that, Vimes began. Not the way he does, believe me. I expect Lord Betinari remembers facts about people. Oh, you'd better believe that. But Carrot takes an interest. He doesn't even think about it. He makes space in his head for people. He takes an interest, and so people think they're interesting. They feel better when he's around. Vimes glanced down. Her fingers were drawing aimlessly in the sand again. We're all changing in the desert, he thought. It's not like the city, hemming your thoughts in. You can feel your mind expand to the horizons. No wonder this is where religions start. And suddenly here I am, probably not legally, just trying to do my job. Why? Because I'm too damn stupid to stop and think before I give chase, that's why. Even Carrot knew better than to do that. I'd have just chased after Ahmed's ship without a thought, but he was bright enough to report back to me first. He did what a responsible officer ought to do. But me? Vetinari's terrier, he said aloud. Chase first and think about it afterwards. His eye caught the distant bulk of Gebra. Out there was a Clachian army, and somewhere over there was the Ankh Morpork army, and he was with a handful of people and no plan, because he'd chased first, and... But I had to, he said. Any copper wouldn't have let a suspect like Ahmed get... Once again he had the feeling that the problem he was facing wasn't really a problem at all. It was something very obvious. He was the problem. He wasn't thinking right. Come to think of it, he hadn't really thought at all. He glanced down again at the trapped company. They had stripped down to their loincloths and were looking very sheepish, as men generally do in their underwear. Carrot's white robe still flapped in the breeze. He hasn't been here a day, thought Vimes, and already he's wearing the desert like a pair of sandals. Ah! Uh, bingly, 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 beep! Is that your demon diary? said Angua. Vimes rolled his eyes. Yes, although it seems to be talking about someone else. Ah, uh, three p.m., the demon muttered slowly. Day not filled in. Check wall defences. See, he thinks I'm in Ankh Morpork. It costs Sybil three hundred dollars, and it can't even keep track of where I am. He flicked his cigar butt away and stood up. I'd better get down there, he said. After all, I am the boss. He slithered his way down the dune and strolled towards Carrot, who salaamed to him. 
A salute would do, Captain, thanks all the same. Sorry, sir, I think I got a bit carried away. Why have you made them strip off? Makes them a bit of a laughing stock when they return, sir. A blow to their pride. He leaned closer and whispered, I've let their commander keep his clothes on, though. It doesn't do to show up the officers. Really, said Vimes. And some want to join us, sir. There's Gorif's lad and a few others. They were just dragooned into the army yesterday. They don't even know why they're fighting, so I said they could. Vimes took the captain aside. Er, uh, I don't remember suggesting that any of the prisoners joined us, he said quietly. Well, sir, I thought what with our army approaching, and since quite a lot of these lads are from various corners of the Empire, and don't like the Clatchians any more than we do, I thought that a flying column of guerrilla fighters, we aren't soldiers. Er, uh, I thought we were soldiers. Yes, yes, all right, in a way. But really, we're coppers, like we've always been. We don't kill people unless... Ahmed? Everyone's slightly on edge when he's around. He worries people. He gets information from all over the place. He seems to go where he pleases, and he's always around where there's trouble. Damn, damn, damn. He ran through the crowd until he reached Jabbar, who was watching Carrot with the usual puzzled smile that Carrot caused in innocent bystanders. Three days, said Vimes. Three days. That's seventy-two hours. Yes, Offendi, said Jabbar. It was the voice of someone who recognised dawn, noon, and sunset, and just let everything in between happen whenever it liked. So why is he called seventy-one hour Ahmed? What's so special about the extra hour? Jabbar grinned nervously. Did he do something after seventy-one hours? said Vimes. Jabbar folded his arms. I will not say. He told you to keep us here? Yes. But not to kill us? Oh, I would not kill my friend, Sir Sam Mule. And don't give me all that eyeball rubbish, said Vimes. He wanted time to get somewhere and do something, right? I will not say. You don't need to, said Vimes, because we are leaving. And if you kill us, well, probably you can, but seventy-one-hour Ahmed would not like that, I expect. Jabbar looked like a man making a difficult decision. He will be coming back, he said. Tomorrow. No problem. I'm not waiting, and I don't think he wants me killed, Jabbar. He wants me alive. Carrot? Carrot hurried over. Yes, sir? Vimes was aware that Jabbar was staring at him in horror. We've lost Ahmed, he said. Even Agua can't pick up his trail with the sand blowing all over the place. We've got no place here. We're not needed here. But we are, sir, Carrot burst out. We could help the desert tribes. Oh, you want to stay and fight, said Vimes, against the Clatchians? Against the bad Clatchians, sir. Ah, oh, well, that's the trick, isn't it? When one of them comes screaming at you, waving a sword, how do you spot his moral character? Well, you can stay if you like and fight for the good name of Aunt Morpork. It should be a pretty short fight, but I'm off. Jenkins probably hasn't got afloat again. OK, Jabbar? The dreg was staring at the desert sand between his feet. You know where he is now, don't you? Vimes prompted. Yes. Tell me. No, I swore to him. But the regs are oath-breakers, everyone knows that. Jabbar gave Vimes a grin. Oh, oaths, stupid things. I gave him my word. He won't break it, sir, said Carrot. The regs are very particular about things like that. It's only when they swear on gods and things that they'll ever break an oath. I will not tell you where he is said Jabbar. But, he grinned again, but there was no humour in it. How brave are you, Mr. Vimes? Stop complaining, Nobby. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying these trousers are a bit drafty, that's all I'm saying. They look good on you, though. And what are these tin bowls supposed to be doing? They're supposed to be protecting the bits you haven't got, Nobby. The way the breeze is blowing, I could do with some to protect the bits I have. Just try and act ladylike, will you, Nobby? Which would be hard, Sergeant Colan had to admit. The lady for whom the clothes had been made had been quite tall and somewhat full-figured, whereas Nobby, without his armour, could have hidden behind a short stick if you attached a toast rack to it about two-thirds of the way up. 
He looked like a gauzy accordion, with a lot of jewellery. In theory, the costume would have been quite revealing, if Corporal Nobbs was something you wished to see revealed. But there were so many billows and folds now, that all one could reliably say was that he was in there somewhere. He was leading the donkey, which seemed to like him. Animals tended to like Nobby. He didn't smell wrong. And them boots don't work, Sergeant Colon went on. Why not? You kept yours on. Yeah, but I'm not supposed to be a flower of the desert, right? A moon of someone's delight shouldn't kick up sparks when she walks. Am I right? They belong to my gran. I ain't leaving her around for anyone to nick, and I ain't mooning for anyone's delight, said Nobby sulkily. Lord Betinari strode on ahead. The streets were already filling up. al Khali liked to get the business of the day started in the cool of dawn, before full day flamethrowered the landscape. No one paid the newcomers any attention, although a few people did turn round to watch Corporal Nobbs. Goats and chickens ambled out of the way as they passed. "'Watch out for people trying to sell you dirty postcards, Nobby,' said Colin. "'My uncle was here once, and he said some bloke tried to sell him a pack of dirty postcards for five dollars. Disgusted he was.' "'Yeah, cos you can get them in the shades for two dollars,' said Nobby. "'That's what he said. And they were on more pork ones, trying to flog us our own dirty postcards. I call that disgusting, frankly.' "'Good morning, Sultan,' said a cheerful and somehow familiar voice. "'New in town, are we?' All three of them turned to a figure that had magically appeared from the mouth of an alleyway. "'Indeed, yes,' said the patrician. "'I could see you, eh? Uh, everyone is these days, and it is your lucky day. Sir, I am here to help, right? You want something? I got it.' Sergeant Colon had been staring at the newcomer. He said in a faraway voice, "'Your name's going to be something like Al Gibbler or something, right?' "'Heard about me, have you?' said the trader jovially. "'Sorta, of, yeah,' said Colin slowly. "'You're amazingly familiar.' Lord Vetinari pushed him aside. "'We are strolling entertainers,' he said. "'We are hoping to get an engagement at the Prince's Palace. "'Perhaps you could help.' The man rubbed his beard thoughtfully, causing various particles to cascade into the little bowls in his tray. "'Dunno about the palace,' he said. What's it you do? We practice juggling, fire-eating, that sort of thing, said Betinari. Do we? said Colon. Al Gibbler nodded at Nobby. What does, uh, she, said Lord Betinari, helpfully, she do? Exotic dancing, said Betinari, while Nobby scowled. Pretty exotic, I should think, said Al Gibbler. You'd be amazed. A couple of armed men had drifted over to them. Sergeant Colan's heart sank. In those bearded faces he saw himself and Nobby, who at home would always saunter over to anything in the street that looked interesting. "'You are jugglers, are you?' said one of them. "'Let's see you juggle, then.' Lord Vetinari gave them a blank look and then glanced down at the tray around Al Gibbler's neck. Among the more identifiable foodstuffs were a number of green melons. "'Very well,' he said and picked up three of them. Sergeant Colon shut his eyes. After a few seconds he opened them again, because a guard had said, All right, but anyone can do it with three. In that case, perhaps Mr. Algibler would throw me a few more, said the patrician, as the ball spun through his hands. Sergeant Colon shut his eyes again. After a short while, a guard said, Seven is pretty good, but it's just melons. Colon opened his eyes. The Clatchian guard twitched his robe aside. Half a dozen throwing knives glinted, and so did his teeth. Lord Betinari nodded. To Colon's growing surprise, he did not seem to be watching the tumbling melons at all. Four melons and three knives,' he said. "'If you would care to give the knives to my charming assistant, Betty?' "'Who?' said Nobby. "'Oh, why not seven knives, then?' "'Kind sirs, that would be too simple,' said Lord Vetinari. "'I am but a humble tumbler. Please let me practice my art.' "'Jugglers will tell you that juggling with items that are identical is always easier than a mixture of all shapes and sizes. This is even the case with chainsaws, although, of course, when the juggler misses the first chainsaw, it is only the start of his problems. Some more will come along very shortly.' "'Betty,' 
said Nobby, glowering under his veils. Three fruits arced gently out of the green whirl and thumped onto Algibla's tray. The guards looked carefully and to Colon's mind nervously at the cross-dressed figure of the cross-corporal. She's not going to do any kind of dance, is she? one of them ventured. No, snapped Betty. Promise? Corporal Nobbs's appearance could be best summarized this way. One of the minor laws of the narrative universe is that any homely-featured man who has for some reason to disguise himself as a woman will apparently become attractive to some otherwise perfectly sane men with, as the ancient scrolls say, hilarious results. In this case, the laws were fighting against the fact of Corporal Nobby Nobbs and gave up. Nobby grabbed three of the knives and tugged them out of the man's belt. I'll give them to his lord, er, uh, to him, shall I, Betty? said Colon, suddenly quite sure that keeping the patrician alive was almost certainly the only way to avoid a brief cigarette in the sunshine. He was also aware that other people were drifting over to watch the show. To me, please. Ow, said the patrician, nodding. Colon tossed the knives, slowly and gingerly. He's going to try and stab the guards, he thought. It's a ruse, and then everyone's going to tear us apart. Now the circling blur glinted in the sunlight. There was a murmur of approval from the crowd. Yet somehow dull, said the patrician, and his hands moved in a complex pattern that suggested that his wrists must have moved through one another at least twice. The tangled ball of hurtling fruit and cutlery leapt into the air. Three melons dropped to the ground, cut cleanly in two. Three knives thudded into the dust a few inches from their owner's sandals. And Sergeant Colon looked up into a growing, greenish, expanding... The melon exploded, and so did the audience, but both their laughter and the humour were slightly lost on Colon as he scraped overripe pith out of his ears. The survival instinct cut in again. Stagger around backwards, it said. So he staggered around backwards, waving his legs in the air. Fall down heavily, it said. So he sat down and almost squashed a chicken. Lose your dignity, it said. Of all the things you've got, it's the one you can most afford to lose. Lord Betinari helped him up. Our very lives depend on your appearing to be a stupid fat idiot, he hissed, putting Colon's fez back on his head. I ain't very good at acting, sir. Good. Yes, sir. The patrician scooped up three melon halves and positively skipped over to a stall that a woman had just set up, snatching an egg from a basket as he went past. Sergeant Colon blinked again. This was not real. The patrician didn't do this sort of thing. Ladies and gentlemen, you see an egg. And here we have a melon rind. Egg, melon, melon, egg. We put the melon over the egg. His hands darted across the three halves, switching them at bewildering speed. Round and round they go, just like that. Now, where's the egg? What about you, Shah? Algibla smirked. It's the one on the left, he said. It always is. Lord Vetinari lifted the melon. The board below was eggless. And you, noble guardsman. It's got to be the one in the middle, said the guard. Yes, of course. Oh, dear, it isn't. The crowd looked at the last melon. They were street people. They knew the score. When the object can be under one of three things, and it's already turned out not to be under two of them, then the one place it was certainly not going to be was under the third. Only some kind of gullible fool would believe something like that. Of course there was going to be a trick. There was always a trick but you watched it in order to see a trick done well. Lord Vetinari raised the melon, nevertheless, and the crowd nodded in satisfaction. Of course, it wasn't there. It'd be a pretty poor day for street entertainment if things were where they were supposed to be. Sergeant Colon knew what was going to happen next, and he knew this because for the last minute or so something had been pecking at his head. Aware that this was probably his moment, he raised his fez and revealed a very small, fluffy chick. Have you got a towel? I'm afraid it's just gone to the toilet on my head, sir. There was laughter, some applause, and to his amazement, a tinkling of coins around his feet. And finally, said the patrician, the beautiful Betty will do an exotic dance. The crowd fell silent. Then someone at the back said, How much do we have to pay for her not to? Right, I've just about had enough of this. Veils flying out behind her, bangles jingling, elbows waving viciously, and boots kicking up sparks, the lovely Betty strode into the crowd. Which of you said that? People shrank away from her. Armies would have retreated. 
and there, revealed like a jellyfish deserted by a suddenly ebbing tide, was a small man about to fry in the wrath of the ascendant knobs. I meant no offence, O oh doe-eyed one. Oh, pastry-faced, am I? Nobby flung out an arm in a crash of bracelets and knocked the man over. You've got a lot to learn about women, young man. And then, because a knobs could never resist a prone target, the petite Betty drew back a steel-capped boot. Betty? snapped the patrician. Oh, right, yeah, right, said Nobby, with veiled contempt. Everyone can tell me what to do, right? Just because I happen to be the woman around here, I'm supposed to accept it all, eh? No, you just ain't supposed to kick him in the fork, hissed Colin, pulling him away. It don't look good. Although he noted the women in the crowd seemed to be disappointed by the sudden curtailment of the performance. And there are many strange stories we can tell you, shouted the patrician. Betty certainly could, murmured Colon, and was kicked sharply on his ankle. And many strange sights we can show you. Betty certainly... Ow! But for now we will seek the shade of yonder caravanserai. What are we doing? We're going to the pub. The crowd began to disperse, but with occasional amused glances back at the trio. One of the guards nodded at Colon. Nice show, he said, especially the bit where your lady didn't remove any veils. He darted behind his colleague as Nobby spun round like an avenging angel. Sergeant, the patrician whispered, it is very important that we learn the current whereabouts of Prince Kadram. Do you understand? In taverns, people talk. Let us keep our ears open. The tavern wasn't Colon's idea of a pub. For one thing, most of it had no roof. Arched walls surrounded a courtyard. A grapevine grew out of a huge cracked urn and had been teased overhead on trellises. There was the gentle sound of tinkling water, and unlike the mended drum, this was not because the bar backed onto the privies, but because of a small fountain in the middle of the cobbles. And it was cool, much cooler than in the street, even though the vine leaves scarcely hid the sky. Didn't know you could juggle, sir, Colon whispered to Lord Betinari. You mean you can't, Sergeant? No, sir. How strange. Hardly a skill, is it? One knows what the objects are and where they want to go. After that, it's just a case of letting them occupy the correct positions in time and space. You're dead good at it, sir. Practice often, do you? Until today, I've never tried. Lord Vetinari looked at Colon's astonished expression. After Ankh Morpork, Sergeant, a handful of flying melons present a very minor problem indeed. I'm amazed, sir. And in politics, Sergeant, it is always important to know where the chicken is. Colon raised his fez. Is this one still on my head? It seems to have gone to sleep. I wouldn't disturb it if I were you. Mm, you, juggler. She can't come in here. They looked up. Someone with a face and apron that said barman in seven hundred languages was standing over them, a wine jug in each hand. No woman in here, he went on. Why not, said Nobby. No women asking questions neither. Why not? Because it is written, that's why. Where am I supposed to go, then? The barman shrugged. Who knows where women go? Off you go, Betty, said the patrician, and listen for information. Nobby grabbed the cup of wine from Colon and gulped it down. Oh, I don't know, he moaned. I've only been a woman ten minutes, and already I hate you male bastards. I don't know what's got into him, sir, whispered Colon as Nobby stamped out. He ain't like this normally. I thought Clatchy and women did what they were told. Does your wife do what she's told, Sergeant? Well, yeah, obviously. A man's got to be the master in his own house, that's what I always say. So why are you, I hear, always putting up kitchen furniture? Well, obviously you got to listen to... In fact, Clatchian history is full of famous examples of women who even went to war with their men, said the patrician. What? On the same side? Prince Arkvin's wife, Tistum, used to ride into the battle with her husband and, according to legend, killed ten thousand thousand men. That's a lot of men. Legends are prone to inflation. However, I believe there is good historical evidence that Queen Sawawandra of Sumitri had more than thirty thousand people put to death during her reign. She could be quite touchy, they say. 
"'You should hear my wife if I don't put the plates away,' said Sergeant Colon gloomily. "'Now we are integrated with the local population, Sergeant,' said the patrician. "'We must find out what is happening. "'Although an invasion is clearly planned, "'I feel sure Prince Kadram will have reserved some forces in case of land attack. "'It would be nice to know where they are, because that's where he will be. "'Right. You think you can handle this? "'Yes, sir. I know Clatchin, sir. Don't you worry about that. "'Here's some money. Buy drinks for people. Mingle. Right. Not too many drinks, but as much mingling as you are capable of. I'm a good mingler, sir. Off you go, then. Sir? Yes. I'm a bit worried about Betty, sir, going off like that. Anything might happen to, it, uh, to her. But he spoke with some hesitation. There wasn't much you could imagine happening to Corporal Nobbs. I'm sure we shall hear about it if there are any problems, said the patrician. You're right there, sir. Colon sidled over to a group of men who were sitting in a rough circle on the floor, talking quietly amongst themselves and eating from a large dish. He sat down. The men on either side of him obediently shuffled along. Now then, how did you— All right. Anyone knew how Clatchians talked. Greetings, fellow brothers of the dessert, he said. I don't know about you, but I could just do with a plate of sheep's eyeballs, eh? I bet you boys can't wait to be back on your camels, I know I can't. I spit upon the defiling dogs of Ankh Morpork. Anyone had any backsheesh lately? You can call me Al. Excuse me, are you the lady who is with the clowns? Corporal Nobbs, who had been trudging along gloomily, looked up. He was being addressed by a pleasant-faced young woman. A woman actually talking to him by choice was a novelty. Smiling while doing so was unheard of. Eh... Uh, Right, yeah, that's me, he swallowed. Betty. My name is Barna. Would you like to come and talk with us? Nobby looked past her. There were a number of women of varying ages sitting around a large well. One of them waved at him shyly. He blinked. This was uncharted territory. He looked down at his clothes, which were already the worse for wear. His clothes always looked the worse for wear five minutes after he'd put them on. Oh, don't worry, said the girl. We know how it is, but you look so alone, and perhaps you can help us. They were among the group now. There were women of every legitimate shape and size, and so far none of them had said yuck, an experience hitherto unchronicled in Nobby's personal history. In a detached, light-headed way, Corporal Nobbs felt that he was entering paradise, and it was only an unfortunate detail that he'd come in via the wrong door. We are trying to comfort Netal, said the girl. Her betrothed won't marry her tomorrow. The swine, said Nobby. One of the girls, eyes red with crying, looked up sharply. He wanted to, she sobbed, but he's been taken off to fight in Gebra, all over some island no one's heard of, and all my family are here. Who took him off, said Nobby. He took himself off, snapped an older woman. Clothing differences aside, there was something hauntingly familiar about her, and Nobby realized that if you cut her in half, the words mother-in-law would be all the way through. Oh, Mrs. Atbar, said Natal, he said it was his duty. Anyway, all the boys have had to go. Men, said Nobby, rolling his eyes. I expect you know a lot about the pleasures of men, then, said mother-in-law sourly. Mother! Who, me? said Nobby, forgetting himself for a moment. Oh, yeah, lots. You do? Why not? Beer's favourite, said Nobby, but you can't beat a good cigar as long as it's free. Huh. Mother-in-law picked up a basket of washing and stamped away, followed by most of the older women. The others laughed. Even the disappointed Natal smiled. I think that's not what she meant, said Barna. To a chorus of giggles, she leaned down and whispered in Nobby's ear. His expression did not change, but it did seem to solidify. Oh, that, he said. There were some worlds of experience which Nobby had only contemplated on a map, but he knew what she was talking about. Of course he'd patrolled certain parts of the Shades in his time, the ones where young ladies tended to hang around without very much to do, and probably catching cold too, but those areas of police work that in other places might be of interest to a vice squad 
now tended to be looked after by the Guild of Seamstresses themselves. People who neglected to obey the, no, not the law as such, called them the unwritten rules, as laid down by Mrs. Palm and her committee of very experienced ladies, attracted the attention of the agony aunts, Dotsy and Sadie, and might or might not be seen again. And Mr. Harris of the Blue Cat Club. His admission caused a lot of argument in the Guild, who knew competition when they saw it. But Mrs. Palm overruled opposition on the basis, she said, that unnatural acts were only natural. Even Mr. Vimes approved of the arrangement. It didn't cause paperwork. Oh, yeah, said Nobby, still staring at some inner screen. Of course, he knew what. Oh, that, he mumbled. Well, I've uh, seen a thing or two, he added. Largely on postcards, he had to admit. It must be wonderful to have so much freedom, said Barna. Well, uh... Natal burst out crying again. Her friends fluttered around her. I don't see why the men have to go off like this, said Barna. My betrothed has gone too. There was a cackle from a very old woman sitting by the well. I can tell you why, dears. Because it's better than growing melons all day. It's better than women. Men think war is better than women? It's always fresh. It's always young. And you can make a good fight last all day. But they get killed. Better to die in battle than in bed, they say. <laughs> she cracked a toothless grin. But there are good ways for a man to die in bed, eh, Betty? Nobby hoped the glow of his ears wasn't singeing his veil. Suddenly, he felt he'd caught up with his future. Ten damn pence worth of it hit him in the face. Excuse me, he said. Are any of you New Bylians? What are New Bylians? said Barna. It's a uh, country round here, said Nobby. He added hopefully, isn't it? Not a single face suggested that this was so. Nobby sighed. His hand reached up to his ear for a cigarette end, but it came down again empty. I'll tell you this, girls, he said. I wish I'd settled for the ten-dollar version. Don't you just sometimes want to sit down and cry? You look even sadder than Netal, said Barna. Isn't there some way we can... Cheer you up? Nobby stared at her for a moment, and then started to sob. Everyone was staring at Colon, their food halfway to their lips. But did I just hear him say that, Fefal? What do I want to be on a camel for? I'm a plumber. He as the clown with the juggler. I think the poor man is several palms short of an oasis. I mean, the bloody things spit and they're a bugger to get up the stairs with your toolbox. Now, come on, it's not his fault. Let's show a little charity. The speaker cleared his throat. Good morning, friend, he said. May we invite you to share our couscous? Sergeant Colon peered at the bowl and then dipped in a finger and tasted it. Hey, this is semolina. You've got semolina. It's just ordinary semolina. He stopped and coughed. <coughs> yeah, right, thanks. Uh, got any strawberry jam? The host looked at his friends. They shrugged. We know not of this strawberry jam of which you speak, he said carefully. We prefer it with lamb, he offered Colon a long wooden skewer. Oh, you've got to have strawberry jam, said Colon, carried away. When we were kids, we'd stir it in and... and... Uh, he looked at their faces. Of course, that was uh, back in... Uh, he said. The men nodded at one another. Suddenly it was all clear. Colon belched loudly. From the looks he got from everyone else, he was the only one who'd heard of this common Clatchian custom. Uh, so, he said, where's the army these days? Um, approximately. Why do you ask, O oh, full of gas one? Oh, we thought we could make a bit of cash entertaining the troops, said Colon. He was immensely proud of this idea. You know, a smile, a song... A lack of exotic dancing. But that means we got to know where they are, see? Excuse me, fat one, but can you understand what I am saying? Yes, it's very tasty, Colon hazarded. Ah, I thought so. So he's a spy, but whose? Really, who would be so stupid to use a joke like this as a spy? 
Ankh Morpork? Oh, come on, he's pretending to be an Ankh Morpork spy, perhaps. But they're cunning over there. You think? A people who make curry out of something called curry powder? And you think they're clever? I reckon he's from Moontub. They're always watching us. And pretending to be from Ankh Morpork? Well, if you were trying to look like a joke Morporkian pretending to be Clatchian, wouldn't you look like that? But why'd he pretend to be from there? Hmm. Politics? Let's call the watch, then. Are you mad? We've been talking to him. They will be inquisitive. Good point, I know. Fayfowl gave Colon a big grin. I did hear the entire army has marched away to En al he said. But don't tell anyone. Have they? Colon glanced at the other men. They were watching him with curiously deadpan expressions. Sounds like a massive place with a name like that, he said. Oh, huge, said his neighbor. One of the other men made a noise that you might think was a suppressed chuckle. It's a long way, is it? No, very close. You're practically on top of it, said Fay Fowl. He nudged a colleague, whose shoulders were shaking. Oh, right. Big army, is it? Could easily be very big, yes. Fine, fine, said Colon. Eh, hmm. Anyone got a pencil? I could have sworn I had one when I... There was a noise outside the tavern. It was the sound of many women laughing, which is always a disquieting noise to men, usually because they suspect the joke's on them. Customers peered suspiciously through the vines. Colon and the rest of the crowd looked around an urn at the group by the well. An old lady was rolling on the ground laughing, and various younger ones were leaning against one another for support. He heard one of them say, What did he say again? He said, That's funny, it's never done that when I've tried it. Yes, that's true, cackled the old woman. It never does. That's funny, it's never done that when I've tried it. Nobby repeated. Colon groaned. That was the voice and tone of Corporal Nobbs in storytelling mode, when Wood could scorch at ten yards. Excuse me, he muttered, and forced his way through the press to the gateway. Have you heard the one about the ki the sultan, who was afraid his wife, well, uh, one of his wives, would be unfaithful to him while he was away? We haven't heard any stories like these, Betty, Barna gasped. Really? How? Oh, I've got a thousand and one of them. Well, anyway, he went and saw the wise old blacksmith, right? And he said, You can't go around telling stories like that, Corporal uh, Betty, Colon panted as he lumbered to a halt. Nobby realised that a change had come over the group. Now he was surrounded by women who were in the presence of a man. A known man. He corrected himself. Several of them were blushing. They hadn't blushed before. Why not? said Betty nastily. You'll offend people, said Colon uncertainly. Er, uh, we are not offended, sir, said Barna, in a small, humble voice. We think Betty's stories are very instructive, especially the one about the man who went into the tavern with the very small musician. And that was pretty hard to translate, said Nobby, because they don't really know what a piano is in Clatch, but it turns out there's this kind of stringed... And it was very interesting about the man with his arms and legs in plaster, said Natal. Yeah, they laughed even though they don't have the same kind of doorbells here, said Nobby. Here, you don't have to go. But the group around the well were dispersing. Water jugs were being picked up and carried away. A kind of preoccupied busyness came over the women. Barna nodded at Betty. Ah, uh, thank you. It's been very interesting, but we must go. It was so kind of you to talk to us. Here, yeah, no, don't go. A faint suggestion of perfume hung in the air. Betty glared at Colon. Sometimes I really want to give you a right ding alongside the lug hole, she growled. My first bloody chance in years, and you... She stopped. There was a crowd of puzzled yet disapproving faces behind Colon, and things might have ended otherwise had it not been for the braying of the donkey from above. The stolen donkey, easily pulling away from Nobby's inexpert tether, had wandered off in search of food. She vaguely associated this with the doorway to her stable, and therefore with doorways in general, and so had wandered through the nearest open one. There had been some narrow spiral stairs inside, but her stall was pretty narrow, and steps didn't worry a donkey that was used to the streets of Al-Khali. 
It was only a disappointment when the steps came to an end, and there was still no hay. Oh, no, said someone behind Colon. There's a donkey up in the minaret again. There were groans all round. What's wrong with that? What goes up must come down, said Colon. You don't know, said one of his dining companions. You don't have minarets in Ur? Um, said Colon. We have plenty of donkeys, said Lord Betinari. There was general laughter, most of it directed at Colon. One of the men pointed to the dim interior of the minaret. Look, see? A very narrow winding staircase, said the patrician. So? There's nowhere to turn at the top, right? Oh, any fool can get a donkey up a minaret. But have you ever tried getting an animal to go backwards down a narrow staircase in the dark? Hm, can't be done. There's something about a rising staircase, said someone else. It attracts donkeys. They think there's something at the top. We had to push the last one off, didn't we? said one of the guards. Right, it splashed, said his comrade in arms. No one is pushing Valerie off of anything, snarled Betty. Any one of you tries anything like that, and so help me, you'll feel the wrong end of— He stopped, and a wide, horrible grin appeared behind the veil. I mean, I'll give you a great big soppy kiss. Several men at the back of the crowd took to their heels. There's no need to get nasty, said the guard. I mean it, said Betty, advancing. The cowering guard cringed. Can't you do anything with her, sirs? Us, said Lord Betinari. Afraid not. Oh, dear. It's going to be like that business in Jilla Baby all over again. Ow. Oh, dear, said Colon, mugging loyally. The crowd, or at least that part that thought itself sufficiently far away from Betty, started to grin. This was street theatre. I don't know if they ever got that man down off the flagpole. Vetinari went on. Oh, most of him they did, said Colon. Tell you what, tell you what, said the guard hurriedly. Suppose we get a rope round it. Her, Betty growled. Her, right. And then you'd need at least three men up there, and there ain't no room. Sir, I've got an idea, whispered one of the guards. I should make it quick, said Colon, because there's no stopping Betty once she gets going. The guards held a whispered argument. We'd get into trouble if we do that. You know all that stuff we were told about the war effort. That's why they were all confiscated. No one will miss it for five minutes. Yeah, but you want to tell the prince we lost one? All right, but do you want to explain to her? They both looked at Betty. And they're easy to steer, after all, one whispered. Valerie, said Sergeant Colon. There is a problem, Betty demanded. No, no, it's a fine name for a donkey knob, um, uh, uh, Betty. No one is to do anything, said one of the guards. We will return. What was that all about? said Colon, watching them go. Oh, they've probably gone to get a carpet, said someone. Very nice, but I don't see how that'd help, said Betty. A flying one. Oh, right, said Colon. They've got one of those up at the university. Ur has a university? Oh, indeed, said the patrician. How do you think that Al learned what a donkey looks like? Once again, laughter dispelled doubt. Colon grinned uncertainly. I'm really getting good at this stupid idiot stuff, aren't I? he said. It just sort of happens. Marvellous, said Lord Vetinari. There was another angry braying from far above. Trouble is, they're all locked up because of the war effort, said someone behind them. A piece of mud brick shattered on the ground nearby. The way it's thrashing around up there is going to fall off anyway. Perhaps I should persuade her to come down, said the patrician. Can't be done, Offendi. You can't get past on the stairs. You can't turn it round and it won't come down backwards. I shall consider the situation, said the patrician. He ambled back into the tavern for a moment and returned. They saw him enter the door, and then they heard him climbing the staircase. Should be good, said a man behind Colon. After a while, the braying stopped. Can't turn round, see? Far too narrow, said the elevated donkey expert. Can't turn round, won't go backwards, well-known fact. There's always a know-all, right, Betty? said Colon. Yeah, always. The tower was full of silence. Several members of the crowd found their attention drawn to it. 
I mean, if you could get three or four men up the stairs, which you can't, you could sort of move it a leg at a time if you didn't mind being kicked and bitten to death. All right, all right, back away from the tower, will you? The guards were back. One of them was carrying a rolled-up carpet. All right, all right, give us room. I can hear hooves, said someone. Oh, yeah, like our friend in the fez is getting the donkey down the stairs. Hang on, I can hear them too, said Colon. Now all eyes stared at the door. Lord Vetinari emerged, holding a length of rope. The voice behind Colon said, All right, it's just a bit of rope. He was probably banging a couple of coconut shells together. You mean ones that he found in the minaret? He had them with him, obviously. You mean he carries coconut shells around? You can't turn a donkey round it. All right, that's a fake donkey head. It's moving its ears. On a string, on a string. All right, it's a donkey. Okay. But it's not the same donkey. It's one he had in a hidden pocket. Well, no need to look at me like that. I've seen them do it with doves. Then even the unbeliever fell silent. Donkey, minaret, said Lord Vetinari. Minaret, donkey. Just like that, said the guard. How did you do it? It was a trick, right? Of course it was a trick, said Lord Vetinari. I knew it was just a trick. That's right. It was just a trick, said Lord Vetinari. So, how did you do it, then? You mean you can't spot it? The crowd craned to see. Uh, you had an inflatable donkey. Can you think of any reason why I should go around with an inflatable donkey? Well, you... one that you wouldn't mind explaining to your own dear mother? If you're going to put it like that... It's easy, said Al Gibbler. There's a sacred compartment in the minaret. Must be. No, you've got it all wrong. It's just an illusion of a donkey. Well, all right, it, it's a good illusion. By now, half the people were around the donkey, and the others were clustered in the doorway of the minaret, looking for secret panels. I think Al and Betty, this is where we walk away, said Lord Vetinari behind Colon, just down this little alley here, and when we turn that corner, we run. What have we got to run for, said Betty, because I've just picked up the magic carpet. Vimes was already lost. Oh, there was the sun, but that was just a direction. He could feel it on the side of his face. And the camel rocked from side to side. There was no real way of judging distance except by hemorrhoids. I'm blindfolded on the back of a camel ridden by a dreg, who everyone says are the most untrustworthy people in the world, but I'm almost positive he's not going to kill me. So, he said as he rocked gently from side to side, you may as well tell me why seventy-one hour Ahmed? He killed a man, said Jabbar. And do regs object to a little thing like that? In the man's own tent, when he had been his guest for nearly three days, if he had but waited an hour. Oh, I see. Definitely bad manners. Had the man done anything to deserve it? Nothing. Although, yes, the man had killed El Issa. The dreg's tone suggested that it wasn't much of a mitigating circumstance, but that it ought to be mentioned out of completeness. Who was she? El Issa was a village. He poisoned a well. There had been a dispute over religion, he added. One thing led to another, but even so, to break the tradition of hospitality. Yes, I could say that's a terrible thing. Almost impolite. The hour was important. Some things should not be done. You're right there, at least. By mid-afternoon, Jabbar let him take off the blindfold. Wind-carved heaps of black rock stood out of the sand. Vimes thought it was the most desolate place he'd ever seen. They say once it was green, said Jabbar, a well-watered land. What happened? The wind changed. At sunset they reached a wadi, between more wind-scoured rocks, and it was only the length of the shadows deepening the shallow indentations that began to give them back an ancient shape. They're buildings, aren't they? said Vimes. There was a city here a long time ago. Did you not know? Why should I know? Your people built it. It was called Tacticum, after a warrior of yours. 
Vimes looked at the crumbled walls and fallen pillars. He had a city named after him, he said to no one in particular. Jabbar nudged him. Ahmed is watching you, he said. I can't see him anywhere. Of course. Get down, and I hope we might meet again in whatever is your paradise. Right, right. Jabbar turned the camel round. It left much faster than it had arrived. Vimes sat on a rock for a while. There was no sound but the hissing of the wind in the rocks and the cry of some bird far away. He thought he could hear his own heart beating. Bingly, bingly, beep! The disorganizer sounded worried and uncertain. Vimes sighed. Yes, appointment with seventy-one hour Ahmed, eh? Er, uh, no, said the demon. Er, uh, Clatchian fleet sighted. Er, uh, ships of the desert, eh? Er, uh, beep, error code 746 divergent temporal instability. Vimes shook the box. Something wrong with you, he demanded. You're still giving me someone else's appointments, you idiot box. Er, uh, the appointments are correct for Commander Samuel Vimes. That's me. Which one of you? said the demon. What? Beep. It refused to say more. Vimes considered throwing it away, but Sybil would be hurt if she found out. He thrust it back into his pocket and tried to concentrate on the scenery again. His seat might have been part of a pillar once. Vimes saw other pieces some way away, and then realized that a heap of apparent rubble was a fallen wall. He followed this, his footsteps echoing off the cliffs, and realized that he was walking between old buildings, or where buildings had been. Here was the wreck of some stairs, there a stump of a pillar. One was a little higher than the others. He pulled himself up and found, on its flat top, two huge feet. A statue must have stood here. It probably stood, if Vimes knew anything about statues, in some kind of noble attitude. Now it had gone and there were just feet, broken off at the ankles. They weren't exceptionally noble. As he lowered himself again, he saw, protected because this side was out of the wind, some lettering carved deeply into the plinth. He tried to make it out in the fading light. Ab hoc possum videri domum tuum. Well, domum tuum was your house, wasn't it? And videri was I see. What? he said aloud. I can see your house from up here. What kind of a noble sentiment is that? I believe it was meant to be a boast and a threat, Sir Samuel, said Seventy-One Hour Ahmed. Somewhat typical of Ankh Morpork, I've always thought. Vimes stood very still. The voice had been right behind him, and it was Ahmed's voice, but it lacked that hint of camel spit and gravel that it had possessed in Ankh Morpork. Now it was the drawl of a gentleman. It's the echoes here, Ahmed went on. I could be anywhere. I could have a crossbow aimed at you right now. You won't fire it, though. We've both got too much at stake. Oh, there is honour among thieves, is there? I don't know, said Vimes. Oh, well. Time to see if he was dead right or just dead. Is there honour among policemen? Sergeant Colon's eyes went big. Swing my weight to one side, he said. That's how magic carpets are steered, said Lord Vetinari calmly. Yes, but supposing I swing myself off? We'll have a lot more room, said Betty, unfeelingly. Come on, Sarge, you know how to throw your weight around. I ain't throwing my weight anywhere, said Colon firmly. He was lying full length on the carpet, both hands gripping it as hard as possible. It's not natural, just a bit of broad loom between you and certain splash. The patrician looked down. We're not over water, Sergeant. I know what I meant, sir. Can we slow down a bit, said Betty. The breeze is invading my privacy, if you get my drift. Lord Betinari sighed. We're not going very fast as it is. I suspect this is a very old carpet. There's a frayed bit here, said Betty. Shut up, said Colon. Look, I can poke my finger right through. Shut up. Notice how it kind of wobbles when you move. Shut up. Here, look, those palm trees down there look really small. Nobby, 
You're scared of heights, said Colon. I know you're scared of heights. That sexual stereotyping. No, it's not. Yes, it is. You'll be expecting me to break my ankle a lot and scream all the time. Next, it's my job to prove to you that a woman can be as good as a man. Practically identical in your case, Nobby. You've caught too much sun, that's what it is. You are not female, Nobby. Betty sniffed. That's just the sort of sexist remark I'd expect from you. Well, you're not. It's the principle of the thing. Well, at least we now have transport, said Lord Vetinari, his tone suggesting that the show was over. Unfortunately, I had no time to find out where the army is. Ah, I can help you there, sir. Colon tried to salute and then made a grab for the carpet again. I found out by cunning, sir. Really? Yes, sir. It's at a place called Er uh, En Al Sam's La Lisa, sir. The carpet drifted onwards for a moment in silence. The place where the sun shineth not, said the patrician. There was more silence. Colon was trying not to look at anyone. Is there a somewhere called Gebra? said Nobby sulkily. Yes, Betty, er, uh, Corporal, there is. They've gone there. Of course, you've only got a woman's word for it. Well done, Corporal. We shall head up the coast. Lord Vetinari relaxed. In a busy and complex life, he'd never met people quite like Nobby and Colon. They talked all the time, yet there was something almost restful about them. He watched the dusty horizon carefully as the ancient carpet curved around. Under his arm was the metal cylinder Leonard had made for him. Drastic times required drastic measures. Sir, said Colon, his voice muffled by the carpet. Yes, Sergeant. I've got to know, how did you, you know, get that donkey down? Persuasion, Sergeant. What? Just talking? Yes, Sergeant, persuasion. And admittedly a sharp stick. Ah, I knew. The trick of getting donkeys down from minarets, said the patrician, as the desert unwound below them, is always to find that part of the donkey which seriously wishes to get down. The wind had settled. The bird up on the cliffs had shut down for the night. All Vimes could hear was the sizzle of the little desert creatures. Then, Ahmed's voice said, I am genuinely impressed, Sir Samuel. Vimes took a deep breath. You know, you really fooled me, he said. May your loins be full of fruit. That was a good one. I really thought you were just... He stopped. But Ahmed continued. Just another camel driver with a towel on his head. Oh, dear. And you've been doing so well up to now, Sir Samuel. The prince was very impressed. Oh, come on. You were all but making suggestive comments about melons. What was I supposed to think? Don't fret, Sir Samuel. I consider it all a compliment. You can turn round... I wouldn't dream of harming you unless you'd do something... foolish. Vimes turned. He could just make out a shape in the afterglow. You were admiring this place, said Ahmed. Tacticus's men had it built when he tried to conquer Clatch. It's not really a city by today's standards, of course. It was really just making a point. Here we are and here we stay, as it were. And then the wind changed. You murdered snowy slopes, didn't you? The term is executed. I can show you the confession he signed beforehand. Of his own free will, more or less. What? Let us say I pointed out to him the alternatives to signing the confession. I was kind enough to leave you the pad. After all, I wanted to keep your interest. And don't look like that, Sir Samuel. I need you. How can you tell how I look? I can guess... The Assassin's Guild had a contract on him in any case, and by a happy chance, I am a Guild member. You? Vimes tried to bite down on the word, and then, why not him? Kids got sent a thousand miles to be taught in the Assassin's Guild school. Oh, yes, the best years of my life, they tell me. I was in Viper House. Up school, up school, right up school. He sighed like a prince and spat like a camel driver. If I shut my eyes, I can still recall the taste of that peculiar custard we used to get on Mondays. Dear me, how it all comes back. I remember every soggy street. Does Mr. Dibbler still sell his horrible sausages in a bun in Treacle Mine Road? Yes. 
Still the same old dibbler, eh? Still the same sausages. Once tasted, never forgotten. True. No, don't move too quickly, Sir Samuel. Otherwise I'm afraid I shall be cutting your own throat. You don't trust me, and I don't trust you. Why did you drag me here? Drag you? <laughs> I had to sabotage my own ship so you wouldn't lose me. Yes, but you... You knew how I'd react. Vimes's heart began to sink. Everyone knew how Sam Vimes would react. Yes. Would you like a cigarette, Sir Samuel? I thought you sucked those damn clothes. In Ankh-Morpork, yes. Always be a little bit foreign wherever you are, because everyone knows foreigners are a little bit stupid. Besides, these are rather good. Fresh from the desert. <laughs> yes, everyone knows Clatchian cigarettes are made from camel dung. A match flared, and for a moment Vimes caught a glimpse of the hooked nose as Ahmed lit a cigarette for him. That is one area where I regret to say prejudice has some evidence on its side. No, these are all the way from Sumtri, an island where it is said the women have no souls. <laughs> Personally, I doubt it. Vimes could make out a hand holding the packet. Just for a moment he wondered if he could grab and... How is your luck? said Ahmed. Running out, I suspect. Yes, a man should know the length of his luck. Shall I tell you how I know you are a good man, Sir Samuel? In the light of the rising moon, Vimes saw Ahmed produce a cigarette holder, insert one and light up almost fastidiously. Do tell. After the attempt on the prince's life, I suspected everyone. But you suspected only your own people. You couldn't bring yourself to think the Clatchians might have done it, because that had lined you up with the likes of Sergeant Colon, and all the rest of the Clatchian fags are made of camel dung brigade. Whose policeman are you? I draw my pay, let us say, as the Wali of Prince Kadram. I shouldn't think he's very happy with you right now, then. You were supposed to be guarding his brother, weren't you? So was I, Vimes thought, but what the hell? Yes, and we thought the same way, Sir Samuel. You thought it was your people, I thought it was mine. The difference is, I was right. Kufura's death was plotted in Clatch. Oh, really? That's what they wanted the Watch to think. No, Sir Samuel, the important thing is what someone wanted... You to think. Really? Well, you've got that wrong. All the stuff with the glass and the sand on the floor. I saw through that straight away. His voice faded into silence. After a while, Ahmed said, almost sympathetically, Yes, you did. Damn! Oh, in some ways you were right. Ossif was paid in dollars originally. And then later on someone broke in, making sure they dumped most of the glass outside and swapped the money, and distributed the sand. I must say that I thought the sand was going a bit too far, too. No one would be that stupid. But they wanted to make sure it looked like a bungled attempt. Who was it? said Vimes. Oh, a small-time thief. Bob Bob Hard, yo-yo. He didn't even know why he was doing it except that someone was willing to pay him. I commend your city, Commander. For enough money, you can find someone to do anything. Someone must have paid him. A man he met in a pub. Vimes nodded glumly. It was amazing how many people were prepared to do business with a man they'd met in a pub. I can believe that, he said. You see, if even the redoubtable Commander Vimes, who is known even to some senior Clatchian politicians as an unbendingly honest and thorough man, if somewhat lacking in intelligence, if even he protested that it was done by his own people, well, the world is watching. The world would soon find out. Starting a war over a rock, well, that sort of thing makes countries uneasy. They've all got rocks off their coast. But starting a war because some foreign dog had killed a man on a mission of peace, that, I think, the world will understand. Lacking in intelligence? said Vimes. Oh, don't be too depressed, Commander. That business with the fire at the embassy, that was sheer bravery. It was bloody terror. 
Well, the dividing line is narrow. That was one thing I hadn't expected. In the rolling, clicking snooker table of Vimes's mind, the black ball hit a pocket. You had expected the fire, then? The building should have been almost empty. Vimes moved. Ahmed was lifted off his feet and slammed against a pillar with both of Vimes's hands around his neck. The woman was trapped in there. It, it was necessary, said Ahmed hoarsely. There had to be a diversion. His life was in danger. I had to get him out. I, I did not know about the woman until too late. I give you my word. Through the red veil of anger, Vimes became aware of a prickle in the region of his stomach. He glanced down at the knife that had appeared magically in the other man's hand. Listen to me, hissed Ahmed. Prince Kadram ordered his brother's death. What better way to demonstrate the perfidy of the sausage eaters killing a peacemaker? His own brother? You expect me to believe that? Messages were sent to the embassy in code. To the old ambassador? I don't believe that. Ahmed stood quite still for a moment. No, you really don't, do you? He said. Be generous, Sir Samuel. Truly treat all men equally. Allow Clatchians the right to be scheming bastards, hmm? In fact, the ambassador is just a pompous idiot. Ankh Morpork has no monopoly on them. But his deputy sees the messages first. He is... A young man of ambition. Vimes relaxed his grip. Him? I thought he was shifty as soon as I saw him. I suspect that you thought he was Clatchian as soon as you saw him. But I take your point. And you could read this code, could you? Oh, come now. Don't you read Vetinari's paperwork upside down when you're standing in front of his desk? Besides, I am Prince Kadram's policeman. So he's your boss, right? Who is your boss, Sir Samuel, when push comes to shove? The two men stood locked together. Ahmed's breath wheezed. Vimes stood back. These messages, you've got them? Oh, yes, with his seal on them. Ahmed rubbed his neck. Good grief, the originals? I'd have thought they'd be under lock and key. They were, in the embassy. But in the fire, many hands were needed to carry important documents to safety. It was a very... Useful fire. Well, you can't argue against that in court. What court? The king is the law. Ahmed sat down. We are not like you. You kill kings. The word is execute, and we only did it once, and that was a long time ago, said Vimes. Is that why you brought me here? Why all this drama? You could have come to see me in Ark Morpork. You're a suspicious man, Commander. Would you have believed me? Besides, I had to get Prince Kufura out of there before he <clears throat> died of his wounds. Where's the prince now? Close and safe. He is safer in the desert than he would ever be in Ankh Morpork, I can assure you. And, well, getting better, he is being looked after by an old lady whom I trust. Your mother? He <laughs> can't know. My mother is a dreg. She'd be terribly offended if I trusted her. She'd say she hadn't brought me up right. He saw Vimes' expression this time. You think I am an educated barbarian? Let's just say I'd have given Snowy Slopes a running start. Really? Look around you, Sir Samuel. Your beat is a city you can walk across in half an hour. Mine is two million square miles of desert and mountain. My companions are a sword and a camel, and, frankly, neither are good conversationalists, believe me. Oh, the towns and cities have their guards, of a sort. They are uncomplicated thinkers, but it is my job to go into the waste places and chase bandits and murderers five hundred miles from anyone who would be on my side. So I must inspire dread and strike the first blow, because I will not have a chance to strike a second one. I am an honest man of a sort, I think. I survive. I survived seven years in an Ark Moorpork public school, patronized by the sons of gentlemen. Compared to that, life among the dregs holds no terrors, I assure you. And I administer justice swiftly and inexpensively. I heard about how you got your name. Ahmed shrugged. The man had poisoned the water, the only well for twenty miles, 
That killed five men, seven women, thirteen children, and thirty-one camels. And some of them were very valuable camels, mark you. I had evidence from the man who sold him the poison, and a trustworthy witness who had seen him near the well on the fateful night. Once I had testimony from his servant, why wait even an hour? Sometimes we have trials, said Vines brightly. Yes, your Lord Vetinari decides. Well, five hundred miles from anywhere, the law is me. Ahmed waved a hand. Oh, no doubt the man would suggest there were mitigating circumstances, that he had an unhappy childhood, or was driven by compulsive well-poisoning disorder. But I have a compulsion to behead cowardly murderers. Vimes gave up. The man had a point. The man had a whole sword. Different strokes for different folk, he said. I find the one at shoulder height generally suffices, said Ahmed. Don't gribbus, it was a joke. I knew the prince was plotting, and I thought this is not right. Had he killed some ankh Morpork lord, that would be just politics. But this, I thought, why do I chase stupid people into the mountains when I am part of a big crime? The prince wants to unite the whole of Clutch. Personally, I like the little tribes and countries, even their little wars. But I don't mind if they fight ankh Morpork because they want to, or because of your horrible personal habits, or your unthinking arrogance. There's a lot of reasons for fighting ankh Morpork. A lie isn't one of them. I know what you mean, said Barnes. But what can I do alone? Arrest my prince? I am his policeman, as you are Vetinari's. No, I'm an officer of the law. All I know is there must be a policeman, even for kings. Vimes looked pensively at the moonlit desert. Somewhere out there was the ankh Morpork army, what there was of it. And somewhere waiting was the Clachian army. And thousands of men who might have quite liked one another had they met socially would thunder towards one another and start killing. And after that first rush, you had all the excuses you needed to do it again and again. He remembered listening when he was a kid to old men in his street talking about war. There hadn't been many wars in his time. The states of the Stowe Plains mainly, mainly tried to bankrupt one another, or the Assassin's Guild sorted everything out on a one-to-one -one basis. Most of the time people just bickered, and while that was pretty annoying, it was a lot better than having a sword stuck in your liver. What he remembered most among the descriptions of puddles filled with blood and flying limbs was the time one old man said, And if your foot got caught in something, it was always best not to look and see what it was, if and you wanted to hold on to your dinner. He'd never explained what he meant. The other old men seemed to know. Anyway, nothing could have been worse than the explanations Vimes thought of for himself. And he remembered that the three old men who spent most of their days sitting on a bench in the sun had between them five arms, five eyes, four and a half legs, and two and three-quarter faces. And seventeen ears. Crazy Winston would bring out his collection for a good boy who looked suitably frightened. He wants to start a war. Vimes had to open his mouth, because otherwise there was no room to get his head round such a crazy idea. This man, who everyone said was honest, noble, and good, wanted a war. Oh, certainly, said Ahmed. Nothing unites people like a good war. How could you deal with someone who thought like that? Vimes asked himself. A mere murderer? Well, you had a whole range of options. He could deal with a mere murderer. You had criminals, and you had policemen. And there was a sort of seesaw there which balanced out in some strange way. But if you took a man who'd sit down and decide to start a war, what in the name of seven hells could you balance him with? You'd need a policeman the size of a country. You couldn't blame the soldiers. They'd just joined up to be pointed in the right direction. Something clicked against the fallen pillar. Vimes glanced down and pulled the baton out of his pocket. It glinted in the moonlight. What damn good was something like this? All it really meant was that he was allowed to chase the little criminals who did the little crimes. There was nothing he could do about the crimes that were so big you couldn't even see them. You lived in them. So safer to stick to the little crimes, Sam Vimes. All right, my sons, let them have it right up the geography. Figures bounded over the fallen pillars. There was a metallic whir as Ahmed unsheathed his sword. Vimes saw a halberd coming towards him, an Ankh-Morpork halberd. And street reaction took over. 
He didn't waste time sneering at someone stupid enough to use a pike on a foot soldier. He dodged the blade, caught the shaft, and pulled it so hard that its owner stumbled right into his upswinging boot. Then he jerked away, struggling to untangle his sword from the unfamiliar robes. He ducked another shadowy figure's wild slice and managed to make an elbow connect with something painful. As he rose, he looked into the face of a man with an upraised sword. There was a silken sound, and the man swayed backwards, his head looking surprised as it fell away from the body. Vimes dragged his headdress off. I'm from Ark Morpork, you stupid sods! A huge figure rose in front of him, a sword in each hand. I'll cut your tonker off ya, you, you greasy... Oh, is that you, Sir Samuel? Huh? Willikins? Indeed, sir, the butler straightened up. Willikins? Do excuse me one moment, sir. Knock it off, you mother-loving sons of bitches. I had no apprehension of your presence, sir. This one's fighting back, Sarge. Ahmed had his back to a pillar. A man already lay at his feet. Three others were trying to get close enough to the Wali while staying away from the whirling wall he was creating with his sword. Ahmed, these are on our side, Vimes yelled. Oh, really? Pardon me. Ahmed lowered his sword and removed the cigarette holder from his mouth. He nodded at one of the soldiers who had been trying to attack him and said, Good morning to you. Here, are you one of ours too? No, I am one of... He's with me, Vimes snapped. How come you're here, Willikins? Sergeant Willikins, I see. We were on patrol, sir, and we were attacked by some Clatchian gentlemen. After the ensuing unpleasantness... You should have seen him, sir. He bit one bastard's nose right off, a soldier supplied. It is true that I endeavoured to uphold the good name of Ankh Morpork, sir. Anyway, after... And one bloke, Sarge, stabbed him right in the... Please, Private Bork, I am apprising Sir Samuel of events, said Willikins. Sarge ought to get a medal, sir. Those few of us who survived tried to get back, sir, but we had to conceal ourselves from other patrols, and we were just considering lying up until dawn in this edifice when we espied you and this gentleman here. Ahmed was watching him with his mouth open. How many were in this Clatchian patrol, Sergeant? he said. Nineteen men, sir. That's a very precise count in this light. I was able to enumerate them subsequently, sir. You mean they were all killed? Yes, sir, said Willikins calmly. However, we ourselves lost five men, sir, not including privates Hobley and Webb, sir, who regrettably seem to have passed away as a result of this unfortunate misunderstanding. With your permission, sir, I will remove them. Poor devils, said Vimes, aware that it was not enough, but that nothing else would be either. The fortunes of war, sir... Private Hobley, ginger to his friends, was nineteen and lived in Ettercap Street, where, until recently, he made bootlaces. Willikins took the dead man's arms and pulled. He was courting a young lady called Grace, a picture of whom he was kind enough to show me last night. A maid at Lady Venturi's, I was given to understand. If you would be good enough to pass me his head, sir, I will get on with things. Smudger, who told you to sit down? Get on your feet right now. Get out your shovel. Take off your helmet. Show some respect. Get digging. Ha! A cloud of smoke rolled past Vimes's ear. I know what you're thinking, said Ahmed, but this is war, Sir Samuel. Wake up and smell the blood. But one minute they're alive. Your friend here knows how it works. You don't. He's a butler. So... It's kill or be killed, even for butlers. You're not a natural warrior, Sir Samuel. Vimes thrust the baton in his face. I'm not a natural killer. See this? See what it says? I'm supposed to keep the peace, I am. If I kill people to do it, I'm reading the wrong manual. Willikins appeared silently, hefting the other corpse. I was not privileged to know much about this young man, he said, as he carried him behind a rock. We called him Spider, sir, he went on, straightening up. He played the harmonica rather badly, and spoke longingly of home. Will you be taking tea, sir? Private Smith is having a brew-up. Er, uh, the butler coughed politely. Yes, Willikins? I hardly like to broach the subject, sir. Broach it, man. Do you have such a thing as a biscuit about you, sir? I hesitate to provide tea without biscuits, but we have not eaten for two days. But you were on patrol. Forage party, sir? Willikins looked embarrassed. Vimes was bewildered. You mean Rust didn't even wait to take on food? Oh, yes, sir. But as it transpired... 
We knew there was something wrong when the mutton barrel started to explode, muttered Private Bork. The biscuits was pretty lively, too. Turned out Bloody Rust had bought a lot of stuff even a raghead wouldn't eat. And we eat anything, said 71-hour Ahmed solemnly. Private Bork, you horrible man, speaking of your commanding officer like that, you will be on a charge. I apologise, sir, but we are feeling a little faint. A long time between noses, eh? said 71-hour Ahmed. Ha ha ha, sir, said Willikins. Vime sighed. Willikins, when you've finished, I want you and your men to come with me. Very good, sir. Vimes nodded at Ahmed. And you too, he said. Push has come to shove. The hot wind flapped the banners. The sunlight sparkled up the spears. Lord Rust surveyed his army and found that it was good, but small. He leaned towards his adjutant. Let us not forget, though, that even General Tacticus was outnumbered ten to one when he took the pass of al Ibi, he said. Yes, sir, although I believe his men were all mounted on elephants, sir, said Lieutenant Hornet, and had all been well provisioned, he added meaningfully. Possibly. Possibly, but then Lord Pinwell's cavalry once charged the full might of the Pseudopolitan army, and are renowned in song and story. But they were all killed, sir. Yes, yes, but it was a famous charge, nevertheless. And every child knows, do they not, the story of the mere one hundred Ephebians who defeated the entire Tsortian army. A total victory, eh? 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 Yes, sir said the adjutant glumly. Oh, you admit it? Yes, sir. Of course, some commentators believe the earthquake helped. At least you will admit that the seven heroes of Hergen beat the big-footed people, although outnumbered by a hundred to one. Yes, sir. That was a nursery story, sir. It never really happened. Are you calling my nurse a liar, boy? No, sir, said Lieutenant Hornet hurriedly. Then you'll concede that Baron Mimbledrone single-handedly beat the armies of the Plum Pudding Country and ate their sultana. I envy him, sir. The lieutenant looked at the lines again. The men were very hungry, although Rust would probably have called them sleek. Things would have been even worse if it hadn't been for the fortuitous shower of boiled lobsters on the way over. Uh, you don't think, sir, since we have a little time in hand... We should look to the disposition of the men, sir. Well, they look well disposed to me. Plucky men, eager to be at the fray. Yes, sir, I meant more, well, positioned, sir. Nothing wrong with a man. Beautifully lined up, eh? A wall of steel poised to thrust at the black heart of the Clachian aggressor. Yes, sir, but, and I realise this is a remote chance, sir, it might be that while we're thrusting at the heart of the Clatchian aggressor, Black Heart, Rust corrected him, uh, Black Heart of the Clatchian aggressor, sir, the arms of the Clatchian aggressor, those companies there, and there, sir, will sweep around in the classic pincer movement. The thrusting wall of steel served us magnificently in the second war with Quirm. We lost that one, sir. But it was a damn close-run thing. We still lost, sir. What did you do as a civilian, Lieutenant? I was a surveyor, sir, and I can read Clatchian. That's why you made me an officer. So you don't know how to fight. Only how to count, sir. Ha! Show a little courage, man. Although I'll wager you won't need to. No stomach for a battle, Johnny Clatchian. Once he tastes our steel, he'll be off. I certainly hear what you say, sir, said the adjutant, who had been surveying the Clatchian lines and had formed his own opinions about the matter. His opinion was this. The main force of the Clatchian army had in recent years been fighting everyone. That suggested to his uncomplicated mind that by now the surviving soldiers were the ones who were in the habit of being alive at the end of battles, and were also very experienced at facing all kinds of enemies. The stupid ones were dead. The current Ankh Morpork army, on the other hand, had never faced an enemy at all, although day-to-day -day experience of living in the city might count for something there, at least in the rougher areas. 
He believed, along with General Tacticus, that courage, bravery, and the indomitable human spirit were fine things, which nevertheless tended to take second place to the combination of courage, bravery, the indomitable human spirit, and a six-to-one superiority of numbers. It had all sounded straightforward in Ankh Morpork, he thought. We were going to sail into Clatch and be in Alcali by tea time, drinking sherbet with pliant young women in the Roxy. The Clatchians would take one look at our weapons and run away. Well, the Clatchians had taken a good look this morning. So far, they hadn't run. They appeared to be sniggering a lot. Vimes rolled his eyes. It worked, but how did it work? He'd heard plenty of good speakers, and Captain Carrot was not among them. He hesitated, lost the thread, repeated himself, and in general made a mess of the whole thing. And yet, and yet, he watched the faces that were watching Carrot. There were the Dregs, and some of the Clatchians who'd stayed behind, and Willikens and his reduced company. They were listening. It was a kind of magic. He told people they were good chaps, and they knew they weren't good chaps, but the way he told it made them believe it for a while. Here was someone who thought you were a noble and worthy person, and somehow it would be unthinkable to disappoint them. It was a mirror of a speech, reflecting back to you what you wanted to hear, and he meant it all. Even so, men occasionally glanced up at Vimes and Ahmed, and he could see them thinking in their separate ways, it must be all right if they're in on it. That, he was ashamed to realize, was one of the advantages of armies. People looked to other people for orders. This is a trick, said Ahmed. No, he doesn't know any tricks like that, said Angua. He really doesn't. Oh, oh. There was a scuffle in the ranks. Carrot strode forward and reached down, bringing up Private Bork and a dreg, each man held by the collar in one big fist. What's going on, you two? He called me the brother of a pig, sir. Liar! You called me a greasy dishcloth head. Carrot shook his head. And you were both doing so well, too, he said sadly. There really is no call for this. Now I want you, Hashel, and you, Vincent, to shake hands, right, and apologize, yes? We've all had a rather trying time, but I know you're both fine fellows underneath it all. Vimes heard Ahmet murmur, Oh, well, now it's all over. So, if you'll just shake hands, we'll say no more about it. Vimes glanced at seventy-one-hour Ahmed. The man was wearing a sort of waxen grin. The two scufflers very gingerly touched hands, as if they were expecting a spark to leap the gap. And now you, Vincent, apologize to Mr. Hashel. There was a reluctant... Sorry. And we're sorry for what? Carrot prompted. Sorry for calling him a gracie disclothed. Well said. And you, Hashel, apologize to Private Bork? The Dureg's eyes scurried around their sockets, looking to find a way out that would allow their body to come to. Then he gave up. Hi. For? Sorry for calling up brother of a pig. Carrot lowered both men. Good. I'm sure you'll get along splendidly once you get to know each other. I didn't just see that, did I? said Ahmed. I didn't just see him talk like a little schoolteacher to Hashel, who I happen to know once hit a man so hard his nose ended up in one of his ears. Yes, you did, said Angua, and now watch them. When the rest of the men turned their attention back to Carrot, the scufflers looked at one another as unfortunates who had both been through the same baptism of fiery embarrassment. Private Bork gingerly offered Hashel a cigarette. It only works around him, said Angua, but it does work. Let it go on working, Vimes prayed. Carrot walked over to a kneeling camel and climbed into the saddle. That's evil brother-in-law of a jackal, said Ahmed. Jabbar's camel. It bites everyone who tries to ride it. Yes, but this is Carrot. It even bites Jabbar. And you notice how he knew how to get on a camel, said Vimes. How he wears the robes. He's fitting in. The boy was raised in a dwarf mine. It took him about a month to know my own damn city better than I do. The camel rose. Now the flag, Vimes thought, give him the flag. When you go to war, there's got to be a flag. On cue, Constable Shoe passed up the spear with the tightly rolled cloth around it. The constable looked proud. He'd stitched the thing in conditions of great secrecy half an hour before. One thing about a zombie, you always knew someone who had a needle and thread. But don't unfurl it, Vimes thought. Don't let them see it. 
It's enough for them to know they're marching under a flag. Carrot brandished the spear. And I promise you this, he shouted. If we succeed, no one will remember, and if we fail, no one will forget. Probably one of the worst rallying cries, Vimes thought, since General Pidley's famous, Let's all get our throats cut, boys. But it got a huge cheer, and once again he speculated that there was magic going on at some bone-deep level. People followed Carrot out of curiosity. All right, you've got an army, I suppose, said Ahmed. And now? I'm a policeman, so are you. There's got to be a crime. Saddle up, Ahmed. Ahmed salaamed. I am happy to be led by a white officer, Offendi. I didn't mean... Have you ever ridden a camel before, Sir Samuel? No. Ah. Ahmed smiled faintly. Then just give it a prod to get started, and when you want to stop, hit it very hard with the stick and shout, Hut, hut, hut! You hit it with a stick to make it stop. Is there any other way? said Seventy-One-Hour Ahmed. His camel looked at Vimes and then spat in his eye. Prince Kadram and his generals surveyed the distant enemy from horseback. The various Clachian armies were drawn up in front of Gebra. Compared to them, the Ankh Morpork regiments looked like a group of tourists who had missed their coach. Is that all? he said. Yes, sire, said General Ashal. But you see, they believe that fortune favors the brave. That is a reason to feel such a contemptible little army. Ah, sire, but they believe that we will turn and run as soon as we taste some cold steel. The prince looked back at the distant banners. Why? I couldn't say, sire. It appears to be an item of faith. Strange. The prince nodded to one of his bodyguards. Fetch me some cold steel. After some hurried discussion, a sword was handed up very gingerly, handle first. The prince peered at it, and then licked it with theatrical care. The watching soldiers laughed. No, he said at last. No, I have to say that I don't feel the least apprehensive. Is this as cold as steel gets? Lord Rust was probably being metaphorical, sire. But the man's a complete incompetent. Indeed, sire. And we're about to set thousands of our countrymen against one another, aren't we? Indeed, sire. So what does the maniac want to do? Tell me there's no hard feelings? Broadly speaking, sire, yes. I understand the motto of his old school was, It matters not that you won or lost, but that you took part. The prince's lips moved as he tried this out once or twice. Finally he said, And knowing this, people still take orders from him? It would seem so, sire. Prince Kadram shook his head. We can learn from Ankh Morpork, his father had said. Sometimes we can learn what not to do. And so he'd set out to learn. First he'd learned that Ankh Morpork had once ruled quite a slice of Clatch. He'd visited the ruins of one of its colonies. And so he'd found out the name of the man who had been audacious enough to do this, and had got agents in Ankh Morpork to find out as much about him as possible. General Tacticus, he'd been called. And Prince Kadram had read a lot and remembered everything. And tactics had been very, very useful in the widening of the empire. Of course, this had its own drawbacks. You had a border, and across the border came bandits. So you sent a force to quell the bandits. And in order to stamp them out, you had to take over their country. And soon you had another restless little vassal state to rule. And now that had a border, over which came, sure as sunrise, a fresh lot of raiders. So your new tax-paying subjects were demanding protection from their brother raiders, neglecting to pay their taxes and doing a little light banditry on the side. And so once again you stretched your forces, whether you wanted to or not, he sighed. For the serious empire builder there was no such thing as a final frontier. There was only another problem. If only people would understand. Nor was there such a thing as a game of war. General Tacticus knew that. Learn about your opposite number, yes, and respect his abilities, if he had them, certainly. But never pretend that afterwards you were going to meet up for a drink and charge-by-charge charge replay. He could well be insane, sire, the general went on. Oh, good. However, I am told that he recently referred to Plachians as the finest soldiers in the world, sire. 
really. He added, when led by white officers, sire. Oh, and we are offering him breakfast, sire. It would be most impolite of him to refuse. What a good idea. Have we got an adequate supply of sheep's eyes? I took the liberty of telling the cooks to save some up for this very eventuality, sire. Then we must see he gets them. After all, he will be our honored guest. Well, let us do this thing properly. Please try to look as if you hate the taste of cold steel. The Glatchins had set up an open-sided tent on the sand between the two armies. In the welcome shade a low table had been laid. Lord Rust and his company were already waiting, and had been for more than half an hour. They stood up and bowed awkwardly as Prince Cadram entered. Around the tent the Clatchian and Ark Morpork honour guards eyed one another suspiciously, every man trying to get the drop on the others. Uh, tell me, do any of you gentlemen speak a Kalachian? said Prince Kadram, after the lengthy introductions. Lord Rust's grin stayed fixed. Hornet, he hissed. I'm not quite certain what he said, sir, said the lieutenant nervously. I thought you knew Kalachian. I can read it, sir. That's not the same. Oh, don't worry, said the prince. As we say in Clatch, this clown's in charge of an army. Around the tent, the Clatchian generals suddenly went poker-faced. Hornet? Um, something about to own, um, to control, uh... It is considered honourable, said Lord Rust. I believe that on the night before the famous Battle of Pseudopolis, officers from both sides attended a ball at Lady Silarchi's, for example. The prince glanced questioningly at General Achal, who nodded. Really? Obviously we have so much to learn. As the poet Mosheda says, I can't believe this man. Ah, yes, said Lord Rust. Clatchian is a very poetic language. Excuse me, sir, said Lieutenant Hornet. What is it, man? There's, um, something going on. There was a column of dust in the distance. Something was approaching fast. One moment, said General Achal. He came back from his saddle with an ornate metal tube, covered in curly Clatchian script. He squinted into one end and pointed the other at the cloud. Mounted men, he said, camels and horses. That's a make things bigger device, isn't it? said Lord Rust. My word, you are up to date. They were invented only last year. I didn't buy this, my lord. I inherited it from my grandfather. The general looked through the eyepiece again. About forty men, I'd say. Dear me, murmured Prince Kadram. Reinforcements, Lord Rust? They've... The rider in the lead is holding a banner, I think, still rolled up. Certainly not, sire, said Lord Rust. Behind him, Lord Salachi rolled his eyes. Ah, now he's unfurling it. It's a white flag, sire. Someone wishes to surrender? The general lowered his telescope. It doesn't... I don't... Uh, they seem to be in a great hurry to do so, sire. Send a squad to apprehend them, said Prince Cadram. We will do so too, added Lord Rust hurriedly, nodding to the lieutenant. Ah, a joint effort, said the prince. A few seconds later, groups of men detached themselves from each army and rode out on an interception course. Everyone saw the sudden glints of sunlight from the approaching cloud. Weapons had been drawn. Fighting under a flag of surrender? That's immoral, said Lord Rust. Novel, certainly, said the prince. The three companies would have met had it not been that even experts find it hard to judge how much ground a running camel can cover. By the time both commanders realized they should start to turn, they should already have been turning. It seems your people misjudged things, sire, said Lord Rust. I knew I should have had them led by white officers, said the prince, but... Oh, dear, it seems your men have been equally unlucky. He stopped. Some confusion had resulted. The foray parties had their instructions, but no one had told them what to do if they ran into the other foray party, and it was composed, after all, of men they were about to fight, 
and everyone knew they were treacherous, greasy towel-heads, or perfidious, untrustworthy, sausage-eating madmen, and this was a battlefield, and everyone was frightened and therefore angry, and everyone was armed. Sam Vimes heard the shouting behind him, but had other things on his mind at this point. It is impossible to ride a running camel without concentrating on your liver and kidneys, in the hope that they won't be pounded out of your body. The thing's legs weren't moving right, he was sure. Nothing on normal legs could be jolting him around so much. The horizon jerked backwards and forwards, and up and down. What was it Ahmed had said? Vimes hit the camel hard and yelled, Hut, 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 hut. It accelerated. The jolts ran together so that his body was no longer being jolted, but was in effect in a permanent state of jolt. Vimes thrashed it again and tried to yell, Hut, 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 hut although the word came out more like <laughs> In any case, the camel found some extra knees somewhere. There was more shouting behind him. Turning his head as much as he dared, he saw several of his accompanying directs falling behind. He was certain he heard Carrot yell, but he couldn't be certain because of his own screaming. Stop, you bastard! he yelled. The tent was coming up fast. Vimes slapped the stick down again and hauled on the reins, and clearly, now judging with special camel sensitivity, that this was the most embarrassing moment to stop, the camel stopped. Vimes slid forward, flung his arms around a neck that was apparently thatched with old doormats, and half fell, half dropped onto the sand. Other camels were thudding to a halt around him. Carrot grabbed his arm. Are you all right, sir? That was amazing. You really impressed the Deregs, screaming defiance like that and you were still shouting for the camel to go faster when it was already galloping. <laughs> the guards around the tent were hesitating, but that wouldn't last long. The wind caught the white flag on Carrot's lance, making it snap. Sir, this is all right, isn't it? I mean, usually a white flag... Might as well show what we're fighting for, eh? I suppose so, sir. Deregs had surrounded the tent. The air was full of dust and screams. What happened back there? A bit of a fracas, sir. Our... Carrot hesitated and then corrected himself. That is, Ark Moorpork soldiers and Clatchians have started fighting, sir, and the Deregs are fighting both of them. What, before the battle's officially declared? Can't you get disqualified for that? Vimes looked back at the guards and pointed to the flag. You know what this flag is, he said. Well, I want you to... Aren't you, Mr. Vimes, said one of the Moorporkians, and that's Captain Carrot, isn't it? Oh, hello, Mr. Smallplank, said Carrot. Feeding you well, are they? Yes, sir. Vimes rolled his eyes. That was Carrot again, knowing everyone. And the man had called him Sir. We just need to go through, said Carrot. We won't be a minute. Well, sir, these towel... Smallplank hesitated. Certain words didn't come so easily when the subjects were standing very close to you, looking very big and tooled up. These clutchians are on guard too, you see. A stream of blue smoke was blown past Vimes' ear. "'Good morning, gentlemen,' said Seventy-One Hour Ahmed. He had a dreg crossbow in each hand. "'You will note that the soldiers behind me are also well armed. Good. My name is Seventy-One Hour Ahmed. I will shoot the last man to drop his weapons. You have my word on it.' The Moporkians looked puzzled. The Clatchians began to whisper urgently. "'Put them down, boys,' said Vimes. The Moporkians threw their swords down hurriedly. The Clatchians dropped theirs very shortly afterwards. A tie between the gentleman on the left and the tall one with the squint, said Seventy-One Hour Ahmed, raising both crossbows. Hey, said Vimes, you can't... The bows twanged. The men dropped, yelling. However, said Ahmed, handing the bows to a dreg behind him, who handed him another loaded one, out of deference to the sensibilities of Commander Vimes here... I am settling for one in the thigh and one in the toes. We are, after all, on a mission of peace. He turned to Vimes. I am sorry, Sir Samuel, but it's important that people know where they stand with me. These two don't, said Vimes. They'll live. Vimes moved closer to the wally. Hut, 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 he hissed. You told me that it meant... I thought it would prove a good example to all if you were in the lead. Ahmed whispered. The dregs will always follow a man who is in a hurry for the fray. Lord Rust stepped out into the sunlight and glared at Vimes. Vimes! What the hell are you doing? Not turning a blind eye, my lord.
Vimes pushed past and into the shade. There was Prince Kadram, still seated, and there were a lot of armed men. These, he noted almost in passing, didn't have the look of ordinary soldiers. They had the much tougher look of loyal bodyguards. So, said the prince, you come in here armed under a flag of peace. Are you Prince Kadram? said Vimes. And you too, Ahmed, said the prince, ignoring Vimes. Ahmed nodded and said nothing. Oh, not now, thought Vimes, tough as leather and vicious as a wasp, but now he's in the presence of his king. You're under arrest, he said. The prince made a little sound between a cough and a laugh. I'm... I'm what? I am arresting you for conspiracy to murder your brother, and there may be other charges. The prince put his hands over his face for a moment and then pulled them towards his chin, in the action of a tired man endeavouring to come to grips with a trying situation. Mr... He began, Sir Samuel Vimes, Ark Morpork City Watch, said Vimes. Well, Mr. Samuel, when I raise my hand, the men behind me will cut you down. I will kill the first man that moves, said Ahmed. Then the second man that moves will kill you, traitor, shouted the prince. They'll have to move very fast, said Carrot, drawing his sword. Any volunteers to be the third man? said Vimes. Anyone? General Achal moved, but only very gently holding up a hand. The bodyguards relaxed slightly. What was that lie you uttered about a murder? he said. Have you gone mad, Achal? said the prince. Oh, sire, before I can disbelieve these pernicious lies, I do need to know what they are. Vimes, you have gone insane, said Rust. You can't arrest the commander of an army. Actually, Mr. Vimes, I think we could, said Carrot, and the army too. I mean, I don't see why we can't. We could charge them with behaviour likely to cause a breach of the peace, sir. I mean, that's what warfare is. Vimes's face split in a manic grin. I like it. But in fairness... Our, uh, that is, the Ankh Morpork army, are also. Then you'd better arrest them too, said Vimes. Arrest a lot of them. Conspiracy to cause an affray. He started to count on his fingers. Going equipped to commit a crime, obstruction, threatening behaviour, loitering with intent, loitering within tent, <laughs> travelling for the purposes of committing a crime, malicious lingering, and carrying concealed weapons. I don't think that one, Carrot began. I can't see him, said Vimes. Vimes, I order you to come to your senses this minute, roared Lord Rust. Have you been out in the sun? That's one count of offensive behaviour to his lordship as well, said Vimes. The prince was still staring at Vimes. You seriously think that you can arrest an army, he said. Perhaps you think you have a bigger army. Don't need one, said Vimes. Power at a point, that's what Tacticus says. And here, it's the one right on the end of Ahmed's crossbow. That wouldn't frighten a dreg, but you, I reckon you don't think like them. Tell your men to stand down, I want the order to go out right now. Even Ahmed would not shoot his prince in cold blood, said Prince Kadram. Vimes snatched the crossbow. I wouldn't ask him to. He took aim. Give that order! The prince stared at him. Count of three, shouted Vimes. General Achal leaned down and whispered something to the prince. The man's expression stiffened, and he glanced back at Vimes again. That's right, said Vimes. It runs in the family. It would be murder, would it, in wartime? I'm from Ankh Morpork. Aren't I supposed to be at war with you? Can't be murder if there's a war on. That's written down somewhere. The general leaned down and whispered. One, said Vimes. Now there was a hurried argument. Two. My prince wishes me to say, the general began. All right, slow down, said Vimes. If it makes you any happier, I will send out the order, said the general. Let the messengers leave. Vimes nodded and lowered the bow. The prince shifted uneasily. And the Ankh Morpork army will stand down as well, said Vimes. But Vimes... You're on our side, Rust began. 
Bloody hell, I'm going to shoot someone today, and it could just be you, Rust. Vime snarled. Sir, Lieutenant Hornet tugged at his commander's jacket, may I have a word? Vimes heard them whispering, and then the young man left. All right. We are all disarmed, said Rust. We are all under arrest. And now, Commander? I ought to read them their rights, sir, said Carrot. What are you talking about, said Vimes. The men out there, sir. Oh, yeah, right. Do it, then. Oh, gods, I arrested an entire battlefield, Vimes thought, and you can't do that, but I've done it. And we've only got six cells back at the yard, and we keep the coal in one of them. You can't do it. Was this the army that invaded your country, ma'am? No, officer, they were taller than that. How about this one? I'm not sure. Get them to march up and down a bit. Carrot's voice could be heard outside, slightly muffled. Now, can you all hear me? You gentlemen in the back there, anyone who can't hear me, please raise... All right, has anyone got a megaphone? Some cardboard I could roll up? In that case, I'll shout. What now? said the prince. I'm taking you back to Ork Morpork. I don't think so. That would be an act of war. You are making a mockery of the whole business, Vimes, said Lord Rust. So long as I'm doing something right, then, Vimes nodded at Ahmed. Then you can answer for your crime here, sire, he said. In what court? said the prince. Ahmed leaned closer to Vimes. What was your plan from here on? he whispered. I never thought we'd get this far. Ah, well, it has been interesting, Sir Samuel. Prince Cadram smiled at Vimes. Would you like some coffee while you are considering your next move? he said. He gestured to an ornate silver pot on the table. We've got proof, Vimes said, but he could feel the world dropping away. The point about burning your boats is that you shouldn't be standing on them when you drop the match. Really? Fascinating. And to whom will you show this proof, Sir Samuel? We'll have to find a court. Intriguing. A court in Ankh-Morpork, perhaps. Or a court here. Someone told me that the world watches, said Vimes. There was silence except for the muffled sounds of carrot outside and the occasional buzz of a fly. Bingly, 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 beep. The disorganizer's voice had lost its chirpy little edge and sounded sleepy and bewildered. Heads turned. Seven a.m. Organize defenders at Rivergate. Seven twenty-five. Hand-to-hand -hand fighting in Peach Pie Street. Seven forty-eight. Eight. Eight. Rally. Survivors in Sartor Square. Things to do today. Build. Mm, build, mm, build barricades. He was aware of surreptitious movement behind him and then slight pressure. Ahmed was standing back to back with him. What is that thing talking about? Search me. Sounds like it's in a different world, doesn't it? He could feel events racing towards a distant wall. Sweat filled his eyes. He couldn't remember when he'd last had a proper sleep. His legs twinged. His arms ached, pulled down by the heavy bow. Bingley, eight o two a.m. Death of Corporal Little Bottom Bottom Bottom, eight o three a.m. Death of Sergeant Detritus, eight o three 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 a.m. And seven seconds death of Constable Visit, eight o three a.m. And nine 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 seconds death of death of death of death of. They say that in Ankh-Morpork one of your ancestors killed a king, said the prince, and he also came to no good end. Vimes wasn't listening. Death of death of Constable Dorful, 8.03 a.m. and 14 teen 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 seconds. The figure in the throne seemed to take up the whole world. Death of Captain Carrot Iron found us and beep. And Vimes thought, I nearly didn't come. I nearly stayed in Ark Morpork. He had always wondered how old Stoneface had felt that frosty morning when he picked up the axe that had no legal blessing because the king wouldn't recognize a court even if a jury could be found, that frosty morning when he prepared to sever what people thought was a link between men and deity. Beep! Thing 
things to do today, 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 die. The sensation flowed into his veins like fresh warm blood. It was the feeling that you got when the law ran out, and you looked into a mocking face on the other side of it, and you decided that you couldn't go on living if you did not step over the line and do one clean thing. There was shouting outside. He blinked away the sweat. Ah, Commander Vines, said a voice somewhere back over the border. He kept his aching gaze sighted along the bow. Yes? A hand darted down and grabbed the arrow out of its groove. Vimes blinked. His finger automatically squeezed the trigger. The string slammed back with a thunk. And the look on the prince's face he knew would keep him warm on cold nights, if there were ever cold nights again. He'd heard them all die, but they weren't dead, and yet the damn thing had sounded so accurate. Lord Vetinari dropped the arrow fastidiously like a society lady who has had to handle something sticky. Well done, Vimes. I see you've got the donkey up the minaret. Good morning, gentlemen. He gave the company a happy smile. I see I am not too late. Vetinari, said Rust, seeming to wake up. What are you doing here? This is a battlefield. I wonder. The patrician gave him a very brief smile of his very own. Outside there seem to be a lot of men sitting around. Many of them seem to be having what I believe is known in military parlance as a brew-up. And Captain Carrot is organising a football match. He's what? said Vimes, lowering the bow. Suddenly the world had to be real again. If Carrot was doing something as dumb as that, things were normal. Quite a large number of fouls so far, I'm afraid, but I wouldn't call it a battlefield. Who's winning? Ark Morpork, I believe, by two hack shins and a broken nose. For the first time in ages, Vimes felt a little pang of patriotism. Everything else in life was in the privy, but when it came to gouging and kicking, he knew which side he was on. Besides, Vetinari went on, I believe quite a large number of people are technically under arrest, and clearly a state of war is not in practical fact in being. It is merely... A state of football. Therefore, I believe I am, shall we say, back. Excuse me, sire, but this won't take a moment. He held up a metal cylinder and began to unscrew the end. For some reason, Vimes felt inclined to take a few steps away from it. What's that? I thought this might become necessary, said Vetinari. It took some preparation, but I am certain it will work. I hope they are readable. We did our best to keep the damp off them. A thick roll of paper dropped out onto the floor. Commander, have you nothing you should be doing? he added. Refereeing, perhaps. Vimes picked up the roll and read the first few lines. Whereas, heretofore, etc., etc., city of Ark Ballpark, surrender. What? said Rust and the Prince together. Yes, surrender said Vetinari cheerfully. A little piece of paper and it's all over. I think you'll find it all in order. You can't, Rust began. You can't, said the prince. Unconditionally, said General Ashall sharply. Yes, I think so, said Vetinari. We give up all claim to Lesp in favour of Clutch. We withdraw all troops from Clutch and our citizens from the island... And as for reparations, shall we say, a quarter of a million dollars, plus various favourable trade arrangements, most favoured nation status, and so on and so on, it's all here. Feel free to read it at your leisure. He passed the document over the head of the prince and into the hands of the general, who flicked through the pages. But we haven't got, Vimes began. Perhaps I did get killed, he thought. I'm on the other side, or someone hit me very hard on the head, and this is all some kind of mirage. It's a forgery, snapped the prince. It's a trick. Well, sire, this man certainly does appear to be Lord Vetinari, and these do seem to be the official seals of Ankh-Mor Pork, said the general. Whereas, whereby without prejudice, ratification within four days, way of trade, yes, this does, I have to say, look genuine. I won't accept it. I see, sire. It does though appear to cover all the points which in your speech last week you... 
I certainly wouldn't accept it, Rust shouted. He waved a finger under Betinari's nose. You'll be banished for this. But we haven't got that money, Vimes repeated, but this time to himself. We're a very rich city, but we haven't got any actual money. The wealth of Ankh-Mor Pork is in its people, we're told, and you couldn't remove it with big pliers. He felt the wind change, and Betinari watching him. And there was something about General Ashao, a certain hunger. I agree with Rust, he said. This is dragging the good name of Ankh-Mor Pork into the mud. To his mild surprise, he managed to say that without smiling. We lose nothing, sire, General Ashal insisted. They withdraw from Clatch and Leshp. Damned if we will, screamed Lord Rust. Right, and have everyone know we've been beaten, said Vimes, outwitted. He looked at the prince, whose gaze was hunting from man to man, but occasionally staring at nothing, as if he was watching some inner vision. A quarter of a million is not enough, the prince said. Lord Betinari shrugged. Hmm, we can discuss it. There is much that I need to buy. Things of a sharp metallic nature, no doubt, said Betinari. Of course, if we are talking about goods rather than money, there is room for flexibility. And now we're going to arm him too, Vimes thought. You'll be out of the city in a week, Rust screamed. Vimes thought the general smiled briefly. Ark Morpork without Betinari, ruled by people like Rust. His future was looking bright indeed. The surrender will need to be ratified and formally witnessed, however, said Ashal. May I suggest Ark Morpork? said Lord Betinari. No, on neutral territory, of course, said the general. But where between Ark Morpork and Clatch is there such a thing? said Betinari. I suppose there is Leshp, said the general thoughtfully. What a good idea, said the patrician. That would not have occurred to me. The place is ours anyway, snapped the prince. Will be, sire, will be, said the general soothingly. We will take possession quite legally while the world watches. And that's it. What about my arrest, said Vimes. I'm not going to... These are matters of state, said Betinari, and there are diplomatic considerations. I am afraid the good ordering of international affairs cannot hinge upon your concerns over the doings of one man. Once again, Vines felt that the words he was hearing were not the words that were being said. I won't, he began. There are larger issues here, but sterling work, nevertheless. There are big crimes and little crimes, is that it? said Vimes. Why don't you take some well-earned rest, Sir Samuel? You are, Vetinari flashed one of his lightning-fast smiles, a man of action. You deal in swords and chases and facts. Now, alas, it is the time for the men of words who deal in promises and mistrust and opinions. For you, the war is over. Enjoy the sunshine. I trust we shall all be returning home shortly. I would like you to stay, Lord Rust. Vimes realized that he'd been switched off. He spun around and marched out of the tent. Ahmed followed him. That's your master, is it? No. He's just the man who pays my wages. Often hard to know the difference, said Ahmed sympathetically. Vimes sat down on the sand. He wasn't certain how he'd been managing to stand up. There was some kind of a future now. He hadn't the faintest idea of what was in it, but there was one. There hadn't been one five minutes ago. He wanted to talk now. That way he didn't have to think about the disorganizer's death roll. It had sounded so accurate. What's going to happen to you, he said, to drive the thought out of his mind. When this is over, I mean, your boss isn't going to be pleased with you. Oh, the desert can swallow me. He'll send people after you. He looks the type. The desert will swallow them. Without chewing, believe it. It shouldn't have to be like this, Vimes shouted at the sky in general. You know, sometimes I dream that we could deal with the big crimes, that we could make a law for countries and not just for people, and people like him would have... Ahmed pulled him upright and patted him on the shoulder. I know how it is, he said. I dream too. You do? Yes. Generally of fish. 
there was a roar from the crowd. Someone scored a convincing foul by the sound of it, said Vimes. They slid and staggered up the side of a dune and watched. Someone broke from the scrum and, punching and kicking, staggered towards the Clatchian goal. Isn't that man your butler? said Ahmed. Yes. One of your soldiers said he bit a man's nose off. Vimes shrugged. He's got a very pointed look if I don't use the sugar tongs. I know that. A white figure marched authoritatively through the mill of players, blowing a whistle. And that man, I believe, is your king. No. Really? Then I am Queen Pongitrum of Sumtri. Carrots are copper, same as me. A man like that could inspire a handful of broken men to conquer a country. Fine. Just so long as he does it on his day off. And he too takes orders from you. You are a remarkable man, Sir Samuel, but you would not, I think, have killed the prince. No, but you'd have killed me if I had. Oh, yes, flagrant murder in front of witnesses. I am, after all, a copper. They'd reached the camels. One looked round as Ahmed prepared to mount, thought better of spitting at him, and hit Vimes instead, with great precision. Ahmed looked back at the footballers. Up in Klachistan, the nomads play a game very similar to that, he said, but on horseback. The aim is to get the object round the goal. Object? Probably best just to think of it as an object, Sir Samuel. And now I think I shall head that way. There are thieves in the mountains. The air is clear up there. As you know, there is always work for policemen. You thinking of returning to Ankh Morpork at any time? You'd like to see me there, Sir Samuel? It's an open city. But be sure to call in at Pseudopolis Yard when you arrive. Ah, and we can reminisce about old times. No, so you can hand over that sword. We'd give you a receipt and you can pick it up when you leave. I'd take some persuading, Sir Samuel. Oh, I think I'd only ask once. Ahmed laughed, nodded at Vimes, and rode away. For a few minutes he was a shape at the base of a column of dust, and then a shifting dot in the heat haze, and then the desert swallowed him. The day wore on. Various Clatchian officials and some of the Ankh Morpork people were summoned to the tent. Vimes wandered close to it a few times and heard the sound of voices raised in dispute. Meanwhile, the armies dug in. Someone had already erected a crude signpost, its arms pointing to various soldiers' homes. Since these were all in part of Ankh Morpork, the arms all pointed exactly the same way. He found most of the watch sitting out of the wind while a wizened Clatchian woman cooked quite a complicated meal over a small fire. They all seemed to be fully alive, with the usual slight question mark in the case of Red Shoe. "'Where have you been, Sergeant Colon?' said Vimes. "'Been sworn to secrecy about that, sir, by his lordship?' "'Right.' Vimes didn't press the point. Getting information out of Colon was like getting water out of a flannel. It could wait. "'And Nobby?' "'Right here, sir.' The wizened woman saluted in a clash of bangles. That's you? Yes, sir. Doing the dirty work as per the woman's role in life, sir, despite the fact that there is less senior watchman present, sir. Now then, Nobby, said Colon, Cheery can't cook, we can't let Reg do it because bits fall into the pan, and Angua doesn't do cookery, said Angua. She was lying back on a rock with her eyes closed. The rock was the slumbering shape of detritus. Anyway, you just started doing the cooking like you was expecting to have to do it, said Colon. Kebab, sir, said Nobby. There's plenty. You certainly got a lot of food from somewhere, said Vimes. Clatchy and quartermaster, sir, said Nobby, grinning beneath his veil. Used my sexual wiles on him, sir. Vimes's kebab stopped halfway to his mouth and dripped lamb fat on his legs. He saw Angua's eyes slam open and stare in horror at the sky. I told him I'd take my clothes off and scream if he didn't give me some grub, sir. That'd scare the daylights out of me, sure enough, said Vimes. He saw Angua breathe out again. Yeah, I reckon if I played my cards right, I could be one of them fatal fammies, said Nobby. I've only got a wink at a man and he runs a mile. Could be useful, that. I told him he could change back into his uniform, but he says he feels more comfortable like this, whispered Colon to Vimes. I'm getting a bit worried, to tell you the truth. 
I can't handle this, Grimes thought. This isn't in the Book of Rules. Er, uh, how could I explain this? he began. I don't want any of them innuendos, said Nobby. It's a good idea to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. That's all I'm saying. Well, so long as it's just shoe. I've just been getting in touch with my softer side, all right? Seeing the other man's point of view, sort of thing. Even if he is a woman. He looked at their faces and waved his hands vaguely. All right, all right. I'll put my uniform on, after I've tied it up around a camp. Will that make you all happy? Something smells nice. Carrot ran up, bouncing his football. He'd stripped to his waist. The whistle bounced on its string around his neck. I've declared half-time, he said, sitting down, so I've sent some of the lads into Gebra to get four thousand oranges. Shortly, the combined Ark Moorpork regimental bands will put on a display of counter-marching while playing a selection of military favourites. Have they practised counter-marching? said Angua. I don't think so. Should be good, then. Carrot, said Vimes, I don't wish to pry, but how in the middle of a desert did you find a football? And the voice in the back of his mind insisted, You heard him die, you heard them all die, somewhere else. Oh, these days I carry a deflated one in my pack, sir. A very pacifying object of football. Are you all right, sir? Eh? Well, oh, yes, just a bit, um, <clears throat> tired. So, who's winning? Vimes patted his pockets and found his last cigar. It's broadly speaking a tie, sir. I had to send 473 men off, though. Clatch is now well ahead on fouls, I'm sorry to say. Sport as a substitute for war, eh? said Vimes. He rootled in the ashes of Nobby's fire and pulled out a half-consumed... Well, it helps to think of it as a desert coal. Carrot gave him a solemn look. Yes, sir, no one's using weapons, and have you noticed how the Clatchian army is getting smaller? Some of the chiefs from distant parts are taking their men away. They say there's no point in staying if there's not going to be a war. I don't think they really wanted to be here in any case, to tell you the truth. And I don't think it's going to be easy to get them to come back. There was shouting behind them. Men were coming out of the tent, arguing. Lord Rust was among them. He looked around, talking to his companions. Then he spotted Vimes and rocketed furiously towards him. Vimes! Vimes looked up, hand halfway to his cigar. We would have won, you know, growled Rust. We would have won. But we were betrayed on the brink of success. Vimes stared at him. And it's your fault, Vimes. We'll be the laughing stock of Clatch. You know the value these people put on face, and we won't have any. Vedinari is finished, and so are you, and so is your stupid mongrel, cowardly watch. What do you say to that, hm, Vimes, eh? The watchmen sat like statues, waiting for Vimes to say something, or even move. Hm, Vimes, eh? Rust sniffed. What's that smell? Vimes slowly shifted his gaze to his fingers. Smoke was rising. There was a faint sizzling. He stood up and brought his fingers up in front of Rust's face. Take it, he said. That's just some trick. Take it, said Vimes. Mesmerized, Rust licked his fingers and gingerly took the ember. It doesn't hurt? Yes, it does, said Vimes. In fact, it... Uh! Rust jumped back, dropped the ember, and sucked his blistered fingers. The trick is not to mind that it hurts, said Vimes. Now go away. You won't last long, Rust sneered. You wait until we're back in the city. You just wait. He strode off, holding his stricken hand. Vimes went back and sat down by the fire. After a while, he said, Where's he gone now? Back to the line, sir. I think he's ordering the men home. Can he see us? No. You sure? There's too many people in the way, sir. You're quite sure? Not unless he can see through camels, sir. Good. Vimes stuck his fingers in his mouth. Sweat was pouring down his face. Damn, damn, damn. Has anyone got any cold water? Captain Jenkins had got his ship afloat again. It had taken a lot of digging and some careful work with bulks of timber and the assistance of a Clatchian captain who had decided not to let patriotism stand in the way of profit. He and his crew were resting on the shore when a greeting ran out from over them. He squinted into the sun. That, that can't be Vimes, can it? The crew stared. Let's get aboard right now. 
A figure started down the face of the dune. It moved very fast, much faster than a man could run on the shifting sand, and moved in a zigzag fashion. As it drew nearer, it turned out to be a man standing on a shield. It slid to a halt a few feet away from the astonished Jenkins. "'Good of you to wait, Captain,' said Carrot. "'Very many thanks. The others will be down in a minute.' Jenkins looked back to the top of the dune. There were other darker figures there now. "'Those are dregs!' he shouted. "'Oh, yes, lovely people. Have you met them at all?' Jenkins stared at Carrot. "'Did you win?' he said. "'Oh, yes, on penalties, in the end.' Green-blue light filtered through the tiny windows of the boat. Lord Vetinare pulled the steering levers until he was pretty certain that they were heading towards a suitable ship, and said, "'What is it I can smell, Sergeant Colan?' "'It's Betty, uh, uh, Nobby, sir,' said Colan, pedalling industriously. "'Corporal Nobbs?' Nobby almost blushed. "'I bought a bottle of scent, sir, for my young lady.' Lord Vetinari coughed. "'What exactly do you mean by your young lady?' he said. "'Well, for when I get one,' said Nobby. "'Ah!' Even Lord Vetinari sounded relieved. "'On account of I expect I shall now, me having fully explored my sexual nature and now feeling fully comfortable with myself,' said Nobby. "'You feel comfortable with yourself?' "'Yes, sir,' said Nobby happily. "'And when you find this lucky lady—' You will give her this bottle of... Uh, it's called Casbar Nights, sir. Of course. Very floral, isn't it? Yes, sir. That's because of the jasmine and rare ungulants in it, sir. And yet at the same time, curiously penetrative. Nobby grinned. Good value for money, sir. A little goes a long way. Not far enough, possibly. But Nobby rusted even irony. I got it in the same shop that Sarge got the hump, sir. Ah, yes. There wasn't very much space in the boat, and most of it was taken up with Sergeant Colan's souvenirs. He'd been allowed a brief shopping expedition to take home something for the wife, sir, otherwise I'll never hear the last of it. And Mrs. Colan will like a stuffed camel hump, will she, Sergeant? said the patrician doubtfully. Yes, sir. She can put things on it, sir. And the set of nested brass tables? To put things on, sir. And the, there was a clanking, set of goat bells, ornamental coffee pot, miniature camel saddle, and this strange glass tube with little bands of different coloured sand in it. Hmm, what are these for? Conversation pieces, sir. You mean people will say things like, what are they for, do you? Sergeant Colan looked pleased with himself. See, sir, we're talking about them already. Remarkable. Sergeant Colan coughed and indicated with a tilt of his head the hunched figure of Leonard, who was sitting in the stern with his head in his hands. He's a bit quiet, sir, he whispered. Can't seem to get a word out of him. He has a lot on his mind, said the patrician. The watchman pedalled onwards for a while, but the close confines of the boat encouraged a confidentiality that would never have been found on land. "'Sorry to hear that you're getting the sack, sir,' said Colan. "'Really,' said Lord Vetinari. "'You'd definitely get my vote if we had elections.' "'Capital. "'I think people want the thumbscrew of firm government myself. "'Good. "'Your predecessor, Lord Snapcase, now he was mental. "'But like I've always said, people know where they stand with Lord Vetinari. Mm, "'Well done. "'They might not like where they're standing, of course.' Lord Vetinari looked up. They were under a boat now, and it seemed to be going in the right direction. He steered the boat until he heard the thunk of hull hitting hull, and gave the auger a few turns. "'Am I being sacked, Sergeant?' he said, sitting back. "'Well, uh, I heard Lord Rust's people say that if you rat, uh, rat, uh, ratify,' said Lord Vetinari, "'yeah, if you ratify that surrender next week, they'll get you exiled, sir.' A week is a long time in politics, Sergeant. Colan's face widened in what he thought of as a knowing grin. He tapped the side of his nose. Ah, politics, he said. Ah, you should have said. Yeah, they'll laugh at the other foot then, eh? said Nobby. Got some secret plan, I'll be bound, said Colan. 
You know where the chicken is all right. I can see that there's no fooling such skilled observers of the carnival that is life, said Lord Vetinari. Yes, indeed, there is something I intend to do. He adjusted the position of the camel hump poof, which in fact smelled of goat and was beginning to leak sand, and lay back. I am going to do nothing. Wake me up if anything interesting happens. Nautical things happened. The wind spun about so much that a weathercock might as well be harnessed to grinding corn. At one point there was a fall of anchovies, and Commander Vimes tried to sleep. Jenkins showed him a hammock, and Vimes realized that this was another sheep's eyeball. No one could possibly sleep in something like that. Sailors probably kept them up for show, and had real beds tucked away somewhere. He tried to make himself comfortable in the hold, and dozed while the others talked in the corner. They were very politely keeping out of his way. Old Chip wouldn't give the whole thing away, would he? What were we fighting for? He'll have a hard job hanging on to the job after this, that's for sure. It's dragging the good name of Ankh Morpork into the mud, like Mr. Vimes said. For Ankh Morpork, mud is up. That was Angua. On the other hand, everyone is still breathing. That was detritus. That's a vitalist remark. Sorry, Reg. What you scratching for? I think I picked up a filthy foreign disease. Sorry? Angua again. What can a zombie catch? Don't like to say. You're talking to someone who knows every brand of flea powder they sell in Ankh Morpork, Reg. Oh, if you must know, my smiths, it's shameful. I keep myself clean, but they just find a way. Have you tried everything, excepting ferrets? If his lordship goes, who'll take over? That was cheery. Lord Rust? He'd last five minutes. Maybe the guilds will get together and they'd fight like... Ferrets, said Reg. The cure's worse than the disease. Cheer up. There'll still be a watch. That was Carrot. Yes, but Mr. Vimes will be out on his ear, cause of politics. Vimes decided to keep his eyes closed. A silent crowd was waiting on the quayside when the ship finally docked. They watched Vimes and his men walk down the gangway. There were one or two coughs, and then someone called out, Say it ain't so, Mr. Vimes! At the foot of the gangplank, Constable Dorfel saluted stiffly. Lord Rust's ship got in this morning, sir, the golem said. Anyone seen Vetinari? No, sir. Afraid to show his face, someone shouted. Lord Rust said you were to do your duty, damn you, said Dorfel. Golems had a certain literalness of speech. He handed Vimes a sheet of paper. Vimes grabbed it and read the first few lines. What's this, emergency council? And this, treason against Betty Nari? I'm not carrying this out. Can I see, sir? said Carrot. It was Angua who noticed the wave, while the others were staring at the warrant. Even in human form, a werewolf's ears are pretty sensitive. She wandered back to the quayside and looked down river. A wall of white water a few feet high was running up the Ankh. As it passed, boats were lifted and rocked. It sloshed by her, sucking at the key and making Jenkins's boat dance for a moment. There was a crash of crockery somewhere aboard. Then it was gone, a line of surf heading towards the next bridge. For a moment the air smelled not of the Ankh's eau de latrine, but of sea winds and salt. Jenkins appeared out of his cabin and looked over the side. What was that? The tide changing? Angua called up. We came up on the tide, said Jenkins. Beats me. One of those phenomena, I expect. Angua went back to the group. Vimes was already red in the face. It has been signed by quite a lot of the major guilds, sir, Carrot was saying. In fact, they're all here except the beggars and the seamstresses. Really? Well, piss on them. Who are they to give me an order like that? Angua saw the look of pain cross Carrot's face. Er, uh, someone has to give us orders, sir, in a general sort of way. We aren't supposed to make up our own. That's sort of, uh, the point. Yes, but not like. And I suppose they represent the will of the people. That bunch. Don't give me that rubbish. We'd have been slaughtered if we'd fought, and then we'd be in just the same position as we... This does look legal, sir. 
It's ridiculous. It's not as if we are accusing him, sir. We just have to make sure he turns up at the rat's chamber. Look, sir, you've had a very trying time, but arrest Vetinari? I can't. Vimes stopped, because his ears had caught up, and because that was the point, wasn't it? If you could arrest anyone, then that's what you had to do. You couldn't turn round and say, but not him. Ahmed would snigger. Old Stoneface would turn in all five of his graves. I can, can't I? he said sadly. Oh, all right, put out a description, Dorful. That will not be necessary, sir. The crowds moved aside as Lord Vetinari walked along the quay, with Nobby and Colon behind him. At least, if it wasn't Sergeant Colon, it was a very strangely deformed camel. I think I caught quite a lot of that, Commander, said Lord Vetinari. Please do your duty. All you've got to do is go to the palace, sir. Let's... You are not going to handcuff me? Vimes's mouth dropped open. Why should I do that? Treason is very nearly the ultimate crime, Sir Samuel. I think I should demand handcuffs. All right, if you insist, Vimes nodded at Dorful. Cuff him, then. You haven't any shackles by any chance, said Lord Betinari, as Dorful produced a pair of handcuffs. We may as well do this thing properly. No, we don't have any shackles. I was only trying to help Sir Samuel. Shall we be going? The crowd weren't jeering. That was almost frightening. They were just waiting, like an audience watching to see how the trick was going to be done. They parted again as the patrician headed towards the centre of the city. He stopped and turned. What was the other thing? Oh, yes. I don't have to be dragged on a hurdle, do I? Only if you're actually executed, my lord, said Carrot cheerfully. Traditionally, traitors are dragged to their place of execution on a hurdle, and then you're hung, drawn, and quartered. Carrot looked embarrassed. I know about the hanging and quartering, but I'm not sure how you're drawn, sir. Are you any good with a pencil, Captain? said Lord Betinari innocently. No, he's not, said Vimes. Do you actually have a hurdle? No, snapped Vimes. No? Well, I believe there's a sports equipment shop in Shear Street, just in case, Sir Samuel. A figure walked across the trampled sand near Gebra and paused when a voice very near ground level said hopefully, Bingly, bingly, beep. The disorganizer felt itself being picked up. What kind of a thing are you? I am the disorganizer Mark II, with many handy, hard-to-use features. Insert name here. Such as? Even the disorganizer's tiny mind felt slightly uneasy. The voice it was speaking to didn't sound right. I know what time it is everywhere, it ventured. So do I. Uh, I can maintain an up-to-the-minute contacts directory. The disorganizer felt movements that suggested the new owner had mounted a horse. Really? I have a great many contacts. There you are, then, said the demon, trying to hold on to its rapidly draining enthusiasm. So I make a note of them, and when you want to contact them again... That is generally not necessary. Mostly, they stay contacted. Well, do you have many appointments? There were hoofbeats and then no sound but rushing wind. More than you could possibly imagine. No, I think perhaps your talents could be better employed elsewhere. There was more rushing wind and then a splash. The rat's chamber was crowded. Guild leaders were entitled to be there, but there were plenty of other people who considered that they had a right to be in at the death, too. There were even some of the senior wizards. Everyone wanted to be able to say to their grandchildren, I was there. Although, of course, wizards aren't allowed to because they're not supposed to have grandchildren. I feel certain I ought to be wearing more chains, said Betinari as they paused in the doorway and looked at the assembled crowd. Are you taking this seriously, sir? said Vimes. Incredibly seriously, Commander, I assure you. But if by some chance I survive, I authorize you to buy some shackles. We must learn to do this sort of thing properly. I shall keep them handy, I assure you. Good. 
The patrician nodded at Lord Rust, who was flanked by Mr. Boggis and Lord Downey. Good morning, he said. Can we make this quick? Going to be a busy day. It pleases you to continue to make Ankh Morpork a laughing stock, Rust began. His glance flicked to Vimes for a moment and wrote him out of the universe. This is not a formal trial, Lord Betinari. It is an arraignment so that the charges may be known. Mr. Slant tells me that it will be many weeks before a full trial can be mounted. Expensive weeks, no doubt. Shall we get on with it? said Vetinari. Mr. Slant will read the charges, said Rust. But in a nutshell, as you are well aware, Havelock, you are charged with treason. You surrendered most ignobly. But I did not, and quite illegally waived all rights to our sovereignty of the country known as Leshp. But there is no such place. Lord Rust paused. Are you quite sane, sir? The surrender terms were to be ratified on the island of Leshp, Lord Rust. There is no such place. We passed it on the way here, man. Has anyone looked recently? Angua tapped Vimes on the shoulder. A strange wave came up the river just after we arrived, sir. There was some urgent conversation among the wizards, and Arch-Chancellor Ridcully stood up. There, there, there seems to be a bit of a problem, your lordship. Uh, the dean says it really isn't there. It's an island. Are you suggesting someone stole it? Are you sure you know where it is, man? We do know where it is, and it isn't there. There's just a lot of seaweed and wreckage, said the dean coldly. He stood up, holding a small crystal ball in his hands. We've been watching it most evenings, for the fights, you know. Of course, the picture is pretty bad at this distance. Rust stared at him, but the dean was too large to be written out of the scene. But an entire island can't just vanish, said Rust. In theory, they can't just appear either, my lord, but um, this one did. Perhaps it's sunk again, said Carrot. Now Rust glared at Betinari. Did you know about this? he demanded. How could I know something like that? Vimes watched the faces around the room. You do know something about this, said Rust. He glanced towards Mr. Slant, who was leaping hurriedly through a large volume. All I know, my lord, is that Prince Cadram has, at a politically dangerous time for him, given up a huge military advantage in exchange for an island which seems to have sunk under the sea, said Lord Vetinari. The Clatchians are a proud people. <laughs> I wonder what they will think. And Vimes thought about General Ashal standing beside Prince Cadram's throne. Clatchians like successful leaders, he thought. I wonder what happens to the unsuccessful ones. I mean, look at what we do when we think someone nudged him. Sir, sir, said Nobby. They said they didn't have any hurdles, but they'd do a ping-pong table for ten dollars. There's a small trampoline we could drag him on, but Sarge thinks that'd be a bit ridiculous. Vimes walked out of the room, dragging Nobby with him, and pushed the little man against the wall. Where did you get to with Vetinari, Corporal? And remember, I know when you tell me lies, your lips move. We, er, uh, we, 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 we just went on a little voyage, sir. He said I wasn't to say we went under the island, sir. So you... Under Leshp? No, sir, we didn't go down there. Stinking hole it was, too. Stunk of rotten eggs. The whole bloody cave. And as big as the city, believe me. I bet you're glad you didn't go, then. Nobby looked relieved. That's right, sir. Vimes sniffed. Are you using some kind of aftersh? He corrected himself. Some kind of instead of shave, Nobby? No, sir. Something smells of fermented flowers. Oh, it's just a souvenir I picked up in foreign parts, sir. It kind of lingers, if you know what I mean. Vimes shrugged and went back into the rat's chamber. And I resent most strongly the suggestion that I would have negotiated with His Highness in the knowledge that, ah, Sir Samuel, the keys to the handcuffs, please? You knew! You knew all the time! Rust shouted. Is Lord Vetinari charged with anything? said Vimes. 
Mr. Slant was scrabbling through another volume. He looked quite flustered for a zombie. His grey-green shade was distinctly greener. Not as such, he muttered. But he will be, said Lord Rust. Well, when you find out what it is, you be sure and let me know, and I'll go and arrest him for it, said Vimes, unlocking the handcuffs. He was aware of cheering outside. Nothing stayed secret very long in Ankh-Morpork. The damn island wasn't there any more, and somehow it had all worked out. He met Betinari's eyes. Piece of luck for you, eh? he said. Oh, there's always a chicken, Sir Samuel, if you look hard enough. The day turned out to be nearly as trying as war. At least one carpet made the flight from Clatch, and there was a constant stream of messages between the palace and the embassy. A crowd still hung around outside the palace. Things were happening, and even if they did not know what they were, they weren't going to miss them. If any history was going to occur, they wanted to watch it. Vimes went home. To his amazement, the door was answered by Willikins. He had his sleeves rolled up and was wearing a long green apron. You! How the hell did you get back so quickly? said Vimes. Sorry, oh, I didn't mean to be impolite. I inveigled myself onto Lord Vust's ship in the general confusion, sir. I did not wish to let things go to vac and ruin here. The silverware is frankly disgusting, I'm afraid. The gardener does not have the least idea how to do it. Allow me to apologise in advance for the shocking condition of the cutlery, sir. A few days ago you were biting people's noses off. Ah, you must not believe Private Bork, sir, said the butler, as Vimes stepped in. It was only one nose. And now you've hurried back to polish the silver. It does not do to let standard slip, sir. He stopped. Sir? Yes? Did we win? Vimes looked into the round pink face. Er... Uh, we didn't lose, Willikins, he said. We couldn't let a foreign despot vase a hand to Ankh Morpork, could we, sir? said the butler. There was a slight tremble in his voice. I suppose not. So it was right what we did. I suppose so. The gardener was saying that Lord Vetinari put one over on the Clatchian, sir. I don't see why not. He's done it with everyone else. That would be very satisfactory, sir. Lady Sybil is in the slightly pink drawing room, sir. She was knitting inexpertly when Vimes came in, but rose and gave him a kiss. I heard the news, she said. Well done. She looked him up and down. As far as she could see, he was all there. I'm not sure that we won. Getting you back alive counts as a win, Sam. Although, of course, I wouldn't say that in front of Lady Salacci. Sybil waved the knitting at him. She's organised a committee to knit socks for our brave lads at the front, but it turns out you're back and I haven't even worked out how to turn a heel yet. She's probably going to be annoyed. Er, uh, how long do you think my legs are? Um, she looked at the knitting. Do you need a scarf? He kissed her again. I'm going to have a bath and then something to eat, he said. The water was only lukewarm. Vimes had some hazy idea that Sybil thought that really hot baths might be letting the side down while there was a war on. He was lying with his nose just above the surface when he heard, with the addition of that special gloing, gloing, gloing sound that comes from listening with your ears underwater, some distant talking. Then the door opened. Fred's here. Betanari wants you, said Sybil. Already? But we haven't even started dinner. I'm coming with you, Sam. He can't keep on calling you out at all hours, you know. Sam Vimes tried to look as serious as any man can when he's holding a loofah. Sybil... I am the commander of the watch, and he's the ruler of the city. It's not like going to complain to the teacher because I'm not doing well in geography. I said, I'm coming with you, Sam. The boat slipped down its rails and into the water. A stream of bubbles came up. Leonard sighed. He had very carefully refrained from putting the cork in. The current might roll it anywhere. He hoped it had rolled to the deepest pit of the ocean, or even right over the rim. He walked unnoticed through the crowds until he came to the palace. He let himself into the secret corridor and avoided the various traps without thinking, since he himself had designed them. He reached the door to his airy room and unlocked it. When he was inside, he locked it again and pushed the key back under the door, and then he sighed. So that was the world, was it? Clearly a mad place with madmen in it. Well, from now on he'd be careful. 
it was clear that some men would try to turn anything into a weapon. He made himself a cup of tea, a process slightly delayed while he designed a better sort of spoon and a small device to improve the circulation of the boiling water. Then he sat back in his special chair and pulled a lever. Counterweights dropped. Somewhere, water sloshed from one tank to another, bits of the chair creaked and slid into a comfortable position. Leonard stared bleakly out of the skylight. A few seabirds turned lazily in the blue square, circling, hardly moving their wings. After a while, his tea growing cold, Leonard began to draw. Lady Sybil, this is an unexpected surprise, said Lord Betinari. Good evening, Sir Samuel, and may I say what a nice scarf you're wearing. And Captain Carrot. Please sit down, we have a lot of business to finish. They sat. Firstly, said Lord Betinari, I have just drafted a proclamation for the town criers. The news is good. The war is officially over, is it? said Carrot. The war, Captain, never happened. It was a misunderstanding. Never happened, said Vimes. People got killed. Quite so, said Lord Betinari, and this suggests, does it not, that we should try to understand one another as much as possible? What about the Prince? Oh, I'm sure we can do business with him, Vimes. I don't think so. Prince Kofura? I thought you rather liked the man. What? What happened to the other one? He appears to have gone on a long visit to the country, said the patrician. At some speed. You mean the kind of visit where you don't even stop to pack? Mm, that kind of visit, yes. He seems to have upset people. Do we know which country? said Vimes. Clatchistan, I believe. I'm sorry, did I say something funny? Oh, no, no. Just a thought crossed my mind, that's all. Vetinari leaned back. And so, once again, peace spreads her tranquil blanket. I shouldn't think the Clatchians are very happy, though. It is in the nature of people to turn on their leaders when they fail to be lucky, Vetinari added, his expression not changing. Oh, there will no doubt be problems. We shall just have to discuss them. Prince Kufura is an amiable man, very much like most of his ancestors, a flask of wine... A loaf of bread and vow, <laughs> or at least a selection of vows, and he'd not be too interested in politics. They're as clever as us, said Vimes. We just have to stay ahead of the men, said Betanari. A brain race, sort of, said Vimes. Better than an arms race. Cheaper, too, said the patrician. He flicked through the papers in front of him. Now then, what was— Oh, yes, the matter of traffic. Traffic? Vimes's brain tried to do a U-turn. Yes, our ancient streets are becoming very congested these days. I hear there is a carter in King's Way who settled down and raised a family while in the queue, and the responsibility for keeping the streets clear is, in fact, one of the most ancient ones incumbent on the watch. Maybe, sir, but these days... So you will set up a department, Vimes, to regulate matters, to deal with things, stolen carts and so on, and keeping the major crossroads clear, and perhaps to fine carters who park for too long and impede the flow and so on. Sergeant Colon and Corporal Nobbs would, I think, be eminently fitted for this work, which I suspect should easily be self-financing. What is your opinion? A chance to be self-financing and not get shot at, thought Vimes. They'll think they've died and gone to heaven. Is this some sort of a reward for them, sir? Let us say, Vimes, that where one finds one has a square peg, one should look for a square hole. I suppose that's all right, sir. Of course, that means I'll have to promote someone. I am sure I can leave the details to you. A small bonus for each of them would not be out of order. Ten dollars, say? Oh, there is one other thing, Vimes, and I am particularly glad that Lady Sybil is here to hear this. I am persuaded to change the title of your office. Yes? Commander is rather a mouthful, so I have been reminded that a word that originally meant commander was dux. Dux Vimes, said Vimes. 
he heard Sybil gasp. He was aware of a waiting hush around him, such as may be found between the lighting of a fuse and the bang. He rolled the word over and over in his mind. Duke, he said. Oh, no. Sybil, could you wait outside? Why, Sam? I need to discuss this very personally with his lordship. Have a row, you mean? A discussion. Lady Sybil sighed. Oh, very well, it's up to you, Sam. You know that. There are associated matters, said Lord Vetinari when the door closed behind her. No. Perhaps you should hear them. No, you've done this to me before. We've got the watch set up. We've almost got the numbers. The Widows and Orphans Fund is so big the men are queuing up for the dangerous beats. And the dartboard we've got is nearly new. You can't bribe me into accepting this time. There is nothing we want. Stoneface Vimes was a much maligned man, I've always thought, said Betinari. I'm not accepting. What? Vimes skidded in mid-anger. I've always thought that too, said Carrot, loyally. Betinari stood up and went to stand by the window, looking down at the broad way with his hands behind his back. The thought occurs that this might be time for reconsideration of certain ancient assumptions, said Betinari. The meaning enveloped Vimes like a chilly mist. You're offering to change history, he said. Is that it? Rewrite the... Oh, my dear Vimes, history changes all the time. It is constantly being re-examined and re-evaluated. Otherwise, how would we be able to keep historians occupied? We can't possibly allow people with their sort of minds to walk around with time on their hands. The chairman of the Guild of Historians is in full agreement with me. I know that the pivotal role of your ancestor in the city's history is ripe for fresh analysis. Disgust it with him, have you? said Vimes. Not yet. Vimes opened and shut his mouth a few times. The patrician went back to his desk and picked up a sheet of paper. And, of course, other details would have to be taken care of, he said. Such as, Vimes croaked, the Vimes coat of arms would be resurrected, of course. It would have to be. I know Lady Sybil was extremely upset when she found you weren't entitled to one. And a coronet, I believe, with knobs on. You can take that coronet with the knobs on and sh— Which I hope you will wear on formal occasions, such as, for example, the unveiling of the statue which has for so long disgraced the city by its absence. For once, Vimes managed to get ahead of the conversation. Old Stoneface again, he said. That part of it, is it? A statue to old Stoneface? Well done, said Lord Vetinari. Not of you, obviously. Putting up a statue to someone who tried to stop a war is not very, um, statue-esque. Of course, if you had butchered five hundred of your own men out of arrogant carelessness, we'd be melting the bronze already. No. I was thinking of the first Vimes who tried to make a future and merely made history. I thought perhaps somewhere in Peach Pie Street. They watched one another like cats, like poker players. Top of Broadway, Vimes said hoarsely, right in front of the palace. The patrician glanced out of the window. Agreed. I shall enjoy looking at it. And right up close to the wall, out of the wind. Certainly. Vimes looked nonplussed for a moment. We lost people. Seventeen caught in skirmishes of one sort or another, said Lord Vetinari. I want financial arrangements will be made for widows and dependents. Vimes gave up. Well done, sir, said Carrot. The new duke rubbed his chin. But that means I'll have to be married to a duchess, he said. That's a big fat word, duchess. And Sybil's never been very interested in that sort of thing. I bow to your knowledge of the female psyche, said Vetinari. I saw her face just now. No doubt when she next takes tea with her friends, who I believe include the Duchess of Quirm and Lady Salachi, she will be entirely unmoved, and not faintly smug in any way. Vimes hesitated. Sybil was an amazingly level-headed woman, of course, and this sort of thing... She'd left it entirely up to him, hadn't she? This sort of thing wouldn't... Well, of course she wouldn't. She... Of course she would, wouldn't she? She wouldn't swank. 
She'd just be very comfortable knowing that they knew that she knew that they knew. All right, he said, but look, I thought only a king could make someone a duke. It's not like all these knights and barons, that's just, well, political. But something like a duke needs a... He looked at Betanari and then at Carrot. Betanari had said that he'd been reminded. I'm sure if ever there is a king in Ankh-Morpork again, he will choose to ratify my decision, said Betanari smoothly, and if there never is a king, well, I see no practical problems. I'm bought and sold, aren't I? said Vimes, shaking his head. Bought and sold. Not at all, said Betanari. Yes, I am. We all are. Even Rust. And all those poor buggers who went off to get slaughtered. We're not part of the big picture, right? We're just bought and sold. Betinari was suddenly in front of Vimes, his chair hitting the floor behind his desk. Really? Men marched away, Vimes, and men marched back. How glorious the battles would have been had they never had to fight. He hesitated and then shrugged. And you say bought and sold. All right. But not, I think, needlessly spent. The patrician flashed one of those sharp, fleeting little smiles to say that something that wasn't very funny had nevertheless amused him. Veni, vici, vetinare. Seaweed floated away on aimless currents. Apart from the driftwood, there was nothing to show that Lesp had ever been. Seabirds wheeled, but their cries were more or less drowned out by the argument going on just above sea level. It is entirely our wood, you nodding acquaintance of a dog. Oh, really? On your side of the island, is it? I don't think so. It floated up. How do you know we didn't have some driftwood on our side of the island? Anyway, we've still got a barrel of fresh water, camel breath. All right, we'll share. You can have half the raft. Ha ha, ha ha Want to negotiate, eh? Now we've got you over a barrel. Can we just say yes, Dad? I'm fed up with treading water. And you'll have to do your share of the paddling. Of course. The birds glided and turned, white scribbles against the clear blue sky. To Unk Morpork! To Clatch! Down below, as the sunken mountain of Lesp settled further onto the seabed, the curious squid jetted back along its curious streets. They had no idea why, at enormous intervals, their city disappeared up into the sky, but it never went away for very long. It was just one of those things. Things happened, or sometimes they didn't. The curious squid just assumed that it all worked out sooner or later. A shark swam by. If anyone had risked placing an ear to its side, they would have heard, Bingley, bingley, beep, 3 p.m., eat, hunger, swim. Things to do today, swim, hunger, eat. 3.05 p.m., feeding frenzy. It wasn't the most interesting of schedules, but it was very easy to organise. Unusually, Sergeant Colon had put himself on the patrol roster. It was good to get out in the cool air. And also, for some reason, the news had got around that the watch was somehow bound up with what seemed in some indefinable way to have been a victory, which meant that a watch uniform was probably good for the odd free pint at the back door of the occasional pub. He patrolled with Corporal Nobbs. They walked with the confident tread of men who had been places and seen things. With a true copper's instinct, the tread took them past mundane meals. Mr. Goriff was cleaning the windows. He stopped when he saw them and darted inside. Call that gratitude, sniffed Colon. The man reappeared, carrying two large packages. My wife made this specially for you, he said. He added, she said she knew you'd be along. Colon pulled aside the waxed paper. My word, he said. Special Ankh more pork curry, said Mr. Goriff, containing yellow curry powder, big lumps of swede, green peas, and soggy sultanas, the size of eggs, said Nobby. Thank you very much, said Colon. How's your lad then, Mr. Goriff? He says you have set him an example, and now he will be a watchman when he grows up. Ah, right, said Colon happily. That'll please Mr. Vimes. You just tell him... In Al-Kali, said Goriff. He is staying with my brother. Oh, well, fair enough then. Er, uh, thanks for the curry anyway. What sort of example do you think he meant, said Nobby, as they strolled away. The good sort, obviously. 
said Colon through a mouthful of mildly spiced swede. Yeah, right. Chewing slowly and walking even slower, they headed towards the docks. I was gonna write Barna a letter, said Nobby after a while. Yeah, but she thought you was a woman, Nobby. Right. So she saw, like, my inner self, shorn of... of... Nobby's lips moved as he concentrated. Shorn of surface thingy. That's what Angua said. Anyway, then I thought, well, her boyfriend will be coming back, so I thought I'd be noble about it and give her up. Because he might be a stroppy bloke too, said Sergeant Colon. I never thought about that, Sarge. They paced for a while. It's a far, far better thing I do now than I have ever done before, said Nobby. Right, said Sergeant Colon. They walked on in silence for a while, and he added, Of course, that's not difficult. I still got the hanky she gave me, look. Very nice, Nobby. That's genuine clatchy and silk, that is. Yeah, it looks very nice. I'm never gonna wash it, Sarge. You soppy old thing, Nobby, said Fred Colon. He watched Corporal Nobbs blow his nose. So, you're gonna stop using it, are you? He said doubtfully. It still bends, Sarge, see? Nobby demonstrated. Yeah, right. Silly of me to ask, really. Overhead, the weather vanes started to creak round. Made me a lot more understanding about women, that experience, said Nobby. Colon, a much married man, said nothing. I met Verity Pushbram this afternoon, Nobby went on, and I said, How about coming out with me tonight? And I don't mind about the squint at all. And I've got this expensive, exotic perfume which will totally disguise your smell. And she said, bugger off, and threw an eel at me. Not good then, said Colin. Oh, yeah, Sarge, because she used to just curse when she saw me. And I've still got the eel, and there's a good feed off it, so I look upon it as a very positive step. Could be, could be, just so long as you give someone that scent soon, eh? Only even the people across the street are starting to complain. Their feet, moving like bees towards a flower, had found their way to the waterfront. They looked up at the Clatchian's head on its spike. It's only wooden, said Colin. Nobby said nothing. And it's like part of our traditional heritage in that, Colin went on, but hesitantly, as if he didn't believe his own voice. Nobby blew his nose again an exercise which, with all its little arpeggios and flourishes, went on for some time. The sergeant gave in. Some things didn't seem quite the same any more, he had to admit. I've never really liked the place. Let's go to the bunch of grapes then, all right? Nobby nodded. Anyway, the beer here is frankly piss, said Colon. Lady Sybil held her handkerchief in front of her husband. Spit, she commanded. Then she carefully cleaned the smut off his cheek. There! Now you look very... Ducal, said Vimes gloomily. I thought I'd done this once already. They never actually had the convivium after all that fuss, said Lady Sybil, picking some microscopic lint off his doublet. It's got to be held. You'd think if I'm a duke I wouldn't have to wear all this damn silly outfit, wouldn't you? Well, I did point out that you could wear the official ducal regalia, dear. Yes, I've seen it. White silk stockings are not me. Well, you've got the calves for them. I think I'll stick with the commander's costume, said Vimes quickly. Arch-Chancellor Ridcully hurried up. Ah, oh, oh, we're, we're ready for you now, Lord Vi. Call me Sir Samuel, said Vimes. I could just about live with that. Well, we found the bursar in one of the, the attics, so I think we can make a start, if you'll take your place. Vimes walked to the head of the procession, feeling every gaze on him, hearing the whispers. Maybe you could get chucked out of the peerage. He'd have to look that up. Although, considering what lords had got up to in the past, it would have to be for something really, really awful. Still, the drawings of the statue looked good, and he'd seen what was going to go into the history books. Making history, it turned out, was quite easy. It was what got written down. It was as simple as that. Jolly good, Rid Cully bellowed above the buzz. Now, if we all step smartly and follow Lord uh, Commander uh, Sir Samuel, we ought to be back here for lunch no later than half past one. Is the choir ready? No one is treading on anyone else's robes. Then off we go. 
Vimes set out at the mandatory slow walking pace. He heard the procession start up behind him. There were no doubt problems, as there always are on civic occasions, which have to involve the old and deaf and the young and the stupid. Several people were probably already walking in the wrong direction. As he stepped out into Sartor Square, there were the jeers and various flatulent noises and murmurs of, "'Who's he, then? Who's he think he is?' that are the traditional crowd responses on these occasions. But there were one or two cheers, too. He tried to look straight ahead. Silk stockings. With garters. Well, they were out. There were a lot of things he'd do for Sybil, but if garters figured anywhere in the relationship, they weren't going to be on him. And everyone said he had to wear a purple robe lined with vermin. They could forget that, too. He'd spent a desperate hour in the library, and all that stuff about the gold knobs and silk stockings was so much marsh gas. Tradition? He'd show them tradition. What the original dukes wore, as far as he could see, was good sensible chain mail with blood on it, preferably other people's. There was a scream from the crowd. His head jerked round, and he saw a stout woman sitting on the ground waving her arms. He stole my bag, and he never showed me a thieves' guild badge. The procession shunted to a halt as Vimes stared at the figure, legging it across Sartor Square. "'You stop right there, Sidney Pickens!' he yelled and leapt forward. And, of course, very few people do know how tradition is supposed to go. There's a certain mysterious ridiculousness about it by its very nature. Once there was a reason why you had to carry a posy of primroses on Soul Cake Tuesday, but now you did it because that's what was done. Besides, the intelligence of that creature known as a crowd is the square root of the number of people in it. Vimes was running, so the university choir hurried after him, and the people behind the choir saw the gap opening up and responded to the urge to fill it, and then everyone was just running because everyone else was running. There were occasional whimpers from those whose heart, lung, or legs weren't up to this kind of thing, and a bellow from the Arch-Chancellor, who had tried to stand firm in the face of the frantic stampede and was now having his head repeatedly trodden into the cobbles and apprentice thief Sidney Pickens ran because he'd taken one look over his shoulder and seen the whole of Ark Moorpork society bearing down on him, and that sort of thing has a terrible effect on a growing lad. And Sam Vimes ran. He tore off his cloak and whirled away his plumed hat, and he ran and ran. There would be trouble later on, people would ask questions, but that was later on. For now, gloriously uncomplicated and wonderfully clean, and hopefully with never an end, under a clear sky, in a world untarnished. There was only the chase. <laughs>